A Mother's Love. Otsu put down her sewing and called, Who's there? She slid open the shoji onto the veranda, but no one was in sight. Her spirit sank. She had hoped it was Jotaro. She needed him now more than ever. Another day of utter loneliness. She could not keep her mind on her needlework. Here below Kiyomizudera, at the bottom of Sangeng Hill, the streets were squalid, but behind the houses and shops were bamboo groves and small fields, camellias blooming and plum blossoms beginning to fall. Osugi was very fond of this particular inn. She stayed here whenever she was in Kyoto, and the innkeeper always let her have this small, quiet, separate house. Behind it was a stand of trees, part of the garden next door. In front was a small vegetable garden, beyond which was the always bustling kitchen of the inn. Otsu, called a voice from the kitchen. It's time for lunch. May I bring it to you now? Lunch, said Otsu. I'll eat with the old woman when she comes back. She said she wouldn't be back until late. We probably won't see her before evening. I'm not hungry. I don't see how you can go on eating so little. Pine smoke billowed into the enclosure from potter's kilns in the neighborhood. On the days when they were fired, there was always a lot of smoke. But after the air cleared, the early spring sky was bluer than ever. From the street came the sound of horses and the footsteps and voices of pilgrims on their way to the temple. It was from the passers-by that the story of Musashi's victory over Seijudo had reached Otsu's ears. Musashi's face appeared before her eyes. Jotaro must have been at the Rendaiji that day, she thought. If only he'd come and tell me about it. She couldn't believe the boy had looked for her and not been able to find her. Twenty days had passed, and he knew she was staying at the foot of Sanen Hill. He might be sick, but she did not really believe this either. Jotaro was not the type to be ill. He's probably out flying a kite somewhere, having a good time, she said to herself. The idea made her a little peevish. Maybe he was the one who was doing the waiting. She had not been back to the Karasumaru house, though she had promised him she would return soon. She was unable to go anywhere, for she had been forbidden to leave the inn without Osugi's permission. Osugi had obviously told the innkeeper and servants to keep an eye on her. Whenever she so much as glanced toward the street, someone would ask, Are you going out, Otsu? The question, the tone of voice, sounded innocent, but she comprehended the meaning. And the only way she could send a letter was by entrusting it to the people at the inn who had been instructed to keep any message she might try to send. Osugi was something of a celebrity in this area, and people were easily persuaded to do her bidding. Quite a few of the shopkeepers, palanquin bearers, and draymen in the neighborhood had seen her in action the year before, when she challenged Musashi at Kiyomizudera and, for all her irascibility, regarded her with a certain affectionate awe. As Otsu made yet another attempt to finish reassembling Osugi's travel outfit, which had been taken apart at the seams to be washed, a shadow appeared outside. She heard an unfamiliar voice say, I wonder if I'm in the wrong place. A young woman had come through the passageway from the street and was standing under a plum tree between two patches of scallions. She seemed nervous, a little embarrassed, but reluctant to turn back. Isn't this the inn? There's a lantern at the entrance of the passageway saying it is, she said to Otsu. Otsu could hardly believe her eyes. So painful was the suddenly reawakened memory. Thinking she had made a mistake, Akemi asked diffidently, which building is the inn? Then, looking around, she noticed the plum blossoms and exclaimed, My, aren't they pretty? Otsu looked at the girl without answering. A clerk, summoned by one of the kitchen girls, came hurrying around the corner of the inn. Are you looking for the entrance? he asked. 
Yes. It's on the corner just to the right of the passageway. The inn faces directly on the street? It does, but the rooms are quiet. I'd like a place where I can come and go without people watching me. I thought the inn was away from the street. Isn't that little house part of the inn? Yes. It looks like a nice, quiet place. We also have some very nice rooms in the main building. There seems to be a woman staying there now, but couldn't I stay too? Well, there's another lady. I'm afraid she's old and rather nervous. Oh, I don't mind. If it's all right with her. I'll have to ask her when she comes back. She's out now. May I have a room to rest in till then? By all means. The clerk led Akimi down the passageway, leaving Otsu to regret that she had not taken the opportunity to ask a few questions. If only she could learn to be a little more aggressive, she reflected sadly. To assuage her jealous suspicions, Otsu had assured herself time and time again that Musashi was not the kind of man who played around with other women. But ever since that day, she had been discouraged. She's had more opportunities to be near Musashi. She's probably much cleverer than I. Knows better how to win a man's heart. Until that day, the possibility of another woman had never crossed her mind. Now she brooded over what she considered to be her own weaknesses. I'm just not beautiful. I'm not very bright either. I have neither parents nor relatives to back me in marriage. Comparing herself with other women, it seemed that the great hope of her life was ridiculously beyond her reach, that it was presumptuous to dream that Musashi could be hers. She could no longer summon up the bravery that had enabled her to climb the old cryptomeria tree during a blinding storm. If only I had Jotaro's help, she lamented. She even imagined she had lost her youthfulness. At the Shipoji, I still had some of the innocence Jotaro has now. That was why I was able to free Musashi. She began to weep into her sewing. Are you here, Otsu? Osugi asked imperiously. What are you doing, sitting there in the dark? Twilight had descended without the girls noticing it. Oh, I'll light a lamp right away, she said apologetically, rising and going to a small room in the rear. As she came in and sat down, Osugi cast a cold look at Otsu's back. Otsu placed the lamp by Osugi's side and bowed. You must be worn out she said. What did you do today? You should know without asking. Shall I massage your legs for you? My legs aren't so bad, but my shoulders have been stiff the last four or five days, probably the weather. If you feel like it, massage them a little. To herself, she was saying that she had to put up with this dreadful girl only a little while longer, until she found Matahachi and got him to set right the evils of the past. Otsu knelt behind her and started to work on her shoulders. They're really stiff, aren't they? It must hurt to breathe. It does feel as though my chest is clogged up sometimes, but I'm old. One of these days I'll probably have some sort of seizure and die. Oh, that's not going to happen to you. You've got more vitality than most young people. Maybe, but think of Uncle Gong. He was as lively as could be, but then it was all over in an instant. People don't know what's going to happen to them. There's no mistake about one thing, though. All I have to do to be myself is think about Musashi. You're wrong about Musashi. He's not a wicked man. Yes, yes, that's right, said the old woman with a slight snort. After all, he's the man you love so much you threw my son over for him. I shouldn't say bad things about him to you. Oh, it's not like that, isn't it? You do love Musashi more than Matahachi, don't you? Why not admit it? Otsu was silent, and the old woman went on. When we find Matahachi, I'll have a talk with him and fix everything up the way you want it. 
But I suppose after that you'll run straight to Musashi, and the two of you will malign us for the rest of your lives. Why do you think that? I'm not that kind of person. I won't forget the many things you've done for me in the past. The way you young girls talk these days. I don't know how you manage to sound so sweet. I'm an honest woman myself. I can't conceal my feelings with a lot of clever words. You know, if you marry Musashi, you'll be my enemy. Ha <laughs> ha! It must be annoying to massage my shoulders. The girl did not answer. What are you crying about? I'm not crying. What's that water falling on my neck? I'm sorry. I couldn't help it. Stop it! It feels like a bug crawling around. Quit pining over Masashi and put some strength into your arms. A light appeared in the garden. Otsu thought it was probably the maid, who usually brought their evening meal about this time, but it turned out to be a priest. I beg your pardon, he said, stepping up onto the veranda. Is this the room of the Hongiden Dowager? Ah, there you are. The lantern he held bore the legend, Kiyomizudera on Mount Otowa. Let me explain, he began. I'm a priest from the Shiando, up the hill. He put the lantern down and took a letter from his kimono. I don't know who it was, but this evening, just before sunset, a young ronin came to the temple and asked if an elderly lady from Mimasaka was doing her devotions there. I told him no, but a devoted worshipper answering that description did come occasionally. He asked for a brush and wrote this letter. He wanted me to give it to the lady the next time she came. I'd heard that you were staying here, and since I was on my way to Gojo Avenue, I dropped in to deliver it. That was very kind of you, said Osugi cordially. She offered him a cushion, but he took his leave immediately. Now what? thought Osugi. She unfolded the letter. As she read, her color changed. Otsu, she called. Yes, what is it? replied the girl from the back room. There's no need to prepare tea. He's already gone. Has he? Why don't you drink it then? How dare you think of serving me tea you made for him? I'm not a drain pipe. Forget about the tea and get dressed. Are we going out? Yes. Tonight we'll reach the settlement you've been hoping for. Oh, then the letter was from Matachi? That doesn't concern you. Very well. I'll go and ask for our dinner to be brought now. Haven't you eaten yet? No, I was waiting for you to come back. You're always doing foolish things. I ate while I was out. Well, have some rice and pickles, but be quick about it. As Otsu started for the kitchen, the old woman said, It'll be cold on the mountain tonight. Have you finished sewing up my cloak? I still have a little more to do on your kimono. I didn't say kimono. I said cloak. I put that out for you to work on, too. And have you washed my socks? The cords on my sandals are loose. Have some new ones brought. The orders came so fast Otsu didn't have time to answer, let alone comply. But she felt powerless to rebel. Her spirit seemed to crouch in fear and dismay before this gnarled old harridan. Food was out of the question. In a matter of minutes, Osugi declared she was ready to leave. Placing new sandals by the veranda, Otsu said, You go ahead, I'll catch up. Did you bring a lantern? No, nitwit! Were you expecting me to stumble around on the mountainside without a light? Go borrow one from the inn. I'm sorry, I didn't think. Otsu wanted to know where they were going, but did not ask, knowing it would provoke Osugi's anger. She fetched the lantern and led the way silently up Sanen Hill. For all the harassment, she felt cheerful. The letter must have been from Matahachi, and this meant the problem that had vexed her for so many years would be solved tonight. As soon as everything has been talked over, she thought, I'll go to Karasumaru house. I must see Jotaro.
It was not an easy climb. They had to walk carefully to avoid fallen rocks and holes in the path. In the deep silence of the night, the waterfall sounded louder than in the daytime. After a time, Osugi said, I'm sure this is the place sacred to the god of the mountain. Ah, here's the sign. Cherry tree of the mountain god. Matahachi, she called into the darkness. Matahachi, I'm here. The trembling voice and face brimming with maternal affection came as a revelation to Otsu. She had never expected to see Osugi overcome by concern for her son. Don't let the lantern go out, snapped Osugi. I'll take care, replied Otsu dutifully. The old woman grumbled under her breath. He's not here. He's simply not here. She had made a round of the temple grounds, but made another one. He said in the letter I should come to the hall of the mountain god. Did he say tonight? He didn't say tonight or tomorrow or any particular time. I wonder if he'll ever grow up. I don't see why he couldn't come to the inn, but maybe he's embarrassed about what happened in Osaka. Otsu pulled at her sleeve and said, Shh, that could be him. Someone's coming up the hill. Son, is that you? Osugi called. The man passed them without a glance and went straight to the back of the little temple. He returned shortly and stopped beside them, staring boldly at Otsu's face. When he had first passed, she had not recognized him, but she did now. The samurai who had been sitting beneath the bridge on New Year's Day. Have you two just come up the hill? asked Kojiro. The question came so unexpectedly that neither Otsu nor Osugi answered. Their surprise was compounded by the sight of Kojiro's gaudy clothes. Pointing his finger at Otsu's face, he went on, I'm looking for a girl about your age. Her name's Akemi. She's a little smaller than you, and her face is a little rounder. She was trained in a tea house and acts a little old for her age. Have either of you seen her around here? They shook their heads in silence. Very peculiar. Somebody told me she'd been seen in the neighborhood. I felt sure she'd spend the night in one of the temple halls. For all the attention he was paying to them, he might as well have been talking to himself. He mumbled a few more words, then left. Osugi clicked her tongue. There's another good for nothing. He has two swords, so I suppose he's a samurai. But did you see that outfit? And up here looking for a woman at this time of night? Well, I guess he saw it was neither of us. Though she did not mention it to Osugi, Otsu had a strong suspicion that the girl he was searching for was the one who had wandered into the inn that afternoon. What on earth could be the tie that linked Musashi with the girl and the girl with this man? Let's go back, said Osugi, her voice both disappointed and resigned. In front of the Hongando, where Osugi's confrontation with Musashi had taken place, they ran into Kojiro again. He looked at them, and they at him, but no words were exchanged. Osugi watched as he went up to the Shiando, then turned away and walked straight down Sanen Hill. That man has scary eyes, Osugi murmured, like Musashi. Just then, her own eyes caught a shadowy movement, and her bent shoulders jerked up. Oh! she hooted like an owl. From behind a large cryptomeria, a hand beckoned. Matachi, murmured Osugi, thinking it was very touching that he did not want to be seen by anyone but her. She called to Otsu, now fifty or sixty feet farther down the slope. Go on ahead, Otsu, but not too far. Wait for me at the place they call Chirimazuka. I'll be with you in a few minutes. All right, said Otsu. Now don't go off anywhere. I've got my eye on you. You needn't try to run away. Osugi ran swiftly to the tree. Matahachi, it's you, isn't it? Yes, mother. His hands came out of the darkness and clasped hers, 
as though he had been waiting for years to see her. What are you doing behind this tree? My, your hands are as cold as ice. She was almost moved to tears by her own solicitude. I had to hide, said Matahachi, his eyes shifting nervously. That man who passed here a minute ago, you saw him, didn't you? The man with the long sword on his back? Yes. Do you know him? Sort of. That's Sasaki Kojiro. What? I thought you were Sasaki Kojiro. Huh? In Osaka, you showed me your certificate. That was the name written on it. You said it was the name you'd taken, didn't you? Did I? Uh, that wasn't true. Today, on my way up here, I caught sight of him. Kojiro gave me a bad time a couple of days ago, so I've been hiding to keep out of his way. If he comes back this way, I might be in trouble. Osugi was so shocked, words failed her. But she noticed that Matahachi was thinner than he had been. This and his agitated state made her love him all the more, for the time being at least. With a look that told him she did not want to hear the details, she said, All that doesn't matter. Tell me, son, did you know that Uncle Gon died? Uncle Gon? Yes, Uncle Gon. He died right there on the beach at Sumiyoshi just after you left us. I hadn't heard. Well, it happened. The question is whether you understand the reason for his tragic death and for my continuing this long, sad mission, even at my age. Yes, it's been engraved on my mind since that night in Osaka when you reminded me of my shortcomings. You remember that, do you? Well, I have news for you. News that'll make you happy. What's that? It concerns Otsu. Oh, that was the girl with you? Matachi started around her, but Osugi blocked his way and asked reproachfully, Where do you think you're going? If that was Otsu, I want to see her. It's been a long time. Osugi nodded. I brought her here for the purpose of letting you see her. But would you mind telling your mother just what you plan to do? I'll tell her I'm sorry. I treated her very badly, and I hope she'll forgive me. And then? Then, well, then I'll tell her I'll never make a mistake like that again. You tell her that too, mother, for me. Then what? Then it'll be just like before. What will? Me and Otsu. I want to be friends with her again. I want to marry her. Oh, mother, do you think she's still... You fool! She dealt him a resounding slap. He staggered back and put his hand to his stinging cheek. W why Mother, what's the matter? He stammered. Osugi, looking angrier than he had ever seen her since the day he was weaned, growled, You just now assured me you'd never forget what I said in Osaka, didn't you? He hung his head. Did I ever say a word about apologizing to that worthless bitch? How could you conceivably beg forgiveness from that she-monster after she threw you over and went off with another man? You'll see her, all right, but apologize you shall not. Now listen to me. Osugi collared him with both hands and shook him back and forth. Matahachi, head bobbing, closed his eyes and listened meekly to a long string of angry rebukes. What's this? she screamed. You're crying? Do you still love that tramp enough to weep over her? If you do, you're no son of mine. As she threw him to the ground, she collapsed too. For several minutes, both of them sat there and wept. But Osugi's bitterness could not stay submerged for long. Straightening up, she said, You've reached a point where you must make a decision. I may not live much longer. And when I'm dead... You won't be able to talk with me like this, even if you want to. Think, Matahachi. Otsu's not the only girl in the world. Her voice became calmer. 
You mustn't let yourself feel any attachment to someone who's acted the way she has. Find a girl you like, and I'll get her for you, even if I have to visit her parents a hundred times, even if it wears me out and I die. He remained sullen and silent. Forget about Otsu, for the sake of the Hongiden name. Whatever you think, she's unacceptable from the family's viewpoint. So if you absolutely cannot do without her, then cut off this old head of mine. After that, you can do as you please. But so long as I'm alive, mother, stop. The virulence of his tone made her bristle. You have your nerve shouting at me. Just tell me this. Is the woman I marry to be my wife or yours? What a silly thing to say. Why can't I choose by myself? Now, now, you're always saying headstrong things. How old do you think you are? You're not a child anymore. Or have you forgotten? But, well, even if you are my mother, you're asking too much of me. It's not fair. Their disagreements were often like this, beginning with a violent clash of emotions, a locking of horns in implacable antagonism. Mutual understanding was undermined before it ever had a chance to grow. It's not fair, Osugi hissed. Whose son do you think you are? Whose belly do you think you came from? There's no point talking about that. I want to marry Otsu. She's the one I love. Unable to endure his mother's ashen scowl, he directed his words to the sky. Son, do you mean that? Osugi drew her short sword and pointed the blade at her throat. Mother, what are you doing? I've had enough. Don't try to stop me. Just have the decency to give me the final blow. Don't do this to me. I'm your son. I can't stand here and let you do that. All right. Will you give up Otsu right now? If that's what you wanted me to do, why did you bring her here? Why tantalize me by parading her in front of me? I don't understand you. Well, it'll be simple enough for me to kill her, but you're the one she's wronged. As your mother, I thought I should leave her punishment for you to carry out. It seems to me you should be grateful for that. You expect me to kill Otsu? Don't you want to? If you don't, say so, but make up your mind. But, but, mother. So you still can't get over her, huh? Well, if that's the way you feel, you're not my son, and I'm not your mother. If you can't cut off that hussy's head, at least cut mine off. The final blow, please. Children, Matahachi reflected, are wont to make trouble for their parents, but sometimes it is the other way around. Osugi wasn't simply browbeating him. She'd thrust him into the most difficult situation in his life. The wild look on her face shook him to the core. Mother, stop! Don't do it! All right, I'll do what you want. I'll forget about Otsu. Is that all? I'll punish her. I promise to punish her with my own hands. You'll kill her? Uh, yes, I'll kill her. Osugi triumphantly burst into tears of joy. Putting away her sword, she clutched her son's hand. Good for you. Now you sound like the future head of the house of Hongideng. Your ancestors will be proud of you. Do you really think so? Go and do it now. Otsu's waiting down there at Chinimazuka. Hurry! Mm. We'll write a letter to send back to the Shippoji with her head. Then everyone in the village will know our shame has been halved. And when Musashi hears she's dead, his pride will force him to come to us. How glorious! Matachi, hurry up! You'll wait here, won't you? No! I'll follow you, but stay out of sight. If Otsu sees me, she'll start whining that I went back on my promise. That would be awkward. She's only a defenseless woman, said Matachi, 
getting up slowly. It's no problem to do away with her, so why don't you wait here? I'll bring her head back. There's nothing to worry about. I won't let her get away. Well, you can't be too careful. She may only be a woman, but when she sees the blade of your sword, she'll put up a fight. Stop worrying. There's nothing to it. Bracing himself, he started down the hill, his mother behind him, an anxious look on her face. Remember, she said, don't let your guard down. Are you still following me? I thought you were going to stay out of sight. Chirimazuka is farther down the path. I know, mother. If you insist on going, go by yourself. I'll wait here. Why are you hanging back? She is a human being. It's difficult to attack her when I have the feeling it's like killing an innocent kitten. I can see your point. No matter how faithless she's been, she was your fiancé. All right. If you don't want me to watch, go by yourself. I'll stay here. He went silently. Otsu had first thought of running away, but if she did, all the patience she had exercised in the previous twenty days would come to naught. She decided to bear it a little longer. To pass the time, she thought of Musashi, then Jotaro. Her love for Musashi sets millions of bright stars shining in her heart. As if in a dream, she counted the many hopes she had for the future and recalled the vows he had made to her at the pass at Nakayama on Hanada Bridge. Though many years might pass, she believed with all her heart that in the end he would not forsake her. Then the image of Akemi came to haunt her darkening her hopes and making her uneasy, but only for a moment. Her fears about Akemi were insignificant in comparison with her unbounded confidence in Musashi. She recalled, too, Takuan's saying that she was to be pitied, but that made no sense. How could he regard her self-perpetuating joy in that light? Even now, waiting in this dark, lonely spot for a person she did not want to see, her rapturous dream of the future made any amount of suffering bearable. Otsu! Who is it? she called back. Hongiden Matachi. Matachi? she gasped. Have you forgotten my voice? No, I recognize it now. Did you see your mother? Yes, she's waiting for me. You haven't changed, have you? You look just the way you did back in Mimasaka. Where are you? It's so dark I can't see. May I come closer? I've been standing here. I'm so ashamed to face you. What were you thinking about? Oh, nothing. Nothing in particular. Were you thinking of me? Not a day has gone by I didn't think of you. As he slowly approached her, Otsu felt a little apprehensive. Matachi... Did your mother explain everything to you? Uh -huh. Since you've heard everything, she said, immensely relieved, you understand my sentiments, but I'd like to ask you myself to see things from my viewpoint. Let's forget the past. It was never intended to be. Now, Otsu, don't be like that, he shook his head. Though he had no idea what his mother had told Otsu, he was fairly certain it had been intended to deceive her. It hurts me to have the past mentioned. It's difficult for me to hold my head up in front of you. If it were possible to forget, heaven knows I'd be glad to. But for some reason, I can't bear the thought of giving you up. Matachi, be sensible. There is nothing between your heart and mine. We're separated by a great valley. That's true, and more than five years have flowed through that valley. Exactly. Those years will never come back. There's no way to recapture the feelings we once had. Oh, no. We can recapture them. We can. No, they're gone forever. He stared at her, stunned by the coolness in her face and the finality of her tone, asking himself if this was the girl who, when she allowed herself to reveal her passions, 
was like spring sunlight. He had the feeling he was rubbing a piece of snowy white alabaster. Where had the severity been hidden in the past? He recalled the porch of the Shipoji and how she had sat there with limpid, dreamy eyes, often for half a day or more, silently looking off into space, as though she saw in the clouds mother and father, brothers and sisters. He drew closer, and as timidly as he might have reached among thorns for a white rosebud, whispered, Let's try again, Otsu. There's no way to bring back five years, but let's begin again, now, just the two of us. Matahachi, she said dispassionately, are you imagining things? I wasn't talking about the length of time. I was talking about the abyss that separates our hearts, our lives. I know that. What I mean is that, beginning right now, I'll win your love back. Maybe I shouldn't say it, but isn't the mistake I made one almost any young man might be guilty of? Talk if you like, but I'll never again be able to take your words seriously. Oh, but, Otsu, I know I was wrong. I'm a man, but here I am, apologizing to a woman. Don't you understand how difficult that is for me? Stop it. If you're a man, you should act like one. But there's nothing in the world more important to me. If you want, I'll get down on my knees and beg forgiveness. I'll give you my oath. I'll swear to anything you wish. I don't care what you do. Please don't be angry. Look, this is no place to talk. Let's go somewhere else. No, I don't want my mother to find us. Come on, let's go. I can't kill you. I couldn't possibly kill you. He took her hand, but she wrenched it away from him. Don't touch me, she cried angrily. I'd rather be killed than spend my life with you. You won't come with me? No, no, no. Is that final? Yes. Does that mean you're still in love with Musashi? Yes, I love him. I'll love him throughout this life and the next. His body trembled. That's the wrong thing to say, Otsu. Your mother already knows. She said she'd tell you. She promised we could talk it over together and put an end to the past. I see. And I suppose Musashi ordered you to find me and tell me that? Is that what happened? No, it is not. Musashi doesn't have to tell me what to do. I've got pride, too, you know. All men have pride. If that's the way you feel about me... What are you doing? She cried. I'm as much a man as Musashi, and if it takes my whole life, I'll keep you from him. I won't permit it. Do you hear? I won't permit it. And just who are you to give permission? I won't allow you to marry Musashi. Remember, Otsu, it wasn't Musashi you were engaged to. You're hardly the one to bring that up. But I am. You were promised to me as my bride. Unless I consent, you can't marry anyone. You're a coward, Matahachi. I pity you. How can you debase yourself like this? I long ago received letters from you and some woman named Oko breaking our engagement. I don't know anything about that. I didn't send any letter. Oko must have done it on her own. That's not true. One letter was in your own hand and said I should forget about you and find someone else to marry. Where's the letter? Show it to me. I don't have it anymore. When Takuan read it, he laughed, then blew his nose on it and threw it away. In other words, you have no proof, so nobody is going to believe you. Everybody in the village knows you are engaged to me. I've got all the proof and you have none. Think, Otsu. If you cut yourself off from everybody else in order to be with Musashi, you'll never be happy. The thought of Oko seems to upset you, but I swear I have absolutely nothing to do with her anymore. You're wasting your time. You won't listen even when I apologize? Matahachi, didn't you just now brag that you were a man? Why don't you act like one? No woman is going to lose her heart to a weak, shameless, lying coward. Women don't admire weaklings. Watch what you're saying. Let me go. You'll tear my sleeve. You, you fickle whore. Stop it. If you won't listen to me, I don't care what happens. Matachi, 
If you care about living, swear you'll give up Musashi. He let go of her sleeve to draw his sword. Once drawn, the sword seemed to take control of him. He was like a man possessed, a wild light in his eyes. Otsu screamed, not so much because of the weapon as because of the way he looked. You bitch, he shouted as she turned to flee. His sword descended, grazing the knot of her obi. I mustn't let her escape, he thought, and started after her, calling over his shoulder to his mother. Osugi came racing down the hill. Has he bungled it? she wondered, drawing her own sword. She's over there! Catch her, mother! called Matachi. But he soon ran back and came to a halt just before colliding with the old woman. Saucer-eyed, he asked, Where did she go? You didn't kill her? No, she got away. Fool! Look, she's down below. That's her! There! Otsu, scampering down a steep bank, had had to stop to get her sleeve loose from a branch. She knew she must be near the waterfall because the sound was very loud. As she rushed on, holding her torn sleeve, Matachi and Osugi closed in on her. And when Osugi cried, We've got her trap now! The sound was right behind her. At the bottom of a ravine, the darkness loomed like a wall around Otsu. Matachi! Kill her! There she is, lying on the ground! Matachi gave himself over to the sword completely. Jumping forward, he aimed at the dark form and brought the blade down savagely. She devil! he screamed. With the cracking of twigs and branches came a screeching death cry. Take this! And this! Matachi struck three times, four, again and again, until it seemed the sword would break in two. He was drunk with blood. His eyes spat fire. Then it was over. Silence ensued. Holding the bloody sword listlessly, he returned slowly to his senses, and his face went blank. He looked at his hands and saw the blood on them, felt his face, and there was blood there too, and all over his clothes. He blanched and grew dizzy, sick with the thought that each drop of blood was Otsu's. Splendid, son! You've finally done it! Panting more from exhilaration than from exertion, Osugi stood behind him and, leaning over his shoulder, peered down at the torn and battered foliage. How happy I am to see this, she exulted. We did it, my son. I've been relieved of half my burden. And now I can hold up my head in the village again. What's the matter with you? Quick, cut off her head. Noticing his queasiness, she laughed. You don't have any guts. If you can't bring yourself to cut off her head, I'll do it for you. Get out of the way. He stood stark still until the old woman started toward the bushes, then raised his sword and jabbed a hilt into her shoulder. Watch what you're doing, cried Osugi as she stumbled forward. Have you lost your mind? Mother! What? Strange sounds gurgled from Matahachi's throat. He wiped his eyes with his bloody hands. I've... I've killed her. I've murdered Otsu. And it was a praiseworthy deed, too. Why? You're crying. I can't help it. Oh, you fool! You crazy, fanatic old fool! Are you sorry? Yes. Yes. If it hadn't been for you, you ought to be dead by now. I'd have somehow gotten Otsu back. You and your family honor. Stop your blabbering. If she meant that much to you, why didn't you kill me and protect her? If I'd been able to do that, I... Could there be anything worse than having a pig-headed maniac for a mother? Stop carrying on like that. And how dare you speak to me that way? From now on, I'll live my life the way I want. If I make a mess of it, that's nobody's business but mine. That's always been a failing of yours, Matahachi. You get excited and make scenes just to cause your mother trouble. I'll cause you trouble, all right, you old sow. You're a witch. I hate you. 
My, my, isn't he angry? Get out of the way. I'll take Otsu's head, and then I'll teach you a few things. More talk? I'm not listening. I want you to take a good look at that girl's head. You'll see then just how pretty she is. I want you to see with your own eyes what a woman is like after she dies. Nothing but bones. I want you to know the folly of passion. Shut up! Matachi shook his head violently. When I think of it, all I've ever wanted was Otsu. When I told myself I couldn't go on as I was, tried to find a way to succeed, start out again on the right path, it was all because I wanted to marry her. It wasn't family honor, and it wasn't for the sake of a horrible old woman. How long are you going to go on about something that's already finished? You do yourself more good chanting sutras. Hail to Amida Buddha! She fumbled among the broken branches and dry grass, which were liberally sprinkled with blood, then bent some grass over and knelt on it. Otsu, she said, don't hate me. Now that you are dead, I have no more grudge against you. It was all a matter of necessity. Rest in peace. She felt around with her left hand and got hold of a mass of black hair. Takuan's voice rang out. Otsu! Carried down into the hollow by the dark wind, it seemed as if its source was the trees and the stars themselves. Have you found her yet? He called, his voice sounding rather strained. No, she's not around here. The keeper of the inn where Osugi and Otsu had been staying wiped the sweat wearily from his brow. Are you sure you heard right? Quite sure. After the priest came from Kiyomizudera in the evening, the old lady left suddenly, saying she was going to the hall of the mountain god. The girl was with her. Both of them folded their arms in thought. Maybe they went up on the mountain or some place off the main path, said Takuan. Why are you so worried? I think Otsu's been tricked. Is the old woman really that wicked? No, said Takuan enigmatically. She's a very good woman. Not from what you told me. Oh, I just remembered something. What's that? Today I saw the girl crying in her room. That may not mean much. The old woman told us she was her son's bride. She would say that. From what you said, it sounds like some terrible hatred made the old woman torment the girl. Still, that's one thing. And taking her up into the mountains on a dark night is another. I'm afraid Osugi's been planning to murder her. Murder? How can you say she's a good woman? Because she is without a doubt what the world calls good. She often goes to Kiyomizudera to worship, doesn't she? And when she's seated before Kanon with her prayer beads in her hand, she must be very close to Kanon in spirit. I hear she also prays to the Buddha Amida. There are lots of Buddhists like that in this world. The faithful, they're called. They do something they shouldn't, go to the temple and pray to Amida. They seem to dream up diabolical deeds for Amida to forgive. They'll quite cheerfully strike a man dead, perfectly confident that if they call on Amida afterward, their sins will be absolved and they'll go to the western paradise when they die. These good people are something of a problem. Matahachi looked around fearfully, wondering where the voice had come from. Hear that, mother? he asked excitedly. Do you recognize the voice? Osugi raised her head, but the interruption did not disturb her greatly. Her hand still grasped the hair. Her sword was poised to strike. Listen, there it is again. That's strange. If anybody came looking for Otsu, it'll be that boy named Jotaro. This is a man's voice. Yes, I know, and I think I've heard it somewhere before. This looks bad. Mother, forget about the head. Bring the lantern. Somebody's coming. This way? Yes, two men. Come on, let's run. 
Danger united mother and son in the twinkling of an eye, but Osugi couldn't tear herself away from her gory task. Just a minute, she said. After coming this far, I'm not going back without the head. If I don't have it, how can I prove I took vengeance on Otsu? I'll be through in no time. Oh, he moaned with revulsion. A horrified cry sprang from Osugi's lips. She dropped the head, half stood, staggered, and collapsed on the ground. It's not her, she screamed. She flailed her arms and tried to stand up, but again fell down. Matahachi jumped forward to look and stammered. W w what See? It's not Otsu. It's a man. Beggar. Invalid. This couldn't be, exclaimed Matahachi. I know this man. What? Some friend of yours? Oh, no. He tricked me into giving him all my money, he blurted out. What was a dirty swindler like Akakabe Yasoma doing here? So near a temple. Who's there? called Takuan. Otsu, is that you? Suddenly, he was standing right behind them. Matahachi was fleeter of foot than his mother. As he dashed out of sight, Takuan caught up with her and took a firm grip on her collar. Just as I thought. And I trust it was your loving son who fled? Matahachi! What do you mean by running away and leaving your mother behind, ungrateful lout? Come back here! Osugi, though squirming miserably at his knees, had lost none of her spunk. Who are you? she demanded angrily. What do you want? Takuan released her and said, Don't you remember me, Granny? You must be getting senile after all. Takuan! Are you surprised? I don't see why I should be. A beggar like you, going wherever he pleases. Sooner or later, you were bound to float into Kyoto. You're right, he agreed with a grin. It's just as you say. I was roaming about in Koyagyu Valley and Izumi Province, but I came up to the capital and last night at a friend's house heard some disturbing news. I decided it was too important not to act on. What does that have to do with me? I thought Otsu would be with you, and I'm looking for her. Oomph! Granny? What? Where's Otsu? I don't know. I don't believe you. Sir, said the innkeeper, blood has been spilled here. It's still fresh. He moved his lantern closer to the corpse. A stony frown came to Takuan's face. Osugi, seeing him preoccupied, jumped up and started running away. Without moving, the priest shouted, Wait! You left home to clear your name, didn't you? Are you going back now with it more sullied than ever? You said you loved your son. Do you plan to desert him now that you've made him miserable? The force of his booming voice wrapped itself around Osugi, bringing her to an abrupt halt. Her face distorted by defiant wrinkles, she cried, Soiled my family's name, made my son unhappy. What do you mean? Exactly what I said. Fool, she gave a short, scornful laugh. Who are you? You go around eating other people's food, living in other people's temples, relieving your bowels in the open field. What do you know about family honor? What do you know of a mother's love for her son? Have you ever once borne the hardships ordinary people bear? Before telling everybody else how to act, you should try working and feeding yourself, like everybody else. You strike a sore spot, and I feel it. There are priests in this world to whom I'd like to say the same thing. I've always said I was no match for you in a battle of words, and I see you still have command of a sharp tongue. And I still have important things to do in this world. You needn't think the only thing I can do is talk. Never mind that. I want to discuss other matters with you. And what might they be? You put Matahachi up to killing Otsu tonight, didn't you? The two of you murdered her, I suspect. Stretching her wrinkled neck, Osugi laughed contemptuously. Takuan, you can carry a lantern through this life, but it won't do you any good unless you open your eyes. What are they anyway? 
just holes in your head? Funny ornaments? Takuan, feeling slightly uneasy, finally turned his attention to the scene of the murder. When he looked up in relief, the old woman said, not without a touch of rancor, I suppose you're happy it's not Otsu, but don't think I've forgotten that you were the unholy matchmaker who threw her together with Musashi and caused all this trouble in the first place. If that's the way you feel, fine. But I know you're a woman with religious faith, and I say you shouldn't go away and leave this body lying here. He was stretched out there, on the verge of death anyway. Matahachi killed him, but it wasn't Matahachi's fault. This Roni, said the innkeeper, was a little peculiar in the head. For the last few days, he's been staggering around town, drooling at the mouth. He had a huge lump on his head. Displaying an absolute lack of concern, Osugi turned to leave. Takuan asked the innkeeper to take care of the corpse and followed her, much to Osugi's annoyance. But as she turned to unleash her poisonous tongue again, Matahachi called softly, Mother! She went happily toward the voice. He was a good son after all. He had stayed to make sure his mother was safe. Whispering a few words to each other, they apparently decided they were not completely free from danger in the priest's presence and ran as fast as they could toward the foot of the hill. It's no use, murmured Takuan. To judge from that performance, they wouldn't listen to anything I have to say. If only the world could be rid of silly misunderstandings, how much less people would suffer. But right now, he had to find Otsu. She had discovered some means of escaping. His spirits rose a little, but he could not really relax until he was sure she was safe. He decided to continue his search despite the darkness. The innkeeper had gone up the hill a while earlier, he came back down accompanied by seven or eight men with lanterns. The night watchman at the temple, having agreed to help with the burial, brought shovels and spades. Presently, Takuan heard the unpleasant sound of grave digging. About the time the hole was deep enough, someone cried, Look over here! Another body! This one's a pretty young girl! The man was about ten yards from the grave on the edge of a marsh. Is she dead? No, just unconscious. The Urbane Craftsman Until his dying day, Musashi's father had never stopped reminding him of his ancestry. I may be only a country samurai, he'd say, but never forget, the Akamatsu clan was once famous and powerful. It should be a source of strength and pride to you. Since he was in Kyoto, Musashi decided to visit a temple called the Rakanji, near which the Akamatsus had once had a house. The clan had long since fallen, but it was just possible he might find at the temple some record of his ancestors. Even if he didn't, he could burn some incense in their memory. Arriving at the Rakan Bridge over the lower Kogawa, he thought that he must be near the temple, for it was said to be located a little east of where the upper Kogawa became the lower Kogawa. His inquiries in the neighborhood, however, drew a complete blank. No one had ever heard of it. Returning to the bridge, he stood and gazed at the clear, shallow water flowing beneath it. Though it wasn't so many years since Munisai's death, it appeared that the temple had been either moved or destroyed, leaving neither trace nor memory. He watched idly as a whitish eddy formed and disappeared, formed and disappeared again. Noticing mud dripping from a grassy spot on the left bank, he concluded that it came from a sword polisher's shop. Musashi! He looked around and saw the old nun Myoshu returning from an errand. How good of you to come, she exclaimed, thinking he was there to pay a call. Koetsu's at home today. He'll be glad to see you. She led him through the gate of a nearby house and sent a servant to fetch her son. 
After warmly welcoming his guest, Kowitz said, At the moment, I'm busy with an important polishing job, but later we can have a nice long chat. It pleased Musashi to see that both mother and son were as friendly and natural as they had been the first time he met them. He spent the afternoon and evening chatting with them, and when they urged him to spend the night, he accepted. The next day, while Koetsu showed him the workshop and explained the technique of sword polishing, he begged Musashi to stay on as long as he wished. The house, with its deceptively modest gate, stood on a corner southeast of the remains of the Jisoin. In the neighborhood were several houses belonging to Koetsu's cousins and nephews, or to other men engaged in the same profession, all the Hongamis lived and worked here, after the fashion of the large provincial clans of the past. The Hongamis were descended from a fairly distinguished military family and had been retainers to the Ashkaga shoguns. In the present social hierarchy, the family belonged to the artisan class, but insofar as wealth and prestige were concerned, Koetsu might have been taken for a member of the samurai class. He hobnobbed with high court nobles and had on occasion been invited by Tokugawa Ieyasu to Fushimi Castle. The Hoami's position was not unique. Most of the wealthy artisans and merchants of the day, Suminokura Soang, Chaya Shirojiro, and Haya Shoyu, among others, were of samurai descent. Under the Ashkaga shoguns, their ancestors had been assigned work related to manufacture or trade. Success in these fields led to a gradual severing of connections with the military class, and as private enterprise became profitable, they were no longer dependent on their feudal emoluments. Although their social rank was technically lower than that of the warriors, they were very powerful. When it came to business, not only was samurai status more of a hindrance than a help, there were definite advantages to being a commoner, chief of which was stability. When fighting erupted, the great merchants were patronized by both sides. True, they were sometimes forced to furnish military supplies for little or nothing, but they had come to regard this onus as no more than a fee paid in lieu of having their property destroyed during wartime. During the Onin War of the 1460s and 70s, the whole district around the ruins of the Jisoin had been razed, and even now, people planting trees often dug up rusted fragments of swords or helmets. The Hoami residence had been one of the first built in the vicinity after the war. A branch of the Arisagawa flowed through the compound, meandering first through a quarter acre or so of vegetable garden, then disappearing into a grove to emerge again near the well by the front entrance of the main house. There was a branch flowing off toward the kitchen, another toward the bath, and still another toward a simple rustic tea house, where the clear water was used for the tea ceremony. The river was the source of water for the workshop, where swords forged by master craftsmen like Masamune, Muramasa, and Osafune were expertly polished. Since the workshop was sacred to the family, a rope was suspended over the entranceway in the manner of Shinto shrines. Almost before he knew it, four days passed, and Musashi made up his mind to take his leave. But before he'd had a chance to mention this, Koetsu said, We're not doing much to entertain you, but if you're not bored, please stay as long as you like. There are some old books and curios in my study. If you'd like to look them over, feel free to do so. And in a day or two, I'm going to fire some tea bowls and dishes. You might enjoy watching. You'll find ceramics almost as interesting as swords. Maybe you could model a piece or two yourself. Touched by the graciousness of the invitation and his host's assurance that no one would take offense if he decided to leave on a moment's notice, Musashi allowed himself to settle down and enjoy the relaxed atmosphere. He was far from bored. The study contained books in Chinese and Japanese, scroll paintings from the Kamakura period, rubbings of calligraphy by ancient Chinese masters, and dozens of other things, 
any one of which Musashi could happily have poured over for a day or so. He was particularly attracted by a painting hanging in the alcove, called Chestnuts. It was by the sung master Liang Kai. It was small, about two feet high by two and a half wide, and so old that it was impossible to tell what sort of paper it was drawn on. He sat and gazed at it by the hour. Finally, one day, he remarked to Koetsu, I'm sure no rank amateur could paint the sort of pictures you paint, but I wonder if maybe even I couldn't draw something as simple as this work. It's the other way around, Koetsu informed him. Anybody could learn to paint as well as I, but there is a degree of profundity and spiritual loftiness in Liang Kai's painting that cannot be acquired merely by studying art. Is that really true? Musashi asked in surprise. He was assured that it was. It showed nothing but a squirrel looking at two fallen chestnuts, one split open and the other tightly closed, as if it wanted to follow its natural impulse and eat the chestnuts, but hesitated for fear of the thorns. Since the painting was executed very freely in black ink, Musashi had thought it looked naive, but the more he looked at it after talking to Koetsu, the more clearly he saw that the artist was right. One afternoon, Koetsu came in and said, Are you staring at Liang Kai's picture again? You seem to have taken a great liking to it. When you leave, roll it up and take it with you. I'd like you to have it. Musashi demurred. I couldn't possibly accept it. It's bad enough for me to stay here in your house so long. Why, that must be a family heirloom. But you do like it, don't you? The older man smiled indulgently. You may have it if you want it. I really don't need it. Pictures should be owned by the people who really love and appreciate them. I'm sure that's what the artist would want. If you put it that way, I'm not the one to own a painting like this. To tell the truth, I've thought several times it'd be nice to have it. But if I did, what would I do with it? I'm only a wandering swordsman. I never stay in the same place very long. I suppose it would be a nuisance, carrying a painting around with you wherever you go. At your age, you probably don't even want a house of your own. But I think every man should have a place he can regard as home, even if it's nothing more than a little shack. Without a house, a person gets lonely, feels lost somehow. Why don't you find some logs and build a cabin in some quiet corner of the city? I never thought about it. I'd like to travel to a lot of distant places, go to the farthest end of Kyushu, and see how people live under the foreign influences in Nagasaki. And I'm eager to see the new capital the shogun is building in Edo, and the great mountains and rivers in northern Honshu. Maybe I'm just a vagabond at heart. You're not the only one, by any means. It's only natural. But you should avoid the temptation of thinking that your dreams can be realized only in some far-off place. If you think that way, you'll neglect the possibilities in your immediate surroundings. Most young people do, I fear, and become dissatisfied with their lives. Koetsu laughed. But an idle old man like myself has no business preaching to the young. Anyway, I didn't come here to talk about that. I came to invite you out this evening. Have you ever been to the licensed quarter? The geisha district? Yes. I have a friend named Haya Shoyu. Despite his age, he's always up to some mischief or other. I just received a note inviting me to join him near Rokujo Avenue this evening, and I wondered if you'd like to come along. No, I don't think so. If you really don't want to, I'll not insist. But I think you'd find it interesting. Myoshu, who had crept in silently and was listening with obvious interest, put in, I think you should go, Musashi. 
It's an opportunity to see something you haven't seen. Hayashoyu's not the kind of man you have to be stiff and formal with, and I believe you'd enjoy the experience. By all means, go! The old nun went to the chest of drawers and began taking out a kimono and obi. As a rule, older people were at pains to prevent young men from frittering away their time and money at geisha houses, but Myoshu seemed as enthusiastic as if she herself were getting ready to go somewhere. Now, let's see. Which of these kimonos do you like? she asked. Will this obi do? Chattering away, she busied herself getting out things for Musashi as if he were her son. She chose a lacquered pillbox, a decorative short sword, and a brocade wallet, then took some gold coins from the money chest and slipped them into the wallet. Well, said Musashi, with only a trace of reluctance, if you insist, I'll go, but I wouldn't look right in all that finery. I'll just wear this old kimono I have on. I sleep in it when I'm out in the open. I'm used to it. You'll do no such thing, Myoshu said sternly. You yourself may not mind, but think of the other people. In those nice pretty rooms, you'd look no better than a dirty old rag. Men go there to have a good time and forget their troubles. They want to be surrounded by beautiful things. Don't think of it as dressing up to make yourself look like something you're not. Anyway, these clothes aren't nearly as fancy as some men wear. They're just clean and neat. Now, put them on. Musashi complied. When he was dressed, Myoshu remarked cheerfully, There, you look very handsome. As they were about to leave, Koetsu went to the household Buddhist altar and lit a candle on it. Both he and his mother were devout members of the Nichiren sect. At the front entrance, Myoshu had laid out two pairs of sandals with new thongs. While they were putting them on, she whispered with one of the servants, who was waiting to shut the front gate after them. Koetsu said goodbye to his mother, but she looked up at him quickly and said, Wait just a minute. Her face was creased in a worried frown. What's the matter? he asked. This man tells me three rough-looking samurai were just here and spoke very rudely. Do you suppose it's anything important? Koetsu looked questioningly at Musashi. There's no reason to be afraid, Musashi assured him. They're probably from the house of Yoshioka. They may attack me, but they don't have anything against you. One of the workmen said the same sort of thing happened a couple of days ago. Only one samurai, but he came through the gate without being asked and looked over the hedge by the tea house path, toward the part of the house where you're staying. Then I'm sure it's the Yoshioka men. I think so too, agreed Koetsu. He turned to the trembling gateman. What did they say? The workmen had all left, and I was about to close the gate when these three samurai suddenly surrounded me. One of them, he looked mean, took a letter out of his kimono and ordered me to hand it to the guest staying here. He didn't say Musashi? Well, later on he did say Miyamoto Musashi, and he said Musashi'd been staying here for several days. What did you say? You said not to tell anyone about Musashi, so I shook my head and said there was no one here by that name. He got angry and called me a liar, but one of the others, a somewhat older man with a smirk on his face, calmed him down and said they'd find a way to deliver the letter directly. I'm not sure what he meant, but it sounded like a threat. They went off toward the corner down there. Koetsu, you walk on a little ahead of me, said Musashi. I don't want you to get hurt or become involved in any trouble because of me. Koetsu replied with a laugh. There's no need to worry about me, particularly if you're sure they're Yoshioka men. I'm not the least bit afraid of them. Let's go. After they were outside, Koetsu put his head back through the small door in the gate and called, Mother! Did you forget something? she asked. No, I was just thinking. 
If you're worried about me, I could send a messenger to show you and tell him I can't come this evening. Oh, no. I'm more afraid something might happen to Musashi. But I don't think he'd come back if you tried to stop him. Go on and have a good time. Koetsu caught up with Musashi and as they ambled along the riverbank said, Shoyu's house is just down the road at Ichijo Avenue and Horikawa Street. He's probably getting ready now, so let's stop in for him. It's right on the way. It was still light, and the walk along the river was pleasant, all the more so because they were completely at leisure at an hour when everybody else was busy. Musashi remarked, I've heard Haya Shoyu's name, but I really don't know anything about him. I'd be surprised if you hadn't heard of him. He's a well-known expert at composing linked verse. Ah, so he's a poet. He is, but of course he doesn't make his living writing verse. He comes from an old Kyoto merchant family. How did he get the name Haya? It's the name of his business. What does he sell? His name means Ash Salesman. And that's what he sells. Ashes. Ashes? Yes, they're used in dyeing cloth. It's a big business. He sells to dyers' guilds all over the country. At the beginning of the Ashkaga period, the ash trade was controlled by an agent of the shogun, but later it was turned over to private wholesalers. There are three big wholesale houses in Kyoto, and Shoyu's is one of them. He himself doesn't have to work, of course. He's retired and living a life of ease. Look over there. You can see his house. It's the one with the stylish gate. Musashi nodded as he listened, but his attention was distracted by the feel of his sleeves. While the right one was waving lightly in the breeze, the left did not move at all. Slipping his hand in, he drew out an object enough to see what it was, a well-tanned purple leather thong of the type warriors use to tie up their sleeves when fighting. Myoshu, he thought. Only she could have put it there. He looked back and smiled at the men behind them, who, as he was already aware, had been trailing along at a discreet distance ever since he and Koetsu had turned out of Hongami Lane. His smile seemed to relieve the three men. They whispered a few words to each other and began taking longer strides. Coming to the Haya house, Koetsu sounded the clapper on the gate, and a servant carrying a broom came to admit them. Koetsu was through the gate and in the front garden before he noticed Musashi was not with him. Turning back toward the gate, he called, Come in, Musashi. There's nothing to be hesitant about. Having closed in on Musashi, the three samurai had their elbows thrust out and their hands on their swords. Koetsu couldn't catch what they said to Musashi, nor the latter's soft reply. Musashi told him not to wait, and Koetsu answered with an air of complete calm. All right, I'll be in the house. Join me as soon as you've finished your business. We're not here one of the men said, to argue about whether you ran away to hide or not. I'm Otaguro Hyosuke. I'm one of the ten swordsmen of the house of Yoshioka. I've brought a letter from Seijuro's younger brother, Denshichiro. Taking the letter out, he held it up for Musashi to see. Read it and give us your answer immediately. Opening the letter in an offhand manner, Musashi read it quickly and said, I accept. Hyosuke looked at him suspiciously. Are you sure? Musashi nodded. Absolutely sure. Musashi's casualness took them off guard. If you don't keep your word, you'll never be able to show your face in Kyoto again. We'll see to that. Musashi's stare was accompanied by a slight smile, but he said nothing. Are you satisfied with the conditions? There's not much time left to prepare yourself. I'm quite ready, Musashi answered calmly. Then we'll see you later this evening. As Musashi started through the gate, Hyosuke approached him again and asked, Will you be here until the time agreed on? No, my host is taking me to the licensed quarter near Rokujo Avenue. The licensed quarter? Hyosuke was surprised. 
Well, I assume you'll be either here or there. If you're late, I'll send someone for you. I trust you won't try any tricks. Musashi had already turned his back and entered the front garden, a step that took him into a different world. The irregularly shaped, artlessly spaced stepping stones of the garden path appeared to have been put there by nature. On either side were moist clumps of low, fern-like bamboo, interspersed with taller bamboo shoots, no thicker than a riding brush. As he walked on, the roof of the main house came into view, then the front entrance, a small separate house, and a garden bower, each contributing to the atmosphere of venerable age and long tradition. Around the buildings, tall pines suggested wealth and comfort. He could hear people playing the game of kickball called kemari, a soft, sporadic thump, often heard from behind the walls of the mansions of court nobles. Hearing it in a merchant's establishment surprised him. Once in the house, he was shown into a room looking out onto the garden. Two servants entered with tea and cakes, one informing them that their host would be with them shortly. Musashi could tell from the servants' manner that they were impeccably trained. Koetsu murmured, It's quite cold, isn't it, now that the sun's gone down? He wanted to have the shoji closed, but didn't ask because Musashi appeared to be enjoying the view of the plum blossoms. Koetsu also turned his eyes toward the view. I see there are clouds above Mount Hie, he remarked. I'd guess they're from the north, Aren't you chilly? No, not especially, answered Musashi honestly, serenely ignorant of what his companion was hinting at. A servant brought a candlestick, and Koetsu took the opportunity to close the shoji. Musashi became conscious of the atmosphere within the household, which was peaceful and genial. Relaxing and listening to the laughing voices coming from the inner part of the house, he was struck by the complete absence of ostentation. It was as though the decor and surroundings had deliberately been made as simply as possible. He could imagine himself in the guest room of a large farmhouse in the country. Heiya Shoyu entered the room and proclaimed, I'm sorry to have kept you waiting so long. His voice, open, friendly, youthful, was just the opposite of Koetsu's soft drawl. Thin as a crane, he was perhaps ten years older than his friend, yet far more jovial. When Koetsu explained who Musashi was, he said, Oh, so you're a nephew of Matsuo Kaname. I know him quite well. Shoyu's acquaintance with his uncle must have been through the noble house of Konoe, thought Musashi, beginning to sense the close ties between the wealthy merchants and the palace courtiers. Without further ado, the spry old merchant said, Let's be on our way. I had intended to go while it was still light so that we could stroll over, but since it's already dark, I think we should call for palanquins. This young man's coming with us, I assume? Palanquins were summoned, and the three set off, Shoyu and Koetsu in front, Musashi behind. It was the first time he had ever ridden in one. By the time they reached the Yanagi riding grounds, the bearers were already puffing white steam. Oh, it's cold, one complained. The wind cuts into you, doesn't it? And it's supposed to be spring. Their three lanterns swung to and fro, flickering in the wind. Dark clouds above the city hinted ominously of still worse weather before the night was out. Beyond the riding field... The lights of the city shone in dazzling splendor. Musashi had the impression of a great swarm of fireflies glowing cheerfully in the cold, clear breeze. Musashi! Koetsu called from the middle palanquin. That's where we're going, over there. It's quite an experience to come upon it suddenly, isn't it? He explained that until three years ago, the licensed district had been at Nijo Avenue near the palace, then the magistrate, Itakura Katsushige, had had it moved because the nightly singing and carousing was a nuisance. 
He said the whole area was thriving and that all new fashions originated within those rows of lights. You could almost say that a whole new culture has been created there. Pausing and listening carefully for a moment, he added, You can just hear it, can't you? The sound of strings and singing? It was music Musashi had never heard before. The instruments are shamisen. They're an improved version of a three-stringed instrument brought from the Ryukyu Islands. A great many new songs have been composed for them, all right here in the quarter, then spread out among the common people. So you can see how influential this district is, and why certain standards of decency have to be maintained, even though it's rather cut off from the rest of the city. They turned into one of the streets, the light from countless bright lamps and lanterns hanging from the willow trees reflected in Musashi's eyes. The district had kept its old name when it was moved, Yanagimachi, the town of willows, willows having long been associated with drinking and dalliance. Koetsu and Shoyu were well known at the establishment they entered. The greetings were obsequious, yet jocular, and it soon became apparent that they used nicknames, play names, as it were. Koetsu was known as Mizuochi-sama, Mr. Falling Water, because of the streams traversing his estate, and Shoyu was Funabashi-sama, Mr. Boat Bridge, after a pontoon bridge in the vicinity of his house. If Musashi was to become a habitué, he would certainly acquire a nickname soon, for in this never-never land, few use their real names. Hayashiya Yojibe was only the pseudonym of the proprietor of the house they were visiting, but more often than not, he was called Ogia, the name of the establishment. Along with the Kikyoya, it was one of the two best-known houses in the district, the only two, in fact, with the reputation of being absolutely first class. The reigning beauty at the Ogia was Yoshino Dayu, and her counterpart at the Kikyoya, Murogimi Dayu. Both ladies enjoyed a degree of fame in the city rivaled only by that of the greatest daimyo. Although Musashi studiously attempted not to gape, he was astonished by the elegance of his surroundings which approach that of the most opulent palaces. The reticular ceilings, ornately carved open-work transoms, exquisite curved railings, fastidiously tended inner gardens, everything was a feast for the eye. Absorbed in a painting on a wooden door panel, he did not notice that his companions had gone on ahead until Koetsu came back for him. The silver-colored doors of the room they entered were transformed into a hazy liquid by the light of the lamps. One side opened onto a garden in the style of koborienshu, well-raked sand and a rock arrangement suggestive of Chinese mountain scenery, such as one might see in a sung painting. Shoyu, complaining of the cold, sat down on a cushion and drew his shoulders together. Koetsu also seated himself and bade Musashi to do likewise. Serving girls soon arrived with warm sake. Seeing that the cup he had urged on Musashi had cooled off, Shoyu became insistent. Drink up, young man, he said, and have a hot cup. After this refrain had been repeated two or three times, Shoyu's manner began to border on rudeness. Kobosatsu! he said to one of the serving girls. Make him drink! You, Musashi, what's the matter with you? Why aren't you drinking? I am, protested Musashi. The old man was already a little tipsy. Well, you're not doing very well. You don't have any spirit. I'm not much of a drinker. What you mean is that you're not a strong swordsman, isn't it? Maybe that's true said Musashi mildly, laughing off the insult. If you're worried about drinking interfering with your studies, or throwing you off balance, or weakening your willpower, or preventing you from making a name for yourself, then you haven't got the pluck to be a fighter. Oh, it's not that. There's only one small problem. What might that be? 
It makes me sleepy. Well, you can go to sleep here or anywhere else in the place. No one will mind. Turning to the girls, he said, The young man's afraid he'll get drowsy if he drinks. If he gets sleepy, put him to bed. Oh, we'll be glad to, chorused the girls, smiling coyly. If he goes to bed, someone will have to keep him warm. Koetsu, which one should it be? Which one, indeed, said Koetsu noncommittally. It can't be Sumigiku Dayu. She's my little wife. And you yourself wouldn't want it to be Kobasatsu Dayu. There's Karakoto Dayu. Mm, she won't do. She's too hard to get along with. Isn't Yoshino Dayu going to put in an appearance? asked Koetsu. That's it? She's just the one. Even our reluctant guest should be happy with her. I wonder why she isn't here now. Someone go call her. I want to show her to the young samurai here. Sumigiku objected. Yoshino's not like the rest of us. She has many clients, and she won't come running at just anyone's beck and call. Oh, yes, she will. For me. Tell her I'm here, and she'll come, no matter who she happens to be with. Go and call her. Shoyu reared up, looked around, and called to the young girls who attended the courtesans and were now playing in the next room. Is Linya there? Linya herself answered. Come here a minute. You wait on Yoshino Dayu, don't you? Why isn't she here? Tell her Funabashi is here. She should come right away. If you bring her back with you, I'll give you a present. Linya looked a little puzzled. Her eyes opened wide, but after a moment, she signaled her assent. She already showed signs of becoming a great beauty, and it was almost certain she would be the successor in the next generation to the famous Yoshino. But she was only eleven years old. Barely had she gone into the outside corridor and slid the door shut when she clapped her hands and called loudly, Uname! Tamami! Itonosuke! Look out here! The three girls rushed out and began clapping their hands and shrieking joyfully, delighted by the discovery of snow outside. The men looked out to see what the commotion was about, and, except for Shoyu, were amused by the sight of the young attendants chattering excitedly, trying to decide whether the snow would still be on the ground in the morning. Linya, her mission forgotten, rushed out into the garden to play in the snow. Impatient, Shoyu sent out one of the courtesans in search of Yoshino Dayu. She returned and whispered into his ear, Yoshino said she would like more than anything to join you, but her guest won't permit it. Won't permit it? That's ridiculous. Other women here may be forced to do their customers' bidding, but Yoshino can do as she pleases. Or is she allowing herself to be bought for money these days? Oh, no, but the guest she's with tonight is particularly stubborn. Every time she says she'd like to leave, he insists more adamantly that she stay. Hmm, I suppose none of her customers ever wants her to go. Who is she with tonight? Lord Karasumaru. Lord Karasumaru, repeated Shoyu with an ironic smile. Is he alone? No. He's with some of his usual cronies? Yes. Shoyu slapped his knee. This might turn out to be interesting. The snow is good, the sake is good, and if we just had Yoshino, everything would be perfect. Koetsu, let's write his lordship a letter. You, young lady, bring me an inkstone and brush. When the girl placed the writing materials before Koetsu, he said, what shall I write? A poem would be good. Prose might do, but verse would be better. Lord Karasumaru is one of our more celebrated poets. I'm not sure I know how to go about it. Let's see. We want the poem to persuade him to let us have Yoshino. Isn't that right? That's it. If it's not a good poem, it won't make him change his mind. Good poems are not easy to write on the spur of the moment. 
Why don't you write the first lines, and I'll write the rest? Hmm, let's see what we can do. Shoyu took the brush and wrote, To our humble hut, let there come one cherry tree, one tree from Yoshino. So far, so good, said Koetsu, and wrote, The flowers shiver from cold in the clouds above the peaks. Shoyu was immensely pleased. Marvelous, he said. That ought to take care of his lordship and his noble companions. The people above the clouds. He neatly folded the paper, then handed it to Sumigiku, saying gravely, The other girls don't seem to have the dignity you have, so I appoint you my envoy to Lord Kangang. If I'm not mistaken, that's the name he's known by in these parts. The nickname, meaning Frigid Mountain Crag, was a reference to Lord Karasumaru's exalted status. Sumigiku was not long in returning. Lord Kangan's reply, if you please, she said, reverentially placing a gorgeously wrought letter box before Shoyu and Koetsu. They looked at the box, which implied formality, then at each other. What had started as a little joke was taking on more serious overtones. My word, said Shoyu, we must be more careful next time. They must have been surprised. Surely they couldn't have known we'd be here tonight. Still hoping to get the better of the exchange, Shoyu opened the box and unfolded the answer. To his dismay, he saw nothing but a piece of cream-colored paper, devoid of writing. Thinking he must have dropped something, he looked around for a second sheet, then glanced again into the box. Sumigiku, what does this mean? I have no idea. Lord Kangang handed me the box and told me to give it to you. Is he trying to make asses of us? Or was our poem too clever for him and he's raising the white flag of surrender? Shoyu had a way of interpreting things to suit his own convenience, but this time he appeared uncertain. He handed the paper to Koetsu and asked, What do you make of it? I think he intends us to read it. Read a blank piece of paper? I should think it can be construed somehow. Do you? What could it possibly mean? Koetsu thought for a moment. Snow... Snow covering everything. Hmm, maybe you're right. In answer to our request for a cherry tree from Yoshino, it could mean, if you gaze at snow and fill your cup with sake, even without flowers. In other words, he's telling us that since it's snowing tonight, we should forget about love, open the doors, and admire the snow as we drink. Or at least that's my impression. How annoying! exclaimed Shoyu with distaste. I have no intention of drinking in such a heartless fashion. Not going to sit here and be silent either. One way or another, we'll transplant the Yoshino tree to our room and admire her blossoms. Excited now, he moistened his lips with his tongue. Koetsu humored him hoping he would calm down, but Shoyu kept after the girls to bring Yoshino and refused to allow the subject to be changed for very long. Though his persistence did not secure his wish, it eventually became comical, and the girls rolled on the floor with laughter. Musashi quietly left his seat. He had chosen the right time. No one noticed his departure. Reverberations in the Snow Musashi wandered about the many hallways, avoiding the brightly lit front parlors. He came upon one dark room where bedding was kept and another full of tools and implements. The walls seemed to exude the warmish odor of food being prepared, but still he could not find the kitchen. An attendant came out of one room and held her arms to block his way. Sir! Guests aren't supposed to come back here, she said firmly, with none of the childish cuteness she might have affected in the guest rooms. Oh, shouldn't I be here? Certainly not. She gave him a shove toward the front and walked in the same direction herself. 
Aren't you the girl who fell in the snow a while ago? Rinya, isn't it? Yes, I'm Rinya. I suppose you got lost trying to find the toilet. I'll show you where it is. She took his hand and pulled. That's not it. I'm not drunk. I'd like you to do me a favor. Take me to an empty room and bring me some food. Food? If that's what you want, I'll take it to your parlor. No, not there. Everybody's having a good time. They don't want to be reminded of dinner yet. Linya cocked her head. I suppose you're right. I'll bring you something here. What would you like? Nothing special. Two large rice balls will do. She returned in a few minutes with the rice balls and served them to him in an unlit room. When he had finished, he said, I guess I can get out of the house through the inner garden there. Without waiting for a reply, he stood up and walked to the veranda. Where are you going, sir? Don't worry, I'll be back soon. Why are you leaving by the back way? People would make a fuss if I went out the front way, and if my hosts saw me, it would upset them and spoil their fun. I'll open the gate for you, but be sure to come back right away. If you don't, they'll blame me. I understand. If Mr. Mizuochi should ask about me, tell him I went to the neighborhood of the Renge Oim to see a man I know. I intend to return shortly. You must come back soon. Your companion for the evening is to be Yoshino Dayu. She opened the snow-laden folding wooden gate and let him out. Directly opposite the main entrance to the gay quarter was a tea shop called the Amigasa Jaya. Musashi stopped and asked for a pair of straw sandals, but they had none. As the name implied, their chief business was selling basket hats to men who wished to conceal their identity when entering the quarter. After sending the shop girl to buy sandals, he sat down on the edge of a stool and tightened his obi and the cord under it. Removing his loose-fitting coat and folding it neatly, he borrowed paper and brush and wrote a brief note, folded it and slipped it into the sleeve of the coat. He then called to the old man crouched beside the hearth in the room behind the shop, whom he took to be the proprietor. Would you keep this coat for me? If I don't return by eleven o'clock, please take it to the Ogia and give it to a man called Koetsu. There's a letter for him inside the sleeve. The man said he'd be glad to help, and on being asked, informed Musashi it was only about seven o'clock, the watchman having just passed and announced the hour. When the girl returned with the sandals, Musashi examined the thongs to make sure the plate was not too tight, then tied them on over his leather socks. Handing the shopkeeper more money than was necessary, he picked up a new basket hat and went outside. Instead of tying the hat on, he held it over his head to keep off the snow, which fell in flakes softer than cherry blossoms. Lights were visible along the riverbank at Shijo Avenue, but to the east, in the Gion Woods, it was pitch black, except for widely scattered patches of light from stone lanterns. The deathly stillness was broken only sporadically by the noise of snow sliding off a branch. In front of a shrine gate, about twenty men knelt in prayer, facing the deserted buildings. The temple bells in the nearby hills had just pealed five times, marking the hour of eight. On this particular night, the loud, clear sound of the bells seemed to penetrate to the pit of the stomach. That's enough praying, said Denshiro. Let's be on our way. As they started off, one of the men asked Denshiro if the thongs of his sandals were all right. On a freezing night like this, if they're too tight, they'll break. They're fine. When it's this cold, the only thing to do is use cloth thongs. You'd better remember that. At the shrine, Denshiro had completed his battle preparations, down to the headband and the leather sleeve thong. Surrounded by his grim-faced retinue, he strode across the snow, taking long, deep breaths and emitting puffs of white vapor. The challenge delivered to Musashi had specified the area behind the Renge Oing at nine o'clock, fearing, or professing to fear, that if they gave Musashi any extra time he might flee, never to return, the Yoshiokas had decided to act quickly. 
Kyosuke had remained in the vicinity of Shoyu's house, but had sent his two comrades to report on the situation. Approaching the Rengeoin, they saw a bonfire near the back of the temple. Who's that? asked Denshichiro. It's probably Ryohei and Juro Zaimon. They're here too? said Denshichiro, with a trace of annoyance. There are too many of our men present. I don't want people saying Musashi lost only because he was attacked by a large force. When the time comes, we'll go away. The main temple building, the Sanju Sangendo, extended through thirty-three column spans. Behind it was a large open space, ideal for practicing archery and long used for that purpose. This association with one of the martial arts was what had induced Denshichiro to choose the Renge Oin for his encounter with Musashi. Denshichiro and his men were satisfied with the choice. There were some pine trees, enough to keep the landscape from being barren, but no weeds or rushes to get in the way during the course of the fight. Ryohei and Juro Zaimon rose to greet Denshichiro, Ryohei saying, You've had a cold walk, I imagine. There's still plenty of time. Sit down and warm yourself. Silently, Denshichiro seated himself in the place Ryohei had vacated. He stretched his hands out over the flames and cracked his knuckles, one finger at a time. I guess I'm too early, he said. His face, warmed by the fire, had already taken on a bloodthirsty look. Frowning, he asked, Didn't we pass the tea house on the way? Yes, but it was closed. One of you, go and get some sake. If you knock long enough, they'll answer. Sake? Now? Yes, now. I'm cold. Moving closer to the fire, Denshiro squatted, almost hugging it. Since no one could remember a time, morning, noon, or night, when he had appeared at the dojo not smelling of alcohol, his drinking had come to be accepted as a matter of course. Though the fate of the whole Yoshioka school was at stake, one man wondered fuzzily if it wouldn't be better for him to warm his body with a little sake than to try to wield the sword with freezing arms and legs. Another quietly pointed out that it would be risky to disobey him, even for his own good, and a couple of the men ran off to the tea house. The sake they brought was piping hot. Good, said Denshichiro. My very best friend and ally. They watched nervously as he imbibed, praying he wouldn't consume as much as usual. Denshichiro, however, stopped well short of his normal quota. Despite his show of nonchalance, he well knew that his life was in the balance. Listen, could that be Musashi? Ears pricked up. As the men around the fire rapidly got to their feet, a dark figure appeared around the corner of the building. He waved his hand and shouted, Don't worry, it's only me. Though gallantly attired, with his hakama tucked up for running, he could not disguise his age. His back was bent into the shape of a bow. When the men could see him more clearly, they informed each other that it was only the old man from Mibu, and the excitement died down. The old man was Yoshioka Genzaimon, Kempo's brother and Denshichiro's uncle. Why, if it isn't Uncle Gen, what brings you here? exclaimed Denshichiro. It had not occurred to him that his uncle might consider his assistance needed tonight. Ah, Denshichiro! said Genzaimon. You're really going through with it. I'm relieved to find you here. I meant to go and discuss the matter with you first, but discuss? What is there to discuss? The Yoshioka name has been dragged through the mud. Your brother's been made a cripple. If you'd taken no action, you'd have had me to answer to. There's nothing to worry about. I'm not weak-kneed like my brother. I'll take your word for that, and I know you'll win, but I thought I'd better come and give you some encouragement. I ran all the way from Mibu. Denshichiro, let me warn you. You shouldn't take this opponent too lightly from what I hear. I'm aware of that. Don't be in too much of a hurry to win. Be calm. Leave it to the gods. 
if by any chance you get killed, I'll take care of your body. Ha 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 ha! Come, Uncle Gan, warm yourself by the fire. The old man silently drank a cup of sake, then addressed the others reproachfully. What are you doing here? Certainly you don't intend to back him up with your swords, do you? This match is between one swordsman and another, and it looks cowardly to have a lot of supporters around. It's almost time now. Come with me, all of you. We'll go far enough away so it doesn't look as though we were planning a mass attack. The men did as they were commanded, leaving Denshiro alone. He sat close to the fire, thinking, When I heard the bells, it was eight o'clock. It must be nine by now. Musashi's late. The only trace of his disciples was their black footprints in the snow. The only sound, the crack of icicles breaking off the eaves of the temple. Once the branch of a tree snapped under the weight of the snow. Each time the silence was disturbed, Denshiro's eyes darted about like a falcon's. And like a falcon, a man came kicking through the snow. Nervous and panting, Hyosuke said between breaths, He's coming! Denshiro knew the message before he heard it and was already on his feet. He's coming? he asked parrot-like, but his feet were automatically stamping out the last embers of the fire. Kyosuke reported that Musashi had taken his time after leaving the Ogia, as if oblivious of the heavy snowfall. Just a few minutes ago, he climbed the stone steps of the Gion Shrine. I took a back street and came as fast as I could, but even dawdling the way he was, he couldn't be far behind me. I hope you're ready. Hmm, this is it. Kyosuke, get away from here. Where are the others? I don't know, but I don't want you here. You make me nervous. Yes, sir. Kyosuke's tone was obedient, but he did not want to leave and made up his mind not to. After Denshiro had trampled the fire into the slush and turned with a tremor of excitement toward the courtyard, Kyosuke ducked under the floor of the temple and squatted in the darkness. Though he had not particularly noticed the wind out in the open, here underneath the building it whipped frigidly. Chilled to the bone, he hugged his knees and tried to deceive himself into thinking that the chattering of his teeth and the painful shiver running up and down his spine came from the cold alone and had nothing to do with his fear. Denshiro walked about a hundred paces from the temple and took a solid stance, bracing one foot against the root of a tall pine tree and waiting with palpable impatience. The warmth of the sake had worn off rapidly, and Denshiro felt the cold biting into his flesh. That his temper was growing shorter was evident even to Hyosuke, who could see the courtyard as clearly as if it were daylight. A pile of snow cascaded off the branch of a tree. Denshiro started nervously. Still, Musashi did not appear. Finally, unable to sit still any longer, Hyosuke came out of his hiding place and shouted, What happened to Musashi? Are you still here? Denshiro asked angrily, but he was as irritated as Hyosuke and did not order him away. By tacit mutual consent, the two walked toward each other. They stood there, looking around in all directions, time and again, one or the other saying, I can't see him. Each time the tone grew both angrier and more suspicious. That bastard! He's run away! exclaimed Denshiro. He couldn't have, insisted Hyosuke, launching into an earnest recapitulation of all he had seen and why he was sure Musashi would eventually come. Denshiro interrupted him. What's that? he asked, looking quickly at one end of the temple. A candle was emerging shakily from the kitchen building behind the long hall. It was in the hands of a priest, that much was clear, but they could not make out the dim figure behind him. Two shadows and the speck of light passing through the gate between the kitchen and the main building ascended the long veranda of the Sanju Sangendo. The priest was saying in a subdued voice, Everything here is shut up at night, so I can't say... 
This evening there were some samurai warming themselves in the courtyard. They may have been the people you're asking about, but they're gone now, as you can see. The other man spoke quietly. I'm sorry to have intruded while you were asleep. Ah, aren't there two men over there under that tree? They may be the ones who sent word they'd wait for me here. Well, it wouldn't do any harm to ask them and see. I'll do that. I can find my way by myself now, so please feel free to go back to your room. Are you joining your friends for a snow-viewing party? Something like that, said the other man with a slight laugh. Putting out the candle, the priest said, I suppose I needn't say this, but if you build a fire near the temple, as those men did earlier, please be careful and extinguish it when you leave. I'll do so without fail. Very well, then. Please excuse me. The priest went back through the gate and shut it. The man on the veranda stood still for a time, looking intently toward Denshichiro. Kyosuke! Who is it? I can't tell, but he came from the kitchen. He doesn't seem to belong to the temple. The two of them walked about twenty paces nearer the building. The shadowy man moved to a point near the middle of the veranda, stopped, and tied up his sleeve. The men in the courtyard unconsciously approached close enough to see this, but then their feet refused to go any nearer. After an interval of two or three breaths, Denshichiro shouted, Musashi! He was well aware that the man standing several feet above him was in a very advantageous position. Not only was he perfectly safe from the rear, but anyone trying to attack him from either the right or the left would first have to climb up to his level. He was thus free to devote his entire attention to the enemy before him. Behind Denshichiro was open ground, snow and wind. He felt sure Musashi would not bring anyone with him, but he could not afford to ignore the wide space to his rear. He made a motion as though brushing something off his kimono and said urgently to Kyosuke, Get away from here! Kyosuke moved to the back edge of the courtyard. Are you ready? Musashi's question was calm but trenchant, falling like so much ice water on his opponent's feverish excitement. Denshichiro now got his first good look at Musashi. So this is the bastard, he thought. His hatred was total. He resented the maiming of his brother, he was vexed at being compared with Musashi by the common people, and he had an ingrained contempt for what he regarded as a country upstart posing as a samurai. Who are you to ask? Are you ready? It's well past the hour of nine. Did I say I'd be here exactly at nine? Don't make excuses. I've been waiting a long time. As you can see, I'm fully prepared. Now come down from there. He did not underestimate his opponent to the extent of daring to attack from his present position. In a minute, answered Musashi with a slight laugh. There was a difference between Musashi's idea of preparation and his opponent's. Denshiro, though physically prepared, had only begun to pull himself together spiritually, whereas Musashi had started fighting long before he presented himself to his enemy. For him, the battle was now entering its second and central phase. At the Gion Shrine, he had seen the footprints in the snow, and at that moment his fighting instinct had been aroused. Knowing that the shadow of the man following him was no longer there, he had boldly entered the front gate of the Lengeoin and made a quick approach to the kitchen. Having wakened the priest, he struck up a conversation, subtly questioning the man as to what had been going on earlier in the evening. Disregarding the fact that he was a little late, he had had some tea and warmed himself. Then, when he made his appearance, it was abrupt and from the relative safety of the veranda. He had seized the initiative. His second opportunity came in the form of Denshichiro's attempt to draw him out. One way of fighting would be to accept this. The other would be to ignore it and create an opening of his own. Caution was in order. In a case like this, victory is like the moon reflected on a lake. If one jumps for it impulsively, one can drown. 
Denshiro's exasperation knew no bounds. Not only are you late, he shouted, you aren't ready, and I haven't got a decent footing here. Musashi, still perfectly calm, replied, I'm coming. Just a minute. Denshiro did not have to be told that anger could result in defeat, but in the face of this deliberate effort to annoy him, he was unable to control his emotions. The lessons he had learned in strategy deserted him. Come down, he screamed. Here into the courtyard. Let's stop the tricks and fight bravely. I am Yoshioka Denshiro, and I have nothing but spit for makeshift tactics or cowardly attacks. If you're frightened before the match begins, you're not qualified to confront me. Get down from there. Musashi grinned. Yoshioka Denshiro, eh? What do I have to fear from you? I cut you in half in the spring of last year, so if I do it again tonight, it's only repeating what I've done before. What are you talking about? Where? When? At Koyagyu, in Yamato. Yamato? In the bath at the Wataya Inn, to be exact. Were you there? I was. We were both naked, of course, but with my eyes, I calculated whether I could cut you down or not. And with my eyes, I slew you then and there, in rather splendid fashion, if I may say so myself. You probably didn't notice, because there were no scars left on your body, but you were defeated, no question about it. Other people may be willing to listen to you brag about your ability as a swordsman, but from me you'll get nothing but a laugh. I was curious as to how you'd talk, and now I know, like an idiot. But your babbling intrigues me. Come down from there, and I'll open your conceited eyes for you. What's your weapon? Sword? Wooden sword? Why ask when you don't have a wooden sword? You came expecting to use a sword, didn't you? I did. But I thought if you wanted to use a wooden sword, I'd take yours away from you and fight with that. I don't have one, you fool. Enough big talk. Fight! Ready? No! Denshiro's heels made a black slanted line about nine feet long as he opened a space for Musashi to land in. Musashi quickly sidestepped twenty or thirty feet along the veranda before jumping down. Then, when they had moved, swords sheathed, eyeing each other warily, about two hundred feet from the temple, Denshiro lost his head. Abruptly, he drew and swung. His sword was long, just the right size for his body. Making only a slight whistling sound, it went through the air with amazing lightness, straight to the spot where Musashi had been standing. Musashi was faster than the sword. Even quicker was the springing of the glittering blade from his own scabbard. It looked as though they were too close together for both of them to emerge unscathed, but after a moment of dancing reflected light from the swords, they backed off. Several tense minutes passed. The two combatants were silent and motionless, swords stationary in the air, point aimed at point, but separated by a distance of about nine feet. The snow piled on Denshiro's brow dropped to his eyelashes. To shake it off, he contorted his face until his forehead muscles looked like countless moving bumps. His bulging eyeballs glowed like the windows of a melting furnace, and the exhalations of his deep, steady breathing were as hot and gusty as those from a bellows. Desperation had entered his thinking, for he realized how bad his position was. Why am I holding the sword at eye level when I always hold it above my head for the attack? he asked himself. He was not thinking in the ordinary sense of the word. His very blood palpitating audibly through his veins, told him that. But his whole body, down to his toenails, was concentrated in an effort to present an image of ferocity to the enemy. The knowledge that the eye-level stance was not one in which he excelled nagged him. Any number of times he itched to raise his elbows and get the sword above his head, but it was too risky. Musashi was on the alert for just such an opening that tiny fraction of a second when his vision would be blocked by his arms. 
Musashi held his sword at eye level two, with his elbows relaxed, flexible and capable of movement in any direction. Denshiro's arms, held in an unaccustomed stance, were tight and rigid, and his sword unsteady. Musashi's was absolutely still. Snow began to pile up on its thin upper edge. As he watched hawk-like for the slightest slip on his opponent's part, Musashi counted the number of times he breathed. He not only wanted to win, he had to win. He was acutely conscious of once again standing on the borderline, on one side life, on the other death. He saw Denshiro as a gigantic boulder, an overpowering presence. The name of the god of war, Hachimang, passed through his mind. His technique is better than mine, Musashi thought candidly. He had had the same feeling of inferiority at Koyagyu Castle when he had been encircled by the four leading swordsmen of the Yagyu school. It was always this way when he faced swordsmen of the orthodox schools, for his own technique was without form or reason, nothing more, really, than a do-or-die method. Staring at Denshiro, he saw that the style Yoshioka Kempo had created and spent his life developing had both simplicity and complexity, was well-ordered and systematic, and was not to be overcome by brute strength or spirit alone. Musashi was cautious about making any unnecessary movements. His primitive tactics refused to come into play. To an extent, that surprised him. His arms rebelled against being extended. The best he could do was to maintain a conservative, defensive stance and wait. His eyes grew red, searching for an opening, and he prayed to Hachiman for victory. With swelling excitement, his heart began to race. If he had been an ordinary man, he might have been sucked into a whirlpool of confusion and succumbed. Yet he remained steady, shaking off his sense of inadequacy as if it were no more than snow on his sleeve. His ability to control this new exhilaration was the result of having already survived several brushes with death. His spirit was fully awake now, as though a veil had been removed from before his eyes. Dead silence. Snow accumulated on Musashi's hair, on Denshiro's shoulders. Musashi no longer saw a great boulder before him. He himself no longer existed as a separate person. The will to win had been forgotten. He saw the whiteness of the snow falling between himself and the other man, and the spirit of the snow was as light as his own. The space now seemed an extension of his own body. He had become the universe, or the universe had become him. He was there, yet not there. Denshiro's feet inched forward. At the tip of his sword, his willpower quivered toward the start of a movement. Two lives expired with two strokes of a single sword. First, Musashi attacked to his rear, and Otaguro Hyosuke's head, or a piece of it, sailed past Musashi like a great crimson cherry as the body staggered lifelessly toward Denshiro. The second horrendous scream, Denshiro's cry of attack, was cut short midway, the broken-off sound thinning out into the space around them. Musashi leapt so high that he appeared to have sprung from the level of his opponent's chest. Denshiro's big frame reeled backward and dropped in a spray of white snow. Body pitifully bent, face buried in the snow, the dying man cried, Wait! Wait! Musashi was no longer there. Hear that? It's Denshiro! He's been hurt! The black forms of Genzaemon and the Yoshioka disciples rushed across the courtyard like a wave. Look! Kyosuke has been killed! Denshiro! Denshiro! Yet they knew there was no use calling, no use thinking about medical treatment. Kyosuke's head had been sliced sideways from the right ear to the middle of the mouth, Denshiro's from the top down to the right cheekbone, all in a matter of seconds. That's... that's why I warned you, sputtered Genzaemon. 
That's why I told you not to take him lightly. Oh, Denshiro! Denshiro! The old man hugged his nephew's body, trying in vain to console it. Genzaemon clung to Denshiro's corpse, but it angered him to see the others milling about in the blood-reddened snow. What happened to Musashi? he thundered. Some had already started searching. They saw no sign of Musashi. He's not here, came the answer, timid and obtuse. He's around somewhere, barked Genzaemon. He hasn't got wings. If I don't get in a blow of revenge, I can never again hold my head up as a member of the Yoshioka family. Find him! One man gasped and pointed. The others fell back a pace and stared in the direction indicated. It's Musashi! Musashi? As the idea sank in, silence filled the air. Not the tranquility of a place of worship, but an ominous, diabolical silence as though ears, eyes, and brains had ceased to function. Whatever the man had seen, it was not Musashi, for Musashi was standing under the eaves of the nearest building. His eyes fixed on the Yoshioka men and his back pressed to the wall, he edged his way along until he reached the southwest corner of the Sanju Sangendo. He climbed onto the veranda and crept, slowly and quietly, to the center. Will they attack? he asked himself. When they made no move in his direction, he continued stealthily on to the north side of the building and, with a bound, disappeared into the darkness. The Elegant People no impudent nobleman's going to get the best of me. If he thinks he can put me off by sending a blank piece of paper, I'll just have to have a word with him, and I'll bring Yoshino back, if only for the sake of my pride. It is said that one need not be young to enjoy playing games. When Haya Shoyu was in his cups, there was no holding him back. Take me to their room! he ordered Sumigik. He put a hand on her shoulder to prop himself into a standing position. In vain, Koetsu admonished him to be calm. No, I'm going to get Yoshino. Standard bearers, ho! Your general is moving into action. Those with heart, follow! A peculiar characteristic of the inebriated is that, though they appear to be in constant danger of falling or suffering some worse mishap, if left alone they usually escape harm. Still, if no one took measures to protect them, it would be a cold world indeed. With all his years of experience, Shoyu was able to draw a fine line between amusing himself and entertaining others. When they thought him tipsy enough to be easy to handle, he would contrive to be as difficult as possible, staggering and tottering until someone came to his rescue, at which point there would be a meeting of spirits on the boundary where drunkenness evokes sympathetic response. You fall! cried Sumigiku, rushing to prevent this. Don't be silly! My legs may wobble a bit, but my spirit's firm! He sounded peevish. Try walking alone. She let go, and he immediately slumped to the floor. I guess I'm a little tired. Someone will have to carry me. On the way to Lord Kangan's parlor, appearing to know nothing, yet perfectly conscious of everything, he staggered, swayed, turned into jelly, and otherwise kept his companions on edge from one end of the long hallway to the other. At stake was whether or not insolent half-baked noblemen, as he called them, were going to monopolize Yoshino Dayu. The great merchants, who were nothing more than rich commoners, did not stand in awe of the emperor's courtiers. True, they were appallingly rank-conscious, but this counted for little because they had no money. By spreading around enough gold to keep them happy, participating in their elegant pastimes, making a show of deference to their status, and allowing them to maintain their pride, it was possible to manipulate them like puppets. 
No one knew this better than Shoyu. Light danced gaily on the shoji of the anteroom to Lord Karasumaru's parlor as Shoyu fumbled to open it. Abruptly, the door was opened from inside. Why, Shoyu, it's you! exclaimed Takuan Soho. Shoyu's eyes widened, first in astonishment, then in delight. Good priest, he sputtered. What a pleasant surprise! Have you been here all along? And you, good sir, have you been here all along? mimicked Takuan. He put his arm around Shoyu's neck, and the two drunkenly embraced like a pair of lovers, cheek against stubbled cheek. Are you well, you old scoundrel? Yes, you old fraud. And you? I've been hoping to see you. And I you. Before the maudlin greeting had run its course, the two were patting each other on the head and licking each other on the nose. Lord Karasumaru turned his attention from the anteroom to Lord Konoe Nobutala, who sat opposite him and said with a sardonic grin, Ha! Just as I expected! The noisy one has arrived! Karasumaru Mitsuhiro was still young, perhaps thirty. Even without his impeccable dress, he would have had an aristocratic air about him, for he was handsome and light-complexioned, with thick eyebrows, crimson lips, and intelligent eyes. While he gave the impression of being a very gentle man, beneath the polished surface lurked a strong temper, fed by pent-up resentment against the military class. Often he had been heard to say, why, in this age, when only the warriors are deemed to be full-fledged human beings, did I have to be born a nobleman? In his opinion, the warrior class should concern itself with military matters and nothing else, and any young courtier with intelligence who did not bridle at the current state of affairs was a fool. The warrior's assumption of absolute control reversed the ancient principle that government should be carried on by the imperial court with the aid of the military. The samurai no longer made any attempt to maintain harmony with the nobility. They ran everything, treating members of the court as though they were mere ornaments. Not only were the ornate headdresses the courtiers were allowed to wear meaningless, but the decisions they were allowed to make could have been made by dolls. Lord Karasumaru considered it a grave mistake on the part of the gods to have made a man like himself a nobleman. And though a servant of the emperor, he saw only two paths open to him, to live in constant misery or to spend his time carousing. The sensible choice was to rest his head on the knees of a beautiful woman, admire the pale light of the moon, view the cherry blossoms in season, and die with a cup of sake in his hand. Having advanced from Imperial Minister of Finance to Assistant Vice Minister of the Right, and then to Imperial Counselor, he was a high official in the Emperor's impotent bureaucracy. But he spent a great deal of time in the licensed quarter, where the atmosphere was conducive to forgetting the insults he had to endure when attending to more practical affairs. Among his habitual companions were several other disgruntled young noblemen, all of them poor in comparison with the military rulers, but somehow able to raise the money for their nightly excursions to the Ogia, the only place, they averred, where they were free to feel human. Tonight he had as his guest a man of another sort, the taciturn, well-mannered Konoe Nobutada, who was about ten years older. Nobutada, too, had an aristocratic demeanor and a grave look in his eyes. His face was full and his eyebrows thick, and though his darkish complexion was marred by shallow pockmarks, the pleasant modesty of the man made the blemishes seem somehow appropriate. In places like the Ogia, an outsider would never have guessed he was one of Kyoto's highest-ranking noblemen, the head of the family from which imperial regents were chosen. Smiling affably by Yoshino's side, he turned to her and said, That's Mr. Funabashi's voice, isn't it? She bit her lips, already redder than plum blossoms, and her eyes betrayed embarrassment at the awkwardness of the situation. 
What shall I do if he comes in? She fretted. Lord Karasumaru commanded, Don't stand up! And grasped the hem of her kimono. Takuan, what are you doing out there? It's cold with the door open. If you're going out, go. And if you're coming back, come back. But close the door. Swallowing the bait, Takuan said to Shoyu, Come on in! And pulled the old man into the room. Shoyu walked over and sat down directly in front of the two noblemen. My, what a pleasant surprise! exclaimed Mitsuhiro with feigned sincerity. Shoyu, on his bony knees, edged closer. Sticking his hand out toward Nobutada, he said, Give me some sake! Having received the cup, he bowed with exaggerated ceremony. Good to see you, old man Funabashi, said Nobutada with a grin. You always seem to be in high spirits. Shoyu drained the cup and returned it. I didn't dream that Lord Kangan's companion was your excellency. Still pretending to be drunker than he actually was, he shook his thin wrinkled neck like an ancient manservant and said in mock fear, Forgive me, esteemed excellency. Then in a different tone, Why should I be so polite? Ha <laughs> ha, isn't that so, Takuan? He put his arm around Takuan's neck, pulled the priest toward him, and pointed a finger at the two courtiers. Takuan, he said, the people in this world I feel sorriest for are the noblemen. They bear resounding titles like counselor or regent, but there's nothing to go with the honors. Even the merchants are better off, don't you think? I do indeed, replied Takuan, contriving to disengage his neck. Say, said Shoyu, placing a cup directly beneath the priest's nose, I haven't received a drink from you yet. Takuan poured him some sake. The old man drank. You're a wily man, Takuan. In the world we live in, priests like you are cunning, merchants smart, warriors strong, and noblemen stupid. Ha <laughs> ha! Isn't that so? It is, it is, agreed Takuan. The noblemen can't do as they please because of their rank, but they're shut out of politics and the government. So all that's left for them to do is compose poetry or become experts at calligraphy. Isn't that the truth? He laughed again. Though Mitsuhiro and Nobutada were as fond of fun as Shoyu, the bluntness of the ridicule was embarrassing. They responded with stony silence. Taking advantage of their discomfort, Shoyu pressed on. Yoshino, what do you think? Do you fancy noblemen? Or do you prefer merchants? He tittered Yoshino. Why, Mr. Funabashi, what a strange question. I'm not joking. I'm trying to peer deep into a woman's heart. Now, I can see what's there. You really prefer merchants, don't you? I think I'd better take you away from here. Come with me to my parlor. He took her by the hand and stood up, a shrewd look on his face. Mitsuhiro, startled, spilled his sake. A joke can be carried too far, he said, yanking Yoshino's hand from Shoyu's and pulling her closer to his side. Caught between the two, Yoshino laughed and tried to make the best of it. Taking Mitsuhiro's hand in her right hand and Shoyu's in her left, she put on a worried look and said, What am I ever going to do with you two? For the two men... Though they neither disliked each other nor were serious rivals in love, the rules of the game dictated that they do everything in their power to make Yoshino Dayu's position more embarrassing. Come now, my good lady, said Shoyu. You must decide for yourself. You must choose the man whose room you will grace, the one to whom you will give your heart. Takuan jumped into the fray. A very interesting problem, isn't it? Tell us, Yoshino, which one is your choice? The only person not participating was Nobutaba. After a time, his sense of propriety moved him to say, Come now, your guests, don't be rude. The way you're acting, I dare say, Yoshino would be delighted to be rid of you both. Why don't we all enjoy ourselves and stop bothering her? Koetsu must be all by himself. 
One of you girls go and invite him to come here. Shoyu waved his hand. No reason to fetch him. I'll just go back to my room with Yoshino. You will not, said Mitsuhiro, hugging her tighter. The insolence of the aristocracy, exclaimed Shoyu. Eyes sparkling, he offered Mitsuhiro a cup, saying, Let's decide who gets her by holding a drinking contest right before her eyes. Why, of course, that sounds like good fun. Mitsuhiro took a large cup and placed it on a small table between them. Are you sure you're young enough to stand it? He asked playfully. Don't have to be young to compete with a skinny nobleman. How are we going to decide whose turn it is? It's no fun just swilling. We should play a game. Whoever loses has to drink a cupful. What game shall we play? We could try staring each other down. That would involve looking at your ugly merchant's face. That's not play. It's torture. Don't be insulting. Hmm. How about the stone-scissor-paper game? Fine. Takuan, you be referee. Anything to oblige. With earnest faces, they began. After each round, the loser complained with appropriate bitterness, and everyone laughed. Yoshino Dayu slipped quietly out of the room, gracefully trailing the bottom of her long kimono behind her, and walked at a stately pace down the hallway. Not long after she left, Konoe Nobutada said, I must go too, and took his leave unnoticed. Yawning shamelessly, Takuan lay down and without so much as a by your leave, rested his head on Sumigiku's knee. Though it felt good to doze here, he also felt a pang of guilt. I should go home, he thought. They're probably lonely without me. He was thinking of Jotaro and Otsu, who were together again at Lord Karasumaru's house. Takuan had taken Otsu there after her ordeal at Kiyomizdera. Takuan and Lord Karasumaru were old friends, with many interests in common. Poetry, Zen, drinking, even politics. Toward the end of the previous year, Takuan had received a letter inviting him to spend the New Year's holidays in Kyoto. You seem to be cooped up in a little temple in the country, Mitsuhiro wrote. Don't you long for the capital, for some good nada sake, for the company of beautiful women, for the sight of the little plovers by the Kamo River? If you like to sleep, I suppose it's all right to practice your zen in the country, but if you want something more lively, then come here and be among people. Should you feel any nostalgia for the capital, by all means pay us a visit. Shortly after his arrival, early in the new year, Takuan was quite surprised to see Jotaro playing in the courtyard. He learned in detail from Mitsuhiro what the boy was doing there, and then heard from Jotaro that there had been no news of Otsu since Osugi got her clutches into the girl on New Year's Day. The morning after her return, Otsu had come down with a fever, and she was still in bed with Jotaro nursing her, sitting by her pillow all day, cooling her forehead with wet towels and measuring out her medicine at the proper times of the day. As much as Takuan wanted to leave, he could hardly do so before his host did, and Mitsuhiro seemed to be more and more absorbed in the drinking contest. Both combatants being veterans, the contest seemed destined to end in a draw, which it did. They went on drinking anyway, facing each other knee to knee and chatting animatedly. Takuan could not tell whether the subject was government by the military class, the inherent worth of the nobility, or the role of merchants in the development of foreign trade, but evidently it was something very serious. He lifted his head from Sumigiku's knee and, eyes still closed, leaned against the post of the alcove, every once in a while grinning at a snatch of conversation. Presently Mitsuhiro asked in an injured tone, Where's Nobutada? Did he go home? Never mind him. Where's Yoshino? Shoyu asked, suddenly looking quite sober. Mitsuhiro told Ninya to go and bring Yoshino back. As she passed the room where Shoyu and Koetsu had started out the evening, Ninya looked in. Musashi was sitting there alone, his face next to the white light of the lamp. Why, I didn't know you were back, said Ninya. I haven't been here long. Did you come in by the back way? Yes. 
Where did you go? Um, outside the district. I bet you had an engagement with a beautiful girl. Shame on you. Shame on you. I'm going to tell my mistress, she said saucily. Musashi laughed. No one's here, he said. What happened to them? They're in another room, playing games with Lord Kangang and a priest. Koetsu too? No, I don't know where he is. Maybe he went home. If he did, I should go too. You mustn't say that. When you come to this house, you can't leave without Yoshino Dayu's consent. If you just sneak away, people will laugh at you, and I'll be scolded. Not being attuned to the humor of the courtesans, he received this news with serious countenance, thinking, So that's the way they do things here. You absolutely mustn't go without taking your leave properly. Just wait here until I come back. A few minutes later, Takuan appeared. And where did you come from? he asked, with a tap on the Ronin's shoulder. What? gasped Musashi. Slipping off his cushion, he put both hands on the floor and bowed deeply. What a long time since I saw you last. Lifting Musashi's hands from the floor, Takuan said, This place is for fun and relaxation. No need for formal greetings. I was told Koetsu was here too, but I don't see him. Where do you suppose he could have gone? Let's find him. I do have a number of things to talk to you about privately, but they can wait until a more suitable occasion. Takuan opened the door into the next room. There, with his feet in the covered kotatsu and a quilt over him, lay Koetsu, sequestered from the rest of the room by a small gold screen. He was sleeping peacefully. Takuan could not bring himself to wake him. Koetsu opened his eyes of his own accord. He stared for a moment at the priest's face, then at Musashi's, not quite knowing what to make of it. After they had explained the situation to him, Koetsu said, If it's only you and Mitsuhiro in the other room, I have no objection to going there. They found that Mitsuhiro and Shoyu, having finally talked themselves out, had sunk into melancholy. They had reached the stage where the sake begins to taste bitter, the lips feel parched, and a sip of water evokes thoughts of home. Tonight, the after-effects were worse. Yoshino had deserted them. Why don't we all go home? Someone suggested. We might as well, agreed the others. Though not really eager to leave, they were afraid that if they stayed longer, nothing would be left of the evening's mellowness. But as they stood up to go, Rinya came running into the room with two younger girls. Clasping Lord Kangan's hands, Rinya said, We're sorry to have kept you waiting. Please don't leave. Yoshino Dayu is ready to receive you in her private quarters. I know it's late, but it's light outside, because of the snow. And in this cold, you should at least warm yourselves properly before getting in your palanquins. Come with us. None of them felt like playing anymore. The spirit, once gone, was difficult to summon back. Noting their hesitation, one of the attendants said, Yoshino said she was sure you all thought her rude for leaving, but she saw nothing else to do. If she gave in to Lord Kangang, Mr. Funabashi would be hurt, and if she went away with Mr. Funabashi, Lord Kangang would be lonesome. She doesn't want either of you to feel slighted, so she's inviting you for a nightcap. Please understand how she feels and stay a little longer. Sensing that a refusal would be ungallant, and more than a little curious to see the leading courtesan in her own living quarters, they allowed themselves to be persuaded. Guided by the girls, they found five pairs of rustic straw sandals at the top of the garden steps. Donning these, they made their way soundlessly across the soft snow. Musashi had no idea of what was going on, but the others assumed they were to take part in a tea ceremony, for Yoshino was known to be an ardent devotee of the tea cult. Since there was something to be said for a bowl of tea after all the drinking they had done, no one was upset until they were led on past the tea house and into an overgrown field. "'Where are you taking us?' asked Lord Kangang in an accusing tone. "'This is a mulberry patch!' The girls giggled, and Linya hastened to explain, Oh no, this is our peony garden. 
In the early summer, we put out stools, and everybody comes here to drink and admire the blossoms. Mulberry patch or peony garden? It's not very pleasant being out here in the snow. Is Yoshino trying to make us catch cold? I'm sorry. It's only a little farther. In the corner of the field was a little cottage with a thatched roof, which, from the looks of it, was probably a farmhouse that had been here since before the area was built up. There was a grove of trees behind it, and the yard was cut off from the well-cared-for garden of the Ogia. This way, urged the girls, leading them into a dirt-floored room whose walls and posts were black with soot. Rinya announced their arrival, and from the interior, Yoshino Dayu answered, Welcome. Please, come in. The fire in the hearth cast a soft red glow on the shoji paper. The atmosphere seemed utterly remote from the city. As the men looked around the kitchen and noticed straw rain capes hanging on one wall, they wondered what sort of entertainment Yoshino had planned for them. The shoji slid open, and one by one they stepped up into the hearth room. Yoshino's kimono was a pale, solid yellow, her obi of black satin. She wore the minimum of makeup and had rearranged her hair into a simple housewifely style. Her guests stared at her with admiration. How unusual! How charming! In her unpretentious outfit, set off by the blackened walls, Yoshino was a hundred times more beautiful than she was in the elaborately embroidered Momoyama-style costumes she wore at other times. The gaudy kimonos the men were accustomed to, the iridescent lipstick and the setting of gold screens and silver candlesticks were necessary for a woman in her business. But Yoshino had no need for props to enhance her beauty. Hmm, said Shoyu, this is something quite special. Not one to offer praise lightly, the old man with his acerbic tongue seemed temporarily tamed. Without spreading cushions, Yoshino invited them to sit down by the hearth. I live here, as you can see, and I can't offer you much, but at least there's a fire. I hope you agree, a fire is the most excellent feast one can present on a cold, snowy night, whether one's guest is prince or pauper. There's a good supply of kindling, so even if we talk the night out, I won't have to use the potted plants for fuel. Please, make yourselves comfortable. The nobleman, the merchant, the artist, and the priest sat cross-legged by the hearth with their hands over the fire. Koetsu reflected on the cold walk from the Ogia and the invitation to the cheery fire. It actually was like a feast, the essence, really, of entertaining. You come up by the fire, too, said Yoshino. She smiled invitingly at Musashi and moved slightly to make a place for him. Musashi was struck by the exalted company he was in. Next to Toyotomi Hideyoshi and Tokugawa Ieyasu, she was probably the most famous person in Japan. Of course, there was Okuni of Kabuki fame and Hideyoshi's mistress, Yodogimi, but Yoshino was regarded as having more class than the former and more wit, beauty, and kindness than the latter. The men who associated with Yoshino were known as the buyers, while she herself was called the Taiyu. Any courtesan of the first class was known as Taiyu, but to say the Taiyu meant Yoshino and no one else. Musashi had heard that she had seven attendants to bathe her and two to cut her nails. This evening, for the first time in his life, Musashi found himself in the company of painted and polished ladies, and he reacted by becoming stiffly formal. This was partly because he could not help wondering what men found so extraordinary about Yoshino. Please, relax, she said. Come, sit here. After the fourth or fifth invitation, he capitulated. Taking his place beside her, he imitated the others, extending his hands awkwardly over the fire. 
Yoshino glanced at his sleeve and saw a spot of red. While the others were immersed in conversation, she quietly took a piece of paper from her sleeve and wiped it off. Uh, thank you, said Musashi. If he had remained silent, no one would have noticed, but the moment he spoke, every eye went to the crimson stain on the paper in Yoshino's hand. Opening his eyes wide, Mitsuhiro said, That's blood, isn't it? Yoshino smiled. No, of course not. It's a petal from a red peony. The Broken Lute The four or five sticks of wood in the hearth burned softly, giving off a pleasant aroma and lighting up the small room as if it were noon. The gentle smoke did not cause the eyes to smart. It looked like white peony petals billowing in the breeze, flecked now and again with sparks of purple gold and crimson. Whenever the fire showed signs of dying down, Yoshino added foot-long strips of kindling from the scuttle. The men were too captivated by the beauty of the flames to ask about the firewood, but eventually Mitsuhiro said, What sort of wood are you using? It's not pine. No, replied Yoshino. It's peony wood. They were mildly surprised, for the peony, with its thin, bushy branches, hardly seemed suitable for firewood. Yoshino took a stick that had been only slightly charred and handed it to Mitsuhiro. She told them that the peony stumps in the garden had been planted more than a hundred years earlier. At the beginning of winter, the gardeners pruned them very closely, cutting off the worm-eaten upper parts. The trimmings were saved for firewood. Though the quantity was small, it was sufficient for Yoshino. The peony, remarked Yoshino, was the king of flowers. Perhaps it was only natural that its withered branches had a quality not to be found in ordinary wood, just as certain men had a worth not displayed by others. How many men are there, she mused, whose merit endures after the blossoms have faded and died? With a melancholy smile she answered her own question. We human beings blossom only during our youth, then become dry, odorless skeletons even before we die. A little later, Yoshino said, I'm sorry I have nothing more to offer you than the sake and the fire, but at least there's wood, enough to last until sunrise. You shouldn't apologize. This is a feast fit for a prince. Shoyu, though accustomed to luxury, was sincere in his praise. There is one thing I'd like you to do for me, said Yoshino. Will you please write a memento of this evening? While she was rubbing the inkstone, the girls spread a woolen rug in the next room and laid out several pieces of Chinese writing paper. Being made of bamboo and paper mulberry, it was tough and absorbent, just right for calligraphic inscriptions. Mitsuhiro, assuming the role of host, turned to Takuan and said, Good priest, since the lady requests it, will you write something appropriate? Or perhaps we should first ask Koetsu. Koetsu moved silently on his knees. He took up the brush, thought for a moment, and drew a peony blossom. Above this, Takuan wrote, why should I cling to a life so far removed from beauty and passion? Peonies, though lovely, shed their bright petals and die. Takuan's poem was in the Japanese style. Mitsuhiro chose to write in the Chinese manner, setting down lines from a poem by Tsai Wen. When I am busy, the mountain looks at me. When I am at leisure, I look at the mountain. Though it seems the same, it is not the same, for busyness is inferior to leisure. Under Takuan's poem, Yoshino wrote, Even as they bloom, a breath of sadness hangs over the flowers. Do they think of the future when their petals will be gone? Shoyu and Musashi looked on in silence, the latter greatly relieved when no one insisted that he write something, too. 
They returned to the hearth and chatted for a while, until Shouyu, noticing a biwa, a kind of lute, next to the alcove in the inner room, asked Yoshino to play for them. The others seconded his suggestion. Yoshino, displaying no trace of timidity, took up the instrument and sat down in the middle of the dimly lit inner room. Her manner was not that of a virtuoso proud of her skills, nor did she attempt to be unduly modest. The men cleared their minds of random thoughts, the better to give their attention to her rendition of a section from Tales of the Heike. Soft, gentle tones gave way to a turbulent passage, then to staccato chords. The fire dwindled and the room darkened. Entranced by the music, no one stirred until a tiny explosion of sparks brought them back to earth. As the music ended, Yoshino said with a slight smile, I'm afraid I didn't play very well. She replaced the lute and returned to the fire. When the men stood up to take their leave, Musashi, happy to be saved from further boredom, was the first to reach the door. Yoshino said farewell to the others one by one, but said nothing to him. As he turned to go, she quietly took hold of his sleeve. Musashi, spend the night here. Somehow... I don't want to let you go home. The face of an importuned virgin couldn't have been redder. He tried to cover up by pretending not to hear, but it was plain to the others that he was too flustered to speak. Turning to Shoyu, Yoshino said, It'll be all right if I keep him here, won't it? Musashi removed Yoshino's hand from his sleeve. No, I'm going with Koetsu. As he made hastily for the door, Koetsu stopped him. Don't be like that, Musashi. Why don't you stay here tonight? You can come back to my house tomorrow. After all, the lady has been kind enough to show her concern for you. He pointedly went to join the other two men. Musashi's cautiousness warned him that they were deliberately trying to trick him into staying for what laughs they might derive from it later. Still, the seriousness he saw written on the faces of Yoshino and Koetsu argued against its being only a joke. Shouyu and Mitsuhiro, vastly amused by his discomfort, persisted in teasing him, one saying, You're the most fortunate man in the country, and the other volunteering to stay in his stead. The joking stopped with the arrival of a man Yoshino had sent out to take a look around the quarter. He was breathing heavily, and his teeth were chattering with fright. The other gentlemen can leave, he said, but Musashi shouldn't think of it. Only the main gate is open now, and on either side of it, around the Amigasa tea house and along the street, are swarms of samurai heavily armed, roaming around in small bands. They're from the Yoshioka school. The tradesmen are afraid something awful might happen, so they all closed early. Beyond the quarter, toward the riding ground, I was told there are at least a hundred men. The men were impressed, not only by the report, but by the fact that Yoshino had taken such a precaution. Only Koetsu had any inkling that some incident might have occurred. Yoshino had guessed something was afoot when she saw the spot of blood on Musashi's sleeve. Musashi, she said, now that you've heard what it's like out there... You may be more determined than ever to leave, just to prove you're not afraid. But please don't do anything rash. If your enemies think you're a coward, you can always prove to them tomorrow that you aren't. Tonight, you came here to relax, and it's the mark of a real man to enjoy himself to his heart's content. The Yoshiokas want to kill you. Certainly, it's no disgrace to avoid that. In fact, many people would condemn you for poor judgment if you insisted on walking into their trap. There's the matter of your personal honor, of course, but please stop to consider the trouble a battle would cause to the people in the quarter. Your friends' lives would be endangered, too. Under the circumstances, the only wise thing for you to do is stay here. Without waiting for his reply, she turned to the other men and said, I think it's all right for the rest of you to go, if you're careful along the way. 
A couple of hours later, the clock struck four. The distant sound of music and singing had died out. Musashi was seated on the threshold of the hearthroom, a lonely prisoner waiting for the dawn. Yoshino remained by the fire. Aren't you cold there? she asked. Do come over here, where it's warm. Never mind me. Go to bed. When the sun comes up, I'll let myself out. The same words had been exchanged quite a number of times already, but to no effect. Despite Musashi's lack of polish, Yoshino was attracted to him. Though it had been said that a woman who thought of men as men rather than as sources of income had no business seeking employment in the gay quarters, this was merely a cliché repeated by the patrons of brothels, men who knew only common prostitutes and had no contact with the great courtesans. Women of Yoshino's breeding and training were quite capable of infatuation. She was only a year or two older than Musashi, but how different they were in their experience of love. Watching him sit so stiffly, restraining his emotions, avoiding her face as though a look at her might blind him, she felt once again like a sheltered maiden experiencing the first pangs of love. The attendants, ignorant of the psychological tension, had spread luxurious pallets fit for the son and daughter of a daimyo in the adjoining room. Little golden bells gleamed softly on the corners of the satin pillows. The sound of snow sliding off the roof was not unlike that of a man jumping down from the fence into the garden. Each time he heard it, Musashi bristled like a hedgehog. His nerves seemed to reach to the very tips of his hair. Yoshino felt a shiver run through her. It was the coldest part of the night, the hour just before dawn, yet her discomfort was not due to the cold. It came from the sight of this fierce man and clashed in an intricate rhythm with her natural attraction to him. The kettle over the fire began to whistle, a cheerful sound that calmed her. Quietly, she poured some tea. It'll be daylight soon. Have a cup of tea and warm yourself by the fire. Thank you, said Musashi, without moving. It's ready now, she said again, and gave up trying. The last thing she wanted to do was make a nuisance of herself. Still, she was slightly offended at seeing the tea go to waste. After it was too cold to drink, she poured it into a small pail kept for that purpose. What is the use, she thought, of offering tea to a rustic like him, for whom the niceties of tea drinking have no meaning? Though his back was to her, she could see that his whole body was as taut as steel armor. Her eyes grew sympathetic. Musashi? What? Who are you on guard against? No one. I'm just trying to keep myself from relaxing too much. Because of your enemies? Of course. In your present state, if you were suddenly attacked in force, you'd be killed immediately. I'm sure of it, and it makes me sad. He did not answer. A woman like myself knows nothing of the art of war, but from watching you tonight, I have the terrible feeling I've seen a man who was about to be cut down. Somehow, there's the shadow of death about you. Is that really safe for a warrior who may at any minute have to face dozens of swords? Can such a man expect to win? The question sounded sympathetic, but it unsettled him. He whirled around, moved to the hearth, and sat facing her. Are you saying I'm immature? Did I make you angry? Nothing a woman ever said would make me angry but I am interested in knowing why you think I act like a man who's about to be killed. He was painfully conscious of the web of swords and strategies and maledictions being woven around him by the Yoshioka partisans. He had anticipated an attempt at revenge, and in the courtyard of the Renge Oin had considered going away to hide. But this would have been rude to Koetsu and would have meant breaking his promise to Linya. 
Far more decisive, however, was his desire not to be accused of running away because he was afraid. After returning to the Ogia, he thought he had displayed an admirable degree of composure. Now Yoshino was laughing at his immaturity. This would not have upset him had she been bantering in the fashion of courtesans, but she seemed perfectly serious. He professed not to be angry, but his eyes were as keen as sword tips. He stared straight into her white face. Explain what you said. When she did not answer immediately, he said, Or maybe you were just joking. Her dimples, which had deserted her for a moment, reappeared. How can you say that? She laughed, shaking her head. Do you think I'd joke about something so serious to a warrior? Well, what did you mean? Tell me. All right. Since you seem so eager to know, I'll try to explain. Were you listening when I played the lute? What does that have to do with it? Perhaps it was foolish of me to ask. Tense as you are, your ears could hardly have taken in the fine, subtle tones of the music. No, that's not true. I was listening. Did it occur to you to wonder how all those complicated combinations of soft and loud tones, weak and strong phrases, could be produced from only four strings? I was listening to the story. What else was there to hear? Many people do that, but I'd like to draw a comparison between the lute and a human being. Rather than go into the technique of playing, let me recite a poem by Po Chu Li, in which he describes the sounds of the lute. I feel sure you know it. She wrinkled her brow slightly as she intoned the poem in a low voice, her style somewhere between singing and speaking. The large strings hummed like rain, the small strings whispered like a secret, hummed, whispered, and then were intermingled like a pouring of large and small pearls into a plate of jade. We heard an aureole, liquid, hidden among flowers. We heard a brook bitterly sob along a bank of sand. By the checking of its cold touch, the very string seemed broken, as though it could not pass, and the notes dying away into a depth of sorrow and concealment of lament told even more in silence than they had told in sound. A silver vase abruptly broke with a gush of water, and out leapt armored horses and weapons that clashed and smoked. And before she laid her pick down, she ended with one stroke, and all four strings made one sound, as of rending silk. And so, you see, one simple lute can produce an infinite variety of tonalities. Since the days when I was an apprentice, this puzzled me. Finally, I broke a lute apart to see what was inside. Then I attempted to make one myself. After trying a number of things, I finally understood that the secret of the instrument is in its heart. Breaking off, she went and got the lute from the next room. Once reseated, she held the instrument by the neck and stood it up in front of him. If you examine the heart inside you can see why the tonal variations are possible. Taking a fine, keen knife in her lithe hand, she brought it down quickly and sharply on the pear-shaped back of the lute. Three or four deft strokes, and the work was done, so quickly and decisively that Musashi half expected to see blood spurt from the instrument. He even felt a slight twinge of pain, as though the blade had nicked his own flesh. Placing the knife behind her, Yoshino held the lute up so he could see its structure. Looking first at her face, then at the broken lute, he wondered whether she actually possessed the element of violence seemingly displayed in her handling of the weapon. The smarting pain from the screech of the cuts lingered. As you can see, she said, the inside of the lute is almost completely hollow. 
All the variations come from this single cross piece near the middle. This one piece of wood is the instrument's bones, its vital organs, its heart. If it were absolutely straight and rigid, the sound would be monotonous, but in fact it has been shaved into a curved shape. This alone would not create the lute's infinite variety. That comes from leaving the cross piece a certain amount of leeway to vibrate at either end. To put it another way, the tonal richness comes from there being a certain freedom of movement, a certain relaxation at the ends of the core. It's the same with people. In life, we must have flexibility. Our spirits must be able to move freely. To be too stiff and rigid is to be brittle and lacking in responsiveness. His eyes did not move from the lute, nor did his lips open. This much, she continued, should be obvious to anybody, but isn't it characteristic of people to become rigid? With one stroke of the pick, I can make the four strings of the lute sound like a lance, like a sword, like the rending of a cloud, because of the fine balance between firmness and flexibility in the wooden core. Tonight, when I first saw you, I could detect no trace of flexibility, only stiff, unyielding rigidity. If the cross piece were as taut and unbending as you are, one stroke of the pick would break a string, perhaps even the sounding board itself. It may have been presumptuous of me to say what I did, but I was worried about you. I wasn't joking or making fun of you. Do you understand that? A cock crowed in the distance. Sunlight, reflected by the snow, came through the slits in the rain shutters. Musashi sat and stared at the maimed body of the lute and the chips of wood on the floor. The crow of the cock escaped him. He did not notice the sunlight. Oh, said Yoshino, it's daylight. She seemed sorry that the night had passed. She reached out her hand for more firewood before realizing there was none. The sounds of mourning, doors rattling open, the twitter of birds infiltrated the room. But Yoshino made no move to open the rain shutters. Though the fire was cold, the blood coursed warmly in her veins. The young girls who waited on her knew better than to open the door to her little house until they were summoned. A Sickness of the Heart Within two days, the snow had melted, and warm spring breezes were encouraging a myriad of fresh buds to swell to their fullest. The sun was strong, and even cotton garments were uncomfortable. A young Zen monk, mud spattered up the back of his kimono as high as the waist, stood before the entrance of Lord Karasumaru's residence. Getting no answer to his repeated calls for admission, he walked around to the servants' quarters and stood on tiptoe to peek through a window. "'What is it, priest?' asked Jotaro. The monk whirled around and his mouth fell open. He couldn't imagine what such a ragamuffin could be doing in the courtyard of Karasumaru Mitsuhiro's house. "'If you're begging, you'll have to go around to the kitchen,' said Jotaro. "'I'm not here for alms,' replied the monk. He took a letterbox from his kimono. "'I'm from the Nansoji in Izumi province. This letter is for Takuan Soho, and I understand he's staying here. Are you one of the delivery boys?' "'Of course not!' I'm a guest, like Takuan. Is that so? In that case, would you please tell Takuan I'm here? Wait here. I'll call him. As he jumped into the entrance hall, Jotaro tripped over the foot of a standing screen, and the tangerines cradled in his kimono tumbled to the floor. Retrieving them rapidly, he sped off toward the inner rooms. He came back a few minutes later to inform the monk that Takuan was out, they say he's over at the Daitokuji. Do you know when he'll be back? They said pretty soon. Is there some place I could wait without inconveniencing anyone? 
Jotaro bounded into the courtyard and led the monk straight to the barn. You can wait here, he said. You won't be in anybody's way. The barn was littered with straw, cartwheels, cow manure, and a variety of other things, but before the priest could say anything, Jotaro was running across the garden toward a small house at the west end of the compound. Otsu, he cried. I've brought you some tangerines. Lord Karasumaru's doctor had told Otsu there was nothing to worry about. She believed him, though she herself could tell how thin she was just by putting her hand to her face. Her fever persisted, and her appetite had not returned, but this morning she had murmured to Jotaro that she would like a tangerine. Leaving his post at her bedside, he went first to the kitchen, only to learn there were no tangerines in the house. Finding none at the green grocers or other food shops, he went to the open marketplace in Kyogoku. A wide variety of goods was available there, silk thread, cotton goods, lamp oils, furs, and so on, but no tangerines. After he left the market, his hopes were raised a couple of times by the sight of orange-colored fruit beyond the walls of private gardens, bitter oranges and quinces, as it turned out. Having covered nearly half of the city, he met with success only by turning thief. The offering in front of the Shinto shrine consisted of small piles of potatoes, carrots, and tangerines. He stuffed the fruit into his kimono and glanced around to make sure no one was watching. Fearful that the outraged god would materialize at any minute, he prayed all the way back to the Karasumaru house. Please don't punish me. I'm not going to eat them myself. He lined the tangerines up in a row, offered Otsu one, and peeled it for her. She turned away refusing to touch it. What's the matter? When he leaned forward to look at her face, she buried her head deeper in the pillow. Nothing's the matter, she sobbed. You've started crying again, haven't you? said Jotaro, clicking his tongue. I'm sorry. Don't apologize. Just eat one of these. Later. Well, eat the one I've peeled at least, please. Jo... I appreciate your thoughtfulness, but I can't eat anything just now. It's because you cry so much. Why are you so sad? I'm crying because I'm happy that you're so good to me. I don't like to see you like this. It makes me want to cry, too. I'll stop, I promise. Now will you forgive me? Only if you eat the tangerine. If you don't eat something, you'll die. Later, you eat this one. Oh, I can't. He swallowed hard, imagining the wrathful eyes of the god. Oh, all right. We'll each have one. She turned over and began removing the stringy white fibers from the pulp with her delicate fingers. Where's Takua? She asked absently. They told me he's at the Daitokuji. Is it true he saw Musashi the night before last? You heard about that? Yes. I wonder if he told Musashi I'm here. I suppose so. Takuan said he'd invite Musashi to come here one of these days. Did he say anything to you about that? No. I wonder if he's forgotten. Shall I ask him? Please do, she replied smiling for the first time. But don't ask him in front of me. Why not? Takuan's awful. He keeps saying I'm suffering from Musashi sickness. If Musashi came, you'd be up and about in no time, wouldn't you? Even you have to say things like that. But she seemed genuinely happy. Is Jotaro there? called one of Mitsuhiro's samurai. Here I am. Takua wants to see you. Come with me. Go and see what he wants, urged Otsu. And don't forget what we were talking about. Ask him, won't you? A tinge of pink crept into her pale cheeks as she pulled the cover halfway up over her face. Takua was in the sitting room talking with Lord Mitsuhiro. Jotaro flung open the sliding door and said, Did you want me? Yes. 
Come in here. Mitsuhiro watched the boy with an indulgent smile, ignoring his lack of manners. As Jotaro sat down, he said to Takuang, A priest just like you came here a while ago. He said he was from the Nansoji. Shall I go get him? Never mind. I know about that already. He was complaining about what a wicked little boy you are. Me? Do you think it's proper to put a guest in the barn and leave him there? He said he wanted to wait someplace where he wouldn't be in anyone's way. Mitsuhiro laughed until his knees shook. Recovering his composure almost immediately, he asked Takuan, Are you going directly to Tajima without returning to Izumi? The priest nodded. The letter was rather disturbing, so I think I should. I don't have to make any preparations. I'll leave today. You're going away? asked Jotaro. Yes, I must return home as quickly as possible. Why? I've just heard that my mother's condition is very serious. You have a mother? The boy couldn't believe his ears. Of course. When are you coming back? That depends on my mother's health. What, what am I going to do without you here? grumbled Jotaro. Does that mean we won't see you anymore? Of course not. We'll meet again soon. I've arranged for you two to stay on here, and I'm counting on you to look after Otsu. Try to make her stop brooding and get well. What she needs more than medicine is greater fortitude. I'm not strong enough to give her that. She won't get well until she sees Musashi. She's a difficult patient, I'll grant you. I don't envy you a traveling companion like her. Takuan, where was it you met Musashi? Well, Takuan looked at Lord Mitsuhiro and laughed sheepishly. When's he coming here? You said you'd bring him, and that's the only thing Otsu has thought about since. Musashi, Mitsuhiro said casually, isn't he the ronin who was with us at the Ogia? Takuan said to Jotaro, I haven't forgotten what I told Otsu. On my way back from the Daitokuji, I stopped in at Koetsu's house to see if Musashi was there. Koetsu hasn't seen him and thinks he must still be at the Ogia. He said his mother was so worried she wrote a letter to Yoshino Dayu, asking her to send Musashi home right away. Oh! exclaimed Lord Mitsuhiro, raising his eyebrows half in surprise and half in envy. So he's still with Yoshino. It would appear that Musashi's only a man, like any other. Even if they seem to be different when they're young, they always turn out to be the same. Yoshino's a strange woman. What does she see in that uncouth swordsman? I don't pretend to understand her, nor do I understand Otsu. What it comes down to is, I don't understand women in general. As far as I'm concerned, they all seem a little sick. As for Musashi, I suppose it's about time he reached the springtime of life. His real training starts now, and let's hope that he gets it through his head that women are more dangerous than swords. Still, other people can't solve his problems for him, and I see nothing for me to do but leave him alone. A little uncomfortable about having said so much in front of Jotaro, he hastened to offer his thanks and bid farewell to his host, requesting him a second time to allow Otsu and Jotaro to stay a little longer. The old saying that journeys should be commenced in the morning meant nothing to Takuang. He was ready to depart, and depart he did, though the sun was well into the west and twilight already descending. Jotaro ran along beside him, pulling at his sleeve. Please, please come back and say a word to Otsu. She's been crying again, and I can't do anything to cheer her up. Did you two talk about Musashi? She told me to ask you when he's coming. If he doesn't come, I'm afraid she might die. You don't have to worry about her dying. Just leave her alone. Takuan, who's Yoshino Dayu? Why do you want to know that? Y you said Musashi was with her, didn't you? Um, I have no intention of going back and trying to heal Otsu's illness, but I want you to tell her something for me. What is it? Tell her to eat properly. I've told her that a hundred times. 
You have? Well, that's the best thing she could possibly be told. But if she won't listen, you may as well give her the whole truth. What's that? Musashi is infatuated with a courtesan named Yoshino, and he hasn't left the brothel for two nights and two days. She's a fool to go on loving a man like that. That's not true, protested Jotaro. He's my sensei. He's a samurai. He's not like that. If I told Otsu that, she might commit suicide. You're the one who's a fool, Takuan. A great big old fool. <laughs> you have no business saying bad things about Musashi or saying Otsu is foolish. You're a good boy, Jotaro, said the priest, patting him on the head. Jotaro ducked from under his hand. I've had enough of you, Takuan. I'll never ask for your help again. I'll find Musashi myself. I'll bring him back to Otsu. Do you know where the place is? No, but I'll find it. Be sassy if you like, but it's not going to be easy for you to find Yoshino's place. Shall I tell you how? Don't bother. Jotaro, I'm no enemy of Otsu's, nor do I have anything against Musashi. Far from it. I've been praying for years that both of them would be able to make good lives for themselves. Then why are you always saying such mean things? Does it seem that way to you? Maybe you're right. But just at the moment, both of them are sick people. If Musashi is left alone, his illness will go away. But Otsu needs help. Being a priest, I've tried to help her. We're supposed to be able to cure sicknesses of the heart, just as doctors cure illnesses of the body. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to do anything for her, so I'm giving up. If she can't realize that her love is one-sided, advising her to eat properly is the best I can do. Don't worry about it. Otsu is not going to ask a big phony like you for help. If you don't believe me, go to the Ogia in Yanagimachi and see for yourself what Musashi is up to. Then go back and tell Otsu what you saw. She'll be heartbroken for a while, but it just might open her eyes. Jotaro put his fingers in his ears. Shut up, you acorn-headed old fraud! You're the one who came chasing after me, or have you forgotten? As Takuan walked off and left him, Jotaro stood in the middle of the street, repeating a very disrespectful chant with which street urchins were wont to taunt beggar priests. But the moment Takuan was out of sight, he choked up, burst into tears, and wept hopelessly. When he finally pulled himself together, he wiped his eyes and, like a lost puppy suddenly remembering the way home, began his search for the Ogia. The first person he saw was a woman. Head covered by a veil, she appeared to be an ordinary housewife. Jotaro ran up to her and asked, How do you get to Yanagimachi? That's the licensed quarter, isn't it? What's a licensed quarter? Goodness. Well, tell me, what do they do there? Why, you... She glared at him indignantly for a moment before hastening on. Undaunted, Jotaro went steadfastly on his way, asking one person after another where the Ogia was. The Scent of Aloe's Wood the lights in the windows of the Houses of Pleasure burned brightly, but it was still too early for many customers to be prowling the three main alleys of the district. At the Ogia, one of the younger servants happened to glance toward the entrance. There was something strange about the eyes peeping through a slit in the curtain, below which a pair of feet and dirty straw sandals and the tip of a wooden sword were visible. The young man gave a little jump of surprise, but before he could open his mouth, Jotaro had entered and stated his business. Miyamoto Musashi is in this house, isn't he? He's my teacher. Will you please tell him Jotaro is here? You might ask him to come out. The servant's look of surprise was replaced by a stern frown. Who are you, you little beggar? He growled. There's nobody here by that name. What do you mean, sticking your dirty face in here just as business is about to begin? Out! 
clutching Jotaro's collar, he gave him a hard shove. Angry as a puffed-up blowfish, Jotaro screamed, Stop it! I came here to see my teacher. I don't care why you're here, you little pack rat. This Musashi's already caused a lot of trouble. He's not here. If he's not here, why can't you just say so? Take your hands off me. You look sneaky. How do I know you're not a spy from the Yoshioka school? That's got nothing to do with me. When did Musashi leave? Where did he go? First you order me around, now you ask for information. You should learn to keep a civil tongue in your head. How should I know where he is? If you don't know, all right, but let go of my collar. I'll let go, all right, like this. He pinched Jotaro's ear hard, swung him around and pinched him toward the gateway. Ouch! screamed Jotaro. Crouching, he drew his wooden sword and struck the servant in the mouth, breaking his front teeth. Ow! The young man put one hand to his bloody mouth, and with the other, he knocked Jotaro down. Help! Murder! yelled Jotaro. He mustered his strength, as he had when he killed the dog at Koyagyu, and brought his sword down on the servant's skull. Blood spurted from the young man's nose, and with a sound no louder than an earthworm's sigh, he collapsed under a willow tree. A prostitute on display behind a grill window on the opposite side of the street raised her head and shouted to the next window over, Look, can you see? That boy with the wooden sword just killed a man from the Ogia. He's getting away! In no time, the street was filled with people running hither and thither, and the air echoed with bloodthirsty shouts. Which way did he go? What did he look like? As suddenly as it had started, the hubbub died down, and by the time merrymakers began arriving, the incident had ceased to be a topic of conversation. Fights were common occurrences, and the denizens of the quarter settled or covered up the bloodier ones in short order so as to avoid investigations by the police. While the main alleys were lit up like daylight, there were byways and vacant lots where all was completely dark. Jotaro found a hiding place, then changed it for another. Innocently enough, he thought he'd be able to get away, but in fact, the whole quarter was surrounded by a ten-foot wall made of charred logs sharpened to a point at the top. Having come up against this, he felt his way along it, but could not find even a large crack, let alone a gate. As he turned back to avoid one of the alleys, he caught sight of a young girl. As their eyes met, she called softly and beckoned with a delicate white hand. Are you calling me? he asked guardedly. He saw no evil intent in her thickly powdered face, so he went a little nearer. What is it? Aren't you the boy who came to the Ogia and asked for Miyamoto Musashi? She asked gently. Yes. Your name's Jotaro, isn't it? Uh-huh. Come with me. I'll take you to Musashi. Where is he? Jotaro asked, growing suspicious again. The girl stopped and explained that Yoshino Dayu, seriously concerned about the incident with the servant, had sent her to look for Jotaro and take him to Musashi's place of hiding. With a look of gratitude, he asked, Are you Yoshino Dayu's servant? Yes, and you can relax now. If she stands up for you, no one in the quarter can touch you. Is my teacher really there? If he wasn't, why would I be showing you the way? What's he doing in a place like this? If you open the door of that little farmhouse right over there, you can see for yourself. Now I have to go back to my work. She disappeared quietly beyond the shrubbery in the neighboring garden. The farmhouse seemed too modest to be the end of his search, but he could not leave without making sure. To reach a side window, he rolled a rock from the garden over to the wall, perched on it, and pressed his nose against the bamboo grill. He is there, he said, keeping his voice down and concealing his presence with some difficulty. He yearned to reach out and touch his master. It had been so long. Musashi was asleep by the hearth, his head resting on his arm. His attire was like nothing Jotaro had ever seen him in before, a silk kimono with large figured designs, 
of the sort favored by the stylish young men about town. Spread out on the floor was a red woolen cloth. On it lay a painter's brush, an ink box, and several pieces of paper. On one sheet, Musashi had practiced sketching an eggplant. On another, the head of a chicken. Jotaro was shaken. How can he waste his time drawing pictures? He thought angrily. Doesn't he know Otsu is sick? A heavy embroidered cloak half covered Musashi's shoulders. It was unquestionably a woman's garment, and the gaudy kimono, disgusting. Jotaro sensed an aura of voluptuousness in which there lurked evil. As had happened on New Year's Day, a wave of bitter indignation at the corrupt ways of adults swept over him. There's something wrong with him, he thought. He's not himself. As vexation slowly turned to mischievousness, he decided he knew what to do. I'll give him a good scare, he thought. Very quietly, he started to lower himself from the rock. Jotaro, Musashi called. Who brought you here? The boy caught himself and looked through the window again. Musashi was still lying down, but his eyes were half open and he was grinning. Jotaro sped around to the front of the house, ran in through the front door and threw his arms around Musashi's shoulders. Sensei! he burbled happily. So, you've come, have you? Lying on his back, Musashi stretched out his arms and hugged the boy's dirty head to his chest. How did you know I was here? Did Takuan tell you? It's been a long time, hasn't it? Without loosening his embrace, Musashi sat up. Jotaro nestled against the warm chest he had almost forgotten, wiggled his head like a Pekingese. Jotaro moved his head to Musashi's knee and lay still. Otsu's sick in bed. You can't imagine how badly she wants to see you. She keeps saying she'll be all right if only you'd come. Just once, that's all she wants. Poor Otsu. She saw you on the bridge on New Year's Day, talking with that crazy girl. Otsu got angry and shut herself up in her shell like a snail. I tried to drag her to the bridge, but she wouldn't come. I don't blame her. I was upset with Akemi that day, too. You have to go see her. She's at Lord Karasumaru's house. Just go in and say, Look, Otsu, I'm here. If you do that, she'll get well right away. Jotaro, eager to get his point across, said much more, but this was the substance of it. Musashi grunted occasionally, once or twice, saying, Is that so? But for reasons the boy could not fathom, he did not come out and say in so many words that he would do what he was asked, despite the boy's begging and pleading. Jotaro, for all his devotion to his teacher, began to feel a dislike for him, an itch to have a real fight with his teacher. His belligerence boiled higher, to the point where it was held in check only by his respect. He lapsed into silence, his disapproval written large on his face, his eyes sullen and his lips twisted as though he had just drunk a cup of vinegar. Musashi took up his drawing manual and brush and began adding strokes to one of his sketches. Jotaro, glaring distastefully at the eggplant drawing, thought, What makes him think he can paint pictures? He's awful. Presently, Musashi lost interest and began washing out his brush. Jotaro was about to make one more appeal when they heard wooden sandals on the stepping stones outside. Your wash is dry, said a girlish voice. The attendant, who had been Jotaro's guide, entered with a kimono and a cloak, both neatly folded. Placing them in front of Musashi, she invited him to inspect them. Thank you, he said. They look as good as new. Bloodstains don't come out easily. You have to scrub and scrub. They seem to be gone now. Thank you. Where's Yoshino? Oh, she's terribly busy, going from one guest to another. They don't give her a moment's rest. It's been very pleasant here, but if I stay longer, I'll be a burden on people. I plan to slip away as soon as the sun comes up. Would you tell Yoshino that and convey my deepest thanks to her? Jotaro relaxed. 
Musashi must certainly be planning to see Otsu. This was the way his master should be, a good, upright man. He broke into a happy smile. As soon as the girl left, Musashi laid the clothes before Jotaro and said, You came at just the right time. These must be returned to the woman who lent them to me. I want you to take them to the house of Hongami Koetsu. It's in the north part of the city. And bring back my own kimono. Will you be a good boy and do this for me? Certainly, said Jotaro with a look of approval. I'll go now. He wrapped the garments in a piece of cloth, along with a letter from Musashi to Koetsu, and swung the parcel onto his back. The attendant arrived just then with dinner and threw up her hands in horror. What are you doing? she gasped. When Musashi explained, she cried, Oh, you can't let him go! and told him what Jotaro had done. Fortunately, Jotaro's aim had not been perfect, so the servant had survived. She assured Musashi that since this was only one fight among many, the matter had ended there, Yoshino having personally warned the owner and the younger people in the establishment to keep quiet. She also pointed out that by unwittingly proclaiming himself to be Miyamoto Musashi's student, Jotaro had lent credence to the rumor that Musashi was still at the Ogia. I see, said Musashi simply. He looked inquisitively at Jotaro, who scratched his head, retreated to a corner, and made himself as small as possible. The girl went on. I don't need to tell you what would happen if he tried to leave. There are still a lot of Yoshioka men around waiting for you to show your face. It's very difficult for Yoshino and the proprietor because Koetsu begged us to take good care of you. The Ogia can't possibly let you walk straight into their clutches. Yoshino's resolve to protect you. Those samurai are so persistent. They've kept constant watch and sent men around several times accusing us of hiding you. We've gotten rid of them, but they're still not convinced. I don't understand it, really. They act as if they were on a major campaign. Beyond the gate to the quarter, there are three or four ranks of them, and lookouts everywhere, and they're armed to the teeth. Yoshino thinks you should stay here another four or five days, or at least until they tire of waiting. Musashi thanked her for her kindness and concern, but added cryptically, I'm not without a plan of my own. He readily agreed to have a servant sent to Koetsu's house in Jotaro's stead. The servant returned in less than an hour with a note from Koetsu. When we have another chance, let us meet again. Life, though it may seem long, is in truth all too short. I beg you to take the best possible care of yourself. My regards from afar. Though few in number, the words seemed warm and very much in character. Your clothing is in this package, said the servant. Koetsu's mother asked me particularly to convey her best wishes. He bowed and left. Musashi looked at the cotton kimono, old, ragged, so often exposed to dew and rain, spotted with sweat stains. It would feel better on his skin than the fine silks lent him by the ogia. Surely this was the outfit for a man engaged in the serious study of swordsmanship. Musashi neither needed nor wanted anything better. He expected it to be smelly after being folded up for a few days, but as he slipped his arms into the sleeves, he found it to be quite fresh. It had been washed. The creases stood out neatly. Thinking Myoshu had washed it herself, he wished he, too, had a mother, and thought of the long, solitary life ahead of him, with no relatives except his sister, living in mountains to which he himself could not return. He looked down at the fire for a time. Let's go, he said. He tightened his obi and slid his beloved sword between it and his ribs. As he did so, the loneliness fell away as quickly as it had come. This sword, he reflected, would have to be his mother, his father, his brothers and sisters. That was what he had vowed to himself years earlier, and that was the way it would have to be. Jotaro was already outside, gazing up at the stars, thinking that no matter how late they arrived at Lord Karasumaru's house, Otsu would be awake. My, won't she be surprised, he said to himself, 
She'll be so happy she'll probably start crying again. Jotaro, said Musashi. Did you come in through the wooden gate in back? I don't know if it's in back. It's that one over there. Go there and wait for me. Aren't we going together? Yes, but first I want to say goodbye to Yoshino. I won't be long. All right, I'll be by the gate. He felt a twinge of anxiety at having Musashi leave him even for a few moments, but on this particular night he would have done anything his teacher asked him to do. The Ogia had been a haven, pleasant but only temporary. Musashi reflected that being shut off from the outside world had done him good, for until now his body and mind had been like ice, a thick, frigid mass, insensitive to the beauty of the moon, heedless of the flowers, unresponsive to the sun. He had no doubts about the rectitude of the ascetic life he led, but now he could see how his self-denial might make him narrow, small-minded, and stubborn. Takuan had told him years ago that his strength was no different from that of a wild beast. Nikan had warned him about being too strong. After his fight with Denshiro, body and soul had been too tense and strained. These past two days, he had let himself go and allowed his spirit to expand. He had drunk a little, dozed when he felt like it, read, dabbled at painting, yawned and stretched at will. Taking a rest had been of immense value, and he had decided that it was important, and would continue to be important, for him occasionally to have two or three days of completely carefree leisure. Standing in the garden, watching the lights and shadows in the front parlors, he thought, I must say just one word of thanks to Yoshino Dayu for all she's done. But he changed his mind. He could easily hear the plinking of shamisen and the raucous singing of the buyers. He saw no way to sneak in to see her. Better to thank her in his heart and hope she would understand. Having bowed toward the front of the house, he made his departure. Outside, he beckoned to Jotaro. As the boy ran to him, they heard Linya coming with a note from Yoshino. She pressed it into Musashi's hand and left. The note paper was small and beautifully colored. As he unfolded it, the scent of aloes wood came to his nostrils. The message said, More memorable than the luckless flowers that wither and disintegrate night after night is a glimpse of moonlight through the trees. Though they laugh as I weep into another's cup, I send you this one word of remembrance. Who's the note from? asked Jotaro. Nobody in particular. A woman? Does it make any difference? What does it say? You don't need to know that. Musashi folded up the paper. Jotaro leaned toward it and said, It smells good. That's aloes wood. The Gate Jotaro thought their next move would be to get out of the quarter without being detected. Going this way will take us to the main gate, he said. That would be dangerous. Hmm, there must be another way out. Aren't all the entrances except the main one closed at night? We could climb the wall. That would be cowardly. I do have a sense of honor, you know, as well as a reputation to maintain. I'll walk straight out the main entrance when the time is right. You will? Though uneasy, the boy didn't argue, for he was well aware that, according to the rules of the military class, a man without pride was worthless. Of course, replied Musashi, but not you. You're still a child. You can go out some safer way. How? Over the wall. By myself? By yourself. I can't do that. Why not? I'd be called a coward. Don't be foolish. They're after me, not you. But where will we meet? The Yanagi riding grounds. You're sure you'll come? Absolutely. Promise you won't run off again? I won't run away. One of the things I don't intend to teach you is lying. I said I'll meet you, and I will. Now, while nobody's around, let's get you over the wall. 
Jotaro looked about cautiously before making a run for the wall, where he stopped dead, looking wistfully upward. It was more than double his height. Musashi joined him, carrying a sack of charcoal. He dropped the sack and peered through a crack in the wall. Can you see anyone out there? Jotaro asked. No, nothing but rushes. There may be water underneath, so you'll have to be careful when you land. I don't care about getting wet, but how am I going to get to the top of this wall? Musashi ignored the question. We have to assume guards have been stationed at strategic points besides the main gate. Take a good look around before you jump, or you may find a sword pointed at you. I understand. I'll throw this charcoal over the wall as a decoy. If nothing happens, you can go ahead. He stooped, and Jotaro jumped onto his back. Stand on my shoulders. My sandals are dirty. Never mind. Jotaro hoisted himself to a standing position. Can you reach the top? No. If you jumped, could you make it? I don't think so. All right, stand on my hands. He stretched his arms straight above his head. I've got it, Jotaro said in a loud whisper. Musashi took the sack of charcoal in one hand and lobbed it as high as he could. It thudded into the rushes. Nothing happened. There's no water here, Jotaro reported after he jumped down. Take care of yourself. Musashi kept one eye to the crack until he could no longer hear Jotaro's footsteps, then walked quickly and lightheartedly to the busiest of the main alleys. None of the many revelers milling about paid any attention to him. When he went out the main gate, the Yoshioka men uttered a collective gasp, and all eyes focused on him. Besides the guards at the gate, there were samurai squatting around the bonfires where the palanquin bearers passed the time while they waited, and relief guards in the Amigasa tea house and the drinking shop across the street. Their vigilance had never relaxed. Basket hats had been unceremoniously lifted and faces examined. Palanquins had been stopped and their occupants examined. Several times negotiations had been started with the Ogia to search the premises, but these had come to naught. As far as the management was concerned, Musashi was not there. The Yoshiokas could not act on the rumor that Yoshino Dayu was protecting Musashi. She was too highly admired, both within the district and in the city itself, to be assailed without serious repercussions. Obliged to fight a waiting war, the Yoshiokas had encircled the quarter at a distance. They didn't rule out the possibility that Musashi might try to escape over the wall, but most expected him to leave by the gate, either in disguise or in a closed palanquin. The one contingency they were unprepared for was the one they were faced with now. No one made a move to block Musashi's path, nor did he pause to acknowledge them. He covered a hundred paces with bold strides before a samurai shouted, Stop him! After him! Eight or nine shouting men filled the street behind Musashi and began stalking him. Musashi, wait! called an angry voice. What is it? he replied immediately, startling all with the force of his voice. He moved to the side of the road and backed up against the wall of a shanty. The shanty was part of a sawmill, and a couple of the mill hands slept there. One of them opened the door crack, but after a quick glance, slammed the door and bolted it. Yelping and howling like a pack of stray dogs, the Yoshioka men gradually formed a black crescent around Musashi. He stared intently at them, gauging their strength, assessing their position, anticipating where a move might come from. The thirty men were quickly losing the use of their thirty minds. It was not difficult for Musashi to read the workings of this communal brain. As he had anticipated, not one came forward alone to challenge him. They babbled and hurled insults, most of which sounded like the barely articulate name-calling of common tramps. Bastard! Coward! Amateur! They themselves were far from realizing that their bravado was merely vocal and revealed their weakness. Until the horde achieved a degree of cohesion, Musashi had the upper hand. He examined their faces, singled out the ones who might be dangerous, picked out the weak spots in the formation, and prepared himself for battle. He took his time, and after slowly scrutinizing their faces, declared, 
I am Musashi. Who called to me to wait? We did. All of us. I take it that you're from the Yoshioka school. That's right. What business do you have with me? You know. Are you prepared? Prepared? Musashi's lips twisted into a sardonic grin. The laugh that issued from his white teeth chilled their excitement. A real warrior is prepared even in his sleep. Come forward when you wish. When you're picking a meaningless fight, what sense is there in trying to talk like a human being or in observing the etiquette of the sword? But tell me one thing. Is your objective only to see me dead? Or do you want to fight like men? No answer. Are you here to settle a grudge or challenge me to a return bout? Had Musashi, by the slightest false movement of eye or body, given them an opening, their swords would have rushed at him like air into a vacuum, but he maintained perfect poise. No one moved. The entire group stood as still and silent as prayer beads. Out of the confused silence came a loud shout. You should know the answer without asking. Musashi, shooting a glance at the speaker, Mike Judo Zaimon judged from the man's appearance that he was a samurai worthy to uphold Yoshioka Kempo's reputation. He alone seemed willing to end the stalemate by striking the first blow. His feet edged forward in a sliding motion. You maimed our teacher Seijudo and killed his brother Denshiro. How can we hold up our heads if we let you live? Hundreds of us who are loyal to our master have vowed to remove the source of his humiliation and restore the name of the Yoshioka school. It's not a matter of grudges or lawless violence, but we will vindicate our master and console the spirit of his slain brother. I don't envy you your position, but we're going to take your head. On guard! Your challenge is worthy of a samurai, replied Musashi. If this is your true purpose... I may lose my life to you. But you talk of discharging your duty. You speak of revenge according to the way of the samurai. Why then do you not challenge me properly, as Seijuro and Denshiro did? Why do you attack en masse? You're the one who's been hiding. Nonsense. You're merely proving that a coward attributes cowardice to others. Am I not standing here before you? Because you were afraid of being caught when you tried to escape. Not so. I could have escaped any number of ways. And did you think the Yoshioka school would have let you? I assumed that you would greet me one way or another. But wouldn't it disgrace us, not only as individuals but as members of our class, to brawl here? Should we disturb the people here like a pack of wild beasts or worthless tramps? You speak of your obligation to your master. But wouldn't a fight here heap still greater shame on the Yoshioka name? If that's what you've decided on, then that's what you shall have. If you've resolved to destroy your teacher's work, disband your school, and abandon the way of the samurai, I have nothing more to say save this. Musashi will fight so long as his limbs hold together. Kill him! cried the man next to Judo Zaimon, whipping out his sword. A distant voice cried, Watch out! It's Itakura! As magistrate of Kyoto, Itakura Katsushige was a powerful man, and though he governed well, he did so with an iron fist. Even children sang songs about him. Whose chestnut roan is that, clopping down the street? Itakura Katsushige's! Run, everyone, run! Or... Itakura, Lord of Iga, has more hands than the thousand-armed Kannon, more eyes than the three-eyed Temmoku. His constables are everywhere. Kyoto was not an easy city to rule. While Edo was well on the way to replacing it as the country's greatest city, the ancient capital was still a center for economic, political, and military life and as the place where culture and education were most highly advanced, it was also the one where criticism of the shogunate was most articulate. The townspeople had, from about the 14th century, given up all military ambition and taken to trades and crafts. 
They were now recognized as a class apart, and on the whole, a conservative one. Also among the populace were many samurai who sat on the fence, waiting to see whether the Tokugawas would be upset by the Toyotomis, as well as a number of upstart military leaders who, while lacking both background and lineage, managed to maintain personal armies of considerable size. There was also a considerable number of ronin like those in Nara. Libertines and hedonists were plentiful in all classes, so that the number of drinking shops and brothels was disproportionate to the city's size. Considerations of expediency rather than political convictions tended to govern the allegiance of a substantial portion of the people. They swam with the current and grasped any opportunity seemingly favorable to themselves. A story circulated in the city at the time of Itakura's appointment in 1601 said that before accepting, he asked Ieyasu if he might first consult his wife. When he returned home, he said to her, Since ancient times there have been innumerable men in positions of honor who have performed outstanding deeds but have ended up bringing disgrace upon themselves and their families. Most often the source of their failure is to be found in their wives or family connections. Thus, I consider it most important to discuss this appointment with you. If you will swear that you won't interfere with my activities as magistrate, I will accept the post. His wife readily consented, avowing that wives have no business interfering in matters of this sort. Then the next morning, as Itakura was about to leave for Edo Castle, she noticed that the collar of his underrobe was askew. She had barely touched it when he admonished her, You've forgotten your oath already! She was made to swear again that she would not meddle. It was generally agreed that Itakura was an effective deputy, strict but fair, and that Ieyasu had been wise to choose him. At the mention of his name, the samurai shifted their eyes away from Musashi. Itakura's men patrolled the quarter regularly, and everyone gave them a wide berth. A young man pushed his way into the open space in front of Musashi. Wait! he cried in the booming voice that had given the alarm. Smirking, Sasaki Kojiro said, I was just getting out of my palanquin when I heard a fight was about to break out. I've been afraid for some time this might happen. I'm appalled to see it take place here and now. I'm not a partisan of the Yoshioka school. Still less am I a supporter of Musashi. Nevertheless, as a warrior and visiting swordsman, I believe I am qualified to make an appeal in the name of the warrior's code and the warrior class as a whole. He spoke forcefully and eloquently, but in a patronizing tone and with uncompromising arrogance. I want to ask you what you're going to do when the police get here. Wouldn't you be ashamed to be picked up in a common street brawl? If you force the authorities to take notice, it won't be treated like an ordinary fight among townspeople. But that is another question. Your timing is bad. So is the place. It's a disgrace to the entire military class for samurai to disturb the public order. As one of your number... I enjoin you to cease this unseemly behavior immediately. If you must cross swords to settle your grievance, then in the name of heaven, abide by the rules of swordsmanship. Choose a time and place. Fair enough, said Judo Zaimon. But if we set a time and place, can you guarantee Musashi will appear? I'd be willing to, but can you guarantee it? What can I say? Musashi can speak for himself. Perhaps you have in mind helping him to escape. Don't be an ass. If I were to show partiality to him, the rest of you would challenge me. He's no friend of mine. There's no reason for me to protect him. And if he leaves Kyoto, you only have to put up notices all over town to expose his cowardice. That's not enough. We aren't leaving here tonight unless you guarantee to take custody of him until the bout. Kojiro spun around. He thrust out his chest and walked closer to Musashi, who had been staring fixedly at his back. Their eyes locked, like those of two wild beasts watching each other. 
There was an inevitability in the way their youthful eagles were pitted one against the other, a recognition of the other man's ability and, perhaps, a mote of fear. Do you consent, Musashi, to meet as I have proposed? I accept. Good. However, I take exception to your involvement. You're not willing to put yourself in my custody? I resent the implication. In my bouts with Seijudo and Denshiro, I have done absolutely nothing cowardly. Why should their followers think I'd flee in the face of a challenge from them? Well spoken, Musashi. I won't forget that. Now, my guarantee aside, would you name the time and place? I agree to any time and place they choose. That, too, is a gallant answer. Where will you be between now and the time of the fight? I don't have an address. If your opponents don't know where you are, how can they send the written challenge? Decide the time and place now. I'll be there. Kojiro nodded. After consulting with Judo Zaimon and a few of the others, he came back to Musashi and said, They want the time to be five o'clock in the morning, the day after tomorrow. I accept. The place is to be the spreading pine at the foot of Ichijoji Hill, on the road to Mount Hiei. The nominal representative of the House of Yoshioka will be Genjiro, the eldest son of Yoshioka Genzaimon, uncle of Seijuro and Denshiro. Genjiro being the new head of the House of Yoshioka, the bout will be conducted in his name, but he is still a child, so it is stipulated that a number of the Yoshioka disciples will accompany him as his seconds. I tell you this to preclude any misunderstanding. After promises had been formally exchanged, Kojiro knocked on the door of the shanty. The door was gingerly opened, and the mill hands peeped out. There must be some wood you don't need around here, Gojiro said gruffly. I want to put up a sign. Find me a suitable board and nail it to a post about six feet long. While the board was being planed, Gojiro sent a man for brush and ink. Materials assembled, he wrote the time, place, and other details in an expert hand. As before, the notice was being made public for this was a better guarantee than a private exchange of oaths. To dishonor the pledge would be to bring on public ridicule. Musashi watched the Yoshioka men erect the signboard at the most conspicuous corner in the neighborhood. He turned away nonchalantly and walked rapidly to the Yanagi riding grounds. All alone in the dark, Jotaro was fidgety. Eyes and ears were alert, but he saw only the occasional light of a palanquin and heard only fleeting echoes of men singing songs on their way home. Dreading the thought that Musashi might have been injured or even killed, he eventually lost patience and started off at a run toward Yanagimachi. Before he had gone a hundred yards, Musashi's voice came through the darkness. Hey, what's this? Oh, there you are, the boy exclaimed with relief. It took you so long, I decided to go have a look. That wasn't very smart. We might have missed each other. Were there lots of Yoshioka men outside the gate? Um, quite a few. Didn't they try to capture you? Jotaro looked quizzically up at Musashi's face. Nothing at all happened? That's right. Where are you going? Lord Karasumara's house is this way. I bet you're eager to see Otsu, aren't you? I want to see her very badly. At this time of night, she'll be terribly surprised. An awkward silence ensued. Jotaro, do you remember that little inn where we first met? What was the name of the village? Lord Karasumara's house is much nicer than that old inn. I'm sure there's no comparison. Everything's closed up for the night, but if we go around to the servants' gate, they'll let us in. And when they find out I have brought you, Lord Karasumaru himself may come to greet you. Oh, I meant to ask you. What's wrong with that crazy monk Takuan? He was so mean it made me sick. He told me the best thing to do with you was leave you alone. And he didn't want to tell me where you were, though he knew perfectly well all along. Musashi made no comment. Jotaro prattled on as they walked. There it is, said Jotaro, pointing at the back gate. Musashi stopped, but said nothing. 
See that light above the fence? That's the north wing where Otsu is staying. She must be waiting up for me. As he made a quick move toward the gate, Musashi gripped his wrist tightly and said, Not just yet. I'm not going into the house. I want you to give Otsu a message for me. Not going in? Isn't that why you're here? No, I only wanted to see that you arrived safely. You must come in. You can't leave now. He tugged frantically at Musashi's sleeve. Keep your voice down, said Musashi, and listen. I won't listen. I won't. You promised to come with me. And I did come, didn't I? I didn't invite you to look at the gate. I asked you to visit Otsu. Calm down. For all I know, I may be dead in a very short time. That's nothing new. You're always saying a samurai must be prepared to die at any time. That's true, and I think it's a good lesson for me to hear you repeat my words. But this time isn't like the others. I already know I don't have one chance in ten of surviving. That's why I don't think I should see Otsu. That doesn't make sense. You wouldn't understand now if I explained. When you grow older, though, you will. Are you telling the truth? Do you really think you're going to die? I do. But you can't tell Otsu that, not while she's sick. Tell her to be strong, to choose a path that will lead to her future happiness. That's the message I want you to give her. You mustn't mention anything about my being killed. I will tell her. I'll tell her everything. How can I lie to Otsu? Oh, please, please, come with me. Musashi pushed him away. You're not listening. Jotaro couldn't hold back the tears. But, but I feel so sorry for her. If I tell her you refuse to see her, she'll get worse. I know she will. That's why you have to give her my message. Tell her it won't do either of us any good to see each other as long as I'm still training to be a warrior. The way I've chosen is one of discipline. It requires me to overcome my sentiments, lead a stoic life, immerse myself in hardship. If I don't, the light I seek will escape me. Think, Jotaro. You yourself are going to have to follow the same path, or you'll never become a self-respecting warrior. The boy was quiet, except for his weeping. Musashi put his arm around him and hugged him. The way of the samurai. One never knows when it will end. When I'm gone, you must find yourself a good teacher. I can't see Otsu now, because I know that in the long run she'll be happier if we don't meet. And when she finds happiness, she'll understand how I feel now. That light. Are you sure it's coming from her room? She must be lonely. You must go and get some sleep. Jotaro was beginning to understand Musashi's dilemma, but there was a trace of sullenness in his attitude as he stood with his back to his teacher. He realized he could press Musashi no further. Lifting his tearful face, he grasped at the last faint ray of hope. When your studies are finished, will you see Otsu and make up with her? You will, won't you? When you think you've studied long enough? Yes, when that day comes. When will that be? It's difficult to say. Two years, maybe? Musashi did not answer. Three years? There's no end to the path of discipline. Aren't you ever going to see Otsu again for the rest of your life? If the talents I was born with are the right ones, I may someday achieve my goal. If not, I may go through life being as stupid as I am now. But now I'm faced with the possibility of dying soon. How can a man with that prospect make vows for the future to a woman as young as Otsu? He had said more than he'd intended to. Jotaro looked bewildered, but then said triumphantly, you don't have to promise Otsu anything. All I'm asking is that you see her. It's not as simple as that. Otsu's a young woman. I'm a young man. I dislike admitting this to you, 
But if I met her, I'm afraid her tears would defeat me. I wouldn't be able to stick to my decision. Musashi was no longer the impetuous youth who had spurned Otsu at Hanada Bridge. He was less self-centered and reckless, more patient and much more gentle. Yoshino's charm might have reawakened the fires of passion had he not rejected love in much the same way that fire repels water. Still, when the woman was Otsu, he lacked confidence in his ability to practice self-control. He knew that he must not think of her without considering the effect he might have on her life. Jotaro heard Musashi's voice close to his ear. Do you understand now? The boy wiped the tears from his eyes, but when he took his hand away from his face and looked around, he saw nothing but thick black mist. Sensei! he cried. Even as he ran to the corner of the long earthen wall, he knew his cries would never bring Musashi back. He pressed his face to the wall. The tears came afresh. He felt utterly defeated, again by adult reasoning. He wept until his throat tightened and no sound came out, but his shoulders went on shaking with convulsive sobs. Noticing a woman outside the servant's gate, he thought it must be one of the kitchen girls returning from a late errand and wondered if she had heard him crying. The shadowy figure raised her veil and walked toward him. Jotaro? Jotaro, is that you? Otsu, what are you doing out here? You're sick. I was worried about you. Why did you leave without saying anything to anyone? Where have you been all this time? The lamps were lit and the gate closed, and still you didn't return. I can't tell you how worried I was. You're crazy. What if your fever goes up again? Go back to bed right now. Why are you crying? I'll tell you later. I want to know now. There must have been something to upset you so. You went chasing after Takuan, didn't you? Hmm, um, yes. Did you find out where Musashi is? Takuan's evil. I hate him. He didn't tell you? Um, no. You're hiding something from me. Oh, you're both impossible, wailed Jotaro. You and that stupid teacher of mine. I can't tell you anything before you lie down and I put a cold towel on your head. If you don't go back to the house now, I'm going to drag you there. Seizing her wrist with one hand and beating on the gate with the other, he called furiously, Open up! The sick girl's out here! If you don't hurry up, she'll freeze. A Toast to the Morrow Matahachi paused on the pebbled road and wiped the sweat from his forehead. He had run all the way from Gojo Avenue to Sangeng Hill. His face was quite red, but this was due more to the sake he'd drunk than to the rare physical exertion. Ducking through the dilapidated gate, he trotted round to the little house beyond the vegetable garden. Mother! he called urgently. Then he glanced into the house and muttered, Is she sleeping again? After stopping by the well to wash his hands and feet, he entered the house. Osugi stopped snoring, opened one eye and roused herself. Why are you making such a racket? she asked grumpily. Oh, are you finally awake? What do you mean by that? All I have to do is sit down for a minute and you start griping about how lazy I am, nagging at me to search for Musashi. Well, pardon me, Osugi said indignantly, for being old. I have to sleep for my health, but nothing's wrong with my spirit. I haven't felt well since the night Otsu got away, and my wrist, where Takuan grabbed it, is still sore. Why is it every time I feel good, you start complaining about something? Osugi glared. You don't often hear me complain, in spite of my age. Have you found out anything about Otsu or Musashi? The only people in town who haven't heard the news are old women who sleep all day. News? What news? Osugi was immediately on her knees, crawling closer to her son. Musashi is going to have a third bout with the Yoshioka school. When? Where? 
There's a sign at Yanagimachi with all the details. It's going to be in Ichijoji village early tomorrow morning. Yanagimachi? That's the license quarter. Osugi's eyes narrowed. What were you doing loafing in the middle of the day in a place like that? I wasn't loafing, Matachi said defensively. You always take things the wrong way. I was there because it's a good place to pick up news. Never mind. I was just teasing. I'm satisfied you've settled down and won't go back to the wicked life you were leading. But did I hear you right? Did you say tomorrow morning? Yes, at five o'clock. Osugi thought. Didn't you tell me you knew somebody at the Yoshioka school? Yes, but I didn't meet them under very favorable circumstances. Why? I want you to take me to the school right now. Get yourself ready. Matahachi was again struck by the impetuousness of the aged. Without making a move, he said coolly, Why get excited? Anybody would think the house was on fire. What do you expect to accomplish by going to the Yoshioka school? Volunteer our services, of course. Huh? They're going out to kill Musashi tomorrow. I'll ask them to let us join them. We may not be much help, but we can probably get in at least one good blow. Mother, you must be joking, Matahachi laughed. What do you find so funny? You're so simple-minded. How dare you speak that way? You're the one who's simple-minded. Instead of arguing, go out and look around. The Yoshiokas are out for blood. This is their last chance. The rules of fighting aren't going to mean anything to them. The only way they can possibly save the house of Yoshioka is by killing Musashi, any way they can. It's no secret they're going to attack in force. Is that so? Osugi purred. Then Musashi is bound to be killed, isn't he? I'm not so sure. He may bring men to help him. And if he does, it'll be quite a battle. That's what a lot of people think will happen. They may be right, but it's still annoying. We can't just sit on our hands and let somebody else kill him after searching for him all this time. I agree, and I've got a plan, Matachi said excitedly. If we get there before the battle, we can present ourselves to the Yoshiokas and tell them why we're after Musashi. I'm sure they'll let us strike a blow at the corpse. Then we can take some of his hair, or a sleeve, or something like that, and use it to prove to the people back home that we killed him. That would restore our standing, wouldn't it? That's a good plan, my son. I doubt if there's any better way. Apparently forgetting that she had once suggested the same thing to him, she sat straight and squared her shoulders. Not only would it clear our name, but with Musashi dead, Otsu would be like a fish out of water. His mother's calm restored, Matahachi felt relieved, but also thirsty again. Well, that's settled. We have a few hours to wait. Don't you think we should have some sake before dinner? Hmm, all right. Have some brought out here. I'll have a little myself to celebrate our approaching victory. As he put his hands on his knees and started to get up, he glanced to one side, blinked, and stared. Akemi! he cried and ran to the small window. She was cowering under a tree just outside, like a guilty cat that had not quite managed to flee in time. Staring with disbelieving eyes, she gasped, Matachi, is that you? What brought you here? Oh, I've been staying here for some time. I had no idea. Are you with Oko? No. Don't you live with her anymore? No. You know Gion Toji, don't you? I've heard of him. He and mother ran away together. Her little bell tinkled as she raised her sleeve to hide her tears. The light in the shade of the tree had a bluish tinge. The nape of her neck, her delicate hand, Everything about her looked very different from the Akemi he remembered. The girlish glow that had so enchanted him at Ibuki and relieved his gloom at the Yomogi 
was no longer in evidence. Mata Hachi, said Osugi suspiciously. Who's that you're talking to? It's the girl I told you about before, Oko's daughter. Her? What was she doing? Eavesdropping? Matachi turned, saying heatedly, Why do you always jump to conclusions? She's staying here too. She just happened to be passing by, right, Akemi? Yes, I didn't dream you were here, though I saw that girl named Otsu here once. Did you talk to her? Not really, but later I got to wondering... Isn't she the girl you were engaged to? Yes. I thought so. My mother caused you a lot of trouble, didn't she? Matachi ignored the question. Are you still single? You look different somehow. Mother made life miserable for me after you left. I put up with it as long as I could, because she is my mother. But last year, when we were in Sumiyoshi, I ran away. She messed up both our lives, didn't she? But you just wait and see. In the end, she'll get what she deserves. I don't even care if she doesn't. I just wish I knew what I'm going to do from now on. Me too. The future doesn't look very bright. I'd like to get even with Oko, but I suppose all I'll ever do is think about it. While they were complaining about their difficulties, Osugi had busied herself with her travel preparations. Now, with a click of her tongue, she said sharply, Matahachi, why are you standing there grumbling to somebody who has nothing to do with us? Come help me pack. Yes, mother. Goodbye, Matahachi. See you again. Looking dejected and ill at ease, Akemi hurried away. Presently, a lamp was lit and the maid appeared with dinner trays and sake. Mother and son exchanged cups without looking at the bill which lay on the tray between them. The servants, who came one by one to pay their respects, were followed by the innkeeper himself. So you're leaving tonight, he said. It's been good having you with us for so long. I'm sorry we haven't been able to give you the special treatment you deserve. We hope to see you again when you're next in Kyoto. Thank you, replied Osugi. I may very well come again. Let's see, it's been three months, hasn't it, since the end of the year? Yes, about that. We'll miss you. Won't you have a little sake with us? That's very kind of you. It's quite unusual to be leaving at night. What made you decide to do that? To tell the truth, some important business came up very suddenly. By the way... Do you happen to have a map of Ichijoji village? Let's see. That's a little place on the other side of Shirakawa, near the top of Mount Hie. I don't think you'd better be going there in the middle of the night. It's quite deserted and... That doesn't matter, interrupted Matachi. Would you please just draw us a map? I'll be glad to. One of my servants comes from there. He can furnish me with the information I need. Ichijoji, you know, doesn't have many people, but it's spread out over quite a large area. Matahachi, a little drunk, said curtly, Don't worry about where we're going. We just want to know how to get there. Oh, forgive me. Take your time with your preparations. Rubbing his hands together obsequiously, he bowed his way out onto the veranda. As he was about to step down into the garden, three or four of his employees came running up, the chief clerk saying excitedly, Didn't she come this way? Who? That girl, the one who was staying in the back room? Well, what about her? I'm sure I saw her earlier in the evening, but then I looked in her room and... Get to the point. We can't find her. You idiot! shouted the innkeeper, his outraged face devoid of the oily servility he had shown a few moments ago. What's the use of running around like this after she's gone? You should have known from her looks there was something wrong. You let a week go by without making sure she had money? How can I stay in business with you doing stupid things like that? I'm sorry, sir. She seemed decent. Well, it's too late now. You'd better see whether anything's missing from the other guest rooms. Oh, what a pack of dunces! He stormed off toward the front of the inn. Osugi and Matahachi drank a little more sake. Then the old woman switched to tea and advised her son to do likewise. I'll just finish what's here, he said, 
pouring himself another cup. I don't want anything to eat. It's not good for you not to eat. Have a little rice and some pickles at least. Clerks and servants were running about in the garden and passageways, waving their lanterns. They don't seem to have caught her, said Osugi. I don't want to get involved, so I kept quiet in front of the innkeeper. But don't you think the girl they're looking for is the one you were talking to earlier? I wouldn't be surprised. Well, you couldn't expect much from somebody with a mother like hers. Why on earth were you so friendly with her? I feel kind of sorry for her. She's had a hard life. Well, be careful and don't let on that you know her. If the innkeeper thinks she has some connection with us, he'll demand that we pay her bill. Matahachi had other things on his mind. Clutching the back of his head, he lay back and grumbled. I could kill that whore. I can see her face now. Musashi's not the one who led me astray. It was Oko. Osugi rebuked him sharply. Don't be stupid. Supposing you killed Oko, what good would it do to our reputation? Nobody in the village knows or cares about her. At two o'clock, the innkeeper came to the veranda with a lantern and announced the time. Matahachi stretched and asked, Did you catch the girl? No, no sign of her, he sighed. She was pretty, so the clerks thought that even if she couldn't pay her bill, we could get back the money by having her live here for a while, if you see what I mean. Unfortunately, she was a bit too fast for us. Sitting on the edge of the veranda, Matahachi tied his sandals. After waiting a minute or so, he called irritably, Mother, what are you doing in there? You're always hurrying me up, but at the last minute you're never ready. Just hold on. Matachi, did I give you the money pouch I carry in my traveling bag? I paid the bill with some cash from my stomach wrapper, but our travel money was in the pouch. I haven't seen it. Come here a minute. Here's a scrap of paper with your name on it. What? Why, of all the nerve, it says, it says that because of her long acquaintance with you, she hopes you'll pardon her for borrowing the money. Borrowing. Borrowing? That's Akemi's writing. Osugi turned on the innkeeper. Look here. If a guest's property is stolen, the responsibility is yours. You'll have to do something about this. Is that so? He smiled broadly. Ordinarily, that would be the case. But since it appears you knew the girl, I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to take care of her bill first. Osugi's eyes darted back and forth wildly as she stammered, w What are you talking about? Why, I never saw that thieving wench before in my life. Matachi, stop fooling around. If we don't get started, the cock will be crowing. The Death Trap With the moon still high in the early morning sky, the shadows of the men climbing the white mountain path collided eerily, making the climbers feel even more uneasy. This isn't what I expected, said one. Me either. There are lots of faces missing. I thought for sure there'd be a hundred and fifty of us at least. Mmm, doesn't look like half that many. I guess when Genzaimon arrives with his men, we'll total about seventy in all. It's too bad. The house of Yoshioka certainly isn't what it used to be. From another group, Who cares about the ones who aren't here? With the dojo closed, a lot of men have to think first about making a living. The proudest and most loyal are here. That's more important than numbers. Right. If there were a hundred or two hundred men here, they'd just get in each other's way. Aha! Talking brave again. Remember their lenge oing. Twenty men standing around, and Musashi still got away. Mount Hie and the other peaks were still fast asleep in the folds of the clouds. The men were gathered at the fork of a little country road, where one path led to the top of Hie and the other branched off toward Ichijoji. The road was steep, rocky, and deeply furrowed by gullies. Around the most prominent landmark, a great pine tree, spreading out like a gigantic umbrella, 
was a group of the senior disciples. Seated on the ground like so many night-crawling crabs, they were discussing the terrain. The road has three branches, so the question is, which one Musashi will use? The best strategy is to divide the men into three squads and station one at each approach. Then Genjiro and his father can stay here with a corps of about ten of our strongest men, Miike, Ueda, and the others. No, the ground's too rugged to have a large number of men in one place. We should spread them out along the approaches and have them stay hidden until Musashi is halfway up. Then they can attack from front and rear simultaneously. There was a good deal of coming and going among the groups, moving shadows appearing to be skewered on lances or long scabbards. Despite a tendency to underestimate their enemy, there were no cowards among them. He's coming! a man on the outer rim shouted. Shadows came to a dead standstill. An icy twinge ran through the veins of every samurai. Take it easy. It's only Genjiro. Why, he's riding in a palanquin. Well, he's only a child. The slowly approaching lanterns, swinging to and fro in the chilly winds from Mount Hie, seemed dull in comparison with the moonlight. A few minutes later, Genzaemon alighted from his palanquin and declared, I guess we're all here now. Genjiro, a boy of thirteen, emerged from the next palanquin. Father and son both wore tightly tied white headbands and had their hakama hitched up high. Genzaemon instructed his son to go and stand under the pine. The boy nodded silently as his father gave him an encouraging pat on the head, saying, the battle is being carried out in your name, but the fighting will be done by the disciples. Since you're too young to take part, you don't have to do anything but stand there and watch. Genjiro ran straight to the tree, where he assumed a pose as stiff and dignified as a samurai doll at the boys' festival. We're a little early, said Genzaemon. The sun won't be up for a while. Fumbling around his waist, he pulled out a long pipe with a large bowl. Does anyone have a light? he asked casually, letting the others know that he was in complete command of himself. A man stepped forward and said, Sir, before you settle down for a smoke, don't you think we should decide how to divide up the men? Yes, I guess we should. Let's station them quickly, so we'll be prepared. How are you going to do it? There'll be a central force here by the tree. Other men will be hiding at intervals of about twenty paces on both sides of the three roads. Who'll be here by the tree? You and I and about ten others. By being here, we can protect Genjiro and be ready to join in when the signal comes that Musashi has arrived. Wait just a minute, said Genzaemon, thinking over the strategy with judicious caution. If the men are spread out like that... There'll be only about twenty in a position to attack him at the outset. True, but he'll be surrounded. Not necessarily. You can be sure he'll bring help. And you have to remember, he's as good at extracting himself from a tight spot as he is at fighting, if not better. Don't forget the Renge Oing. He might strike at a point where our men are thinly dispersed, wound three or four, then leave. Then he'd go around bragging he'd taken on more than seventy members of the Yoshioka school and come out the victor. We'll never let him get away with that. It'll be his word against ours. Even if he brings supporters, people are going to regard this match as being between him personally and the Yoshioka school as a whole. And their sympathies are going to be with the lone swordsman. I think, said Mike Juro Zaimon, it goes without saying that if he escapes again, we'll never live it down, no matter what we say. We're here to kill Musashi, and we can't be too fussy about how we do it. Dead men tell no tales. Juro Zaimon summoned four men in the nearest group to come forward. Three of them carried small bows, the fourth a musket. He had them face Genzaimon. Perhaps you'd like to see what precautions we've taken? Ah, 
flying weapons. We can station them on high ground or in trees. Won't people say we're using dirty tactics? We care less about what people say than about making sure Musashi is dead. All right. If you're prepared to face the criticism, I have nothing more to add, the old man said meekly. Even if Musashi brings along five or six men, he's not likely to escape when we have bows and arrows and a gun. Now, if we go on standing here, we may find ourselves taken by surprise. I leave the disposition of the men to you, but get them to their posts immediately. The black shadows dispersed like wild geese in a marsh, some diving into copses of bamboo, others disappearing behind trees or flattening themselves out on the ridges between the rice paddies. The three archers ascended to a higher point overlooking the field. Below, the musketeer climbed into the upper branches of the spreading pine. As he squirmed about to conceal himself, pine needles and bark cascaded onto Genjiro. Noticing the boy wriggling around, Genzaemon said reprovingly, You're not nervous already, are you? Don't be such a coward. It's not that. I've got pine needles down my back. Stand still and bear it. This will be a good experience for you. Watch closely when the actual fighting begins. Along the easternmost approach, a great shout went up. Stop, you crazy fool! The bamboo rustled loud enough to let any but the deaf know men were hiding all along the roads. Genjiro cried, I'm scared, and hugged his father around the waist. Judo Zaemon immediately set off toward the commotion, though somehow sensing that this was a false alarm. Sasaki Kojiro was bawling out one of the Yoshioka men. Haven't you got eyes? The idea of mistaking me for Musashi... I've come here to act as a witness, and you come running at me with a lance. What an ass! The Yoshioka men, too, were angry, some of them suspecting he might be spying on them. They held themselves back, but continued to block his way. As Judo Zaemon broke through the circle, Kojiro lit into him. I came here to stand as a witness, but your men are treating me as an enemy. If they're acting on instructions from you, I'll be more than happy clumsy swordsman that I am, to take you on. I have no reason to help Musashi, but I do have my honor to uphold. Besides, this would be a welcome opportunity for me to dampen my drawing pole with some fresh blood, something I've neglected to do for some time now. He was a tiger spitting fire. Those of the Yoshioka men who had been deceived by his foppish appearance were taken aback by his sheer nerve. Judo Zaimon, determined to show that he was not frightened by Kojiro's tongue, laughed. Ha ha! You're really riled, aren't you? But tell me, just who asked you to be a witness? I don't remember any such request. Did Musashi? Don't talk nonsense! When we posted the sign at Yanagimachi, I told both parties I would act as witness. I see. You said that. In other words, Musashi didn't ask you, nor did we. You took it upon yourself to be an observer. Well, the world is full of people who butt into affairs that don't concern them. That's an insult, snapped Kojiro. Spit flying from his mouth, Judo Zaimon cried, Go away! We're not here to put on a show. Kojiro, blue with rage, deftly detached himself from the group and ran a short distance back down the path. Watch out, you bastards! He shouted, preparing to attack. Genzaemon, who had trailed after Judo Zaemon, said, Wait, young man! You wait! shouted Kojiro. I have no business with you, but I'll show you what happens to people who insult me. The old man ran up to him. Now, now, you're taking this too seriously. Our men are keyed up. I'm Seijudo's uncle, and I heard from him that you're an outstanding swordsman. I'm sure there's been some mistake. I hope you'll forgive me personally for our men's conduct. I'm grateful to you for greeting me in this fashion. I've been on good terms with Seijudo, and I wish the house of Yoshioka well, 
though I do not feel I can act as a second. But that is no reason for your men to insult me. Kneeling in a formal bow, Genzaimon said, You're quite right. I hope you'll forget what happened, for the sake of Seijuro and Denshiro. The old man chose his words tactfully, worried that Kojiro, if offended, might advertise the cowardly strategy they had adopted. Kojiro's anger subsided. Stand up, sir. I'm embarrassed to have an older man bow before me. In a swift about-face, the wielder of the drawing pole now put his eloquent tongue to work, encouraging the Yoshioka men and vilifying Musashi. I have for some time been friendly with Seijudo, and as I said before, I have no connection with Musashi. It is only natural that I favor the house of Yoshioka. I have seen many conflicts among warriors, but never have I witnessed a tragedy such as has befallen you. It is incredible that the house that served the Ashkaga shoguns as instructors in the martial arts should be brought into disrepute by a mere country bumpkin. His words, spoken as though he were deliberately trying to make their ears burn, were received with rapt attention. On Judo Zaimon's face was a look of regret for having spoken so rudely to a man who had nothing but goodwill for the house of Yoshioka. The reaction was not lost on Kojiro. He picked up momentum. In the future, I plan to establish a school of my own. It is therefore not out of curiosity that I make a practice of observing bouts and studying the tactics of other fighters. This is part of my education. I do not believe, however, that I've ever witnessed or heard of a bout that irritated me more than your two encounters with Musashi. Why, when so many of you were at the Lenge Oing and before that at the Rendaiji, did you allow Musashi to escape so that he could swagger about the streets of Kyoto? This I cannot comprehend. Licking his dry lips, he went on. There's no doubt Musashi is a surprisingly tenacious fighter, as vagabond swordsmen go. I know that myself just from having seen him a couple of times. But at the risk of seeming meddlesome, I want to tell you what I've found out about Musashi. Without mentioning Akemi's name, he elaborated. The first information came to me when I happened to meet a woman who had known him since he was seventeen. Filling out what she told me with other bits of information picked up here and there, I can give you a fairly complete outline of his life. He was born the son of a provincial samurai in Mimasaka province, he ran away to the Battle of Sekigahara, and after returning home, committed so many atrocities that he was driven out of the village. Since then, he's been roaming about the countryside. Though he's a man of worthless character, he possesses a certain talent for the sword. And physically, he's extremely strong. Moreover, he fights with no regard for his own life. Because of this, Orthodox methods of swordsmanship are ineffective against him, just as reason is ineffective against insanity. You must trap him as you would a vicious animal, or you will fail. Now consider what your enemy is like, and make your plans accordingly. Genzaimon, with great formality, thanked Kojiro and proceeded to describe the precautions that had been taken. Kojiro nodded his approval. If you've been that thorough, he probably hasn't a chance of getting away alive. Still, it seems to me you could devise a more effective trick. Trick? repeated Genzaimon, taking a fresh and somewhat less admiring look at Kojiro's cocky face. Thank you, but I think we've done enough already. No, my friend, you haven't. If Musashi comes walking up the path in an honest, straightforward manner, there's probably no way he can escape. But what if he should find out about your strategy in advance and not show up at all? Then all your planning will have been in vain, won't it? If he does that, we only have to put up signs all over the city to make him the laughing stock of Kyoto. That would no doubt restore your face to some degree... But don't forget, 
he'd still be free to go around saying your tactics were dirty. In that case, you wouldn't have cleared your master's name completely. Your preparations are meaningless unless you kill Musashi here today. To be sure of doing that, you must take steps to ensure that he actually comes here and falls into the death trap you have set. Is there any way of doing that? Certainly. In fact, I can think of several ways. Kojiro's voice was full of confidence. He bent forward and, with a look of friendliness not often observed on his proud face, whispered a few words in Genzaimon's ear. How about that? he asked out loud. Hmm, I see what you mean. The old man nodded several times, then turned to Juro Zaimon and whispered the scheme to him. A Meeting in the Moonlight It was already past midnight when Musashi arrived at the small inn north of Kitano, where he had first met Jotaro. The astonished innkeeper welcomed him cordially and quickly prepared a place for him to sleep. Musashi went out early in the morning and returned late in the evening, presenting the old man with a sack of kurama sweet potatoes. He also showed him a bolt of bleached nara cotton, purchased at a nearby shop, and asked if he could have it made up into an undershirt, a stomach wrapper, and a loincloth. The innkeeper obligingly took the cloth to a neighborhood seamstress and on his way back bought some sake. He made a stew with the sweet potatoes and chatted with Musashi over the stew and sake until midnight, when the seamstress came with the clothes. Musashi folded the clothing neatly and placed it beside his pillow before retiring. The old man was awakened long before dawn by the sound of splashing water. Looking out, he saw that Musashi had bathed with cold well water and was standing in the moonlight wearing his new underwear and just putting on his old kimono. Musashi, remarking that he was a little tired of Kyoto and had decided to go to Edo, promised that when he came to Kyoto again in three or four years, he would stay at the inn. The innkeeper having tied his obi in the back for him, Musashi set off at a fast pace. He took the narrow path through the fields to the Kitano High Road, carefully picking his way through the piles of ox dung. The old man watched sadly as the darkness swallowed him. Musashi's mind was as clear as the sky above him. Physically refreshed, his body seemed to grow more buoyant with each step. There's no reason to walk so fast, he said out loud, slackening his pace. I suppose this will be my last night in the realm of the living. This was neither exclamation nor lament merely a statement coming unbidden to his lips. He had no sense as yet of actually staring death in the face. He had spent the previous day meditating under a pine tree at the inner temple at Kurama, hoping to achieve that state of bliss in which body and soul no longer matter. Unsuccessful in his effort to rid himself of the idea of death, he was now ashamed of having wasted his time. The night air was invigorating. The sake, just the right amount, a short but sound sleep, the bracing well water, new clothing. He did not feel like a man about to die. He recalled the night in the dead of winter when he had forced himself to the top of Eagle Mountain. Then, too, the stars had been dazzling, and the trees had been festooned with icicles. The icicles would now have given way to budding flowers. His head full of stray thoughts, he found it impossible to concentrate on the vital problem facing him. What purpose, he wondered, would be served at this stage by pondering questions that a century of thinking would not solve? The meaning of death, the agony of dying, the life that would follow afterward. The district he was in was inhabited by noblemen and their retainers. He heard the doleful sound of a flagellate, accompanied by the slow strains of a reed mouth organ. In his mind's eye, he saw mourners seated around a coffin, waiting for the dawn. Had the dirge penetrated his ears before he actually became aware of it? 
Perhaps it had aroused the subconscious memory of the dancing virgins of Ise and his experience on Eagle Mountain. Doubt gnawed at his mind. As he paused to give the matter some thought, he noticed that he had passed the Shōkokuji and was now only about a hundred yards from the silvery Kamo River. In the light reflected on a dirt wall, he caught sight of a still dark figure. The man walked toward him, followed by a smaller shadow, a dog on a leash. Satisfied by the presence of the animal that the man was not one of his enemies, he relaxed and walked on by. The other man took a few steps, turned, and said, Can I trouble you, sir? Me? Yes, if it's all right. His cap and hakama were of the sort worn by artisans. What is it? asked Musashi. Forgive me a peculiar question, but did you notice a house all lit up along this street? I wasn't paying much attention, but no, I don't think I did. I guess I'm on the wrong street again. What are you looking for? A house where there's just been a death. I didn't see the house, but I heard a mouth organ and a flagellet about a hundred yards back. That must be the place. The Shinto priest probably arrived before me and began the wake. Are you attending the wake? Not exactly. I'm a coffin maker from Toribe Hill. I was asked to go to the Matsuo house, so I went to Yoshida Hill. They don't live there anymore. The Matsuo family on Yoshida Hill? Yes. I didn't know they'd moved. I went a long way for nothing. Thank you. Wait, said Musashi. Would that be Matsuo Kaname, who's in the service of Lord Konoe? That's right. He fell sick only about ten days before he died. Musashi turned and walked on. The coffin maker hurried off in the opposite direction. So my uncle's dead thought Musashi, matter-of-factly. He recalled how his uncle had scraped and saved to accumulate a small sum of money. He thought of the rice cakes he had received from his aunt and devoured on the bank of the freezing river on New Year's morning. He wondered vacantly how his aunt would get along now that she was all alone. He stood on the bank of the upper Kamo and regarded the looming dark panorama of the thirty-six hills of Higashiyama. Each peak seemed to stare back at him with enmity. Then he ran down to a pontoon bridge. From the northern part of the city, it was necessary to cross here to reach the road to Mount Hie and the pass leading to Omi province. He was halfway across when he heard a voice, loud but indistinct. He stopped and listened. The rapidly flowing water gurgled cheerfully while a cold wind swept through the valley. He couldn't locate the source of the cry, and after a few more steps paused again at the sound of the voice. Still unable to tell where it came from, he hurried on to the other bank. As he left the bridge, he spied a man with upraised arms running toward him from the north. The figure seemed familiar. It was Sasaki Kojiro, the ubiquitous fixer. As he approached, he greeted Musashi in an all-too-friendly way. After a glance across the bridge, he asked, Are you alone? Yes, of course. I hope you will pardon me for the other night, said Kojiro. Thank you for putting up with my interference. I think it is I who should thank you, replied Musashi with equal politeness. Are you on your way to the bout? Yes. All alone? Kojiro asked again. Yes, of course. Hmm. I wonder, Musashi. If you've misunderstood the sign we put up at Yanagimachi. I don't think so. You're fully aware of the conditions? This isn't to be a simple man-to-man -man fight as it was in the case of Seijuro and Denshichiro. I know that. Though the battle will be fought in the name of Genjiro, he'll be aided by members of the Yoshioka school. Do you understand that members of the Yoshioka school could be ten men or a hundred? Even a thousand? Yes. Why do you ask? Some of the weaker men have run away from the school, but the stronger and more courageous have all gone up to the spreading pine. Right now they're stationed all over the hillside, waiting for you. Have you been to take a look? Um, I decided I'd better come back and warn you. 
Knowing you'd cross the pontoon bridge, I waited here. I considered this my duty, since I wrote the sign. That's very thoughtful of you. Well, that's the situation. Are you really intending to go alone, or do you have supporters going by another route? I will have one companion. Is that so? Where is he now? Right here, Musashi, his laughing teeth shining in the moonlight, pointed to his shadow. Kojiro bristled. This is no laughing matter. I didn't mean it as a joke. Oh, it sounded as though you were making fun of my advice. Musashi, assuming an attitude even graver than Kojiro's, countered, Do you think the great saint Shinnan was joking when he said that any believer has the strength of two because the Buddha Amida walks with him? Kojiro did not answer. From all appearances, it seems the Yoshiokas have the upper hand. They're out in force. I'm alone. Without a doubt, you're assuming I'll be beaten. But I beg you not to worry on my behalf. Supposing I knew they had ten men and took ten men with me, what would happen? They'd throw in twenty men rather than ten. If I took twenty, they'd increase the number to thirty or forty, and the battle would create an even greater public disturbance. Many people would be killed or injured. The result would be a serious infringement against the principles of government, with no compensating advancement for the cause of swordsmanship. In other words, there'd be much to lose and little to gain by my calling in assistance. True as that may be, it's not in accordance with the art of war to enter into a battle you know you're going to lose. There are times when it's necessary. No, not according to the art of war. Abandoning yourself to rash action is quite a different matter. Whether or not my method is in accordance with the art of war, I know what's necessary for me. You're breaking all the rules, Musashi laughed. If you insist on going against the rules, argued Kojiro, why don't you at least choose a line of action that will give you a chance to go on living? The path I'm following is, for me, the way toward a fuller life. You'll be lucky if it doesn't lead you straight to hell. This river, you know, may be the three-pronged river of hell. This road, the mile-long road to perdition. The hill I'll soon climb, the mountain of needles on which the damned are impaled. Nevertheless, this is the only path toward true life. The way you talk... You may already be possessed by the god of death. Think what you like. There are people who die by remaining alive, and others who gain life by dying. You poor devil, said Kojiro, half in derision. Tell me, Kojiro, if I follow this road, where will it take me? To Hananoki village, and then to the spreading pine at Ichijoji, where you've chosen to die. How far is it? Only about two miles. You have plenty of time. Thank you. I'll see you later, said Musashi breezily as he turned and started down a side road. That's not the way, Musashi nodded. That's the wrong way, I tell you. I know. He went on down the slope. Beyond the trees on either side of the road were tiered rice paddies. Off in the distance, a few thatched farmhouses. Kojiro watched Musashi stop, look up at the moon, and stand still for a time. Kojiro broke into laughter as it dawned on him that Musashi was urinating. He himself looked up at the moon, thinking that before it had set, a lot of men would be dead or dying. Musashi didn't come back. Kojiro sat down on the root of a tree and contemplated the coming fight with a sentiment approaching glee. To judge from Musashi's calmness, he's already resigned to dying. Still, he'll put up a tremendous struggle. The more of them he cuts down, the more fun it'll be to watch. Ah, but the Yoshiokas have flying weapons. If he's hit by one of them, the show will be over right then. 
That would spoil everything. I think I'd better tell him about them. There was now a little mist and a pre-dawn chill in the air. Standing up, Kojiro called, Musashi, what's taking you so long? A sense that something was off-key sent a pang of anxiety through him. He walked rapidly down the slope and called again. The only sound was the turning of a water wheel. The silly bastard! Racing back to the main road, he looked around in all directions, seeing only the temple roofs and forests of Shirakawa rising on the slopes of Higashiyama and the moon. Jumping to conclusion that Musashi had run away, he rebuked himself for not seeing through his calmness and took off at a flying pace for Ichijoji. Grinning, Musashi emerged from behind a tree and stood where Kojiro had been standing. He was glad to be rid of him. He had no use for a man who took pleasure in watching other people die, who watched impassively while other men staked their lives on causes that were important to them. Kojiro was no innocent spectator, motivated only by the desire to learn. He was a deceitful, scheming interloper, always out to ingratiate himself with both sides, always presenting himself as the splendid chap who wants to help everybody. Perhaps Kojiro had thought that if he told Musashi how strong the enemy was, Musashi would get down on his hands and knees and ask him to serve as his second. And, conceivably, if Musashi's first objective had been to preserve his own life, he would have welcomed assistance. But even before meeting Kojiro, he had picked up enough information to know he might have to face a hundred men. It wasn't that he had forgotten the lesson Takuan had taught him. The truly brave man is one who loves life, cherishing it as a treasure that once fortified can never be recovered. He well knew that to live was more than merely to survive. The problem was how to imbue his life with meaning, how to ensure that his life would cast a bright ray of light into the future, even if it became necessary to give up that life for a cause. If he succeeded in doing this, the length of his life, twenty years or seventy, made little difference. A lifetime was only an insignificant interval in the endless flow of time. To Musashi's way of thinking, there was one way of life for ordinary people, another for the warrior. It was vitally important for him to live like a samurai and to die like one. There was no turning back from the path he had chosen. Even if he was hacked to pieces, the enemy could not obliterate the fact of his having responded fearlessly and honestly to the challenge. He gave his attention to the routes available. The shortest, as well as the widest and easiest to travel, was the road Kojiro had taken. Another, not quite so direct, was a path leading along the Takano River, a tributary of the Kamo, to the Ohara High Road and then by way of the Shugakuin Imperial Villa to Ichijoji. The third route went east for a short distance, then north as far as the foothills of Uryu, and finally across a path into the village. The three roads met at the spreading pine. The difference in distance was insignificant. Yet from the viewpoint of a small force attacking a much larger one, the approach was all important. The choice itself could decide victory or defeat. Instead of weighing the problem at some length, after only a momentary pause, he started running in a direction almost opposite from that of Ichijoji. First, he crossed over the foot of Kagura Hill to a point behind the tomb of the emperor Go Ichijo. Then, passing through a thick bamboo grove, he came to a mountain stream flowing through a village in the northwest. Looming above him was the north shoulder of Mount Daimonji. Silently, he began climbing. Through the trees on his right he could see a garden wall, apparently belonging to the Ginkakuji. Almost directly beneath him the jujube-shaped pond in the garden shone like a mirror. As he went farther up, the pond was lost in the trees, and the rippling Kamo River came into view. 
He felt as though he held the whole city in the palm of his hand. He stopped for a moment to check his position. By proceeding horizontally across the sides of four hills, he could reach a point above and behind the spreading pine, where he could command a bird's-eye view of the enemy's position. Like Oda Nobunaga at the Battle of Okehazama, he had spurned the usual routes in favor of a difficult detour. Who goes there? Musashi froze and waited. Footsteps approached cautiously. Seeing a man dressed like a samurai in the service of a court noble, Musashi decided he was not a member of the Yoshioka forces. The man's nose was smudged from the smoke of his torch. His kimono was damp and mud-spattered. He uttered a little cry of surprise. Musashi stared at him suspiciously. Aren't you Miyamoto Musashi? the man asked with a low bow, his eyes tinged with fright. Musashi's eyes brightened in the light of the torch. Are you Miyamoto Musashi? Terrified, the samurai seemed to wobble slightly on his feet. The fierceness in Musashi's eyes was something not often encountered in human beings. Who are you? Musashi asked crisply. Er, I, I... Stop stammering. Who are you? I'm, I'm from the house of Lord Karasumaru Mitsuhiro. I'm Miyamoto Musashi. But what's a retainer of Lord Karasumaru's doing up here in the middle of the night? Then you are Musashi, he sighed with relief. The next instant, he was running at breakneck speed down the mountain, his torch trailing light behind him. Musashi turned and continued on his way across the mountainside. When the samurai reached the vicinity of the Ginkakuji, he shouted, Kura! Where are you? We're here! Where are you? It wasn't the voice of Kura, another retainer of Karasumaru, but that of Jotaro. Jotaro! Is that you? Yes! Come up here fast! I can't! Otsu can't walk any farther! The samurai swore under his breath, raised his voice even higher, and shouted, Come quick! I found Musashi! Musashi! If you don't hurry, we'll lose him! Jotaro and Otsu were about two hundred yards farther down the path. It took a while for their two long shadows, seemingly linked together, to hobble up to the samurai. He waved his torch to hurry them on, and in a matter of seconds could hear for himself Otsu's labored breathing. Her face looked whiter than the moon. The travel paraphernalia on her thin arms and legs seemed cruel and absurd. But when the light fell full upon her, her cheeks took on a ruddy hue. Is it true? she panted. Yes, I just saw him. Then, in a more urgent tone, If you hurry, you should be able to catch him. But if you waste time, which way? asked Jotaro, exasperated at being caught between an agitated man and an ailing woman. Otsu's physical condition had by no means improved, but once Jotaro had divulged the news of Musashi's impending battle, there was no way of keeping her in bed, even if that might prolong her life. Disregarding all entreaties, she had tied up her hair, laced on her straw sandals, and all but staggered out of Lord Karasumaru's gate. Once the impossibility of stopping her had become apparent, Lord Karasumaru did all he could to help. He took charge of the operation himself, and while she was limping slowly toward the Ginkakuji, sent his men to scour the various approaches to Ichijoji village. The men walked until their feet ached and had been on the verge of giving up when the quarry was found. The samurai pointed and Otsu started resolutely up the hill. Jotaro, fearing she might collapse, asked at every other step, Are you all right? Can you make it? She did not reply. Truth to tell, she did not even hear him. Her emaciated body was responsive only to the need to reach Musashi. Though her mouth was parched, cold sweat poured from her ashen forehead. This must be the way, said Jotaro, hoping to encourage her. This road goes to Mount Hie. It's all flat from now on. No more climbing. Do you want to rest for a moment? Silently she shook her head, clinging firmly to the stick they were carrying between them, 
struggling for breath as though all life's difficulties were compressed into this one journey. When they'd managed to cover nearly a mile, Jotaro shouted, Musashi! Sensei! and went on shouting. His strong voice bolstered Otsu's courage, but before long her strength was gone. Jo... Jotaro, she whispered weakly. She let go of the stick and sank into the grass by the road. Face to the ground, she clasped her delicate fingers over her mouth. Her shoulders jerked convulsively. Otsu! It's blood! You're spitting up blood! Oh, Otsu! On the brink of tears, he clasped his arms around her waist and held her up. She shook her head slowly from side to side. Not knowing what else to do, Jotaro patted her gently on the back. What do you want? he asked. She was beyond replying. I know, water. Is that it? She nodded feebly. Wait here, I'll get some. He stood up and looked around, listened for a moment, and went to a nearby ravine where he heard water running. With little difficulty, he found a spring bubbling forth from the rocks. As he started to scoop up some water with his hands, he hesitated, eyes fixed on the tiny crabs at the bottom of the pristine pool. The moon wasn't shining directly on the water, but the reflection of the sky was more beautiful than the silver-white clouds themselves. Deciding to take a sip himself before carrying out his task, he moved a few feet to one side and bent down on his hands and knees, craning his neck like a duck. Then he gasped. Apparition? and his body bristled like a chestnut in its burr. Reflected in the small pool was a striped pattern, half a dozen trees on the other side. Right beside them was the image of Musashi. Jotaro thought his imagination was playing tricks on him, that the reflection would soon dissolve. When it failed to go away, he raised his eyes very slowly. "'You're here!' he cried. "'You're really here!' The peaceful reflection of the sky turned to mud as he splashed across to the other side, wetting his kimono to the shoulders. You're here! He threw his arms around Musashi's legs. Quiet, said Musashi softly. It's dangerous here. Come back later. No, I found you. I'm staying with you. Quiet. I heard your voice. I've been waiting here. Now take Otsu some water. It's muddy now. There's another brook over there. See? Here, take this with you. He held out a bamboo tube. Jotaro raised his face and said, No, you take it to her. They stood like that for a few seconds. Then Musashi nodded and went to the other brook. Having filled the tube, he carried it to Otsu's side. He put his arm around her gently and held the tube to her mouth. Jotaro stood beside them. Look, Otsu, it's Musashi. Don't you understand? Musashi! As Otsu sipped the cool water, her breath came a little more easily, though she remained limp in Musashi's arm. Her eyes seemed to be focused on something very far away. Don't you see, Otsu? Not me, Musashi. It's Musashi's arm around you, not mine. Burning tears gathered in her vacant eyes until they looked like glass. Two streams sparkled down her cheeks. She nodded. Jotaro was beside himself with joy. You're happy now, aren't you? This is what you wanted, isn't it? Then to Musashi, she's been saying over and over that whatever happened, she had to see you. She wouldn't listen to anybody. Please tell her, if she keeps on acting like this, she'll die. She won't pay any attention to me. Maybe she'll do what you tell her. It was all my fault, said Musashi. I'll apologize and tell her to take better care of herself. Jotaro. Yes? Would you leave us alone, just for a little while? Why? Why can't I stay here? Don't be that way, Jotaro, Otsu said pleadingly. Just for a few minutes, please. Oh, all right. He couldn't refuse Otsu, even if he didn't understand. I'll be up the hill. 
Call me when you're through. Otsu's natural shyness was magnified by her illness, and she could not decide what to say. Musashi, embarrassed, turned his face away from her. With her back to him, she stared at the ground. He gazed up at the sky. He feared instinctively that no words existed to tell her what was in his heart. All that had happened since the night she had freed him from the cryptomeria tree passed through his mind, and he recognized the purity of the love that had kept her searching for him these five long years. Who was stronger? Who had suffered more? Otsu, her life difficult and complex, burning with a love she could not conceal? Or he himself, hiding his feelings behind a stony face, burying the embers of his passion under a layer of cold ashes? Musashi had thought before, and thought now, that his way was the more painful. Yet there was strength and valor in Otsu's constancy. The burden she had borne was too heavy for most men to bear alone. Only a short time to go, thought Musashi. The moon was low in the sky, the light whiter now. Dawn was not far away. Soon both the moon and he himself would fade behind the mountain of death. He must, in the short time remaining, tell Otsu the truth. He owed her that much, for her devotion and her faithfulness but the words would not come. The harder he tried to speak, the more tongue-tied he became. He watched the sky helplessly, as though inspiration might descend from it. Otsu stared at the ground and wept. Within her heart was a flaming love, a love so strong that it had driven everything else out. Principles, religion, concern for her own welfare, pride all paled beside this one consuming passion. In some way, she believed, this love simply had to overcome Musashi's resistance. Somehow, through her tears, a way must be found for them to live together, apart from the world of ordinary people. But now that she was with him, she was helpless. She could not bring herself to describe the pain of being away from him, the misery of traveling through life alone, the agony she suffered over his lack of feeling. If only she had a mother to whom she could pour out all her sorrows. The long silence was broken by the honking of a flock of geese. Attuned to the approach of dawn, they rose above the trees and flew off over the mountain tops. The geese are flying north said Musashi, conscious of the irrelevance. Musashi. Their eyes met in a shared memory of the years in the village when the geese had passed high above each spring and fall. Everything had been so simple then. She had been friendly with Matahachi. Musashi she had disliked because of his roughness, but she had never been afraid to talk back to him when he said insulting things to her. Each now thought of the mountain where the Shippoji stood and the banks of the Yoshino River below, and both knew they were squandering precious moments, moments that would never return. Jotaro said you were ill. Is it very bad? It's nothing serious. Are you feeling better now? Yes, but it's of no importance. Are you really expecting to be killed today? I'm afraid so. If you die, I can't go on living. Perhaps that's why it's so easy to forget about my sickness now. A certain light came into her eyes, and it made him feel the weakness of his own determination as compared to hers. To acquire even a degree of self-control, he had had to ponder the question of life and death for many years, discipline himself at every turn of the road, force himself to undergo the rigors of a samurai's training. With no training or conscious self-discipline, 
This woman was able to say without the slightest hesitation that she, too, was prepared to die if he did. Her face expressed perfect serenity, her eyes telling him she was neither lying nor speaking impulsively. She seemed almost happy over the prospect of following him in death. He wondered with a tinge of shame how women could be so strong. Don't be a fool, too, he suddenly blurted. There's no reason why you should die. The strength of his own voice and the depth of his feelings surprised even him. It's one thing for me to die fighting against the Yoshiokas. Not only is it right for a man who lives by the sword to die by the sword. I have a duty to remind those cowards of the way of the samurai. Your willingness to follow me in death is deeply touching, but what good would it do? No more than the pitiful death of an insect. Seeing her burst into tears again, he regretted the brutality of his words. Now I understand how over the years I've lied to you, and I've lied to myself. I didn't intend to deceive you when we ran away from the village or when I saw you at Hanada Bridge, but I did, by pretending to be cold and indifferent. That wasn't the way I really felt. In a little while, I'll be dead. What I'm about to say is the truth. I love you, Otsu. I'd throw everything to the four winds and live out my life with you, if only... After a moment's pause, he continued in a more forceful vein. You must believe every word I say, because I'll never have another chance to tell you this. I speak with neither pride nor pretense. There have been days when I couldn't concentrate for thinking about you. Nights I couldn't sleep for dreaming of you. Hot, passionate dreams, Otsu. Dreams that nearly drove me mad. Often I've hugged my palate, pretending it was you. But even when I felt like that, if I took up my sword and looked at it, the madness evaporated and my blood cooled. Her face turned toward him, tearful but as radiant as a morning glory, she started to speak. Seeing the fervor in his eyes, her words caught in her throat and she looked at the ground again. The sword is my refuge. Any time my passion threatens to overcome me, I force myself back into the world of swordsmanship. This is my fate, Otsu. I'm torn between love and self-discipline. I seem to be traveling on two paths at once, yet when the paths diverge, I invariably manage to keep myself on the right one. I know myself better than anyone else does. I'm neither a genius nor a great man. He became silent again. Despite his desire to express his feelings honestly, his words seemed to him to be concealing the truth. His heart told him to be even more candid. That's the kind of man I am. What else can I say? I think of my sword, and you disappear into some dark corner of my mind. No, disappear altogether, leaving no trace. At times like that, I'm happiest and most satisfied with my life. Do you understand? All this time you've suffered. You've risked body and soul on a man who loves his sword more than he loves you. I'll die to vindicate my sword, but I wouldn't die for the love of a woman. Not even you. As much as I'd like to fall on my knees and beg your forgiveness, I can't. He felt her sensitive fingers tighten on his wrist. She was no longer crying. I know all that, she said emphatically. If I didn't know it, I wouldn't love you as I do. But can't you see the foolishness of dying on my account? For this one moment, I'm yours, body and soul. But once I've left you, you mustn't die for the love of a man like me. There's a good way, a proper way for a woman to live, Otsu. You must search for it. Make a happy life for yourself. These must be my parting words. It's time for me to go. Gently he removed her hand from his wrist and stood up. She caught his sleeve and cried, 
Musashi, just one minute more. There were so many things she wanted to tell him. She did not care if he forgot her when he was not with her. She did not mind being called insignificant. She'd had no delusions about his character when she fell in love with him. She caught his sleeve again, her eyes searching his, trying to prolong this last moment to keep it from ever ending. Her silent appeal nearly undid him. There was beauty even in the weakness that prevented her from speaking. Overcome by his own weakness and fear, he felt himself to be a tree with brittle roots, menaced by a raging wind. He wondered if his chaste devotion to the way of the sword would crumble like a landslide under the weight of her tears. To break the silence, he asked, Do you understand? Yes, she said weakly. I understand perfectly. But if you die, I'll die too. My dying will have a meaning to me, just as yours has to you. If you can face the end calmly, so can I. I won't be trampled down like an insect or drown in a moment of grief. I have to decide for myself. Nobody else can do it for me, not even you. With great strength and perfect calm, she went on. If in your heart you'll consider me to be your bride, that's enough, a joy and a blessing that only I, of all the women in the world, possess. You said you didn't want to make me unhappy. I can assure you I won't die because of unhappiness. There are people who seem to consider me unfortunate, yet I don't feel that way in the least. I look forward with pleasure to the day when I die. It will be like a glorious morning when the birds are singing. I'll go as happily as I would to my wedding. Nearly out of breath, she folded her arms over her breast and gazed up contentedly, as though captivated by a delightful dream. The moon seemed to be sinking rapidly. Though it was still not daybreak, mist had begun to rise through the trees. The silence was shattered by a horrifying scream that rent the air like the screech of a mythical bird. It came from the cliff Jotaro had climbed earlier. Startled out of her dreams, Otsu directed her eyes to the top of the cliff. Musashi chose this moment to leave. Without a word, he simply withdrew from her side and walked away, toward his appointment with death. Otsu, with a stifled cry, ran a few steps after him. Musashi ran farther ahead, then turned back and said, I understand your feelings, Otsu, but please don't die a cowardly death. Don't, because of your sorrow, allow yourself to sink into the valley of death and succumb like a weakling. Get well first, then think about it. I'm not throwing my life away for a useless cause. I've chosen to do what I'm doing because, by dying, I can achieve eternal life. Depend on one thing. My body may turn to dust, but I'll still be alive. Catching his breath, he added a warning. Are you listening? By attempting to follow me in death, you may find that you're dying alone. You may look for me in the world beyond, only to find I'm not there. I intend to live on for a hundred or a thousand years, in the hearts of my countrymen, in the spirit of Japanese swordsmanship. He was out of hearing before she could speak again. She felt her very soul had left her, but she did not think of this as a parting. It was more as though the two of them were being engulfed in a great wave of life and death. A cascade of dirt and pebbles came to rest at the foot of the cliff, followed closely by Jotaro, wearing the grotesque mask he had received from the widow in Nara. Throwing his hands up, he said, I've never been so surprised in my life. What happened? whispered Otsu, not quite recovered from the shock of seeing the mask. Didn't you hear it? I don't know why, but all of a sudden there was this horrible scream. Where were you? Were you wearing that mask? I was above the cliff. There's a path up there about as wide as this one. After I climbed up a little way, I found a nice big rock, so I was just sitting there looking at the moon. The mask. 
Did you have it on? Yes. I could hear foxes howling and maybe badgers or something rustling around near me. I thought the mask would scare them away. Then I heard the shriek, blood-curdling, like it was coming from a ghost in hell. Stray Geese Wait for me, Matahachi. Why do you have to walk so fast? Osugi, far behind and completely winded, had forfeited both patience and pride. Matahachi, in a voice calculated to be heard, grumbled. She was in such a hurry when we left the inn, but listen to her now. She talks better than she walks. As far as the foot of Mount Daimonji, they had been on the road to Ichijoji, but now, deep in the mountains, they were lost. Osugi would not give up. The way you keep picking on me, she rasped. Anybody would think you had a terrible grudge against your own mother. By the time she had wiped the sweat from her wrinkled face, Matahachi was off again. Won't you slow down? she cried. Let's sit here for a while. If you keep stopping every ten feet to rest, we won't be there before sunrise. The sun won't be up for a long time yet. Ordinarily, I wouldn't have any trouble on a mountain road like this, but I'm coming down with a cold. You'll never admit you're wrong, will you? Back there, when I woke up the innkeeper so you could rest, you couldn't sit still for a minute. You didn't want anything to drink, so you started carrying on about how we'd be late. I hadn't had two sips before you dragged me out of the place. I know you're my mother, but you're a hard woman to get along with. Ha! Still peeved because I wouldn't let you drink yourself, silly? Is that it? Why can't you exercise a little restraint? We have important things to do today. It's not as if we're going to whip out our swords and do the job ourselves. All we have to do is get a lock of Musashi's hair or something off the body. There's nothing so hard about that. Have it your way. No use fighting with each other like this. Let's go. As they started walking again, Matahachi resumed his disgruntled soliloquy. The whole thing's stupid. We take a lock of hair back to the village and offer it as proof that our great mission in life had been accomplished. Those bumpkins have never been out of the mountains, so they'll be impressed. Oh, how I hate that village! Not only had he not lost his fondness for the good sake of Nada, the pretty girls of Kyoto, and a number of other things, he still believed the city was where he would get his lucky break. Who could deny that one morning he mightn't wake up with everything he'd ever wanted? I'll never go back to that piddling village, he vowed silently. Osugi, again lagging a good distance behind, cast dignity to the winds. Matachi, she wheedled. Carry me on your back, won't you? Please, just for a short while. He frowned, said nothing, but stopped to let her catch up. Just as she reached him, their ears were assaulted by the shriek of terror that had jolted Otsu and Jotaro. Faces blankly curious, they stood still, listening keenly. A moment later, Osugi uttered a cry of dismay as Matahachi ran abruptly to the edge of the cliff. What, where are you going? It must be down there, he said, and disappeared over the edge of the cliff. Stay there, I'll see who it is. Osugi recovered in no time. Fool, she shouted. Where are you going? You deaf? Didn't you hear that scream? What's that got to do with you? Come back. Come back here. Ignoring her, he rapidly made his way from tree root to tree root to the bottom of the little ravine. Fool! Numbskull! she cried. She might as well have been barking at the moon. Matahachi again shouted to her to stay where she was, but he was so far down that Osugi barely heard him. Now what? he thought, beginning to regret his impulsiveness. If he was wrong about where the cry had come from, he was wasting time and energy. Though no moonlight penetrated the foliage, his eyes gradually became accustomed to the dark. 
He came upon one of the many shortcuts crisscrossing the mountains east of Kyoto and leading to Sakamoto and Otsu. Walking alongside a brook with tiny waterfalls and rapids, he found a hut, probably a shelter for men who came to spear mountain trout. It was too small to hold more than one person, and obviously empty, but behind it he spotted a crouching figure, face and hands starkly white. It's a woman, he thought with satisfaction, and concealed himself behind a large rock. After a couple of minutes, the woman crept from behind the hut, went to the edge of the stream and scooped up some water to drink. He took a step forward. As though warned by animal instinct, the girl looked around furtively and started to flee. Akemi! Oh, you frightened me! But there was relief in her voice. She swallowed the water that had caught in her throat and heaved a deep sigh. After eyeing her up and down, Matahachi asked, What happened? What are you doing here at this hour of the night, dressed in traveling clothes? Where's your mother? She's up there, he waved his arm. I bet she's furious. About the money? Yes. I'm really sorry, Matahachi. I had to leave in a hurry, and I didn't have enough to pay my bill and nothing to travel on. I know it was wrong, but I panicked. Please forgive me. Don't make me go back. I promise I'll return the money some day. She melted into tears. Why all the apologies? Oh, I see. You think we came up here to catch you. Oh, I don't blame you. Even if it was just a wild impulse, I did run away with the money. If I'm caught and treated like a thief, I guess I can't really complain. That's the way Mother would look at it, but I'm not like that. Anyway, it wasn't very much. If you really needed it, I'd have been glad to give it to you. I'm not angry. I'm much more interested in why you left so suddenly and what you're doing up here. I overheard you and your mother talking tonight. Oh? About Musashi? Uh, yes. And you decided all of a sudden to go to Ichijoji? She didn't answer. Oh, I forgot, he exclaimed, recalling his purpose and coming down into the ravine. Were you the one who screamed a few minutes ago? She nodded, then quickly stole a frightened glance at the slope above them. Satisfied that nothing was there, she told him how she had crossed the stream and was climbing a steep crag when she looked up and saw an incredibly evil-looking ghost sitting on a high rock, staring at the moon. It had the body of a midget, but the face, that of a woman, was an eerie color, whiter than white, with a mouth that slashed up on one side to the ear. It seemed to be laughing grotesquely at her, and had frightened her out of her wits. Before she came to her senses, she had already slid back down into the ravine. Though the tale sounded absurd, she told it with deadly seriousness. Matachi tried to listen politely, but was soon overcome with laughter. Ah-ha! You're making it all up! You probably frightened the ghost! Why, you used to roam the battlefields and didn't even wait for the dead spirits to leave before you started stripping the corpses. I was only a child then. I didn't know enough to be afraid. You weren't all that young. I gather you're still pining over Musashi. No. He was my first love, but... Then why go to Ichijoji? I don't really know myself. I just thought that if I went... I might see him. You're wasting your time, he said emphatically, then told her Musashi didn't have a chance in a thousand of coming out of the battle alive. After what had happened to her at the hands of Seijudo and Kojiro, thoughts of Musashi could no longer conjure up images of the bliss she had once imagined sharing with him. Having neither died nor found a life that appealed to her, she felt like a soul in limbo a goose separated from the flock and lost. As he stared at her profile, Matachi was struck by the similarity between her situation and his. They had both been cut adrift from their moorings. Something in her powdered face suggested that she was looking for a companion. He put his arm around her, brushed his cheek against hers, and whispered, Akemi, let's go to Edo. To, to Edo? 
You must be joking, she said. But the idea shook her out of her trance. Tightening his hold on her shoulders, he said, It doesn't necessarily have to be Edo, but everybody says it's the city of the future. Osaka and Kyoto are old now. Maybe that's why the shogun's building a new capital in the east. If we go there now, there should still be lots of good jobs, even for a couple of stray geese like you and me. Come on, Akemi, say you'll go. Encouraged by the growing spark of interest in her face, he went on more fervently. We could have fun, Akemi. We could do the things we want to do. Why live if you can't do that? We're young. We've got to learn to be bold and clever. Neither of us will get anywhere acting like weaklings. The more you try to be good and honest and conscientious, the harder fate kicks you in the teeth and laughs at you. You end up crying your heart out. And where does that get you? Look, that's the way it's always been for us, isn't it? You've done nothing but let yourself be devoured by that mother of yours and some brutal men. From now on, you've got to be the one who eats rather than the one who gets gobbled up. She was beginning to be swayed. Her mother's tea house had been a cage from which they had both fled. Since then, the world had shown her nothing but cruelty. She sensed that Matahachi was stronger and better able to cope with life than she. After all, he was a man. Will you go? he asked. Even though she knew it was as if the house had burned down and she was trying to rebuild it with the ashes, it took some effort to shake off her fantasy, the rapturous daydream in which Musashi was hers and hers alone. But finally she nodded without speaking. Then it's settled. Let's go, now. What about your mother? Oh, her? He sniffed. He glanced up at the cliff. If she manages to lay hands on something to prove that Musashi's dead, she'll go back to the village. No doubt she'll be mad as a hornet when she finds I'm not around. I can hear her now, telling everybody how I left her on the mountain to die, the way they used to throw away old women in some parts of the country. But if I make a success of myself, that'll make up for everything. Anyway, we've made up our minds. Let's go. He strode off ahead, but she hung back. Matahachi, not that way. Why? We'll have to pass that rock again. Aha! And see the midget with a woman's face? Forget it. I'm with you now. Oh, listen, isn't that my mother calling? Hurry up before she comes looking for me. She's a lot worse than a small ghost with a scary face. The Spreading Pine The wind soughed in the bamboo. Though it was still too dark to take flight, birds were awake and chirping. Don't attack! It's me! Kojiro! Having run like a demon for more than a mile, he was breathing heavily when he reached the spreading pine. The faces of the men who emerged from their hiding places to encircle him were numb from waiting. Didn't you find him? Genzaimon asked impatiently. I found him all right, replied Kojiro, with an inflection that turned every eye upon him. Looking around coolly, he said, I found him, and we walked together up the Takano River for a way, but then he... He ran away, exclaimed Miike Juro Zaimon. No, Kojiro said emphatically. To judge from his calmness and from what he said, I don't think he did. At first it seemed that way, but on second thought, I decided he was just trying to get rid of me. He's probably devised some strategy he wanted to conceal from me. Better keep your guard up. Strategy? What kind of strategy? They jostled closer to avoid missing a word. I suspect he's enlisted several seconds. He was probably on his way to meet them so they could attack all at once. Ugh, groaned Genzaimon. That seems likely. It also means it won't be long before they arrive. Judo Zaimon separated himself from the group and ordered the men back to their stations. If Musashi attacks while we're scattered like this, he warned, we may lose the first skirmish. 
We don't know how many men he'll have with him, but it can't be very many. We'll stick to our original plan. He's right. Mustn't be caught off guard. It's easy to make a mistake when you're tired of waiting. Be careful. Get to your posts. Gradually they dispersed. The musketeer resettled himself in the upper branches of the pine tree. Kojiro, noticing Genjiro standing stiffly with his back to the trunk, asked, Sleepy? No, the boy replied pluckily. Kojiro patted him on the head. Your lips have turned blue. You must be cold. Since you're the representative of the house of Yoshioka, you have to be brave and strong. Be patient a little longer, and you'll see some interesting things happen. Walking away, he added, Now I have to find a good place for myself. The moon had traveled with Musashi from the hollow between Shiga Hill and Uryu Hill, where he'd left Otsu. Now it sank behind the mountain, as a gradual upward movement of the clouds resting on the thirty-six peaks served notice that the world would soon be beginning its daily chores. He quickened his pace. Directly below him, a temple roof came into view. It's not far now, he thought. He looked up and reflected that in only a short time, a few breaths, his spirit would join the clouds in their skyward flight. To the universe, the death of one man could hardly have any more significance than that of a butterfly. But in the realm of mankind, a single death could affect everything, for better or worse. Musashi's only concern now was how to die a noble death. The welcome sound of water struck his ears. Stopping and kneeling at the foot of a tall rock, he scooped some water from the brook and drank quickly. His tongue smarted from its freshness, an indication, he hoped, that his spirit was calm and collected and his courage had not deserted him. Taking a moment to rest, he seemed to hear voices calling him. Otsu? Jotaro? He knew it couldn't be Otsu. She was not the kind to lose control of herself and chase after him at a time like this. She knew him too well for that. Still, he couldn't rid himself of the notion that he was being beckoned. He looked back several times, hoping to see someone. The thought that he might be having delusions was unnerving. But he couldn't afford to waste any more time. Being late would not only mean breaking his promise, but put him at a considerable disadvantage. For a lone warrior attempting to take on an army of opponents, the ideal time, he surmised, was the brief interval after the moon had set but before the sky was completely light. He recalled the old saying, It is easy to crush an enemy outside oneself, but impossible to defeat an enemy within. He had vowed to expel Otsu from his thoughts, and even bluntly told her this as she had clung to his sleeve yet he seemed unable to shake her voice from his mind. He cursed softly. I'm acting like a woman. A man on a man's mission has no business thinking about frivolities like love. He spurred himself on, running as fast as he could. Then all at once he caught sight, below him, of a white ribbon rising from the foot of the mountain through the bamboo and trees and fields, one of the roads to Ichijoji. He was only about four hundred yards from the point where it met with the other two roads. Through the milky mist he could make out the branches of the great spreading pine. He dropped to his knees, his body tense. Even the trees around him seemed transformed into potential enemies. As nimbly as a lizard, he left the path and made his way to a point directly above the pine tree. A gust of cold wind swept down from the mountaintop pushing the mist in a great rolling wave over the pine trees and bamboo. The branches of the spreading pine quivered, as though to warn the world of impending disaster. Straining his eyes, he could just discern the figures of ten men standing perfectly still around the pine tree, their lances poised. The presence of others elsewhere on the mountain he could feel, even though he couldn't see them. Musashi knew he had now entered the province of death. A feeling of awe brought goose pimples even to the backs of his hands, but his breathing was deep and steady. 
Down to the tips of his toes, he was keyed for action. As he crept slowly forward, his toes gripped the ground with the strength and sureness of fingers. A stone embankment that might once have been part of a fortress was nearby. On an impulse, he made his way among the rocks to the eminence on which it had stood. There he found a stone tori looking straight down on the spreading pine. Behind it was the sacred precinct, protected by rows of tall evergreens, among which he could see a shrine building. Though he had no idea which deity was honored here, he ran through the grove to the shrine gate and knelt before it. With death so near, he could not keep his heart from trembling at the thought of the sacred presence. The shrine was dark inside, save for a holy lamp swaying in the wind, threatening to expire, then miraculously recapturing its full brightness. The plaque above the door read, Hachidai Shrine. Musashi took comfort from the thought that he had a powerful ally that if he charged down the mountain, the god of war would be behind him. The gods, he knew, always supported the side that was right. He recalled how the great Nobunaga, on his way to the Battle of Okehazama, had paused to pay his respects at the Atsuta Shrine. The discovery of this holy place seemed felicitous indeed. Just inside the gate was a stone basin, where supplicants could cleanse themselves before praying. He rinsed out his mouth, then took a second mouthful and sprayed water on the hilt of his sword and the cords of his sandals. Thus purified, he hitched up his sleeves with a leather thong and tied on a cotton headband. Flexing his leg muscles as he walked, he went to the steps of the shrine and put his hand on the rope hanging from the gong above the entrance. In time-honored fashion, he was about to give the gong a rap and say a prayer to the deity. Catching himself, he quickly withdrew his hand. What am I doing? he thought in horror. The rope, plated with red and white cotton cord, seemed to be inviting him to take hold of it, sound the gong, and make his supplication. He stared at it. What was I going to request? he asked himself. What need have I of the help of the gods? Am I not already one with the universe? Haven't I always said I must be prepared to face death at any time? Haven't I trained myself to face death calmly and confidently? He was appalled. Without thinking, without remembering his years of training and self-discipline, he had been on the brink of begging for supernatural assistance. Something was wrong, for deep down he knew that the samurai's true ally was not the gods but death itself. Last night and earlier this morning, he had felt confident that he had come to terms with his fate. And yet there he was, within a hairbreadth of forgetting all he had ever learned, beseeching aid from the deity. Head drooped in shame, he stood there like a rock. What a fool I am! I thought I'd achieve purity and enlightenment, but there is still within me something that longs to go on living. Some delusion stirring up thoughts of Otsu or my sister. Some false hope leading me to clutch at any straw. A diabolical yearning causing me to forget myself, tempting me to pray to the gods for help. He was disgusted, exasperated, with his body, with his soul, with his failure to master the way. The tears he had held back in Otsu's presence poured from his eyes. It was all unconscious. I had no intention of praying, hadn't even thought of what I was going to pray for. But if I'm doing things unconsciously, that makes it all the worse. Racked by doubt, he felt foolish and inadequate. Had he ever had the ability to become a warrior in the first place? If he had achieved the state of calm he had aspired to, there should have been no need, not even a subconscious need, for prayers or supplications. In one shattering moment, only minutes before the battle, he had discovered in his heart the true seeds of defeat. It was impossible now to regard his approaching death as the culmination of a samurai's life, in the next breath, 
A surge of gratitude swept over him. The presence and magnanimity of the deity enveloped him. The battle had not yet begun. The real test still lay before him. He had been warned in time. By recognizing his failure, he had overcome it. Doubt vanished. The deity had guided him to this place to teach him this. While believing sincerely in the gods, he did not consider it the way of the samurai to seek their aid. The way was an ultimate truth transcending gods and Buddhas. Stepping back a pace, he folded his hands and, rather than ask for protection, thanked the gods for their timely help. After a quick bow, he hurried out of the shrine compound and down the narrow, steep path, the sort of path which a heavy downpour would quickly convert into a rushing stream. Pebbles and brittle clumps of dirt tumbled down at his heels, breaking the silence. When the spreading pine came into view again, he leaped off the path and crouched in the bushes. Not a drop of dew had yet fallen from the leaves, and his knees and chest were soon drenched. The pine tree was no more than forty or fifty paces below him. He could see the man with the musket in its branches. His anger flashed. Cowards, he said almost out loud. All this against one man. In a way, he felt a little sorry for an enemy who had to go to such extremes. Still, he had expected something like this and was, in so far as possible, prepared for it. Since they would naturally assume that he was not alone, prudence would dictate that they have at least one flying weapon, and probably more. If they were also using short bows, the archers were probably hidden behind rocks or on lower ground. Musashi had one great advantage. Both the man in the tree and the men underneath it had their backs to him. Stooping so low that the hilt of his sword rose above his head, he crept, almost crawled forward. Then he covered about twenty paces at a dead run. The musketeer twisted his head around and spotted him and shouted, There he is! Musashi ran on another ten paces, knowing that the man would have to reverse his position to aim and fire. Where? cried the men nearest the tree. Behind you! came the throat-splitting reply. The musketeer had his weapon trained on Musashi's head. While sparks from the fuse showered down, Musashi's right elbow described an arc in the air. The rock he hurled hit the fuse squarely with terrific force. The musketeer's scream mingled with the sound of cracking branches as he plunged to the ground. In an instant, Musashi's name was on every man's lips. Not one of them had taken the trouble to think the situation through— to imagine that he might devise a means of attacking the central core first. Their confusion was all but total. In their rush to reorient themselves, the ten men bumped into each other, got their weapons tangled, tripped each other with their lances, and otherwise displayed a perfect picture of disorder, all the while screaming at each other not to let Musashi escape. Just as they sorted themselves out and began to form a semicircle, they were challenged— I am Miyamoto Musashi, the son of Shinmen Munisai of Mimasaka province. I have come in accordance with our agreement made the day before yesterday at Yanagimachi. Genjiro, are you there? I beg you not to be careless like Seijiro and Denshiro before you. I understand that, because of your youth, you have several score men to support you. I, Musashi, have come alone. Your men may attack individually or in a group as they wish. Now, fight! Another total surprise. No one expected Musashi to deliver a formal challenge. Even those who would desperately have liked to reply in kind lacked the necessary composure. Musashi, you're late! cried a hoarse voice. Many took encouragement from Musashi's declaration that he was alone, but Genzaimon and Jurozaimon, believing it was a trick, started looking around for phantom seconds. A loud twang off to one side was followed a split second later by the glint of Musashi's sword flashing through the air. The arrow aimed at his face broke, half falling behind his shoulder, the other half near the tip of his lowered sword. 
or rather where his sword had just been, for Musashi was already on the move. His hair bristling like a lion's mane, he was bounding toward the shadowy form behind the spreading pine. Genjiro hugged the trunk, screaming, Help! I'm scared! Genzaemon jumped forward, howling as though the blow had struck him, but he was too late. Musashi's sword sliced a two-foot strip of bark off the trunk. It fell to the ground by Genjiro's blood-covered head. It was the act of a ferocious demon. Musashi, ignoring the others, had made straight for the boy, and it seemed he had had this in mind from the beginning. The assault was of a savagery beyond conception. Genjiro's death did not reduce the Yoshioka's fighting capacity in the slightest. What had been nervous excitement rose to the level of murderous frenzy. Beast! screamed Genzaemon, face livid with grief and rage. He rushed headlong at Musashi, wielding a sword somewhat too heavy for a man of his age. Musashi shifted his right heel back a foot or so, leaned aside and struck upward, grazing Genzaemon's elbow and face with the tip of his sword. It was impossible to tell who wailed, for at that moment a man attacking Musashi from the rear with a lance stumbled forward and fell on top of the old man. The next instant, a third swordsman, coming from the front, was sliced from shoulder to navel. His head sagged and his arms went limp as his legs carried his lifeless body forward a few more steps. The other men near the tree screamed their lungs out, but the calls for help were lost in the wind and trees. Their comrades were too far away to hear and couldn't have seen what happened, even if they'd been looking toward the pine tree instead of watching the roads. The spreading pine had been standing for hundreds of years. It had witnessed the retreat of the defeated Taira troops from Kyoto to Omi in the wars of the twelfth century. Innumerable were the times it had seen the warrior priests of Mount Hiei descend on the capital to put pressure on the imperial court. Whether out of gratitude for the fresh blood seeping through to its roots, or out of anguish over the carnage, its branches stirred in the misty wind and scattered drops of cold dew on the men beneath. The wind gave rise to a medley of sounds from the branches, from the swaying bamboo, from the mist, from the tall grass. Musashi took a stance with his back against the tree trunk, whose girth could hardly be spanned by two men with outstretched arms. The tree made an ideal shield for his rear, but he seemed to consider it hazardous to stay there long. As his eye traveled down the top edge of his sword and fastened on his opponents, his brain reviewed the terrain, searched for a better position. Go to the spreading pine! The pine tree! The fighting's there! The shout came from the top of the rise from which Sasaki Kojiro had chosen to view the spectacle. Then came a deafening report from the musket, and at last the samurai of the house of Yoshioka grasped what was going on. Swarming like bees, they left their hiding places and hurtled toward the crossroads. Musashi slipped deftly sideways, the bullet lodged in the tree trunk inches from his head. On guard, the seven men facing him edged around a couple of feet to compensate for his change in position. Without warning, Musashi darted toward the man at the extreme left, his sword held at eye level. The man, Kobashi Kurando, one of the Yoshioka Ten, was taken completely by surprise. With a low cry of dismay, he whirled on one foot, but he was not quick enough to escape the blow to his side. Musashi, sword still extended, continued running straight ahead. Don't let him get away! The other six rushed after him, but the attack had again thrown them into perilous disarray, all coordination lost. In a flash, Musashi spun around, striking laterally at the nearest man, Mike Jurozaemon. Experienced swordsman that he was, Jurozaemon had anticipated this and left some play in his legs so that he was able to quickly move backward. The tip of Musashi's sword barely grazed his chest. Musashi's use of his weapon differed from that of the ordinary swordsman of his time. By normal techniques, if the first blow did not connect, the force of the sword was spent in the air. It was necessary to bring the blade back before striking again. This was too slow for Musashi. 
Whenever he struck laterally, there was a return blow. A slice to the right was followed in essentially the same motion by a return strike to the left. His blade created two streaks of light, the pattern very much like two pine needles joined at one end. The unexpected return stroke slashed upward through Judo Zaimon's face, turning his head into a large red tomato. Not having studied under a teacher, Musashi found himself occasionally at a disadvantage, but there were also times when he had profited from this. One of his strengths was that he had never been pressed into the mold of any particular school. From the orthodox point of view, his style had no discernible form, no rules, no secret techniques. Created by his own imagination and his own needs, it was hard to define or categorize. To an extent, he could be challenged effectively using conventional styles if his opponent was highly skilled. Judo Zaemon had not anticipated Musashi's tactic. Anyone adept at the Yoshioka style, or for that matter, at any of the other Kyoto styles, would probably have been taken unawares in similar fashion. If, following through on his fatal blow to Judo Zaemon, Musashi had charged the motley group that remained around the tree, he would certainly have slain several more of them in short order. Instead, he ran toward the crossroads. But then, just as they thought he was about to flee, he suddenly turned and attacked again. By the time they had regrouped to defend themselves, he was gone again. Musashi! Coward! Fight like a man! We're not through with you yet! The usual imprecations filled the air as furious eyes threatened to pop out of their sockets. The men were drunk on the sight and smell of blood, as drunk as if they had swallowed a storehouse full of sake. The sight of blood, which makes a brave man cooler, has the opposite effect on cowards. These men were like goblins surfacing from a lake of gore. Leaving the shouts behind him, Musashi reached the crossroads and plunged immediately into the narrowest of the three paths of exit, the one leading toward the Shugakuin. Coming helter-skelter from the opposite direction were the men who had been stationed along the path. Before he had gone forty paces, Musashi saw the first man in this contingent. By the ordinary laws of physics, he would soon be trapped between these men and those pursuing him. In fact, when the two forces collided, he was no longer there. Musashi, where are you? He came this way, I saw him. He must have. He's not here. Musashi's voice broke through the confused babble. Here I am. He jumped from the shadow of a rock to the middle of the road behind the returning samurai so that he had them all to one side. Dumbfounded by this lightning change of position, the Yoshioka men moved on him as rapidly as they could, but in the narrow path they could not concentrate their strength. Considering the space needed to swing a sword, it would have been dangerous for even two of them to try to move forward abreast. The man nearest Musashi stumbled backward, pushing the man behind him back into the oncoming group. For a time, they all floundered about helplessly, legs clumsily entwined. But mobs do not give up easily. Though frightened by Musashi's speed and ferocity, the men soon gained confidence in their collective strength. With a stirring roar, they moved forward, again convinced that no single swordsman was a match for all of them. Musashi fought like a swimmer battling giant waves. Striking once, then retreating a step or two, he had to give more attention to his defense than to his attack. He even refrained from cutting down men who stumbled into range and were easy prey, both because their loss would only result in meager gains and because, if he missed, he would have been exposed to the thrusts of the enemy's lances. It was possible to judge the range of a sword accurately, but not that of a lance. As he continued his slow retreat, his attackers pressed on relentlessly. His face was bluish-white. It seemed inconceivable that he was breathing adequately. The Yoshioka men hoped that he would eventually stumble on a tree root or trip on a rock. At the same time, none of them was eager to get too close to a man fighting desperately for his life. 
The nearest of the swords and lances pressing in on him were always two or three inches short of their target. The tumult was punctuated by the whinnying of a pack horse. People were up and about in the nearby hamlet. This was the hour when early rising priests passed by on their way to and from the top of Mount Hie, clopping along on raised wooden sandals, their shoulders proudly squared. As the battle progressed, woodcutters and farmers joined the priests on the road to witness the spectacle, and then excited cries set up an answering response from every chicken and horse in the village. A crowd of bystanders collected around the shrine where Musashi had prepared for battle. The wind had dropped, and the mist descended again like a thick white veil. Then all of a sudden it lifted, giving the spectators a clear view. During the few minutes of fighting, Musashi's appearance had changed completely. His hair was matted and gory. Blood mixed with sweat had dyed his headband pink. He looked like the devil incarnate, charging up from hell. He was breathing with his whole body, his shield-like chest heaving like a volcano. A rip in his hakama exposed the wound on his left knee. The white ligaments visible at the bottom of the gash were like seeds in a split pomegranate. There was also a cut on his forearm, which, though not serious, had spattered blood from his chest to the small sword in his obi. His whole kimono appeared to have been tie-dyed with a crimson design. Onlookers who had a clear view of him covered their eyes in horror. More ghastly still was the sight of the dead and wounded left in his wake. As he continued his tactical retreat up the path, he reached a patch of open land where his pursuers surged forward in a mass attack. In a matter of seconds, four or five men had been cut down. They lay scattered over a wide area, moribund testimony to the speed with which Musashi struck and moved on. He seemed to be everywhere at once. But for all his agile shifts and dodges, Musashi clung to one basic strategy. He never attacked a group from the front or the side, always obliquely at an exposed corner. Whenever a battery of samurai approached him head-on, he somehow contrived to shift like lightning to a corner of their formation, from which he could confront only one or two of them at a time. In this way, he managed to keep them in essentially the same position. But eventually, Musashi was bound to be worn down. Eventually, too, his opponents seemed bound to find a way to thwart his method of attack. To do this, they would need to form themselves into two large forces, before and behind him. Then he would be in even greater danger. It took all Musashi's resourcefulness to stop that from happening. At some point, Musashi drew his smaller sword and started to fight with both hands. While the large sword in his right hand was smeared with blood up to the hilt and the fist that held it, the small sword in his left hand was clean. And though it picked up a bit of flesh the first time it was used, it continued to sparkle, greedy for blood. Musashi himself was not yet fully aware that he had drawn it, even though he was wielding it with the same deftness as the larger sword. When not actually striking, he held the left sword so that it was pointed directly at his opponent's eyes. The right sword extended out to the side, forming a broad horizontal arc with his elbow and shoulder, and was largely outside the enemy's line of vision. If the opponent moved to Musashi's right, he could bring the right sword into play. If the attacker moved the other way, Musashi could shift the small sword in to his left and trap him between the two swords. By thrusting forward, he could pin the man in one place with the larger sword and, before there was time to dodge, attack with the larger sword. In later years, this method came to be formally named the two-sword technique against a large force, but at this moment he was fighting by pure instinct. By all accepted standards, Musashi was not a great sword technician. Schools, styles theories, traditions, none of these meant anything to him. His mode of fighting was completely pragmatic. What he knew was only what he had learned from experience. He wasn't putting theory into practice. He fought first and theorized later. The Yoshioka men, from the Ten Swordsmen on down, 
had all had the theories of the Kyohachi style pounded thoroughly into their skulls. Some of them had even gone on to create stylistic variations of their own. Despite being highly trained and highly disciplined fighters, they had no way of gauging a swordsman like Musashi, who had spent his time as an ascetic in the mountains, exposing himself to the dangers presented by nature as often as to those presented by man. To the Yoshioka men, it was incomprehensible that Musashi, with his breathing so erratic, face ashen, eyes bleary with sweat and body covered with gore, was still able to wield two swords and threaten to make short work of anyone who came within range. But he fought on like a god of fire and fury. They themselves were dead tired, and their attempts to pin down this bloody specter were becoming hysterical. All at once, the tumult increased. Run! cried a thousand voices. You, fighting by yourself, run! Run while you can! The shouts came from the mountains, the trees, the white clouds above. Spectators on all sides saw the Yoshioka forces actually closing in on Musashi. The impending peril moved them all to try to save him, if only with their voices. But their warnings made no impression. Musashi would not have noticed if the earth had split asunder or the heavens cast down crackling bolts of lightning. The uproar reached a crescendo, shaking the thirty-six peaks like an earthquake. It issued simultaneously from the spectators and the jostling throng of Yoshioka samurai. Musashi had finally taken off across the mountainside with the speed of a wild boar. In no time, five or six men were on his heels, trying desperately to get in a solid blow. Musashi, with a vicious howl, suddenly wheeled, crouched, and swung his sword sideways at shin level, stopping them in their tracks. One man brought his lance down from above, only to see it knocked into the air by a powerful counter-blow. They shrank back. Musashi swung fiercely with the left sword, then the right, then the left again. Moving like a combination of fire and water, he had his enemies reeling and cowering, tottering and stumbling in his wake. Then he was gone again. He had leapt from the open land across which the battle had been raging into a green field of barley below. Stop! Come back and fight! Two men in hot pursuit jumped blindly after Musashi. A second later, there were two death screams, two lances flying through the air and coming to rest upright in the middle of the field. Musashi was slithering like a great ball of mud through the far end of the field. Already a hundred yards away, he was rapidly widening the gap. He's going toward the village! He's heading for the main road! But in fact, he had crawled rapidly and invisibly up the far edge of the field and was now hidden in the woods above. He watched his pursuers dividing up to continue their chase in several directions. It was daylight, a sunny morning, much like any other. An Offering for the Dead When Oda Nobunaga finally lost patience with the priest's political machinations, he attacked the ancient Buddhist establishment on Mount Hiei, and in one horrendous night, all but a few of its three thousand temples and shrines had gone up in flames. Though four decades had passed, and the main hall and a number of secondary temples had been rebuilt, the memory of that night hung like a shroud over the mountain. The establishment was now stripped of its temporal powers, and the priests devoted their time once again to religious duties. Situated on the southernmost peak, commanding a view of the other temples and of Kyoto itself, was a small, secluded temple known as the Mudoji. It was rare for the stillness to be broken by any sound less peaceful than the rippling of a brook or the chirping of small birds. From the inner recesses of the temple came a masculine voice reciting the words of Kannon, the goddess of mercy, as revealed in the Lotus Sutra. The monotone would rise gradually for a time, then, as if the chanter had suddenly remembered himself, sink abruptly. 
Along the jet-black floor of the corridor walked a white-robed acolyte, carrying at eye level a tray on which had been placed the meager, meatless meal customarily served in religious establishments. Entering the room from which the voice was coming, he placed the tray in one corner, knelt politely, and said, Good day, sir. Leaning slightly forward, absorbed in his work, the guest did not hear the boy's greeting. Sir, said the acolyte, raising his voice slightly, I've brought your lunch. I'll leave it here in the corner if you wish. Oh, thank you, replied Musashi, straightening up. That's very kind of you. He turned and bowed. Would you like to eat now? Yes. Then I'll serve you your rice. Musashi accepted the bowl of rice and began eating. The acolyte stared first at the block of wood by Musashi's side, then at the small knife behind him. Chips and slivers of fragrant white sandalwood lay scattered about. What are you carving? he asked. It's to be a sacred image. The Buddha Amida? No. Kannon. Unfortunately, I don't know anything about sculpture. I seem to be cutting my hands more than the wood. He held out a couple of well-nicked fingers as evidence, but the boy seemed more interested in the white bandage round his forearm. How are your wounds? he asked. Thanks to the good treatment I've received here, they're about healed now. Please tell the head priest I am very grateful. If you're carving an image of Kannon, you should visit the main hall. There's a statue of Kannon by a very famous sculptor. If you'd like, I'll take you there. It's not far, only half a mile or so. Delighted by the offer, Musashi finished his meal, and the two of them started for the main hall. Musashi had not been outdoors in the ten days since he'd arrived covered with blood and using his sword as a cane. He'd barely begun to walk when he discovered his wounds were not so thoroughly healed as he had thought. His left knee ached, and the breeze, though light and cool, seemed to cut into the gash on his arm. But it was pleasant outside. Blossoms falling from the gently swaying cherry trees danced in the air like snowflakes. The sky showed signs of the azure hue of early summer. Musashi's muscles swelled as if they were buds about to burst open. Sir, you're studying the martial arts, aren't you? That's right. Then why are you carving an image of Kannon? Musashi did not answer immediately. Instead of carving, wouldn't it be better to spend your time practicing swordsmanship? The question pained Musashi more than his wounds. The acolyte was about the same age as Genjiro, and about the same size. How many men had been killed or wounded on that fateful day? He could only guess. He had no clear memory even of how he had extricated himself from the fighting and found a place to hide. The only two things that struck quite clearly in his mind, haunting him in his sleep, were Genjiro's terrified scream and the sight of his mutilated body. He thought again, as he had several times in the past few days, of the resolution in his notebook. He would do nothing that he would later regret. If he took the view that what he had done was inherent in the way of the sword, a bramble lying on his chosen path, then he would have to assume that his future would be bleak and inhuman. In the peaceful atmosphere of the temple, his mind had cleared. And once the memory of spilt blood and gore began to fade, he was overcome by grief for the boy he had slaughtered. His mind coming back to the acolyte's question, he said, Isn't it true that great priests like Kobo Daishi and Genshin made lots of images of the Buddha and Bodhisattvas? I understand quite a few statues here on Mount Hiei were carved by priests. What do you think of that? Cocking his head, the boy said uncertainly, I'm not sure, but priests do make religious paintings and statues. Let me tell you why. It's because by painting a picture or carving an image of the Buddha, they draw closer to him. A swordsman can purify his spirit in the same way. We human beings all look up at the same moon, 
but there are many roads we may travel to reach the top of the peak nearest it. Sometimes, when we lose our way, we decide to try someone else's, but the ultimate aim is to find fulfillment in life. Musashi paused, as though he might have more to say, but the acolyte ran ahead and pointed to a rock almost hidden in the grass. Look, he said, this inscription is by Jichin. He was a priest, a famous one. Musashi read the words carved on the moss-covered stone. The water of the law will presently run shallow. At the very end, a cold, bleak wind will blow on the barren peaks of Hie. He was impressed by the writer's powers of prophecy. The wind on Mount Hie had indeed been cold and bleak since Nobunaga's merciless raid. There were rumors that some of the clergy longed for the old days, for a powerful army, political influence, and special privileges, and it was a fact that they never selected a new abbot without a lot of intrigue and ugly internal conflict. While the holy mountain was dedicated to the salvation of the sinful, it actually depended on the alms and donations of the sinful for its survival. Altogether, not a very happy state of affairs, mused Musashi. Let's go, said the boy impatiently. As they started to walk on, one of the priests from the Mudoji came running after them. Senin, he called to the boy. Where are you going? To the main hall. He wants to see a statue of Kanon. Couldn't you take him some other time? Forgive me for bringing the boy with me when he probably has work to do, said Musashi. By all means, take him back with you. I can go to the main hall any time. I didn't come for him. I'd like you to come back with me, if you don't mind. Me? Yes, I'm sorry to bother you, but... Has somebody come looking for me? Asked Musashi, not at all surprised. Well, yes. I told them you weren't in, but they said they'd just seen you with Seinen. They insisted I come and get you. On the way back to the Mudoji... Musashi asked the priest who his visitors were and learned that they were from the Sannoin, another of the subsidiary temples. There were about ten of them, dressed in black robes and wearing brown headbands. Their angry faces might well have belonged to the dreaded warrior priests of old, a haughty race of bullies in clerical robes who had had their wings clipped but apparently had rebuilt their nest. Those who had failed to profit from Nobunaga's lesson swaggered about with great swords at their sides, lording it over others, calling themselves scholars of the Buddhist law, but being, in fact, intellectual ruffians. There he is, said one. Him? asked another contemptuously. They stared with undisguised hostility. A burly priest, motioning to Musashi's guides with his lance, said, Thanks. You're not needed. Go inside the temple. Then, very gruffly, Are you Miyamoto Musashi? There was no courtesy in the words. Musashi replied curtly, without bowing. Another priest, appearing from behind the first, declaimed, as though reading from a text, I shall convey to you the decision handed down by the tribunal of the Enryakuji. It is this. Mount Hie is a pure and sacred precinct, which must not be used as a haven by those who harbor enmities and grudges, nor can it be offered as a refuge to base men who have engaged in dishonorable conflict. The Mudoji has been instructed to send you away from the mountain immediately. If you disobey, you shall be strictly punished in accordance with the laws of the monastery. I shall do as the monastery directs. Musashi replied in a mild tone. But since it is well past midday, and I've made no preparations, I should like to ask that you permit me to stay until tomorrow morning. Also, I'd like to inquire whether this decision came from the civil authorities or from the clergy itself. The Mudoji reported my arrival. I was told there was no objection to my staying. I don't understand why this has changed so suddenly. If you really want to know the first priest replied. I'll tell you. At first, we were glad to extend our hospitality because you fought alone against a large number of men. Later, however, we received bad reports concerning you, 
which forced us to reconsider. We decided we could no longer afford to provide refuge for you. Bad reports, Musashi thought resentfully. He might have expected that. It required no stretch of the imagination to guess that the Yoshioka school would be vilifying him all over Kyoto. But he saw no point in trying to defend himself. Very well, he said coldly. I shall leave tomorrow morning without fail. As he entered the temple gate, the priests started to malign him. Look at him, the evil wretch! He's a monster! Monster? Simple-minded is what he is! Turning and glaring at the men, Musashi asked sharply, What did you say? Oh, you heard, did you? asked the priest defiantly. Yes, and there's one thing I would like you to know. I'll comply with the wishes of the priesthood, but I'm not going to put up with abuse from the likes of you. Are you looking for a fight? As servants of the Buddha, we do not pick fights, came the sanctimonious reply. I opened my mouth, and the words came out naturally. It must be the voice of heaven, said another priest. The next instant, they were all around Musashi, cursing, taunting, even spitting at him. He wasn't sure how long he'd be able to restrain himself. Despite the power the warrior priests had lost, these latter-day embodiments had lost none of their arrogance. Look at him, sneered one of the priests. From what the villagers said, I thought he was a self-respecting samurai. Now I see he's only a brainless oaf. He doesn't get angry. He doesn't even know how to speak on his own behalf. The longer Musashi remained silent, the more viciously the tongues wagged. Finally, his face reddening slightly, he said, Didn't you say something about the voice of heaven speaking through a man? Yes. What of it? Are you suggesting heaven has spoken out against me? You've heard our decision. Don't you understand yet? No. I guess you wouldn't. Having no more sense than you do, you deserve to be pitied. But I dare say in the next life you'll come to your senses. When Musashi said nothing, the priest continued. You'd better be careful after you leave the mountain. Your reputation is nothing to be proud of. What does it matter what people say? Listen to him. He still thinks he's right. What I did was right. I did nothing base or cowardly in my fight with the Yoshiokas. You're talking nonsense. Did I do anything to be ashamed of? Name one thing. You have the gall to say that? I'm warning you. I'll overlook other things, but I won't permit anyone to belittle my sword. Very well. See if you can answer one question. We know you put up a brave fight against overwhelming odds. We admire your brute strength. We praise your courage in holding out against so many men. But why did you murder a boy only thirteen years old? How could you be so inhuman as to slaughter a mere child? Musashi's face turned pale. His body suddenly felt weak. The priest went on. After he lost his arm, Seijudo became a priest. Denshijiro you killed outright. Genjiro was the only person left to succeed them. By murdering him, you put an end to the house of Yoshioka. Even if it was done in the name of the way of the samurai, it was cruel, dastardly. You're not good enough to be described as a monster or a demon. Do you consider yourself human? Do you imagine you should be ranked as a samurai? Do you even belong in this great land of the cherry blossoms? No! And this is why the priesthood is expelling you. Whatever the circumstances, slaying the child is unforgivable. A real samurai would commit no crime like that. The stronger a samurai is, the gentler and more considerate he is to the weak. A samurai understands and practices compassion. Now go away from here, Miyamoto Musashi, as fast as you can. Mount Hiei rejects you. Their anger spent, the priests marched off in a body. Though he'd borne this last torrent of abuse silently, it wasn't because he had no answer to their charges. Whatever they say, I was right, he thought. I did the only thing I could to protect my convictions, which are not mistaken.
He honestly believed in the validity of his principles and in the necessity of upholding them. Once the Yoshiokas had set Genjiro up as their standard bearer, there had been no alternative to killing him. He was their general. So long as he lived, the Yoshioka school would remain undefeated. Musashi could have killed ten, twenty, or thirty men, but unless Genjiro died, the survivors would always claim victory. Killing the boy first made Musashi the victor, even if he'd later been killed in the fighting. By the laws of swordsmanship, there was no flaw in this logic, and to Musashi, those laws were absolute. Nevertheless, the memory of Genjiro disturbed him profoundly, giving rise to doubt, grief, and pain. The cruelty of his act was repellent, even to himself. Should I throw away my sword and live like an ordinary man? he asked himself, not for the first time. In the clear, early evening sky, the white petals of the cherry blossoms fell randomly, like flakes of snow leaving the trees looking as vulnerable as he now felt, vulnerable to doubts about whether he should not change his way of life. If I give up the sword, I could live with Otsu, he thought. But then he remembered the easy-going lives of the Kyoto townspeople and the world inhabited by Koetsu and Shoyu. That's not for me, he said decisively. He went through the gate and entered his room. Seated by the lamp, he took up his half-finished work and began carving rapidly. It was vitally important to finish the statue. Whether the craftsmanship was expert or not, he wanted desperately to leave something here to comfort the spirit of the departed Genjiro. The lamp dimmed. He trimmed the wick. In the dead stillness of evening, the sound of tiny chips falling on the tatami was audible. His concentration was total, his whole being focused with perfect intensity on the point of contact with the wood. Once he had set himself a task, it was his nature to lose himself in it until it was completed, unmindful of boredom or fatigue. The tones of the sutra rose and fell. After each trimming of the wick, he resumed his work with an air of devotion and reverence, like the ancient sculptors who were said to have bowed three times to the Buddha before picking up their chisels to carve an image. His own statue of Kannon would be like a prayer for Genjiro's happiness in the next life and, in a sense, a humble apology to his own soul. Finally, he mumbled, I guess this will do. As he straightened up and examined the statue, the bell in the eastern pagoda sounded the second watch of the night which began at ten o'clock. It's getting late, he thought, and left immediately to pay his respects to the head priest and ask him to take custody of the statue. The image was roughly carved, but he had put his soul into it, weeping tears of repentance as he prayed for the dead boy's spirit. No sooner was he out of the room than Seinen came in to sweep the floor. When the room was again tidy, he laid out Musashi's pallet and broom over shoulder, sauntered back to the kitchen. Unknown to Musashi, while he was still carving, a cat-like figure had crept into the mudoji, through doors that were never locked, and onto the veranda. After Seinen was out of sight, the shoji onto the veranda slid silently open and just as silently shut. Musashi returned with his going-away presence, a basket, hat, and a pair of straw sandals. Placing them beside his pillow, he extinguished the lamp and crawled into bed. The outer doors were open, and a breeze blew softly through the corridors. There was just enough moonlight to give the white paper of the shoji a dull gray hue. Tree shadows swayed gently, like waves on a calm, open sea. He snored softly breathing more slowly as he sank deeper into sleep. Silently, the edge of a small screen in the corner shifted forward, and a dark figure crawled stealthily out on hands and knees. The snoring halted, and the black form quickly spread itself flat on the floor. Then, as the breathing steadied, the intruder advanced inch by inch, 
patiently, cautiously, coordinating his movements with the rhythmical breathing. All at once, the shadow rose like a cloud of black floss and descended on Musashi, crying, No, I'll teach you! A short sword swept toward Musashi's neck, but the weapon clattered to one side as the black form flew back through the air and landed with a crash against the shoji. The invader emitted one loud wail before tumbling, along with the shoji, into the darkness outside. At the instant Musashi made his throw, it crossed his mind that the person in his hands was as light as a kitten. Though the face had been swathed in cloth, he thought he had caught a glimpse of white hair. Without pausing to analyze these impressions, he grabbed his sword and ran out onto the veranda. Stop! he shouted. Since you've gone to the trouble of coming here, give me a chance to greet you properly. Leaping to the ground, he ran swiftly toward the sound of retreating footsteps. But his heart was not in it. After a few seconds, he stopped and watched laughingly as some priests disappeared into the darkness. Osugi, after her bone-jarring landing, lay on the ground groaning with pain. Why, Granny, it's you! he exclaimed, surprised that his attacker was neither a Yoshioka man nor one of the irate priests. He put his arm around her to help her up. Now I begin to understand, he said. You're the one who told the priests a lot of bad things about me, aren't you? And since the story came from a courageous, upright old lady, they believed every word of it, I suppose. Oh, my back hurts! Osugi neither confirmed nor denied his accusation. She squirmed a bit, but lacked the strength to put up much resistance. Feebly, she said, Musashi, since it's come to this, it's no use worrying about right and wrong. The house of Hongiden has been unlucky in war, so just cut off my head now. It seemed unlikely to Musashi that she was merely being dramatic. Hers sounded like the honest words of a woman who had gone as far as she could and wanted to put an end to it. Are you in pain? he asked, refusing to take her seriously. Where does it hurt? You can stay here tonight, so there's nothing to worry about. He lifted her in his arms, carried her inside, and laid her on his pallet. Sitting by her side, he nursed her through the night. When the sky lightened, Sinan brought the lunchbox Musashi had requested, along with a message from the head priest, who, while apologizing for being rude, urged Musashi to be on his way as quickly as possible. Musashi sent word explaining that he now had an ailing old woman on his hands. The priest, not wanting Osugi at the temple, offered a suggestion. It seemed that a merchant from the town of Otsu had come to the temple with a cow and left the animal in the head priest's care while he went off on a side trip. The priest offered Musashi the use of the animal, saying that Musashi could let the woman ride it down the mountain. In Otsu, the cow could be left at the wharf or at one of the wholesale houses in the vicinity. Musashi accepted the offer gratefully. A Drink of Milk The road descending along a ridge from Mount Hie came out in Omi province, at a point just beyond the Miidera. Musashi was leading the cow by a rope. Looking over his shoulder, he said gently, If you want, we can stop and rest. It's not as though either of us is in a hurry. But at least, he thought, they were on their way. Osugi, unused to cows, had at first flatly refused to get on the animal. It had taken all his ingenuity to persuade her, the argument that worked being that she could not remain indefinitely in a priestly bastion of celibacy. Face down on a cow's neck, Osugi groaned painfully and readjusted herself. At every sign of solicitude on Musashi's part, she reminded herself of her hatred, silently conveying her contempt at being cared for by her mortal enemy. Though he was well aware that she lived for no other reason than to take revenge on him, he found himself unable to regard her as a genuine foe. No one, not even enemies much stronger than she was, had ever caused him so much trouble or embarrassment. Her trickery had brought him to the brink of disaster in his own village, 
Because of her, he had been jeered and reviled at Kiyomizudera. Time and again she had tripped him up and thwarted his plans. There had been times, such as the previous night, when he had cursed her and very nearly given in to the urge to slice her in two. Still, he could not bring himself to lay a hand on her, especially now, when she was ailing and bereft of her customary verve. Oddly, the inactivity of her vicious tongue depressed him, and he longed to see her restored to health, even if this meant more trouble for him. Riding that way must be pretty uncomfortable, he said. Try to bear up a little longer. When we get to Otsu, I'll think of something. The view to the northeast was magnificent. Lake Biwa was spread out placidly below them, Mount Ibuki was just beyond, and the peaks of Echizen rose in the distance. On the near side of the lake, Musashi could make out each of the famous eight views of Karasaki in the village of Seta. Let's stop for a while, he said. You'll feel better if you get off and lie down for a few minutes. Tying the animal to a tree, he put his arms around her and lifted her down. Face down on the ground, Osugi pushed his hands away and let out a groan. Her face was feverishly hot and her hair was a mess. Don't you want some water? Musashi asked, not for the first time, rubbing her on the back. You should eat something, too. She shook her head stubbornly. You haven't drunk a drop of water since last night, he said pleadingly. If you keep this up, you'll just make yourself worse. I'd like to get some medicine for you, but there aren't any houses around here. Look, why don't you eat half of my lunch? How disgusting! Huh? I'd rather die in some field and get eaten by the birds. I'd never sink so low as to accept food from an enemy. She shook his hands off her back and clutched at the grass. Wondering if she would ever get over her basic misunderstanding, he treated her as tenderly as he would his own mother, patiently trying to soothe her each time she lashed out at him. Now, Granny, you know you don't want to die. You've got to live. Don't you want to see Matahachi make something of himself? She bared her teeth and snarled. What's that got to do with you? Matahachi will get ahead one of these days without your help, thank you. I'm sure he will, but you must get well so that you yourself can encourage him. You hypocrite, the old woman screamed. You're wasting your time if you think you can flatter me into forgetting how much I hate you. Realizing that anything he said would be taken the wrong way, Musashi stood up and walked away. He chose a spot behind a rock and began eating his lunch of rice balls stuffed with a dark Swedish bean paste and individually wrapped in oak leaves. Half of them he left uneaten. Hearing voices, he looked around the rock and saw a country woman talking with Osugi. She was dressed in the hakama worn by the women of Ohara, and her hair hung down around her shoulders. In stentorian tones, she was saying, I've got this sick person at my place. She's better now, but she'd recover even quicker if I could give her some milk. May I milk the cow? Osugi lifted her face and looked at the woman inquiringly. We don't have many cows where I come from. Can you actually get milk from her? The two exchanged a few more words as the woman squatted down and began squirting milk into a sake jar. When it was full, she stood up, clutching it tightly in her arms, and said, Thanks, I'll be going now. Wait, cried Osugi in a raspy voice. She stretched out her arms and glanced around to make sure Musashi was not watching. Give me some milk first. Just a sip or two will be enough. The woman watched, astonished, as Osugi put the jar to her lips, closed her eyes, and gulped greedily, dribbling milk down her chin. When she was through, Osugi shuddered, then grimaced as though she might vomit. What a nasty taste, she whined. But maybe it'll make me better. It's awful, though, viler than medicine. Is something the matter? Are you sick? Nothing serious. Cold and a little fever. She stood up briskly, as though all her ailments had dropped away, 
and after again reassuring herself that Musashi wasn't looking, drew closer to the woman and asked in a low voice, If I go straight down this road, where will it take me? Just above the Midera. That's in Ōtsu, isn't it? Is there a back way I could take? Well, yes, but where do you want to go? I don't care. I just want to get away from that villain. About eight or nine hundred yards down this road, there's a path going off to the north. If you keep on that, you'll end up between Sakamoto and Ōtsu. If you meet a man looking for me, Osugi said furtively, don't tell him you saw me. She bumbled off like a lame praying mantis in a hurry, brushing clumsily past the woman. Musashi chuckled and came out from behind his rock. I suppose you live around here, he said amicably. Your husband, he's a farmer, woodcutter, something like that. The woman cowered, but answered, Oh, no, I'm from the inn at the top of the pass. So much the better. If I gave you some money, would you run an errand for me? I'd be glad to, but you see, there's this sick person at the inn. I could take the milk back for you and wait for you there. How would that be? If you go now, you should be back before dark. In that case, I guess I could go, but... Nothing to worry about. I'm not the villain the old woman said I am. I was only trying to help her. If she can get about on her own, there's no reason for me to worry about her. Now I'll just write a note. I want you to take it to the house of Lord Karasumaru Mitsuhiro. That's in the north part of the city. With the brush from his writing kit, he quickly scribbled the words he had been longing to write to Otsu during his recuperation at the Mudoji. Having entrusted this letter to the woman, he mounted the cow and lumbered off, repeating the words he had written and speculating on how Otsu would feel when she read them. And I thought I'd never see her again, he mumbled, suddenly coming to life. Considering how weak she was, he mused, she may be sick in bed again, but when she receives my letter, she'll get up and come as fast as she can, Jotaro too. He allowed the cow to proceed at her own pace, stopping from time to time to let her nibble grass. His letter to Otsu was simple, but he was rather pleased with it. At Hanada Bridge, it was you who waited. This time, let it be me. I've gone on ahead. I'll wait for you in Ōtsu, at Kara Bridge in the village of Seta. When we're together again, we'll talk of many things. He had tried to give the matter-of-fact message a poetic cast. He recited again to himself, pondering the many things they had to discuss. When he reached the inn, he got off the cow and, holding the jar of milk in both hands, called, Anybody here? As was usual in roadside establishments of this sort, there was an open area under the front eaves for travelers who stopped to have tea or a light meal. Inside was a tea room, a section of which formed the kitchen. Rooms for guests were in the rear. An old woman was putting wood into an earthen oven, on top of which was a wooden steamer. As he took a seat on a bench out front, she came and poured him a cup of lukewarm tea. He then explained himself and handed her the jar. What's this? she asked, eyeing him dubiously. Thinking that perhaps she was deaf, he slowly repeated what he had said. Milk, you say? Milk? What for? Still puzzled, she turned toward the interior and called, Sir, can you come out here a minute? I don't know what this is all about. What? A man ambled around the corner of the inn and asked, What's the trouble, ma'am? She thrust the jar into his hands, but he neither looked at it nor heard what she was saying. His eyes were glued on Musashi, his face a study in disbelief. Musashi, equally astounded, cried, Mataji! Takezo! The two rushed at each other, stopping just before they collided. When Musashi held out his arms, Matahachi did the same thing, letting go of the jar. How many years? Not since Sekigahara. That makes it... Five years. It must be. I'm twenty-two now. 
As they hugged each other, the sweet odor of the milk from the broken jar enveloped them, evoking the time when they had both been babes in arms. You've become very famous, Takezo. But I guess I shouldn't be calling you Takezo. I'll call you Musashi like everyone else. I've heard many stories about your success at the Spreading Pine, and about some things you did before that, too. Don't embarrass me. I'm still an amateur. But the world's full of people who don't seem to be as good as I am. Say, are you staying here? Yes, I've been here about ten days. I left Kyoto with the idea of going to Edo, but something came up. I'm told somebody's sick. Oh, well, can't do anything about it now. But that's why I brought the milk. Sick? Oh, yeah, my traveling companion. That's too bad. Anyway, it's good to see you. The last I heard from you was the letter Jotaro brought when I was on my way to Nara. Matachi hung his head hoping Musashi wouldn't mention the boastful predictions he'd made at the time. Musashi put his hand on Matachi's shoulder, thinking how good it was to see him again, and how he'd like to have a good long talk. Who's traveling with you? he asked innocently. Oh, it's nobody. Nobody you'd be interested in. It's just... It doesn't matter. Let's go somewhere where we can talk. As they walked away from the inn, Musashi asked, What are you doing for a living? Work, you mean? Yes. I don't have any special talents or skills, so it's hard to get a position with a daimyo. I guess I can't say I do anything in particular. You mean you've been loafing all these years? Asked Musashi, vaguely suspecting the truth. Stop it! Saying things like that brings back all sorts of unpleasant memories. His mind seemed to drift back to those days in the shadow of Mount Ibuki. Where I made my great mistake was in taking up with Oko. Let's sit down, said Musashi, crossing his legs and dropping to the grass. He felt a twinge of exasperation. Why did Matahachi persist in considering himself inferior? And why did he attribute his troubles to others? You blame everything on Oko, he said firmly. But is that any way for a full-grown man to talk? Nobody can create a worthwhile life for you but you yourself. I admit I was wrong, but how can I put it? I just don't seem able to alter my fate. In times like these, you'll never get anywhere thinking that way. Go to Edo if you want, but when you get there, you're going to find people from all over the country, everyone hungry for money and position. You won't make a name for yourself just doing what the next man does. You'll have to distinguish yourself in some way. I should have taken up swordsmanship when I was young. Now that you mention it, I wonder if you're cut out to be a swordsman. Anyway, you're just starting out. Maybe you should think of becoming a scholar. I suspect that'll be the best way for you to find a position with a daimyo. Don't worry. I'll do something. Matachi broke off a blade of grass and put it between his teeth. His shame weighed him down. It was mortifying to realize what five years of idleness had done. He'd been able to brush off stories he'd heard about Musashi with comparative ease. Confronting him in the flesh like this drove home the contrast between them. In Musashi's overpowering presence, Matachi had trouble remembering they had once been the best of friends. Even the man's dignity was somehow oppressive. Neither envy nor his competitive urge could save him from the painful awareness of his own inadequacy. Cheer up, said Musashi. But even as he slapped Matachi on the shoulder, he sensed the man's weakness. What's done is done. Forget about the past, he urged. If you killed five years, so what? All it means is you're starting out five years later. Those five years may in their own way hold a valuable lesson. They were lousy. Oh, I forgot. I just left your mother a little while ago. You saw my mother? Yes. I must say, I can't understand why you weren't born with more of her strength and tenacity. Nor, he thought to himself, could he understand why Osugi had a son like this, so shiftless and full of self-pity. He felt like shaking him and reminding him how lucky he was to have a mother at all. 
Staring at Matahachi, he asked himself how Osugi's wrath could be assuaged. The answer came immediately. If Matahachi would only make something of himself. Matahachi, he said solemnly. Why, when you have a mother like yours, don't you try to do something to make her happy? Having no parents, I can't help feeling you're not as grateful as you ought to be. It's not that you don't show her enough respect, but somehow, even though you're blessed with the best things a person can have, you seem to think no more of it than of so much dirt. If I had a mother like yours, I'd be much more eager to improve myself and do something really worthwhile, simply because there'd be someone to share my happiness. Nobody rejoices over a person's accomplishments as much as his parents. Maybe it sounds like I'm just spouting moral platitudes, but from a vagabond like me, it's not that. I can't begin to tell you how lonely I feel when I come across a beautiful view, then suddenly realize there's no one to enjoy it with me. Musashi paused to catch his breath and took hold of his friend's hand. You yourself know what I'm saying is true. You know I'm speaking as an old friend, a man from the same village. Let's try to recapture the spirit we had when we went off to Sekigahara. There are no more wars now, but the struggle to survive in a peaceful world is no less difficult. You have to fight. You have to have a plan. If you'd give it a try, I'd do anything I could to help. Matahachi's tears dropped onto their clutched hands. Despite the resemblance of Musashi's words to one of his mother's tiresome sermons, he was deeply moved by his friend's concern. You're right, he said, wiping away his tears. Thanks. I'll do what you say. I'll become a new man, right now. I agree I'm not the type to succeed as a swordsman. I'll go to Edo and find a teacher. Then I'll study hard. I swear I will. I'll keep my eyes open for a good teacher as well as a good master you might work for. You could even work and study at the same time. It'll be like starting life over again. But there's something else that bothers me. Well, as I said, I'll do anything I can to help. That's the least I can do to make up for making your mother so angry. It's sort of embarrassing. You see, my companion is a woman. Not just any woman, it's... Oh, I can't say it. Come on, act like a man. Don't get angry. It's somebody you know. Who? Akemi. Startled, Musashi thought. Could he have picked anybody worse? But he caught himself before saying it out loud. True, Akemi was not as sexually depraved as her mother, not yet at least, but she was well on her way, a bird on the wing with a destructive torch in its mouth. Besides the incident with Sejudo, Musashi strongly suspected there had been something going on between her and Kojiro. He wondered what perverse fate led Matahachi to women like Oko and her daughter. Matachi misinterpreted Musashi's silence as a sign of jealousy. Are you angry? I told you honestly because I didn't think I should hide it. You simpleton. It's you I'm worried about. Have you been cursed since birth, or do you go out of your way to find bad luck? I thought you'd learn your lesson from Oko. In reply to Musashi's questions, Matachi told him how he and Akemi happened to be together. Maybe I'm being punished for deserting mother, he concluded. Akemi hurt her leg when she fell into the ravine, and it began to get worse, so... Oh, here you are, sir, said the old woman from the inn in the local dialect. Vague and senile, she put her arms behind her back and looked up at the sky, as though checking on the weather. The sick woman isn't with you, she added, her flat inflection leaving it unclear as to whether she was asking or telling. Flushing slightly, Matahachi said, Akemi? Has something happened to her? She's not in bed. Are you sure? She was there a while ago, but she isn't now. 
Though a sixth sense told Musashi what had happened, he merely said, We'd better go see. Akemi's bedding was still spread out on the floor, but otherwise the room was bare. Matahachi cursed and made a futile circuit of the room. Face burning with rage, he said, No obi, no money. Not so much as a comb or hairpin. She's crazy. What's wrong with her, deserting me like this? The old woman was standing in the doorway. Terrible thing to do, she said, as if to herself. That girl, maybe I shouldn't say it, but she wasn't sick. Putting on, she was, so she could stay in bed. I may be old, but I can see through things like that. Matahachi ran out and stood staring down the white road curving along the ridge. The cow, lying under a peach tree whose blossoms had already darkened and fallen, broke the silence with a long, sleepy-sounding moo. Matahachi, said Musashi, why stand there moping? Let's pray she finds a place where she can settle down and lead a peaceful life, and let it go at that. A single yellow butterfly was tossed high in the swirling breeze before plummeting over the edge of a cliff. Your promise made me very happy, said Musashi. Now, isn't it time to do something about it? Really try and make something of yourself? Yes, I have to, don't I? Mumbled Matahachi without enthusiasm, biting his lower lip to keep it from trembling. Musashi swung him around, diverting his eyes from the deserted road. Look here, he said cheerfully. Your path has opened up of its own accord. Wherever Akemi's headed, it isn't right for you. Go now, before it's too late. Take the path that comes out between Sakamoto and Otsu. You should catch up with your mother before the day is out. Once you've found her, don't ever lose sight of her again. To emphasize the point, he brought Matahachi's sandals and leggings, then went into the inn and came back with his other belongings. Do you have any money? he asked. I don't have much myself, but you can have part of it. If you think Edo's the place for you, I'll go there with you. Tonight, I'll be at the Kara Bridge in Seta. After you find your mother, look for me there. I'm counting on you to bring her. After Matahachi left, Musashi settled down to wait for twilight and the reply to his letter. Stretching out on the bench in the back of the tea room, he closed his eyes and was soon dreaming. Of two butterflies, drifting in the air, frolicking among intertwining branches. One of the butterflies he recognized, Otsu. When he awoke, the slanting rays of the sun had reached the back wall of the tea room. He heard a man say, However you look at it, it was a shoddy performance. You mean the Oshiokas? That's right. People had too much regard for the school because of Kempo's reputation. Looks like in any field, only the first generation counts for much. The next generation gets slack luster, and by the third, everything falls apart. You don't often see the head of the fourth generation buried by the side of the founder. Well, I intend to be buried right next to my great-grandfather. You're nothing but a stone cutter anyway. I'm talking about famous people. If you think I'm wrong, just look what happened to Hideyoshi's heir. The stonecutters worked in a quarry in the valley, and around three o'clock every afternoon came up to the inn for a cup of tea. Earlier, one of them, who lived near Ichijoji, had claimed that he saw the battle from beginning to end. Having already told his story dozens of times, he could now deliver it with stirring eloquence, embroidering skillfully on facts, and mimicking Musashi's movements. While the stonecutters were listening raptly to his recital, four other men had arrived and taken seats out front, Sasaki Kojiro and three samurai from Mount Hie. Their scowling faces made the workmen uneasy, so they'd picked up their teacups and retreated inside. But as the saga gathered steam, they began laughing and commentating, repeating Musashi's name frequently and with obvious admiration. When Kojiro reached the limit of his forbearance, he called loudly, You there! Yes, sir, they chorused, automatically bowing their heads. What's going on here? You! 
He pointed his steel-ribbed fan at the man. Talking as if you knew so much. Come out here. The rest of you, too. I'm not going to hurt you. As they shuffled outdoors again, he continued. I've been listening to you using the praises of Miyamoto Musashi, and I've had enough. You're talking nonsense. There were questioning looks and murmurs of puzzlement. Why do you consider Musashi a great swordsman? You, you say you saw the fight the other day, but let me assure you, I, Sasaki Kojiro, also saw it. As the official witness, I observed every detail. Later, I went to Mount Hie and lectured to the student priests on what I'd seen. Moreover, at the invitation of some eminent scholars, I visited several subsidiary temples and gave more lectures. Now, unlike me, you men know nothing about swordsmanship. Condescension was creeping into Kojiro's voice. You see only who won and who lost. Then you join the herd and praise Miyamoto Musashi as though he were the greatest swordsman who ever lived. Ordinarily, I wouldn't bother to refute the prattle of ignoramuses, but I feel it's necessary now because your erroneous opinions are harmful to society at large. Moreover, I wish to expose your fallacies for the benefit of these distinguished scholars who accompany me today. Clean out your ears and listen carefully. I'll tell you what actually happened at the Spreading Pine and what kind of man Musashi is. Obedient noises issued from the captive audience. In the first place, declaimed Kojiro, let us consider what Musashi really has in mind, his ulterior purpose. To judge from the way he provoked this last bout, I can only conclude that he was trying desperately to sell his name, to make a reputation for himself. To do this, he singled out the house of Yoshioka, the most famous school of swordsmanship in Kyoto, and cleverly picked a fight. By falling victim to this ruse, the house of Yoshioka became Musashi's stepping stone to fame and success. What he did was dishonest. It was already common knowledge that the days of Yoshioka Kempo were over, that the Yoshioka school had fallen into decline. It was like a withered tree or an invalid close to death. All Musashi had to do was give a push to an empty hulk. Anyone could have done the same, but no one did. Why? Because those of us who understand the art of war already knew the school was powerless. Second, because we did not wish to sully the honored name of Kempo. Yet, Musashi chose to provoke an incident, to place challenging signs on the streets of Kyoto, to spread rumors, and finally, to make a great spectacle of doing what any reasonably skillful swordsman could have done. I couldn't begin to enumerate all the cheap, cowardly tricks he resorted to. Consider, for example that he contrived to be late both for his bout with Yoshioka Seijudo and for his encounter with Denshichiro. Instead of meeting his enemies head-on at the spreading pine, he came by a roundabout way and employed all sorts of base stratagems. It's been pointed out that he was only one man fighting against many. That's true, but it's only part of his devilish scheme for promoting his name. He knew full well that because he was outnumbered, the public would sympathize with him. And when it comes to the actual fighting, I can tell you, I observed it personally, it was little more than child's play. Musashi managed to survive for a time with his clever tricks. Then, when the chance to flee presented itself, he ran. Oh, I have to admit that to a certain extent he displayed a kind of brute strength. But that doesn't make him an expert swordsman. No, not at all. Musashi's greatest claim to fame is his ability to run fast. At making a rapid getaway, he is without equal. The words were now streaming from Kojiro's mouth like water over a dam. Ordinary people think it's difficult for a lone swordsman to fight against a great number of opponents, but ten men are not necessarily ten times stronger than one man. To the expert, numbers are not always important. Kojiro then gave a professional critique of the battle. It was easy to belittle Musashi's feat, for despite his valor, 
Any knowledgeable observer could have picked out flaws in his performance. When he got around to mentioning Genjiro, Kojiro was scathing. He said the boy's murder was an atrocity, a violation of the ethics of swordsmanship that could not be condoned from any point of view. And let me tell you about Musashi's background, he cried indignantly. He then revealed that within the past few days he'd met Osugi herself on Mount Hiei and had heard the whole long story of Musashi's duplicity. Sparing no details, he recounted the wrongs suffered by this sweet old woman. He ended by saying, I shudder to think that there are people who shout the praises of this rogue. The effect on public morals is terrifying to contemplate. And this is the reason I've spoken at some length. I have no connection with the house of Yoshioka, nor do I have any personal grudge against Musashi. I've spoken to you fairly and impartially, as a man devoted to the way of the sword, and as one determined to follow righteously in that way. I've told you the truth. Remember it! Falling silent, he eased his thirst with a cup of tea, then turned to his companions and remarked very quietly, Ah, the sun's already low in the sky. If you don't start soon, it'll be dark before you reach the Miidera. The samurai from the temple rose to take their leave. Take good care of yourself, said one of them. We look forward to seeing you again when you return to Kyoto. The stone cutters saw their chance and, like prisoners freed by a tribunal, hastened back to the valley, which was now cloaked in purplish shadows and echoed with the singing of nightingales. Kojiro watched them go, then called into the inn. I'll put the money for the tea here on the table. By the way, do you have any matchlock fuses? The old woman was squatting before the earthen oven, preparing the evening meal. Fuses, she said. There's a bunch hanging in the corner back there. Take as many as you want. He strode to the corner. As he was pulling two or three of them out of a sheaf, the rest fell on the bench below. Reaching to retrieve them, he couldn't help noticing the two legs stretched out on the bench. His eyes traveled slowly from legs to body to face. The shock was like a solid blow to the solar plexus. Musashi stared straight at him. Kojiro sprang back a step. Well, well, said Musashi, grinning broadly. Unhurriedly, he stood up and went to Kojiro's side, where he stood silently, an amused and knowing expression on his face. Kojiro tried to smile back, but his facial muscles refused to obey. He realized instantly that Musashi must have overheard every word he'd said, and his embarrassment was all the more unbearable because he felt Musashi was laughing at him. It took him only a moment to recover his usual aplomb, but during that brief interval, his confusion was unmistakable. Why, Musashi, I didn't expect to find you here, he said. Nice to see you again. Yes, yes, indeed. Regretting the words even as he spoke them, yet somehow unable to help himself, he went on. I must say, you've really distinguished yourself since I last saw you. It's hard to believe a mere human being could have fought the way you did. Let me congratulate you. You don't even seem to be any the worse for it. The trace of a smile still on his lips, Musashi said with exaggerated politeness, Thank you for acting as witness that day, and thank you also for the critique you've just given of my performance. Not often are we allowed to see ourselves as others see us. I am much indebted to you for your comments. I assure you I won't forget them. Despite the quiet tone and lack of rancor, the last statement sent a chill through Kojiro. He recognized it for what it was, a challenge that would have to be met at some future date. These two men, both proud, both headstrong, both convinced of their own rectitude, were bound to clash head-on sooner or later. Musashi was content to wait, but when he said, I won't forget, he was only speaking the simple truth. 
He already regarded his most recent victory as a milestone in his career as a swordsman, a high point in his struggle to perfect himself. Kojiro's calumnies would not go unchallenged indefinitely. Though Kojiro had embellished his speech to sway his listeners, he actually saw the event very much as he had described it, and his honest opinion was not substantially different from what he had stated. Nor did he doubt for a moment the fundamental accuracy of his appraisal of Musashi. I'm glad to hear you say that, said Kojiro. I wouldn't want you to forget, nor will I. Musashi was still smiling as he nodded his agreement. Entwining Branches Otsu, I'm back, Jotaro called as he swept through the rustic front gate. Otsu sat just inside the veranda with her arms propped on a low writing table, staring at the sky as she had been since morning. Under the gable was a wooden plaque bearing an inscription in white characters, Hermitage of the Mountain Moon, the little cottage belonging to a priestly official at the Ginkakuji had, at Lord Karasumara's request, been lent to Otsu. Jotaro plopped down in a clump of blossoming violets and began splashing his feet in the brook to wash off the mud. The water, which flowed directly from the garden of the Ginkakuji, was purer than fresh snow. Water's freezing, he observed with a frown, but the earth was warm, and he was happy to be alive and in this beautiful spot. Swallows sang as if they, too, were pleased with the day. He rose, wiped his feet on the grass, and walked over to the veranda. Don't you get bored? he asked. No, I have many things to think about. Wouldn't you like to hear some good news? What news? It's about Musashi. I heard he's not so far from here. Where? I've been wandering around for days asking if anyone knew where he was, and today I heard he's staying at the Mudoji on Mount Hiei. In that case, I suppose he's all right. Probably, but I think we should go there right away before he goes off someplace. I'm hungry. Why don't you get ready while I have something to eat? There are some rice dumplings wrapped in leaves. They're in that three-tiered box over there. Help yourself. When Jotaro finished the dumplings, Otsu hadn't moved from the table. What's the matter? he asked, eyeing her suspiciously. I don't think we ought to go. Of all the stupid... One minute you're dying to see Musashi, and the next you start pretending you don't want to. You don't understand. He knows how I feel. That night when we met on the mountain, I told him everything, said all there was to say. We thought we'd never see each other alive again. But you can see him again, so what are you waiting for? I don't know what he's thinking, whether he's satisfied with his victory or just staying out of danger. When he left me, I resigned myself to never being with him again in this life. I don't think I should go unless he sends for me. What if he doesn't do that for years? I'll go on doing what I'm doing right now. Sit there and look at the sky? You don't understand. But never mind. What don't I understand? Musashi's feelings. I really feel I can trust him now. I used to love him heart and soul, but I don't think I believed in him completely. Now I do. Everything's different. We're closer than the branches of the same tree. Even if we're separated, even if we die, we'll still be together. So nothing can make me lonely anymore. Now I only pray he'll find the way he's searching for. Jotaro exploded. You're lying, he shouted. Can't women even tell the truth? If you want to act that way, all right, but don't ever mention to me again how much you long to see Musashi. Cry your eyes out. It's all the same to me. He'd put a lot of effort into finding out where Musashi had gone from Ichijoji, and now this... He ignored Otsu and didn't say a word the rest of the day. 
Just after dusk, a reddish torchlight crossed the garden, and one of Lord Karasumaru's samurai knocked on the door. He handed a letter to Jotaro, saying, It's from Musashi to Otsu. His lordship said Otsu should take good care of herself. He turned and left. It's Musashi's handwriting, all right, thought Jotaro. He must be alive. Then, with a trace of indignation, It's addressed to Otsu, not to me, I see. Emerging from the rear of the cottage, Otsu said, That samurai brought a letter from Musashi, didn't he? Yes, but I don't suppose you'd be interested, he replied with a pout, hiding the letter behind his back. Oh, stop it, Jotaro. Let me see it, Otsu implored. He resisted for a time, but at the first hint of tears thrust the envelope at her. Ha! he gloated. You pretend you don't want to see him, but you can't wait to read his letter. As she crouched by the lamp, the paper trembling in her white fingers, the flame seemed to have a special gaiety, a portent almost of happiness and good fortune. The ink sparkled like a rainbow, the tears on her eyelashes like jewels. Otsu suddenly transported to a world she hadn't dared hope existed recalled the ecstatic passage in Po Chui's poem where the departed spirit of young Guifei rejoiced over a message of love from her bereaved emperor. She read the short message, then again read it. He must be waiting this very minute. I must hurry. Though she thought she said the words aloud, she uttered not a sound. Flying into action, she wrote thank you notes to the owner of the cottage, to other priests at the Ginkakuji, and to all those who had been kind to her during her stay. She had gathered her belongings together, tied on her sandals, and was out in the garden before she noticed that Jotaro was still sitting inside nursing his peak. Come on, Jo, hurry up! Going somewhere? Are you still angry? Who wouldn't be? You never think of anybody but yourself! Is there something so secret about Musashi's letter you can't even show it to me? I'm sorry, she said apologetically. There's no reason you shouldn't see it. Forget it. I'm not interested now. Don't be so difficult. I want you to read it. It's a wonderful letter, the first he's ever sent me. And this is the first time he's asked me to come and join him. I've never been so happy in my life. Stop pouting and come with me to Seta, please. On the road through Shiga Pass, Jotaro maintained a grumpy silence, but eventually he plucked a leaf to use as a whistle and hummed a few popular ditties to relieve the nocturnal stillness. Eventually, too, Otsu, prompted to make a peace offering, said, There are some sweets left from the box Lord Karasumaru sent the day before yesterday. But dawn was breaking and clouds beyond the pass were turning pink before he became his normal self again. Are you all right, Otsu? Aren't you tired? A little. It's been uphill all the way. It'll be easier from now on. Look, you can see the lake. Yes, Lake Biwa. Where's Seta? Over that way. Musashi wouldn't be there this early, would he? I really don't know. It'll take us half the day to get there ourselves. Shall we take a rest? Okay, he replied, his good humor restored. Let's sit down under those two big trees over there. The smoke of early morning cooking fires rose in strands, like vapors ascending from a battlefield. Through the mist stretching from the lake to the town of Ishiyama, the streets of Utsu were becoming visible. As he approached, Musashi drew his hand across his brow and looked around, glad to be back among people. Near the Midera, as he started up the Bizoji slope, he had wondered idly which road Otsu would take. He had imagined earlier he might meet her on the way, but later decided this was unlikely. The woman who had taken his letter to Kyoto had informed him that though Otsu was no longer at the Karasumaru residence, his letter would be delivered to her. Since she would have received it no sooner than late evening and would have had various things to do before leaving, 
it seemed probable that she would wait until morning before setting out. Passing a temple with a fine stand of old cherry trees, no doubt famous, he thought, for their spring blossoms, he had noticed a stone monument standing on a mound. Though he had caught only a glimpse of the poem inscribed thereon, it came back to him a few hundred yards farther down the road. It was from the Taiheki. Recalling that the poem was connected with a tale he had once memorized, he began reciting it slowly to himself. A venerable priest from the temple of Shiga, leaning on a six-foot staff and so old that his white eyebrows grew together in a frosty peak on his forehead, was contemplating the beauty of Kanon in the waters of the lake when he chanced to catch sight of an imperial concubine from Kyogoku. She was on her way back from Shiga, where there was a great field of flowers, and when he saw her, he was overcome with passion. The virtue that he had so arduously accumulated over the years deserted him. He was engulfed in the burning house of desire, and— Now, how did that go? I seem to have forgotten some of it. Ah! And he returned to his hut made of sticks and prayed before the image of the Buddha— but a vision of the woman persisted. Though he called on the Buddha's name, his own voice sounded like the breath of delusion. In the clouds above the mountains at twilight, he seemed to see the combs in her hair. This made him sad. When he raised his eyes to the lonely moon, her face smiled back at him. He was perplexed and ashamed. Fearing that such thoughts would prevent him from going to paradise when he died, he resolved to meet the damsel and reveal his feelings to her. In this way, he hoped to die a peaceful death. So he went to the imperial palace and, planting his staff firmly in the ground, stood waiting in the kickball court for an entire day and night. Pardon me, sir. You, on the cow! The man seemed to be a day laborer of the sort found in the wholesale district. Coming around in front of the cow, he patted her nose and looked over her head at the rider. You must have come from the Mudoji, he said. I did, as a matter of fact. How did you know? I lent this cow to a merchant. I guess he must have left her there. I rent her out, so I'll have to ask you to pay me for the use of her. I'd be happy to pay, but tell me, how far would you let me take her? So long as you pay, you can take her anywhere. All you have to do is turn her over to a wholesaler in the town nearest where you're going. Then somebody else will rent her. Sooner or later, she'll get back here. How much would it cost me if I took her to Edo? I'll have to check that at the stable. It's right on your way, anyhow. If you decide to rent her, you just have to leave your name at the office. The wholesale district was near the ford at Uchidegahama. Since many travelers passed through there, Musashi thought it was just the place to freshen up and buy some things he needed. After the arrangements for the cow had been made, he had a leisurely breakfast and set out for Seta, savoring the prospect of seeing Otsu again. He no longer had any misgivings about her. Until their meeting on the mountain, she had always elicited a certain fear in him, but this time it was different. Her purity, intelligence, and devotion on that moonlit night had made his confidence in her deeper than love. Not only did he trust her, he knew she trusted him. He had vowed that once they were together again, he would refuse her nothing, provided, of course, it did not jeopardize his way of life as a swordsman. What had worried him before was the dread that if he allowed himself to love her, his sword would be blunted. Like the old priest in the story, he might lose the way. That she was well-disciplined was now evident. She would never become a hindrance or a fetter holding him back. His only problem now was to make sure that he himself did not drown in the deep pool of love. When we get to Edo, he thought. I'll see she gets the type of training and education a woman needs. While she studies, I'll take Jotaro with me, and together we'll find a still higher plane of discipline. Then one day, 
When the time comes. Light reflected from the lake bathed his face in a gently flickering glow. The two sections of Kara Bridge, one 96 column spans and the other 23 column spans, were linked by a small island. On the island was an ancient willow tree, a landmark for travelers. The bridge itself was often called Willow Bridge. He's coming, cried Jotaro, dashing out of the tea shop onto the shorter section of the bridge, where he stood beckoning to Musashi with one hand and pointing to the tea shop with the other. There he is, Otsu, see, riding a cow. He broke into a little dance. Soon Otsu was standing beside him, she waving her hand, he waving his basket hat. A broad grin lit Musashi's face as he drew near. He tied the cow to a willow tree, and the three of them entered the tea shop. Though Otsu had called wildly to Musashi while he was still on the far side of the bridge, now that he was beside her, words failed her. Beaming happily, she left the talking to Jotaro. Your wounds healed, said the boy, almost rhapsodically. When I saw you on the cow, I thought maybe it was because you couldn't walk. But we still managed to get here first, didn't we? As soon as Otsu got your letter, she was ready to leave. Musashi smiled, nodded, murmured ohs and ahs. But Jotaro's talk about Otsu and her love in front of strangers made him uncomfortable. At his insistence, they moved to a little porch and back, which was shaded by a wisteria trellis. Otsu remained too diffident to speak, and Musashi grew taciturn. But Jotaro paid no heed. His rapid chatter mingled with the buzzing of bees and the whir of gadflies. He was interrupted by the proprietor's voice, saying, You'd better come inside. A storm's brewing. Look how dark the sky's getting above Ishiyamadera. He bustled about, putting away straw blinds and placing wooden rain shutters around the sides of the porch. The river had turned gray. Gusts of wind set the lavender wisteria blossoms into wild motion. All at once, a flash of light streaked through the sky, and the rain came pouring down in great torrents. Lightning! cried Jotaro. The first this year! Hurry up, get inside, Otsu! You'll get soaked! Hurry, sensei! Oh, the rain came at just the right time! It's perfect! But if the shower was perfect for Jotaro, it meant embarrassment for Musashi and Otsu, for going back inside together would make them feel like starry-eyed lovers. Musashi held back, and Otsu, blushing, stood at the edge of the porch, no better protected from the elements than the wisteria blossoms. The man holding a piece of straw matting over his head as he ran through the blinding rain looked like a large, self-propelled umbrella. Dashing under the eaves of a shrine gate, he smoothed his wet, rumpled hair and looked up questioningly at the swiftly moving clouds. It's just like midsummer, he grumbled. No sound was audible above the pounding of the rain, but an abrupt flash of light sent his hands to his ears. Matahachi squatted fearfully near a statue of the God of Thunder, which stood beside the gate. As suddenly as it had begun, the rain ceased. The black clouds parted, the sunshine streamed through, and before long the street had returned to normal. Somewhere in the distance, Matachi could hear the plinking of shamisen. As he started to move on, a woman dressed like a geisha crossed the street and walked directly up to him. Your name's Matahachi, isn't it? she said. It is he answered suspiciously. How did you know? A friend of yours is at our shop now. He saw you from the window and told me to come get you. Glancing around, he saw that there were several brothels in the neighborhood. Though he hesitated, the woman hurried him along toward her own. If you have other business, she said, you don't have to stay long. When they entered, the girls virtually fell all over him, wiping off his feet, removing his wet kimono, and insisting that he go to the parlor upstairs. When he asked who this friend was, they laughed and told him he would find out soon enough. Well, 
said Matahachi. I've been out in the rain, so I'll stay until my clothes dry, but don't try to keep me here any longer than that. There's a man waiting for me at the bridge in Seta. With much tittering, the women promised him he could leave in good time, meanwhile almost pushing him up the stairs. At the threshold of the parlor, he was greeted by a man's voice. Well, well, if it isn't my friend Inugami-sensei. For a moment, Matachi thought it was a case of mistaken identity, but when he looked into the room, the face seemed vaguely familiar. Who are you? he asked. Have you forgotten Sasaki Kojiro? No, Matachi replied quickly. But why do you call me Inugami? My name's Hongiden. Hongiden Matahachi. I know, but I always remember you as you were that night on Gojo Avenue, making funny faces at a pack of stray curs. I think Inugami, God of the Dogs, is a good name for you. Cut it out. That's nothing to joke about. I had a terrible time that night, thanks to you. I don't doubt it. In fact, I sent for you today because I want to do you a good turn for a change. Come in, have a seat. Give the man some sake, girls. I can't stay. I have to meet someone in Seta. I can't afford to get drunk today. Who are you meeting? A man by the name of Miyamoto. He's a childhood friend of mine, and... Miyamoto Musashi? Did you make an appointment with him when you were at the inn in the pass? How did you know? Oh, I've heard all about you. All about Musashi, too. I met your mother. Osugi, is it? At the main hall on Mount Hie. She told me about all the troubles she's gone through. You talked to my mother? Yes. She's a splendid woman. I admire her. And so do all the priests on Mount Hie. I tried to give her some encouragement. Rinsing his cup in a bowl of water, he offered it to Matahachi and continued. Here, let's drink together and wash away our old enmity. There's no reason to worry about Musashi if you've got Sasaki Kojiro on your side. Matahachi refused the cup. Why don't you drink? I can't. I have to go. As Matachi started to get up, Kojiro grabbed him tightly by the wrist, saying, Sit down! But Musashi's waiting. Don't be an ass. If you attack Musashi by yourself, he'll kill you instantly. You've got it all wrong. He promised to help me. I'm going with him to Edo to make a new start in life. You mean you'd rely on a man like Musashi? Oh, I know. A lot of people say he's no good. But that's because my mother's gone around slandering him. But she's wrong. Has been all along. Now that I've talked to him, I'm more sure of that than ever. He's my friend, and I'm going to learn from him so that I can make something of myself too, even if it is a little late in the day. Roaring with laughter, Kojiro slapped the tatami with his hand. How could you be so innocent? Your mother told me you were unusually naive, but to be taken in by... That's not true. Musashis, just be quiet. Listen. In the first place, how could you think of betraying your own mother by siding with her enemy? It's inhuman. Even I, a total stranger, was so moved by that valiant old lady that I swore to give her all the support I can. I don't care what you think. I'm going to meet Musashi, and don't try to stop me. You, girl, bring my kimono. It should be dry by now. Raising his drunken eyes, Kojiro commanded, don't touch it until I tell you to. Now look, Matahachi, if you plan to go with Musashi, you should at least talk to your mother first. I'm going on to Edo with Musashi. If I make something of myself there, the whole problem will solve itself. That sounds like something Musashi would say. In fact, I'd bet he put the words in your mouth. Anyway, wait till tomorrow and I'll go with you to look for your mother. You have to listen to her opinion before you do anything. In the meantime, let's enjoy ourselves. Like it or not, you're going to stay here and drink with me. This being a brothel, and Kojiro the paying guest, the women all came to his support. Matahachi's kimono was not forthcoming, and after a few drinks, he stopped asking for it. Sober, 
Matahachi was no match for Kojiro. Inebriated, he could be something of a menace. By the time day faded into night, he was demonstrating to one and all how much he could drink, demanding more, saying everything he should not say, airing all his resentments, in short, being a complete nuisance. It was dawn before he passed out and noon before he came to again. The sun seemed all the brighter for the rain the previous afternoon. With Musashi's words echoing in his head, Matahachi longed to throw up every drop he had drunk. Fortunately, Kojiro was still asleep in another room. Matahachi slipped downstairs, made the women give him his kimono, and set off at a run for Seta. The muddy red water under the bridge was liberally sprinkled with Ishiyamadera's fallen cherry blossoms. The storm had broken the wisteria vines and strewn yellow caria flowers everywhere. After a lengthy search, Matahachi asked at the tea shop and was told that the man with the cow had waited until the shop closed for the night, then had gone to an inn. He had returned in the morning, but not finding his friend, had left a note tied to a willow branch. The note, which looked like a large white moth, said, Sorry I couldn't wait longer. Catch up with me on the way. I'll be looking for you. Matahachi made good time along the Nakasendo, the high road leading through Kiso to Edo, but he had still not caught up with Musashi when he reached Kusatsu. After passing through Hikone and Torimoto, he began to suspect he had missed him on the way, and when he reached Suribachi Pass, he waited half a day, keeping his eyes on the road the whole time. It wasn't until he reached the road for Mino that Kojiro's words came back to him. Was I taken in after all? he asked himself. Did Musashi really have no intention of going with me? After much doubling back and investigation of side roads, he finally caught sight of Musashi just outside the town of Nakatsugawa. At first he was elated, but when he got close enough to see that the person on the cow was Otsu, jealousy took instant and complete control of him. What a fool I've been! he growled. From the day that bastard talked me into going to Sekigahara until this very minute. Well, he can't walk all over me this way forever. I'll get even with him somehow, and soon. The Male and Female Waterfalls Phew, it's hot, Jotaro exclaimed. I've never sweated like this on a mountain road before. Where are we? Near Magome Pass, said Musashi. They say it's the most difficult section of the high road. Well, I don't know about that, but I've had enough of this. I'll be glad to get to Edo. Lots of people there, right, Otsu? There are, but I'm in no hurry to get there. I'd rather pass the time traveling on a lonely road like this. That's because you're riding. You'd feel different if you were walking. Look, there's a waterfall over there. Let's take a rest, said Musashi. The three of them made their way along a narrow path. All around, the ground was covered with wild flowers, still damp with morning dew. Coming to a deserted hut on a cliff overlooking the falls, they stopped. Jotaro helped Otsu off the cow, then tied the animal to a tree. Look, Musashi, said Otsu. She was pointing at a sign that read, Meoto no Taki. The reason for the name Male and Female Waterfalls was easy to understand, for rocks split the falls into two sections, the larger one looking very virile, the other one small and gentle. The roiling basin and rapids below the falls fired Jotaro with renewed energy. Half jumping, half dancing down the steep bank, he called up excitedly, There are fish down here! A few minutes later he cried, I can catch them! I threw a rock and one rolled over dead! Not long after that, his voice, barely audible above the roar of the falls, echoed back from still another direction. In the shadow of the little hut, Musashi and Otsu sat among countless tiny rainbows made by the sun shining on the wet grass. Where has that boy gone, do you suppose? she asked, adding, He's really impossible to manage. 
Do you think so? I was worse than that at his age. Matahachi, though, was just the opposite. Really very well behaved. I wonder where he is. He worries me far more than Jotaro. I'm glad he's not here. I'd have to hide if he was. Why? I think he'd understand if we explained. I doubt it. He and his mother aren't like other people. Otsu, are you sure you won't change your mind? About what? I mean, mightn't you decide you really want to marry Matahachi? Her face twitched with shock. Absolutely not, she replied indignantly. Her eyelids turned orchid pink, and she covered her face with her hands, but the slight trembling of her white collar almost seemed to cry out, I'm yours, no one else's. Regretting his words, Musashi turned his eyes toward her. For several days now he had watched the play of light on her body, at night the flickering glow of a lamp, in the daytime the warm rays of the sun. Seeing her skin glisten with perspiration, he'd thought of the lotus blossom. Separated from her palate by only a flimsy screen, he'd inhaled the faint scent of her black tresses. Now the roar of the water became one with the throbbing of his blood, and he felt himself being swallowed up by a powerful impulse. Abruptly he stood up and moved to a sunny spot where the winter grass was still high, then sat down heavily and heaved a sigh. Otsu came and knelt at his side, put her arms around his knees, and twisted her neck to look up into his silent, frightened face. What is it? she asked. Did something I said make you angry? Forgive me. I'm sorry. The more tense he became, and the harsher the look in his eyes, the more closely she clung to him. Then all at once she threw her arms around him. Her fragrance, the warmth of her body, overwhelmed him. Otsu! he cried impetuously, as he seized her in his brawny arms and threw her backward onto the grass. The roughness of the embrace took her breath away. She struggled free and crouched beside him. You mustn't, you mustn't do that, she shrieked hoarsely. How could you, you of all people? She broke off sobbing. His burning passion, suddenly chilled by the pain and horror in her eyes, Musashi came to himself with a jolt. Why? he cried. Why? Overcome by shame and anger, he himself was on the verge of tears. Then she was gone, leaving behind only a sachet which had broken loose from her kimono. Staring blankly at it, Musashi groaned, then turned his face to the ground and let the tears of pain and frustration flow into the withered grass. He felt she'd made a fool of him, deceived, defeated, tortured and shamed him. Hadn't her words, her lips, her eyes, her hair, her body, been calling out to him? Hadn't she labored to light a fire in his heart, then, when the flames burst forth, fled in terror? By some perverse logic, it seemed that all his efforts to become a superior person had been defeated. All his struggles and privations had been rendered utterly meaningless. His face buried in the grass, he told himself he'd done nothing wrong, but his conscience wasn't satisfied. What a girl's virginity, vouchsafed to her for only a short period of her life, meant to her. How precious and sweet it was, was a question that never entered his mind. But as he breathed in the smell of the earth, he gradually regained his self-control. When he eventually dragged himself to his feet, the raging fire was gone from his eyes and his face was devoid of passion. Trampling the sachet underfoot, he stood looking intently at the ground, listening, it seemed, to the voice of the mountains. His heavy black eyebrows were knit together just as they had been when he threw himself into battle under the spreading pine. The sun went behind a cloud, and the sharp screech of a bird split the air. The wind changed, subtly altering the sound of the falling water. Otsu, her heart fluttering like a frightened sparrow's, observed his agony from behind a birch tree. 
Realizing how deeply she had hurt him, she now longed to have him at her side again, but as much as she wanted to run to him and beg forgiveness, her body would not obey. For the first time, she realized that the lover she had given her heart to was not the vision of masculine virtues she had imagined. Discovering the naked beast, the flesh and blood and passions clouded her eyes with sadness and fear. She had started to run away, but after twenty paces, her love caught and held her. Now, a little calmer, she began to imagine that Musashi's lust was different from that of other men. More than anything else in the world, she wanted to apologize and assure him she harbored no resentment for what he'd done. He's still angry, she thought fearfully, suddenly realizing he was no longer before her eyes. Oh. What'll I do? Nervously, she went back to the little hut, but there was only a cold white mist and the thundering of the water, which seemed to shake the trees and stir up vibrations all around her. Otsu! Something awful's happened! Musashi's thrown himself into the water! Jotaro's frantic cry came from a promontory overlooking the basin, just a second before he grabbed the wisteria vine and began descending, swinging from branch to branch like a monkey. Though she hadn't caught the actual words, Otsu heard the urgency in his voice. She raised her head in alarm and began clambering down the steep path, slipping on the moss, then clinging to rocks to steady herself. The figure just visible through the spray and mist resembled a large rock, but was actually Musashi's naked body. Hands clasped in front of him, head bowed, he was dwarfed by the fifty-foot flood cascading down on him. Halfway down, Otsu stopped and stared in horror. Across the river, Jotaro stood similarly transfixed. Sensei! he cried. Musashi! Their shouts never reached Musashi's ears. It was as though a thousand silver dragons were nipping at his head and shoulders, the eyes of a thousand water demons exploding around him. Treacherous eddies tugged at his legs, ready to pull him to his death. One false rhythm in breathing, one faltering heartbeat, and his heels would lose their tenuous hold on the algae-covered bottom. His body would be swept up in a violent current from which there was no return. His lungs and heart seemed to be collapsing under the incalculable weight the total mass of the Magome Mountains falling on him. His desire for Otsu died a slow death, for it was closely akin to the hot-blooded temperament without which he would never have gone to Sekigahara or accomplished any of his extraordinary feats. But the real danger lay in the fact that at a certain point all his years of training became powerless against it and he sank again to the level of a wild, mindless beast. And against an enemy like this, formless and hidden, the sword was utterly useless. Bewildered, perplexed, conscious of the devastating defeat he'd suffered, he prayed that the raging waters might bring him back to his quest for discipline. Sensei! Sensei! Jotaro's shouts had become a tearful wailing. You mustn't die! Please don't die! He, too, had clasped his hands in front of his chest, and his face was contorted, as if he, too, were bearing the weight of the water, the sting, the pain, the cold. Glancing across the river, Jotaro suddenly felt himself go limp. He couldn't make any sense out of what Musashi was doing. Apparently, he was determined to stay under the torrent until he died, but now Otsu, where was she? He was sure she'd leap to her death in the river below. Then, above the sound of the water, he heard Musashi's voice. The words weren't clear. He thought it might be a sutra, but then maybe they were angry oaths of self-recrimination. The voice was full of strength and life. Musashi's broad shoulders and muscular body exuded youth and vigor, as if his soul had been cleansed and was now ready to begin life afresh. 
Jotaro began to feel that whatever had been wrong had passed. As the light of the evening sun made a rainbow above the falls, he called Otsu and dared to hope that she had left the cliffside simply because she thought Musashi was in no real danger. If she's confident he's all right, he thought, there's nothing for me to worry about. She knows him better than I do, right down to the bottom of his heart. Jotaro skipped lightly down to the river, found a narrow place, crossed it, and climbed up the other side. Approaching silently, he saw that Otsu was inside the hut, huddled on the floor with Musashi's kimono and swords clutched to her bosom. Jotaro sensed that her tears, which she made no effort to hide, were somehow not ordinary tears. And without really understanding what had happened, he felt it was of grave concern to Otsu. After a couple of minutes, he slipped quietly back to where the cow lay in the whitish grass and sprawled out beside her. At this rate, we'll never get to Edo, he said. Book Five Sky The Abduction Beyond the pass, the snow on Mount Koma glistened in lance-like streaks, while on Mount Ontake, visible through the faintly reddish tree buds, it lay in scattered patches. The light green heralding the growing season seemed to shimmer along the high road and in the fields. Otsu daydreamed. Jotaro was like a new plant, stubborn and hardy. It would take an awful lot to trample him, to keep him down for long. He was growing fast these days. Occasionally she thought she caught a glimpse of the man he would one day be. The line between rambunctiousness and insolence was a fine one, however, and even making allowances for his unorthodox upbringing Otsu was growing more and more dismayed with Jotaro's behavior. His demands, particularly for food, were unending. Every time they came to a food shop, he stopped dead and wouldn't budge until she'd bought him something. After buying rice crackers at Suhara, she vowed, This is the very last time. But before they'd gone a mile farther, the crackers were gone and he was claiming to be half-starved. The next crisis was only just averted by stopping at a tea shop in Nezame for an early lunch. By the time they'd crossed another pass, he was famished again. Look, Otsu, that shop has dried persimmons. Shouldn't we get some just to carry with us? Pretending not to hear, Otsu rode on. When they arrived at Fukushima in Shinano province, a place famous for the variety and abundance of its food products, it was mid-afternoon about the time they were in the habit of having a snack. Let's rest a while, he whined. Please. She paid no attention. Come on, Otsu. Let's have some of those rice cakes coated with soybean flour. The ones they make here are famous. Don't you want any? Since he now had hold of the cow's rope, Otsu saw it was going to be difficult to get past the shop. Haven't you had enough? She said with annoyance. The cow, as if in secret alliance with Jotaro, stopped and began munching grass by the roadside. All right, snapped Otsu. If that's the way you're going to act, I'll go on ahead and tell Musashi. When she made as if to dismount, Jotaro burst into laughter, knowing perfectly well she wouldn't carry out her threat. Her bluff called, Otsu resignedly got off the cow and together they went into the open-sided lean-to in front of the shop. Jotaro shouted an order for two servings, then went out to tether the cow. When he returned, Otsu said, You shouldn't have ordered any for me. I'm not hungry. You don't want anything to eat? No. People who eat too much turn into stupid pigs. Ah, I guess I'll have to eat yours, too. You are shameless. His mouth was too full for his ears to hear. Presently, however, he paused long enough to shift his wooden sword to his back, where it wouldn't interfere with his expanding ribs. He began eating again, but all at once stuffed the last rice cake in his mouth and bolted for the exit. 
Through already? Otsu called after him. She laid some money on the table and started to follow him, but he returned and roughly shoved her back inside. Wait, he said excitedly. I just saw Matachi. You couldn't have. She turned pale. What would he be doing around here? I have no idea. Didn't you see him? He had on a basket hat and he was staring straight at us. I don't believe it. Want me to bring him in here and prove it? You do no such thing. Oh, don't worry. If anything happens, I'll go get Musashi. Otsu's pulse was beating wildly, but realizing that the longer they stood there, the farther ahead Musashi would have gone, she got back on the cow. As they started off, Jotaro said, I can't figure it out. Until we got to the waterfall at Magome, we were all as friendly as could be. Since then, Musashi's hardly said a word, and you haven't been talking to him either. What's the matter? When she said nothing, he went on. Why is he walking on ahead of us? Why do we sleep in different rooms now? Did you have a fight or something? Otsu couldn't bring herself to give him an honest answer, for she hadn't been able to give herself one. Did all men treat women the way Musashi had treated her, openly trying to force his love on her? And why had she rejected him so vehemently? Her distress and confusion now were, in a way, more painful than the illness from which she had but recently recovered. The fountain of love that had comforted her for years had suddenly turned into a raging waterfall. The memory of that other waterfall resounded in her ears, along with her own cry of distress and Musashi's angry protest. She could ask herself whether they would go on like this forever, never understanding each other, but why she was now trailing along behind him, trying not to lose sight of him, struck even her as illogical. Though out of embarrassment they kept apart and spoke rarely, Musashi showed no signs of breaking his promise to go with her to Edo. At the Kozenji, they turned on to another road. There was a barrier at the top of the first hill. Otsu had heard that ever since the Battle of Sekigahara, government officials had been examining travelers, particularly women, on this road with great thoroughness. But Lord Karasumaru's letter of introduction worked like a charm, and they passed the checkpoint without difficulty. As they reached the last of the tea shops on the far side of the barrier, Jotaro asked, Otsu, what does fugen mean? Fugen? Yeah, back there in front of a tea shop, a priest pointed at you and said, You looked like fugen on a cow. What does that mean? I suppose he was referring to the bodhisattva fugen. That's the bodhisattva that rides on an elephant, isn't it? In that case... I must be the Bodhisattva Monju. They're always together. A very gluttonous Monju, I should say. Good enough for a crybaby Fugeng. Oh, you would say that. Why are Fugeng and Monju always together? They're not a man and a woman. Intentionally or not, he was striking close again. Having heard much about these things while she was living at the Shippoji, Otsu could have answered the question in some detail but she replied simply, Monju represents wisdom, Fugen devoted conduct. Stop! The voice was Matahachi's, and it came from behind them. Sick with revulsion, Otsu thought, the coward. She turned and stared frigidly at him. Matahachi glared back, his feelings more muddled than ever. At Nakatsugawa, it had been pure jealousy but he'd continued to spy on Musashi and Otsu. When he saw that they were keeping apart, he interpreted this as an attempt to deceive people and imagined all sorts of scandalous goings-on when they were alone. Get down, he commanded. Otsu stared at the cow's head, unable to speak. Her feeling toward him had settled once and for all into hatred and contempt. Come on, woman, get down! Though she burned with indignation, she spoke coldly. Why? I have no business with you. Is that so? He growled menacingly, taking hold of her sleeve. You may not have any business with me, but I have business with you. 
Get down! Jotaro let go of the rope and shouted, Leave her alone! If she doesn't want to get off, why should she? Holding his arms straight out, he butted Matahachi's chest. What do you think you're doing, you little bastard? Thrown off balance, Matahachi readjusted his feet in his sandals and raised his shoulders threateningly. I thought I'd seen your ugly face somewhere. You're the tramp from that sake shop in Kitano. Yeah, and now I know why you were drinking yourself silly. You were living with some old bitch and you didn't have the guts to stand up to her. Isn't that the truth? Jotaro couldn't have touched a more tender spot. You snot-nosed runt! Matachi snatched at his collar, but Jotaro ducked and came up on the other side of the cow. If I'm a snot-nosed runt, what does that make you? Snot-nosed oaf? Scared of a woman? Matachi darted around the cow, but again Jotaro slipped under the animal's belly and came up on the other side. This happened three or four times before Matahachi finally managed to latch on to the boy's collar. All right, just say that one more time. Snot-nosed oaf, scared of a woman. Jotaro's wooden sword was only half drawn when Matahachi got a good grip and sent him sailing well away from the road into a clump of bamboo. He landed on his back in a small stream, stunned and only barely conscious. By the time he recovered enough to crawl like an eel back to the road, it was too late. The cow was loping heavily along the road, Otsu still on her back, Matahachi running ahead with the rope in his hand. Bastard! moaned Jotaro, stung by his own helplessness. Too dazed to get to his feet, he lay there fuming and cursing. On a hill a mile or so ahead, Musashi was resting his feet and idly wondering whether the clouds were moving or, as they seemed, were permanently suspended between Mount Koma and the broad foothills below. He started, as though at some wordless communication, shook himself and straightened up. His thoughts were really on Otsu, and the more he thought, the angrier he became. Both his shame and his resentment had been washed away in the swirling basin under the falls, but as the days passed, the doubts kept coming back. Had it been wicked of him to reveal himself to her? Why had she rebuffed him, shrunk from him as though she despised him? Leave her behind, he said out loud. Yet he knew he was only deceiving himself. He had told her that when they reached Edo, she could study what was best for her, while he followed his own path. Implicit in this was a promise for the more distant future. He had left Kyoto with her. He had a responsibility to stay with her. What will happen to me? With two of us, what will happen to my sword? He raised his eyes to the mountain and bit his tongue, ashamed of his pettiness. To look at the great peak was humbling. He wondered what could be keeping them and stood up. He could see the forest a mile back, but no people. Could they have been held up at the barrier? The sun would be setting soon. They should have caught up long ago. Suddenly he felt alarmed. Something must have happened. Before he knew it, he was tearing down the hill so fast that the animals in the fields scurried off in all directions. The Warrior of Kiso Musashi had not run very far when a traveler called to him. Hey, weren't you with a young woman and a boy before? Musashi stopped abruptly. Yes, he said with sinking heart. Has something happened to them? Apparently, he was about the only person who had not heard the story that was fast becoming common gossip along the high road. A young man had approached the girl, kidnapped her. He had been seen whipping the cow, driving her down a side road near the barrier. The traveler had barely finished repeating the tale before Musashi was on his way. Racing at top speed, he still took an hour to reach the barrier, which had closed at six, and with it the tea shops on either side. Looking rather frantic, Musashi approached an old man who was piling up stools in front of his shop. What's the matter, sir? Forget something? No, I'm looking for a young woman and a boy who passed here a few hours ago. 
Would that be the girl who looked like Fugen on a cow? That's the one, Musashi answered without thinking. I'm told a ronin took her off somewhere. Do you know which way they went? I didn't actually see the incident myself, but I heard they'd left the main road at the head burying mound. That'd take them toward Nobu Pond. For the life of him, Musashi had no idea who might have kidnapped Otsu or why. Matachi's name never entered his mind. He imagined it might be a good-for-nothing ronin, like the ones he had encountered in Nara. Or perhaps one of the freebooters reputed to be hanging out in the woods hereabouts. He only hoped it was a petty crook rather than one of the hoodlums who made a business of abducting and selling women and were known to be vicious on occasion. He ran on and on in his search for Nobu Pond. After the sun went down, he could hardly see a foot ahead, though the stars were bright above. The road began to slope upward. He assumed he was entering the foothills of Mount Koma. Having seen nothing resembling a pond and fearing he was on the wrong road, he stopped and looked around. In the vast sea of blackness, he was able to make out a lone farmhouse, a windbreak of trees, and looming darkly above these, the mountain. When he got closer, he saw that the house was large and sturdily built, though moss grew on the thatched roof and the thatch itself was rotting. There was a light outside, whether torch or fire he couldn't tell, and near the kitchen a spotted cow. He was sure it was the animal Otsu had been riding. He approached stealthily, keeping to the shadows. When he was close enough to see into the kitchen, he heard a loud male voice coming from a shed on the other side of some piles of straw and firewood. Put up your work, mother, the man was saying. You're always complaining about your eyes being bad, but you go on working practically in the dark. There was a fire in the hearth room next to the kitchen, and Musashi thought he heard the whir of a spinning wheel. After a moment or two, the sound stopped, and he heard someone moving about. The man came out of the shed and closed the door behind him. I'll be in as soon as I've washed my feet, he called. You can go ahead and put dinner on. He placed his sandals on a rock by a stream flowing behind the kitchen. As he sat wiggling his feet in the water, the cow put her head close to his shoulder. He rubbed her nose. Mother, he called, come here a minute. I made a real find today. What do you think it is? It's a cow, a really fine one, too. Musashi made his way quietly past the front door of the house. Crouching on a stone beneath a side window, he looked into what turned out to be a hearth room. The first object he saw was a lance hanging from a blackened rack near the top of the wall, a fine weapon that had been polished and lovingly cared for. Bits of gold shone dully on the leather of its scabbard. Musashi did not know what to make of it. It was not the sort of thing usually found in a farmer's house. Farmers were forbidden to have weapons, even if they could afford them. The man appeared for a moment in the light of the outside fire. At a glance, Musashi knew he was no ordinary peasant. His eyes were too bright, too alert. He wore a knee-length work kimono and mud-spattered leggings. His face was round and his bushy hair was tied in back with two or three lengths of straw. Though he was short, no more than five feet six, he was thick-chested and solidly built. He walked with firm, decisive steps. Smoke began to escape from the window. Musashi raised his sleeve to cover his face, but too late. He inhaled a lungful of smoke and couldn't stop himself from coughing. Who's there? The old woman called from the kitchen. She came into the hearth room and asked, Gonnosuke, did you shut the shed? There seems to be a millet thief around. I heard him cough. Musashi slipped away from the window and hid himself among the trees of the windbreak. Where? shouted Gonnosuke, striding rapidly from behind the house. The old woman appeared at the little window. He must be right around here. I heard him cough. Are you sure it's not just your ears? 
My hearing's all right, and I'm sure I saw a face at the window. The smoke from the fire must have made him cough. Slowly, suspiciously, Gonnosuke advanced fifteen or twenty paces, looking carefully to right and left, as though he were a sentinel guarding a fortress. You may be right, he said. I seem to smell a human being. Taking his cue from the look in Gonnosuke's eyes, Musashi bided his time. There was something about the man's posture, something that said it was best to be cautious. He seemed to be leaning slightly forward from the waist. Musashi could not make out what sort of weapon he was carrying, but when he turned, Musashi saw he had a four-foot staff behind his back. No ordinary pole, it had the sheen of a much-used weapon and seemed to be an integral part of the man's body. There was no question in Musashi's mind but that he lived with it day in and day out and knew exactly how to use it. Moving into view, Musashi shouted, You! Whoever you are, I've come for my companions. Gonosuke glared silently at him. Give me back the woman and boy you kidnapped on the high road. If they're unharmed, we'll let it go at that. But if they've been injured, you're in for it. The snow melt feeding the streams in this area gave the breeze a sharp edge, which somehow emphasized the silence. Turn them over to me, now! Musashi's voice bit more sharply than the wind. Gonosuke had what was called a reverse hold on his staff. His hair standing up like a hedgehog's, he straightened to his full height and shouted, You horses turd! Who are you calling a kidnapper? You! You must have seen the boy and woman were unprotected, so you kidnapped them and took them here. Bring them out! The staff came away from Gonnosuke's side in a movement so rapid Musashi could not tell where the man's arm ended and the weapon began. Musashi jumped aside. Don't do anything you'll regret, he warned, then withdrew several paces. Who do you think you are, you crazy bastard? As Gonnosuke spat out his reply, he moved swiftly into action again, determined not to give Musashi a moment's rest. When the latter shifted ten paces, he covered the same distance simultaneously. Twice Musashi started to move his right hand to the hilt of his sword, but both times he stopped. During the instant when he grasped his sword, his elbow would be exposed. Musashi had seen the swiftness of Gonnosuke's staff and knew he wouldn't have time to complete the movement. He saw, too, that if he allowed himself to make light of his stocky opponent, he'd be in trouble and if he didn't remain calm, even taking a breath could endanger him. Musashi had yet to size up his enemy, who at the moment had his legs and torso in a splendid stance of the indestructible perfect type. Musashi was already beginning to feel that this farmer had a technique superior to that of any expert swordsman he had encountered so far, and a look in his eyes suggested he had mastered that way which Musashi was forever seeking. But he had little time for assessment. Strike followed strike, almost by the second, as one curse after another poured from Gonnosuke's mouth. Sometimes he used both hands, sometimes only one, executing with flowing dexterity the overhead strike, the lateral strike, the thrust, and the shift. A sword, being distinctly divided into blade and hilt, has only one point, but either end of a staff can be applied lethally. Gonosuke was wielding the staff with the same agility as a candy maker handling taffy. Now it was long, now short, now invisible, now high, now low, seemingly everywhere at once. From the window, the old woman urged her son to be careful. Gonosuke! He doesn't look like an ordinary samurai. She seemed to be as involved in the fight as he was. Don't worry. The knowledge that she was watching appeared to raise Gonosuke's fighting spirit to an even higher pitch. At this point, Musashi ducked a blow to his shoulder and in the same movement slid in close to Gonosuke and seized his wrist. The next instant, the farmer was flat on his back, his feet kicking at the stars. 
Wait, shouted the mother, breaking the lattice of the window in her excitement. Her hair stood on end. She seemed thunderstruck to see her son downed. The wild look on her face kept Musashi from taking the next logical step, which would have been to whip out his sword and finish Gonnosuke off. All right, I'll wait, he shouted, straddling Gonnosuke's chest and pinning him to the ground. Gonnosuke was struggling valiantly to free himself. His legs, over which Musashi had no control, flew in the air, then crashed into the earth as he arched his back. It was all Musashi could do to keep him down. The mother came rushing out the kitchen door, screaming vituperously, Look at you! How did you get into a mess like that? But she added, Don't give up! I'm here to help you! Since she had asked Musashi to wait, he expected her to fall down on her knees and beg him not to kill her son, but a glance told him that he was sadly mistaken. She held the lance, now unsheathed behind her, but he caught the glint of the blade, and he felt her eyes burning into his back. Filthy Ronin, she cried. Use a tricky throw, will you? You think we're nothing but dumb farmers, don't you? Musashi couldn't turn to ward off an attack from behind because of the way Gonnosuke was squirming about, trying to put Musashi in a position advantageous to his mother. Don't worry, mother, he said. I'll make it. Don't get too close. Keep calm, she cautioned. You mustn't lose to the likes of him. Remember your ancestors. What's happened to the blood you inherited from the great Kakumyo, who fought side by side with the general of Kiso? I won't forget, yelled Gonosuke. No sooner were the words out of his mouth than he managed to raise his head and sink his teeth into Musashi's thigh, at the same time letting go of his staff and striking Musashi with both hands. The old woman chose this moment to level the lance at Musashi's back. Wait, shouted Musashi. They had reached a stage where settlement seemed possible only through the death of one of them. If Musashi had been absolutely sure that by winning he could free Otsu and Jotaro, he would have pressed on. Now it seemed the better part of valor to call a halt and talk things over. He turned his shoulders toward the old woman and told her to put down the lance. What should I do, son? Gonnosuke was still pinned to the ground, but he was also having second thoughts. Perhaps this Ronin had some reason to think his companions were here. There was no sense in risking death over a misunderstanding. Once they had disentangled themselves, it took only a few minutes to make it clear that it was all a mistake. The three of them repaired to the house and the blazing fire. Kneeling by the hearth, the mother said, Very dangerous to think that there was no cause for a fight to begin with. As Gonnosuke prepared to take his place beside her, she shook her head. Before you sit down, she said. Take the samurai all through the house so that he can be satisfied that his friends aren't here. Then to Musashi, I want you to look carefully and see for yourself. That's a good idea, agreed Gonnosuke. Come with me, sir. Examine the house from top to bottom. I dislike being suspected of kidnapping. Already seated, Musashi declined. It's not necessary. From what you've told me... I'm sure you had nothing to do with the kidnapping. Forgive me for accusing you. I was partly to blame, Gonosuke said apologetically. I should have found out what you were talking about before I lost my temper. Musashi then asked, somewhat hesitantly, about the cow, explaining that he was quite sure it was the one he had rented in Seta. I just happened to find her, replied Gonosuke. This evening I was down at Nobu Pond netting loaches, and on my way home I saw the cow with one leg sunk in the mud. It's swampy down there. The more she struggled, the deeper she sank. She was raising an awful rumpus, so I pulled her free. When I asked around the neighborhood, she didn't seem to belong to anybody, so I thought a thief must have stolen her and later abandoned her. A cow's worth about half a man on a farm, and this is a good one with a young udder, Gonnosuke laughed. 
I sort of decided that heaven must have sent the cow to me because I'm poor and can't do anything for my mother without a little supernatural help. I don't mind giving the animal back to her owner, but I don't know who that is. Musashi noted that Gonnosuke told the story with the simple, straightforward honesty of a person born and brought up in the country. His mother became sympathetic. I'm sure this Ronin's worried about his friends, she said. Eat your dinner and take him to look for them. I only hope they're somewhere near the pond. The hills are no place for strangers. They're full of bandits who'll steal anything. Horses, vegetables, anything. This whole business sounds like some of their work. The breeze would begin as a whisper, mushroom into a violent gust, then roar through the trees and raise havoc with the smaller plants. During a lull that left only the ominous silence of the stars above, Gonnasuke held the torch high and waited for Musashi to catch up with him. Sorry, he said, but nobody seems to know anything about them. There's just one more house between here and the pond. It's behind those woods over there. The owner farms part of the time and hunts the rest. If he can't help us, there's nowhere else to look. Thanks for going to all this trouble. We've already been to more than ten houses, so I suppose there's not much hope of their being around here. If we don't find out anything at this next house, let's give up and go back. It was past midnight. Musashi had expected they would at least find some trace of Jotaro, but no one had seen him. Descriptions of Otsu had brought nothing but blank looks and long country pauses. If it's the walking you're thinking about, that's nothing to me. I could walk all night. Are the woman and boy servants of yours? Brother? Sister? They're the people closest to me. Each would have liked to ask the other more about himself, but Gonosuke lapsed into silence, moved a pace or two ahead, and guided Musashi along a narrow path toward Nobu Pond. Musashi was curious about Gonosuke's skill with the staff and how he had acquired it, but his sense of propriety kept him from asking about it. Musing that his meeting the man was due to a mishap and his own rashness, he nevertheless felt extremely grateful. What a misfortune it would have been to miss seeing this great fighter's dazzling technique. Gonosuke stopped and said, You'd better wait here. Those people are probably asleep, and we don't want to frighten them. I'll go alone and see if I can find out anything. He pointed out the house, whose thatched roof seemed nearly buried in the trees. A rustling of bamboo accompanied his running footsteps. Presently, Musashi heard him knocking loudly on the door. He returned a few minutes later with a story that seemed to give Musashi his first real lead. It had taken him a while to make the man and his wife understand what he was asking about, but finally the wife told him of something that had happened to her that afternoon. A little before sundown, on her way home from shopping, the woman had seen a boy running toward Yabuhara hands and face covered with mud and a long wooden sword in his obi. When she stopped him and asked what was wrong, he responded by asking her where the office of the shogun's deputy was. He went on to tell her that a bad man had carried off the person he was traveling with. She advised him that he was wasting his time. The shogun's officers would never on their own organize a search for a person of no consequence. If it was somebody great or important, or if they had orders from above, they would turn every dollop of horse manure, every grain of sand, but they had no use for common folk. Anyway, for a woman to be kidnapped or a traveler to be stripped clean by highwaymen was nothing unusual. Things like that happened morning, noon, and night. She had told the boy to go past Yabuhara to a place called Narai, there, at an intersection it was easy to see, he would find a wholesale house dealing in herbs. It was owned by a man named Daizo, who would listen to his story and in all likelihood offer to help him. Unlike the officials, Daizo not only sympathized with the weak, 
but would go to great lengths to help them if he thought their cause was worthy. Gonnosuke ended by saying, It sounded to me as though the boy was Jotaro. What do you think? I'm sure of it, said Musashi. I suppose the best thing to do would be to go to Narai as quickly as possible and look up this man Daizo. Thanks to you, I at least have an idea what to do. Why not spend the rest of the night at my house? You can start out in the morning after you've had some breakfast. May I do that? Sure. If we cross Nobu Pond, we can get home in less than half the time it took us to get here. I asked the man and he said we could use his boat. The pond, at the end of a short downhill walk, looked like a gigantic drumhead. Encircled by purple willow trees, it must have been twelve or thirteen hundred yards in diameter. The dark shadow of Mount Koma was reflected in the water, along with a sky full of stars. With Musashi holding the torch and Gonnosuke poling, they slid silently across the middle of the pond. Far redder than the torch itself was its reflection in the smooth water. Poisonous Fangs From a distance, the torch and its reflection suggested a pair of firebirds swimming across the serene surface of Nobu Pond. Somebody coming, whispered Matahachi. All right, we'll go this way, he said tugging at the rope he had tied Otsu with. Come on! I'm not going anywhere, protested Otsu, digging in her heels. Stand up! With the end of the rope, he lashed her across the back, then lashed and lashed again. But every stroke reinforced her resistance. Matahachi lost heart. Come on now, he implored. Please walk! When she still refused to stand, his anger flared again, and he seized her by the collar. You'll come whether you like it or not. Otsu tried to turn toward the pond and scream, but he quickly gagged her with a hand towel. Eventually, he managed to drag her to a tiny shrine hidden among the willows. Otsu, yearning to have her hands free to attack her abductor, thought how wonderful it would be to be transformed into a snake like the one she could see painted on a plaque. It was coiled around a willow, hissing at a man who was putting a curse on it. That was lucky. Sighing with relief, he pushed her into the shrine and leaned heavily against the outside of the grill door, intently watching the little boat coast into an inlet some four hundred yards away. His day had been totally exhausting. When he'd tried to use brute force to take her, she'd made it clear she'd rather die than submit. She'd even threatened to bite off her tongue, and Matachi knew her well enough to know it was no empty threat. His frustration brought him to the verge of committing murder, but the very notion sapped his strength and cooled his lust. He couldn't fathom why she loved Musashi instead of him when it had for so long been the other way around. Didn't women prefer him to his old friend? Hadn't they always? Hadn't Oko been immediately drawn to Matahachi when they'd first met her? Of course she had. Only one explanation was possible. Musashi was slandering him behind his back. Pondering his betrayal, Matahachi worked himself into a fury. What a stupid, gullible ass I am! How could I have let him make such a fool of me? To think I was in tears listening to him talk about undying friendship, about how he treasured it. Ha! He upbraided himself for ignoring Sasaki Kojiro's warning, which resounded in his ears. Trust that scoundrel Musashi, and you'll live to regret it. Until today, he'd wavered between liking and disliking his childhood friend, but now he loathed him. And although he couldn't bring himself to voice it, a solemn prayer for Musashi's eternal damnation took form in his heart. He had become convinced that Musashi was his enemy, born to thwart him at every turn and eventually destroy him. The lousy hypocrite, he thought. He sees me after such a long time and starts preaching about being a real human being, tells me to buck up, 
that will go on from here hand in hand, friends for life. I remember every word, can see him saying it all so sincerely. It makes me sick just to think about it. He was probably laughing to himself the whole time. The so-called good people of this world are all phonies like Musashi, he reassured himself. Well, I see through them now. They can't fool me anymore. Studying a lot of silly books and putting up with all sorts of hardship just to become another hypocrite is nonsense. From now on, they can tell me whatever they please. If I have to be a villain to do it, one way or another I'll stop that bastard from making a name for himself. For the rest of his life, I'll stand in his way. He turned around and kicked the grill door in. Then he untied her gag and said coldly, Still crying, are you? She did not answer. Answer me. Answer the question I asked you before. Enraged by her silence, he kicked her dark form on the floor. She moved out of range and said, I have nothing to say to you. If you're going to kill me, do it like a man. Don't talk like a fool. I've made up my mind. You and Musashi have ruined my life, and I'm going to get even, no matter how long it takes. That's nonsense. Nobody led you astray but you yourself. Of course, you may have had a little help from that Oko woman. Watch what you're saying. Oh, you and your mother. What is it about your family? Why do you always have to go around hating somebody? You talk too much. What I want to know is, are you going to marry me or not? I can answer that question easily. Well, answer then. Throughout this lifetime and the eternal future, my heart is bound to one man, Miyamoto Musashi. How can I possibly care for anyone else, let alone a weakling like you? I hate you! A trembling swept over his body. With a cruel laugh, he said, So you hate me, do you? Well, that's too bad, because whether you like me or not, from this night on, your body is mine. Otsu shook with anger. You still want to be difficult about it? I was brought up in a temple. I never saw my father or mother. Death doesn't frighten me in the least. Are you joking? He growled as he dropped to the floor beside her and pressed his face toward hers. Who said anything about death? Killing you wouldn't give me any satisfaction. This is what I'm going to do. Seizing her shoulder and her left wrist, he sank his teeth right through her sleeve and into her upper arm. Screaming and writhing about, she tried to free herself, but only tightened the hold of his teeth on her arm. He did not release her even when blood dribbled down to the wrist he was holding. Face stark white, she fainted from the pain. Feeling her body grow limp, he let go and hastily forced open her mouth to make sure she hadn't actually bitten off her tongue. Her face was bathed in sweat. Otsu, he wailed. Forgive me! He shook her until she came to. The moment she was able to speak, she stretched out full length and groaned hysterically. Oh, it hurts! It hurts so! Jotaro! Jotaro! Help me! Matahachi, pale and gasping for breath, said, Does it hurt? Too bad. Even after it heals, the mark of my teeth will be there for a long time. What'll people say when they see that? What'll Musashi think? I put that there as a brand, so everyone'll know that one of these days you'll belong to me. If you want to run away, run. But you'll never stop being reminded of me. In the dark shrine, slightly hazy with dust, the silence was broken only by Otsu's sobbing. Stop blubbering. It gets on my nerves. I'm not going to touch you, so just be quiet. Do you want me to bring you some water? He took an earthen bowl from the altar and started to go out. He was surprised to see a man standing outside looking in. When the man took to his heels, Matachi bounded through the door and grabbed him. The man, a farmer on his way to the wholesale market in Shiojiri with several sacks of grain packed on his horse's back, fell at Matahachi's feet, quaking with terror. I wasn't going to do anything. I just heard a woman crying and looked in to see what happened. Is that so? Are you sure? 
His manner was as stern as a local magistrate's. Yes, I swear it is. If that's the case, I'll let you off alive. Take those sacks off the horse's back and tie the woman on it. Then you'll stay with us until I'm through with you. His fingers played menacingly with his sword hilt. The farmer, too frightened to disobey, did as he was told, and the three of them started off. Matahachi picked up a bamboo stick to use as a whip. We're going to Edo, and we don't want any company, so stay away from the main road, he ordered. Take a road where we won't run into anybody. That's very difficult. I don't care how difficult it is. Take a back road. We'll go to Ina, and from there to Koshu without using the main highway. But that means climbing a very bad mountain path from Ubagami to Gombe Pass. All right, start climbing. And don't try any tricks, or I'll split your skull open. I don't particularly need you. All I want is the horse. You should be thankful I'm taking you along. The dark path seemed to get steeper with every step. By the time they reached Ubagami, about halfway up, both men and horse were ready to drop. Beneath their feet, clouds billowed like waves. A faint trace of light tinged the eastern sky. Otsu had ridden all night without uttering a word, but when she saw the rays of the sun, she said quietly, Matachi, please let the man go. Give him back his horse. I promise not to run away. Matahachi was reluctant, but she repeated her plea a third and a fourth time, and he gave in. As the farmer went away, Matachi said to Otsu, Now you just come along quietly, and don't try to escape. She placed her hand over the injured arm, and biting her lips said, I won't. You don't think I want anyone to see the marks of your venomous fangs on me, do you? A maternal warning. Mother, said Gonnosuke, you're going too far. Can't you see I'm upset too? He was weeping, and the words came in spurts. Shh, you'll wake him. His mother's voice was soft but stern. She might have been scolding a three-year-old. If you feel so bad, the only thing to do is get a firm grip on yourself and follow the way with all your heart. Crying won't do any good. Besides, it's unbecoming. Wipe your face. First promise you'll forgive me for that shameful performance yesterday. Well, I couldn't help scolding you, but I suppose, after all, it's a matter of skill. They say the longer a man goes without facing a challenge, the weaker he becomes. It's only natural you lost. Hearing that from you makes it all the worse. After all your encouragement, I still lost. I see now I don't have the talent or spirit to be a real warrior. I'll have to give up the martial arts and be content with being a farmer. I can do more for you with my hoe than I can with my staff. Musashi was already awake. He sat straight up, amazed that the young man and his mother had taken the skirmish so seriously. He himself had already brushed it off as a mistake on his part, as well as Gonnosuke's. What a sense of honor, he mumbled, as he crept quietly into the next room. He went to the far side and put his eye to the crack between the shoji panels. Faintly lit by the rising sun, Gonnosuke's mother was seated with her back to the Buddhist altar. Gonnosuke was kneeling meekly before her, his eyes downcast, and his face streaked with tears. Grabbing the back of his collar, she said with vehemence, What did you say? What's this about spending your life as a farmer? Pulling him closer until his head rested on her knees, she continued in an outraged tone, Only one thing's kept me going all these years, the hope that I could make a samurai of you and restore our family's good name. So I had you read all those books and learn the martial arts. And that's why I've managed to live all these years on so little. And now, now you say you're going to throw it all away? She too began to weep. Since you let him get the best of you, you have to think of vindicating yourself. 
He's still here. When he wakes up, challenge him to another bout. That's the only way you can regain your self-confidence. Gonnosuke, lifting his head, said sadly, If I could do that, mother, I wouldn't feel the way I do now. What's the matter with you? You're not acting like yourself. Where's your spirit? Last night, when I went with him to the pond, I kept my eye open for a chance to attack him, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. I kept telling myself he was only a nameless ronin. Still, when I took a good look at him, my arm refused to move. That's because you're thinking like a coward. What of it? Look, I know I've got the blood of a Kiso samurai in me. I haven't forgotten how I prayed before the god of Ontake for twenty-one days. Didn't you swear before the god of Ontake that you'd use your staff to create your own school? Yes, but I guess I've been too complacent. I haven't considered that other men know how to fight too. If I'm as immature as I showed myself to be yesterday, how could I ever establish a school of my own? Rather than live in poverty and see you hungry, it'll be better to break my staff in half and forget about it. You've never lost before, and you've had a number of matches. Maybe the god of Ontake intended yesterday's defeat as a lesson to you. Maybe you're being punished for being overconfident. Giving up the staff to take better care of me isn't the way to make me happy. When that Ronin wakes up, challenge him. If you lose again, then's the time to break your staff and forget your ambitions. Musashi went back to his room to give the matter some thought. If Gonnosuke challenged him, he'd have to fight. And if he fought, he knew he'd win. Gonnosuke would be crushed, his mother heartbroken. There's nothing to do but avoid it, he concluded. Noiselessly sliding open the door to the veranda, he went out. The morning sun spilled a whitish light through the trees. In the corner of the yard near a storehouse stood the cow, grateful for another day and for the grass growing at her feet. Bidding the animal a silent farewell, Musashi went through the windbreak and strode off on a path winding through the fields. Mount Koma today was visible from top to bottom. The clouds were countless, small and cottony, each of a different shape, all playing freely in the breeze. Jotaro's young, or too frail, he told himself. But there are people who have the goodness of heart to take care of the young and the frail. Some power in the universe will decide whether I find them or not. His spirit, in turmoil since that day at the waterfall, had seemed in danger of losing its way. Now it returned to the path it was meant to follow. On a morning like this, thinking solely of Otsu and Jotaro seemed short-sighted, no matter how important they were to him. He must keep his mind on the way he had sworn to follow throughout this life and into the next. Narai, which he reached a little after noon, was a thriving community. One shop displayed a variety of pelts outside, another specialized in kiso combs. With the intention of asking his way, Musashi stuck his head into a shop that sold medicine made from bear's gall. There was a sign reading, The Big Bear and by the entrance, a large bear in a cage. The proprietor, his back turned, finished pouring himself a cup of tea and said, Can I help you? Could you tell me how to find the store belonging to a man named Daizo? Daizo? He's down at the next crossroads. The man came out, holding his cup of tea, and pointed down the road. Catching sight of his apprentice returning from an errand, he called, Here! This gentleman wants to go to Daizo's place. He might not recognize it, so you'd better take him there. The apprentice, whose head was shaved so as to leave one shock of hair in front and another in back, but none on top, marched off with Musashi in tow. The latter, grateful for the kindness, reflected that Daizo must enjoy the respect of his fellow townsmen. Over there, said the boy. He pointed at the establishment on the left and immediately took his leave. Musashi, having expected a shop like the ones catering to travelers, was surprised. 
The grilled display window was 18 feet long, and behind the shop there were two storehouses. The house, which was large and appeared to extend quite a way back from the high wall enclosing the rest of the compound, had an imposing entranceway, now closed. With a certain hesitancy, Musashi opened the door and called, Good day! The large, dim interior reminded him of the inside of a sake brewery. Because of the dirt floor, the air was pleasantly cool. A man stood in front of a bookkeeper's cabinet in the office, a room with a raised floor covered with tatami. Shutting the door behind him, Musashi explained what he wanted. Before he finished, the clerk nodded and said, Well, well, so you've come for the boy. He bowed and offered Musashi a cushion. I'm sorry to say you've just missed him. He showed up around midnight while we were preparing for the master's trip. Seems the woman he was traveling with was kidnapped, and he wanted the master to help find her. The master told him he'd be glad to try, but he couldn't guarantee anything. If she'd been taken by a freebooter or a bandit from around here, there'd be no problem. Apparently, though, it was another traveler, and he'd be sure to stay off the main roads. This morning, the master sent people out to look, but they didn't find any clues. The boy broke down when he heard that, so the master suggested he come along with him. Then they could look for her on the way, or they might even run into you. The boy seemed eager to go, and they left shortly after that. I guess it's been about four hours now. What a shame you missed them. Musashi was disappointed, though he wouldn't have been in time even if he had started earlier and traveled faster. He consoled himself with the thought that there was always tomorrow. Where's Daizo going? he asked. It's hard to say. We don't run a shop in the ordinary sense. The herbs are prepared in the mountains and brought here. Twice a year, spring and fall, the salesmen stock up here and go out on the road. Since the master doesn't have much to keep him busy, he often takes trips, sometimes to temples or shrines, sometimes to hot spring resorts, other times to places famous for their scenery. This time I suspect he'll go to the Zenkoji, travel around Echigo a while, and then go on to Edo. That's only a hunch, though. He never mentioned where he was going. Wouldn't you like some tea? Musashi waited impatiently, ill at ease in such surroundings, while fresh tea was fetched from the kitchen. When the tea arrived, he asked what Daizo looked like. Oh, if you see him, you'll recognize him right off. He's fifty-two years old, quite robust, looks strong, too, a squarish, ruddy face with a few pockmarks. There's a balding spot on his right temple. How tall is he? About average, I'd say. How does he dress? Now that you ask, I imagine that's the easiest way to recognize him. He's wearing a striped Chinese cotton kimono he ordered from Sakai, especially for this trip. It's a very unusual fabric. I doubt anybody else is wearing it yet. Musashi formed an impression of the man's character, as well as his appearance. Out of politeness, he lingered long enough to finish the tea. He could not catch up with them before sundown, but he reckoned that if he traveled during the night, he'd be at Shiojiri Pass by dawn and could wait for them there. By the time he came to the foot of the pass, the sun had disappeared, and an evening mist was descending softly over the high road. It was late spring. Lights in the houses along the road emphasized the loneliness of the mountains. It was still five miles to the top of the pass. Musashi climbed on, not stopping to relax until he reached Inojigahara, a high, level place hard by the pass. There he lay down among the stars and allowed his mind to wander. It was not long before he was sleeping soundly. The diminutive Sengen Shrine marked the pinnacle of the rocky eminence that stood out like a carbuncle on the plateau. This was the highest point in the Shiojiri area. Musashi's sleep was interrupted by the sound of voices. Come up here, shouted one man. You can see Mount Fuji. Musashi sat up and looked around without seeing anyone. The morning light was dazzling, and there... 
Floating on a sea of clouds was the red cone of Mount Fuji, still wearing its winter mantle of snow. The sight brought a childish cry of delight to his lips. He had seen paintings of the famous mountain and had a mental image of it, but this was the first time he had actually seen it. It was nearly a hundred miles away, but seemed to be on the same level as he was. Magnificent, he sighed, making no effort to wipe the tears from his unblinking eyes. He felt awed by his own tininess, saddened by the thought of his insignificance in the vastness of the universe. Since his victory at the Spreading Pine, he had secretly dared to think there were few, if any, men as well qualified as he was to be called great swordsmen. His own life on earth was short, limited, the beauty and splendor of Mount Fuji eternal. Annoyed and a little depressed, he asked himself how he could possibly attach any importance to his accomplishments with the sword. There was an inevitability in the way nature rose majestically and sternly above him. It was in the order of things that he was doomed to remain beneath it. He fell on his knees before the mountain, hoping his presumptuousness would be forgiven, and clasped his hands in prayer for his mother's eternal rest and for the safety of Otsu and Jotaro. He expressed his thanks to his country and begged to be allowed to become great, even if he could not share nature's greatness. But even as he knelt, different thoughts came rushing into his mind. What had made him think man was small? Wasn't nature itself big only when it was reflected in human eyes? Didn't the gods themselves come into existence only when they communicated with the hearts of mortals? Men living spirits, not dead rock, perform the greatest actions of all. As a man, he told himself, I am not so distant from the gods and the universe. I can touch them with the three-foot sword I carry. But not so long as I feel there is a distinction between nature and humankind. Not so long as I remain distant from the realm of the true expert, the fully developed man. His contemplation was interrupted by the chattering of some merchants who had climbed up near where he was and were gazing at the peak. They were right! You can see it! But it's not often you can bow before the sacred mountain from here. Travelers moved in ant-like streams in both directions, laden with a kaleidoscopic array of luggage. Sooner or later, Daizo and Jotaro would come up the hill. If by chance he failed to pick them out from among the other travelers, surely they would see the sign he had left at the foot of the cliff. To Daizo of Narai, I wish to see you when you pass through. I shall wait at the shrine up above. Musashi, Jotaro's teacher. The sun was well above the horizon now. Musashi had been watching the road like a hawk, but there was no sign of Daizo. On the other side of the pass, the road divided into three. One went through Koshu straight to Edo. Another, the main route, crossed Usui Pass and entered Edo from the north. The third veered off to the northern provinces. Whether Daizo was going north to the Zenkoji or east to Edo, he would have to use this pass. Still, as Musashi realized, people did not always move as one might expect. The wholesaler could have gone somewhere well off the beaten path, or he could be spending an extra night at the foot of the mountain. Musashi decided it might not be a bad idea to go back there and ask about Daizo. As he started down the path cut into the cliffside, he heard a familiar raucous voice say, There he is, up there! It brought to mind instantly the staff that had grazed his body two nights before. Come down from there! Gonnosuke shouted. Staff in hand, he glared at Musashi. You ran away! You figured I'd challenge you and ducked out! Come down! Fight me one more time! Musashi stopped between two rocks, leaned against one of them, and stared silently at Gonnosuke. Taking this to mean that he was not coming, 
Gonnuske said to his mother, Wait here. I'll go up there and throw him down. Just watch. Stop, scolded his mother, who was astride the cow. That's what's wrong with you. You're impatient. You have to learn to read your enemy's thoughts before you go flying into battle. Supposing he were to throw a big rock down on you, then what? Musashi could hear their voices, but the words were not clear. As far as he was concerned, he'd already won. He already understood how Gonnosuke used his staff. What he found upsetting was their bitterness and their desire for revenge. If Gonnosuke lost again, they would be that much more resentful. From his experience with the house of Yoshioka, he knew the folly of fighting bouts that led to even greater hostility. And then there was the man's mother, in whom Musashi saw a second Osugi, a woman who loved her son blindly and would bear an eternal grudge against anyone who harmed him. He turned around and began climbing. Wait! Held back by the strength of the old woman's voice, Musashi stopped and turned around. She dismounted and walked to the foot of the cliff. When she was sure she had his attention, she knelt, put both hands on the ground, and bowed deeply. Musashi had done nothing to cause her to humble herself before him, but he bowed back as best he could from the rocky path. His hand went out as though to help her up. Good samurai, she cried. I am ashamed to appear before you like this. I'm sure you have nothing but scorn for my stubbornness. But I'm not acting out of hate or spite or ill will. I ask you to take pity on my son. For ten years, he's practiced all by himself. No teachers, no friends, no truly worthy opponents. I beg you to give him another lesson in the art of fighting. Musashi listened silently. I would hate to see you part from us like this, she continued emotionally. My son's performance two days ago was shoddy. If he doesn't do something to prove his ability, neither he nor I will be able to face our ancestors. Right now, he's nothing more than a farmer who lost the fight. Since he's had the good fortune to meet a warrior of your stature, it would be a shame for him not to profit from the experience. That's why I've brought him here. I implore you to heed my pleas and accept his challenge. Her speech ended, she bowed again, almost as though she were worshipping at Musashi's feet. Coming down the hill, he took her hand and helped her back up onto the cow. Gonnosuke, he said, take the rope. Let's talk this over while we walk. I'll consider whether I want to fight you or not. Musashi walked slightly ahead of them, and though he had suggested discussing the question, said not a word. Gonnosuke kept his eyes suspiciously on Musashi's back, now and again absently flicking a switch at the cow's legs. His mother looked anxious and worried. When they had gone perhaps a mile, Musashi grunted and turned on his heel. I'll fight you, he said. Dropping the rope, Gonnosuke said, Are you ready now? He looked around to check his position, as if ready to have it out right then and there. Ignoring him, Musashi addressed his mother. Are you prepared for the worst? There's not a wit's difference between a bout like this and a fight to the death, even if the weapons are not the same. For the first time, the old woman laughed. No need to tell me that. If he loses to a younger man like you, then he may as well give up the martial arts. And if he does that, there'd be no further point in living. If it turns out that way, I'll bear you no grudge. If that's the way you feel, all right. He picked up the rope Gonnosuke had thrown down. If we stay on the road, there'll be people in the way. Let's tie the cow up, then I'll fight as long as you wish. There was a huge larch tree in the very middle of the flat area on which they stood. Pointing at it, Musashi led them there. Make your preparations, Gonnosuke, he said calmly. Gonnosuke needed no urging. In a moment, he was standing before Musashi with his staff pointed toward the ground. 
Musashi stood empty-handed, arms and shoulders relaxed. Aren't you going to make any preparations? asked Gonnosuke. What for? Gonnosuke's anger flared. Get something to fight with! Anything you want! I'm ready. No weapon? I have my weapon here, Musashi replied, bringing his left hand up to his sword hilt. You're fighting with a sword? Musashi's only reply was a crooked little smile at the corner of his mouth. They were already at the stage where he couldn't afford to waste breath talking. Underneath the larch tree sat Gonnosuke's mother, looking like a stone Buddha. Don't fight yet. Wait, she said. Staring at each other, not making the slightest move, neither man seemed to hear. Gonnosuke's staff was waiting under his arm for the opportunity to strike, as if it had breathed in all the air on the plateau and was about to exhale it in one great screeching blow. His hand glued to the underside of his sword hilt. Musashi's eyes seemed to pierce Gonnosuke's body. Inwardly, the battle had already begun, for the eye can damage a man more seriously than a sword or staff. After the opening slice is made with the eye, the sword or staff slips in effortlessly. Wait, called the mother again. What is it? asked Musashi, jumping back four or five feet to a safe position. You're fighting with a real sword? The way I fight, it doesn't make any difference whether I use a wooden sword or a real one. I'm not trying to stop you. I want to be sure you understand. The sword, wood or steel, is absolute. In a real bout, there are no halfway measures. The only way to avoid risk is to run away. You're perfectly right, but it occurred to me that in a match this important, you should announce yourself formally. Each of you is meeting an opponent the likes of whom he will encounter only rarely. After the fight's over, it'll be too late. True. Gonnosuke, give your name first. Gonnosuke bowed formally to Musashi. Our distant ancestor is said to have been Kakumyo, who fought under the banner of the great warrior of Kiso, Minamoto no Yoshinaka. After Yoshinaka's death, Kakumyo became a follower of the Saint Honen, and it is possible that we are from the same family as he. Over the centuries, our ancestors have lived in this area, but in my father's generation, we suffered dishonor, which I shall not name. In my distress, I went with my mother to Ontake Shrine and vowed in writing that I would restore our good name by following the way of the samurai. Before the god of Ontake Shrine, I acquired my technique for using the staff. I call it the Musou style, that is, the style of the vision, for I received it in a revelation at the shrine. People call me Musou Gonnosuke. Musashi returned his bow. My family is descended from Hirata Shogen, whose house was a branch of the Akamatsus of Harima. I am the only son of Shinmen Munisai, who lived in the village of Miyamoto in Mimasaka. I have been given the name Miyamoto Musashi. I have no close relatives, and I have dedicated my life to the way of the sword. If I should fall before your staff, there is no need to trouble yourself about my remains. Retaking his stance, he cried, On guard! On guard! The old woman seemed scarcely to breathe. Far from having danger thrust on herself and her son, she had gone out of her way to seek it out, deliberately placing her son in front of Musashi's gleaming sword. Such a course would have been unthinkable for an ordinary mother, but she was fully confident she had done the right thing. She sat now in formal style, her shoulders leaning slightly forward, and her hands placed primly, one on top of the other, on her knees. Her body gave the impression of being small and shrunken. It would have been hard to believe that she had borne several children, buried all but one of them, and persevered through innumerable hardships to make a warrior out of the lone survivor. Her eyes emitted a flash of light, as though all the gods and bodhisattvas of the cosmos had gathered in her person to witness the battle. 
In the instant when Musashi unsheathed, Gonnosuke felt a chill go through his body. He sensed instinctively that his fate, exposed to Musashi's sword, had already been decided, for at this moment he saw before him a man he had not seen before. Two days earlier he had observed Musashi in a fluid, flexible mood, one that might be likened to smooth, flowing lines of calligraphy in the cursive style. He was unprepared for the man who faced him now, a study in austerity, like a square, immaculately written character with every line and dot in place. Realizing that he had misjudged his adversary, he found himself unable to swing into a violent attack, as he had done before. His staff remained poised but powerless above his head. While the two men confronted each other silently, the last of the morning mist cleared away. A bird flew indolently between them and the hazy mountains in the distance. Then all at once a shriek split the air, as though the bird had plummeted to earth. It was impossible to tell whether the sound came from the sword or the staff. It was unreal, the clapping of one hand that followers of Zen talk about. Simultaneously, the two fighters' bodies, moving in perfect coordination with their weapons, shifted positions. The change took less time than it takes for an image to be transmitted from the eye to the brain. Gonnosuke's strike had missed. Musashi had defensively reversed his forearm and swept upward from near Gonnosuke's side to a point above his head, narrowly missing his right shoulder and temple. Musashi then employed his masterful return strike, the one that had previously brought all opponents to grief. But Gonnosuke, seizing his staff near the ends with both hands, blocked the sword above his own head. Had the sword not met the wood obliquely, Gonnosuke's weapon would doubtless have been split in two. In shifting, he had thrust his left elbow forward and lifted his right elbow, with the intent of striking Musashi in the solar plexus. But at what should have been the moment of impact, the end of the staff was still a fraction of an inch from Musashi's body. With sword and staff crossed above Gonnosuke's head, neither could advance or retreat. Both knew that a false move meant sudden death. Though the position was analogous to a sword guard to sword guard impasse, Musashi was aware of the important differences between sword and staff. A staff ostensibly had no guard, no blade, no hilt, no point. But in the hands of an expert like Gonnosuke, any part of the four foot weapon could be blade, point, or hilt. Thus the staff was far more versatile than the sword and could even be used as a short lance. Unable to predict Gonnosuke's reaction, Musashi could not withdraw his weapon. Gonnosuke, on the other hand, was in an even more perilous position. His weapon was playing the passive role of blocking Musashi's blade. If he allowed his spirit to waver for so much as an instant, the sword would split open his head. Gonnosuke's face paled, he bit his lower lip, and oily sweat glistened around the upturned corners of his eyes. As the crossed weapons began to waver, his breathing became heavier. Gonnosuke! cried his mother, her face more pallid than her son's. She raised her torso and slapped her hip. Your hip's too high! she shouted, then fell forward. Her senses seemed to have left her. Her voice had sounded as though she were spitting blood. It had appeared that sword and staff would remain locked until the fighters turned to stone. At the sound of the old woman's cry, they came apart with a force more frightening than that of their coming together. Musashi, slamming his heels into the ground, leaped backward a full seven feet. The interval was spanned in a flash by Gonnosuke and the length of his staff. Musashi barely managed to jump aside. Thwarted in this do-or-die attack, Gonnosuke stumbled forward off balance, exposing his back. Musashi moved with the speed of a peregrine falcon, and a thin flash of light connected with the dorsal muscles of his adversary, who, with the bleat of a terrified calf, stumbled and fell face down on the ground. Musashi sat down with a thud on the grass, holding his hand to his stomach. I give up! he shouted. 
No sound came from Gonnosuke. His mother, too stunned to speak, stared blankly at his prostrate form. I used the ridge of the sword, said Musashi, turning to her. Since she did not seem to comprehend, he said, Get him some water. He's not badly hurt. What? she cried in disbelief. Seeing there was no blood on her son's body, she staggered to his side and threw her arms around him. She called his name, brought him water, then shook him until he came to his senses. Gonnosuke gazed vacantly at Musashi for a few minutes, then walked over to him and bowed his forehead to the ground. I'm sorry, he said simply. You're too good for me. Musashi, seemingly awakened from a trance, grasped his hand and said, Why do you say that? You didn't lose. I did. He opened the front of his kimono. Look at this. He pointed to a red spot where the staff had struck him. Only a little more, and I'd have been killed. There was a tremor of shock in his voice, for the truth was, he had not yet figured out when or how he had suffered the wound. Gonnosuke and his mother stared at the red mark, but said nothing. Pulling his kimono together, Musashi asked the old woman why she had cautioned her son about his hips. Had she observed something faulty or dangerous in his stance? Well, I'm no expert in these matters, but as I watched him using all his strength to hold your sword off, it seemed to me he was missing an opportunity. He couldn't advance, couldn't retreat, and he was too excited. But I saw that if he simply dropped his hips, holding his hands the way they were, the end of the staff would naturally strike your chest. It all happened in an instant. At the time, I wasn't really conscious of what I said. Musashi nodded, regarding himself fortunate to have received a useful lesson without having had to pay with his life. Gonnosuke too listened reverently. No doubt he had also gained a new insight. What he had just experienced was no ephemeral revelation, but a journey to the boundary between life and death. His mother perceiving him to be on the brink of disaster, had taught him a lesson in survival. Years later, after Gonnosuke had established his own style and become known far and wide, he recorded the technique his mother had discovered on this occasion. Though he wrote at some length of his mother's devotion and of his match with Musashi, he refrained from saying that he had won. On the contrary, for the rest of his life he told people that he had lost, and that the defeat had been an invaluable lesson to him. Musashi, having wished mother and son well, proceeded on from Inojigahara to Kamisua, unaware that he was being followed by a samurai who inquired of all the grooms at the horse stations, as well as of other travelers, whether they had seen Musashi on the road. A One-Night Love Affair Musashi's injury was painful, so instead of spending time in Kamisua to make inquiries about Otsu and Jotaro, he went on to the hot springs at Shimosua. This town, on the banks of Lake Sua, was quite a large one, with the houses of ordinary townsmen alone numbering over a thousand. At the inn designated for use by Daimyo, the bath was covered by a roof, but otherwise the pools situated along the roadside were open to the sky and available to anyone who wanted to use them. Musashi hung his clothes and swords on a tree and eased himself into the steaming water. As he massaged the swelling on the right side of his abdomen, he rested his head against a rock on the edge of the pool, closed his eyes, and savored a groggy, pleasurable sense of well-being. The sun was beginning to set, and a reddish mist rose from the surface of the lake, which he could see between the fishermen's houses along the shore. A couple of small vegetable plots lay between the pool and the road, where people and horses were coming and going with the usual noise and bustle. At a shop selling lamp oil and sundries, a samurai was purchasing straw sandals. Having selected a suitable pair, he sat down on a stool 
took off his old ones and tied the new ones on. You must have heard about it, he said to the shopkeeper. It happened under the great spreading pine at Ichijoji near Kyoto. This ronin took on the entire house of Yoshioka all by himself and fought with a spirit you rarely hear about anymore. I'm sure he passed this way. Are you certain you didn't see him? For all his eagerness, the samurai seemed to know little about the man he was looking for, neither his age nor how he might be dressed. Disappointed when he received a negative reply, he repeated, I must find him somehow, two or three times while he finished tying his sandals. The samurai, a man of about forty, was well-dressed and sunburned from traveling. The hair at his temples stood out around the cords of his basket hat, and the toughness in his facial expression matched his manly build. Musashi suspected his body bore the marks and calluses that come from wearing armor. I don't remember ever seeing him before, he thought. But if he's going around talking about the Yoshioka school, maybe he's one of their students. The schools had so many students. A few must have some backbone. They may be hatching another plot for revenge. When the man had completed his business and left, Musashi dried himself and put on his clothes, thinking the coast was clear. But when he walked out onto the high road, he almost bumped into him. The samurai bowed and, looking intently into his face, said, Aren't you Miyamoto Musashi? Musashi nodded, and the samurai, ignoring the suspicion written on his face, said, I knew it! After a short pian to his own perspicacity, he continued familiarly. You can't know how happy I am to meet you at last. I've had the feeling I'd run into you somewhere along the way. Without pausing to give Musashi a chance to speak, he urged him to spend the night at the same inn with him. Let me assure you, he added, you don't have to worry about me. My status, if you'll forgive me for saying so, is such that I usually travel with a dozen attendants and a change of horses. I'm a retainer of Date Masamune, the lord of Aoba Castle in Mutsu. My name is Ishimoda Geki. When Musashi passively accepted the invitation, Geki decided they would stay at the inn for Daimyo and led him into the place. How about a bath? he asked. But of course... You've just had one. Well, make yourself comfortable while I take one. I'll be back shortly. He took off his traveling clothes, picked up a towel, and left the room. Though the man had a winning way about him, Musashi's head was full of questions. Why would this well-placed warrior be looking for him? Why was he being so friendly? Wouldn't you like to change into something more comfortable? asked the maid proffering one of the cotton-stuffed kimonos furnished to guests. No, thank you. I'm not sure I'll be staying. Musashi stepped out onto the veranda. Behind him, he heard the maid quietly setting the dinner trays. As he watched the ripples on the lake change from deep indigo to black, the image of Otsu's sad eyes formed in his mind. I suppose I'm not looking in the right place, he thought. Anyone evil enough to kidnap a woman certainly has the instinct to avoid towns. He seemed to hear Otsu calling for help. Was it really all right to take the philosophic view that all things happen as a result of heaven's will? Standing there doing nothing, he felt guilty. Coming back from his bath, Ishimoda Geki apologized for having left him alone and sat down before his dinner tray. Noticing that Musashi still wore his own kimono, he asked, Why don't you change? I'm comfortable in what I have on. I wear this all the time, on the road, inside the house, when I sleep on the ground under the trees. Geki was favorably impressed. I might have known, he said. You want to be ready for action at any time, no matter where you are. Lord Date would admire that. He stared with unconcealed fascination at Musashi's face, which was lit from the side by the lamp. Remembering himself after a moment, he said, Come, sit down and have some sake. He rinsed off a cup in a bowl of water and offered it to Musashi. Musashi seated himself and bowed. 
Resting his hands on his knees, he asked, Could you tell me, sir, why you're treating me in such a friendly manner? And if you don't mind, why you were inquiring about me out on the high road? I suppose it's only natural for you to wonder, but there's really very little to explain. Perhaps the simplest way to put it is that I have a sort of crush on you. He paused for a moment, laughed, and went on. Yes, it's a matter of infatuation, a case of one man being attracted to another. Geki seemed to feel this was sufficient explanation, but Musashi was more mystified than ever. While it did not seem impossible for one man to be enamored of another, he himself had never experienced such an attachment. Takuan was too severe to inspire strong affection. Koetsu lived in an entirely different world. Sekshusai occupied a plane so far above Musashi's that either liking or disliking was inconceivable. Though it could be Geki's way of flattering him, a man who made such statements opened himself to the charge of insincerity. Still, Musashi doubted that this samurai was a sycophant. He was too solid, too manly in appearance for that. Precisely what do you mean, Musashi asked with a sober air, when you say you are attracted to me? Perhaps I'm being presumptuous, but ever since I heard of your feet at Ichijoji, I've been convinced that you're a man I would like, and like very much. Were you in Kyoto then? Yes, I arrived during the first month of the year and was staying at Lord Date's residence on Sanjo Avenue. When I happened to drop in on Lord Karasumaru Mitsuhiro the day after the fight, I heard quite a bit about you. He said he'd met you and remarked on your youth and what you'd been doing in the past. Feeling this strong attraction, I resolved that I must make an effort to meet you. On my way from Kyoto, I saw the sign you put up at Shiojiri Pass. Oh, you saw that? Ironic, thought Musashi that instead of bringing him Jotaro, the sign had brought him someone of whose existence he had never dreamed. But the more he considered the matter, the less he felt he deserved the esteem in which Geki seemed to hold him. Painfully conscious of his own mistakes and failures, he found Geki's adulation embarrassing. With perfect honesty, he said, I think you're rating me too highly. There are a number of outstanding samurai serving under Lord Date. His fief has an income of five million bushels, you know. And in time I've met many a skilled swordsman. But from what I've heard, it would seem that few can be compared with you. What's more, you're still very young. You have your whole future before you. And that, I suppose, is why you appeal to me. Anyway, now that I've found you... Let's be friends. Have a drink and talk about anything that interests you. Musashi accepted the sake cup in good humor and began matching his host drink for drink. Before long, his face was bright red. Geki, still going strong, said, We samurai from the north can drink a lot. We do it to stay warm. Lord Date can outdrink any of us. With a strong general in the lead, it wouldn't do for the troops to fall behind. The maid kept bringing more sake. Even after she'd trimmed the lamp wick several times, Geki showed no inclination to stop. Let's drink all night, he suggested. That way we can talk all night. Fine, agreed Musashi. Then, with a smile, you said you'd talk to Lord Karasumaru. Do you know him well? You couldn't say we're close friends, but over the years I've been to his house any number of times on errands. He's very friendly, you know. Yes, I met him on the introduction of Honami Koetsu. For noblemen, he seemed remarkably full of life. Looking somewhat dissatisfied, Geki asked, Is that your only impression? If you'd talked with him at any length, I'd think you'd have been struck by his intelligence and sincerity. Well, we were in the licensed quarter at the time. In that case, I suppose he refrained from revealing his true self. What's he really like? Geki settled himself in more formal fashion and in a rather grave tone said, 
He's a troubled man. A man of sorrows, if you will. The shogunate's dictatorial ways disturb him greatly. For a moment, Musashi was conscious of a lilting sound coming from the lake and the shadows cast by the white light of the lamp. Abruptly, Geki said, Musashi, my friend, for whose sake are you trying to perfect your swordsmanship? Never having considered the question, Musashi replied with guileless candor, For my own. That's all right as far as it goes, but for whose sake are you trying to improve yourself? Surely your aim is not merely personal honor and glory. That's hardly sufficient for a man of your stature. By accident or design, Geki had come around to the subject he really wanted to talk about. Now that the whole country is under Ieyasu's control, he declared, we have a semblance of peace and prosperity. But is it real? Can the people actually live happily under the present system? Over the centuries, we've had the Hojos, the Ashkagas, Oda Nobunaga, Hideyoshi, a long string of military rulers consistently oppressing not only the people, but the emperor and the court as well. The imperial government has been taken advantage of, and the people mercilessly exploited. All the benefits have gone to the military class. This has been going on since Minamoto no Yoritomo, hasn't it? And the situation today is unchanged. Nobunaga seems to have had some idea of the injustice involved. At least he built a new palace for the emperor. Hideyoshi not only honored the emperor Go Yose by requiring all the daimyo to pay obeisance to him, but even tried to provide a measure of welfare and happiness for the common people. But what of Ieyasu? To all intents and purposes, he has no interest beyond the fortunes of his own clan. So again, the happiness of the people and the well-being of the imperial family are being sacrificed to create wealth and power for a military dictatorship. We seem to be at the threshold of another age of tyranny. No one worries about this state of affairs more than Lord Date Masamune or, among the nobility, Lord Karasumaru. Geki paused, waiting for a response, but none was forthcoming except for barely articulate, I see. Like anyone else, Musashi was aware of the drastic political changes that had occurred since the Battle of Sekigahara. Yet he had never paid any attention to activities of the daimyo in the Osaka faction, or the ulterior motives of the Tokugawas, or the stands taken by powerful outside lords like Date and Shimazu. All he knew about Date was that his fief, officially, had an income of three million bushels per year, but in fact probably yielded five million, as Geki had mentioned. Twice every year, Geki went on, Lord Date sends produce from our fief to Lord Konoe in Kyoto for presentation to the emperor. He's never failed to do this, even in times of war. That's why I was in Kyoto. Aoba Castle is the only one in the country to have a special room reserved for the emperor. It's unlikely, of course, that it'll ever be used, but Lord Date set it aside for him anyway, built it out of wood taken from the old imperial palace when that was rebuilt. He had the wood brought from Kyoto to Sendai by boat. And let me tell you about the war in Korea. During the campaigns there, Kato... Konishi and other generals were competing for personal fame and triumph. Not Lord Date. Instead of his own family crest, he wore the crest of the rising sun and told everyone he'd never have led his men to Korea for the glory of his own clan or for that of Hideyoshi. He went out of love for Japan itself. While Musashi listened attentively, Geki became absorbed in his monologue describing his master in glowing terms and assuring Musashi that he was unexcelled in his single-minded devotion to the nation and the emperor. For a time, he forgot about drinking, but then suddenly looked down and said, The sake is cold! Clapping his hands for the maid, he was about to order more. Musashi hurriedly interrupted, I've had more than enough. If you don't mind, I'd rather have some rice and tea now. 
All ready? mumbled Geki. He was obviously disappointed, but out of deference to his guest, told the girl to bring the rice. Geki continued to talk as they ate. The impression Musashi formed of the spirit that seemed to prevail among the samurai of Lord Date's fief was that, as individuals and as a group, they were vitally concerned with the way of the samurai and with the problem of disciplining themselves in accordance with the way. This way had existed since ancient times, when the warrior class had come into being, but its moral values and obligations were now little more than a vague memory. During the chaotic domestic strife of the 15th and 16th centuries, the ethics of the military man had been distorted, if not totally ignored, and now almost anyone who could wield a sword or shoot an arrow from a bow was regarded as a samurai, regardless of the attention, or lack of it, given to the deeper meaning of the way. The self-styled samurai of the day were often men of lower character and baser instincts than common peasants or townsmen. Having nothing but brawn and technique to command the respect of those beneath them, they were in the long run doomed to destruction. There were few daimyo capable of seeing this, and only a handful of the higher vassals of the Tokugawas and the Toyotomis gave any thought to establishing a new way of the samurai, which could become the foundation of the nation's strength and prosperity. Musashi's thoughts returned to the years when he had been confined in Himeji Castle. Takuan, remembering that Lord Ikeda had in his library a handwritten copy of Nichio Shu Shinkang by Fushikiang, had taken it out for Musashi to study. Fushikiang was the literary name of the celebrated general Uesugi Kenshin. In his book, he recorded points of daily ethical training for the guidance of his chief vassals. From this, Musashi had not only learned about Kenshin's personal activities, but also gained an understanding of why Kenshin's fief in Echigo had come to be known throughout the country for its wealth and military prowess. Swayed by Geki's enthusiastic descriptions, he began to feel that Lord Date, besides equaling Kenshin in integrity, had created in his domain an atmosphere in which samurai were encouraged to develop a new way, one that would enable them to resist even the shogunate, should that become necessary. You must forgive me for going on and on about matters of personal interest, said Geki. What do you think, Musashi? Wouldn't you like to come to Sendai, see for yourself? His lordship is honest and straightforward. If you're striving to find the way, your present status doesn't matter to him. You can talk with him as you would with any other man. There's a great need for samurai who will devote their lives to their country. I'll be more than happy to recommend you. If it's all right with you, we can go to Sendai together. By this time, the dinner trays had been removed, but Geki's ardor was in no way diminished. Impressed, but still cautious, Musashi replied, I'll have to give it some thought before I can reply. After they had said good night, Musashi went to his room, where he lay awake in the dark, his eyes glistening. The way of the samurai. He concentrated on this concept as it applied to himself and to his sword. Suddenly he saw the truth. The techniques of a swordsman were not his goal. He sought an all-embracing way of the sword. The sword was to be far more than a simple weapon. It had to be an answer to life's questions. The way of Uesugi Kenshin and Date Masamune was too narrowly military, too hidebound. It would be up to him to add to its human aspect, to give it greater profundity, greater loftiness. For the first time, he asked whether it was possible for an insignificant human being to become one with the universe. A Gift of Money Musashi's first waking thought was of Otsu and Jotaro, 
and though he and Geki carried on a convivial conversation over breakfast, the problem of how to find them was very much on his mind. After emerging from the inn, he unconsciously scrutinized every face he encountered on the high road. Once or twice he thought he saw Otsu ahead, only to find he was mistaken. You seem to be looking for someone, said Geki. I am. My companions and I got separated along the way, and I'm worried about them. I think I'd better give up the idea of going to Edo with you and search some of the other roads. Disappointed, Geki said, That's too bad. I was looking forward to traveling with you. I hope the fact that I talked too much last night won't change your mind about visiting Sendai. Geki's manner, straightforward and masculine, appealed to Musashi. That's very kind of you, he said. I hope I have the chance some day. I want you to see for yourself how our samurai conduct themselves, and if you're not interested in that, then just regard it as a sightseeing trip. You can listen to the local songs and visit Matsushima. It's famous for its scenery, you know. Geki took his leave and headed briskly for Wada Pass. Musashi turned around and went back to where the Koshu High Road branched off from the Nakasendo. As he stood there mapping out his strategy, a group of day laborers from Sua came up to him. Their dress suggested they were porters or grooms or bearers of the primitive palanquins used in these parts. They approached slowly, arms folded, looking like an army of crabs. As their eyes rudely sized him up, one of them said, Sir, you seem to be looking for someone. A beautiful lady, is it? Or only a servant? Musashi shook his head, waved them off with a slightly disdainful gesture, and turned away. He did not know whether to go east or west, but finally made up his mind to spend the day seeing what he could find out in the neighborhood. If his inquiries led nowhere, he could then proceed to the shogun's capital with a clear conscience. One of the laborers broke in upon his thoughts. If you're looking for somebody, we could help you, he said. It's better than standing around under the hot sun. What does your friend look like? Another added, We won't even set a rate for our services. We'll leave it up to you. Musashi relented to the extent of describing Otsu and Jotaro in detail. After consulting with his fellows, the first man said, We haven't seen them, but if we split up, we're sure to find them. The kidnappers must have taken one of the three roads between Sua and Shiojiri. You don't know this area, but we do. None too optimistic about his chances of success in such difficult terrain, Musashi said, All right, go look for them. Done! shouted the men. Again they huddled, ostensibly deciding who was to go where. Then the ringleader came forward, rubbing his hands together deferentially. There's just one little thing, sir. You see, I don't like to mention it, but we're just penniless laborers. Why, not one of us has had anything to eat yet today. Wonder if you couldn't advance us half a day's pay and say a little something extra? I guarantee we'll find your companions before sundown. Of course, I was planning to give you something. The man named a figure, which Musashi found, after counting his money, was more than he had. He was not unmindful of the value of money, but being alone, with no one to support... His attitude was on the whole indifferent. Friends and admirers sometimes donated travel funds, and there were temples where he could often obtain free lodging. At other times, he slept in the open or went without ordinary food. One way or another, he had always managed to get by. On this trip, he had left the finances to Otsu, who had received a sizable gift of travel money from Lord Karasumaru. She had been paying the bills and giving him a certain amount of spending money each morning, as any ordinary housewife might do. Keeping only a little for himself, he distributed the rest of his money among the men, and though they'd expected more, they agreed to undertake the search as a special favor. Wait for us by the two-story gate of the Sua Myojin Shrine, the spokesman advised. By evening we'll be back with some news. They made off in several directions. Rather than waste the day doing nothing, 
Musashi went to see Takashima Castle and the town of Shimosua, stopping here and there to note features of the local topography, which might come in handy at some future date, and to observe the methods of irrigation. He asked several times whether there were any outstanding military experts in the area, but heard nothing of interest. As sundown drew near, he went to the shrine and sat down, tired and dispirited, on the stone stairway leading up to the two-story gate. No one showed up, so he took a turn around the spacious shrine grounds. But when he returned to the gate, there was still no one there. Though not loud, the sound of horses stamping the ground began to get on his nerves. Descending the steps, he came upon a shed, obscured by the trees, where an ancient horsekeeper was feeding the shrine's sacred white horse. He glanced at Musashi accusingly. Can I help you? he asked brusquely. Do you have some business with the shrine? Upon hearing why Musashi was there, he broke out in uncontrollable laughter. Musashi, seeing nothing at all funny about his predicament, made no attempt to conceal a scowl. Before he spoke, however, the old man said, You've no business being on the road by yourself. You're too innocent. Did you really believe roadside vermin would spend the whole day looking for your friends? If you paid them in advance, you'll never see them again. You mean you think they were just putting on an act when they divided up and left? The horsekeeper's expression changed to one of sympathy. You've been robbed, he said. I heard there were about ten vagrants drinking and gambling in the grove on the other side of the mountain all day today. They're most likely the ones. These things happen all the time. He went on to tell some stories of travelers being cheated out of their money by unscrupulous laborers, but concluded mildly, That's the way the world is. You'd better be more careful from now on. With this sage advice, he picked up his empty pail and departed, leaving Musashi feeling foolish. It's too late to do anything now, he sighed. I pride myself on my ability not to give my opponent any opening, and then get taken in by a gang of illiterate workmen. This evidence of his gullibility came like a slap in the face. Such lapses could easily muddy his practice of the art of war. How could a man so easily deceived by his inferiors effectively command an army? As he climbed slowly toward the gate, he resolved to henceforth pay more attention to the ways of the world about him. One of the laborers was peering around in the dark, and as soon as he caught sight of Musashi, he called to him and ran partway down the steps. Glad I found you, sir, he said. I've got news about one of the people you're looking for. Oh? Musashi? having just reprimanded himself for his naivete, was astonished but gratified to know that not everyone in the world was a swindler. By one of them, do you mean the boy or the woman? The boy. He's with Daizo of Narai, and I found out where Daizo is, or at least where he's headed. Where might that be? I didn't think that bunch I was with this morning would do what they promised. They took the day off to gamble, but I felt sorry for you. I went from Shiojiri to Seba, asking everybody I ran into. Nobody knew anything about the girl, but I heard from the maid at the inn where I ate that Daizo passed through Sua about noon today on his way to Wada Pass. She said he had a young boy with him. Embarrassed, Musashi said rather formally, It was good of you to let me know. He took out his money pouch, knowing it contained only enough for his own meal. He hesitated a moment but reflecting that honesty should not go unrewarded, gave the laborer his last bit of cash. Pleased with the tip, the man raised the money to his forehead in a gesture of thanks and went happily on his way. Watching his money go down the road, Musashi felt he had used it for a purpose worthier than that of filling his stomach. Perhaps the laborer, having learned that right conduct can be profitable, would go out on the road the next day and help another traveler. It was already dark, but he decided that instead of sleeping under the eaves of some peasant's house, he would cross Wada Pass. By traveling all night, he should be able to catch up with Daizou. 
He started off, savoring once again the satisfaction of being on a deserted road at night. Something about it appealed to his nature. Counting his footsteps, listening to the silent voice of the heavens above, he could forget everything and rejoice in his own being. When he was surrounded by crowds of busy people, his spirit often seemed sad and isolated. But now he felt alive and buoyant. He could think about life coolly and objectively, even appraise himself as he might appraise a total stranger. A little after midnight, his musings were distracted by a light in the distance. He had been climbing steadily since crossing the bridge over the Ochiai River. One pass was behind him. The next one, at Wada, loomed up in the starry sky ahead, and beyond that, the even higher crossing at Daimon. The light was in a hollow that ran parallel to the two ridges. It looks like a bonfire, he thought, feeling pangs of hunger for the first time in hours. Maybe they'll let me dry off my sleeves, give me a bit of gruel or something. As he drew near, he saw that it wasn't an outdoor fire, but the light from a small roadside tea house. There were four or five stakes for tying horses, but no horses. It seemed incredible that there would be anyone in such a place at this hour, yet he could hear the sound of raucous voices mingling with the crackling of the fire. He stood hesitantly under the eaves for a few minutes. If it had been a farmer's or a woodcutter's hut, he would have had no qualms about asking for shelter and some leftovers, but this was a place of business. The smell of food made him hungrier than ever. The warm smoke enveloped him. He could not tear himself away. Well, if I explain my situation to them, maybe they'll accept the statue as payment. The statue was the small image of Kannon he had carved from the wood of an ancient plum tree. When he barged into the shop, the startled customers stopped talking. The interior was simple, a dirt floor with a hearth and a fire hood in the middle, around which huddled three men on stools. Stewing in a pot was a mixture of boar's meat and giant radish. A jar of sake was warming in the ashes. Standing with his back to them, slicing pickles and chatting good-naturedly was the proprietor. What do you want? asked one of the customers, a keen-eyed man with long sideburns. Too hungry to hear, Musashi passed by the men and, seating himself on the edge of a stool, said to the proprietor, Give me something to eat, quick! Rice and pickles will do, anything! The man poured some of the stew over a bowl of cold rice and set it before him. Are you planning to cross the pass tonight? he asked. Um, mumbled Musashi who had already seized some chopsticks and was attacking the food with gusto. After his second mouthful, he asked, Do you know if a man named Daizo, he comes from Narai, passed here this afternoon, going toward the pass? He has a young boy with him. I'm afraid I can't help you. Then to the other man, Toji, did you or your friends see an older man traveling with a boy? After a bit of whispering, the three replied in the negative, shaking their heads in unison. Musashi, filled and warmed by the hot food, began to worry about the bill. He'd hesitated discussing it with the proprietor first, due to the presence of the other men, but he didn't for a moment feel he was begging. It had simply seemed more important to tend to his stomach's needs first. He made up his mind that if the shopkeeper would not accept the statue— He'd offer him his dagger. I'm sorry to have to tell you this, he began, but I don't have any cash at all. I'm not asking for a free meal, mind you. I have something here to offer in payment, if you'll take it. With unexpected amiability, the proprietor replied, I'm sure that'll be all right. What is it? A statue of Kannon. A real statue? Oh, it's not the work of a famous sculptor, just something I carved myself. It may not be worth even the price of a bowl of rice, but take a look at it anyway. As he began untying the cords of his bag, the one he had carried for years, the three men left off drinking and focused their attention on his hands. Besides the statue, the bag contained a single change of underwear and a writing set. When he emptied out the contents, something fell with a clunk to the ground. The others gasped 
for the object that lay at Musashi's feet was a money pouch, from which several gold and silver coins had spilled out. Musashi himself stared in speechless amazement. Where did that come from? he wondered. The other men craned their necks to gape at the treasure. Feeling something else in the bag, Musashi pulled out a letter. It consisted of a single line saying, This should take care of your travel expenses for the time being, and was signed, Geki. Musashi had a pretty clear idea of what it meant. It was Geki's way of trying to buy his services for Lord Date Masamune of Sendai and Aoba Castle. The increasing probability of a final clash between the Tokugawas and the Toyotomis made it imperative for the great daimyo to maintain sizable numbers of able fighters. A favorite method used in the cutthroat competition for the few really outstanding samurai was to attempt to get such men in debt, even for a small sum, and then forge a tacit agreement for future cooperation. It was common knowledge that Toyotomi Hideori was providing large sums of money to Goto Matabe and Sanada Yukimura. Though Yukimura was ostensibly in retirement on Mount Kudo, so much gold and silver was being sent to him from Osaka Castle that Ieyasu had undertaken a full-scale investigation. Since the personal requirements of a retired general living in Hermitage were fairly modest, it was all but certain that the money was being passed on to several thousand indigent ronin who were idling away their time in nearby towns and cities, waiting for the outbreak of hostilities. Finding an able warrior, as Geki believed he had, and somehow enticing him into his lord's service was one of the most valuable services a retainer could perform. And it was for just this reason that Musashi had no interest in Geki's money. Using it would incur an unwanted obligation. In a matter of seconds, he decided to ignore the gift to pretend it did not exist. Without a word, he reached down, picked up the pouch, and restored it to his bag. Addressing the proprietor as though nothing had happened, he said, All right, then. I'll leave the statue here in payment. But the man balked. I can't accept that now, sir. Is there something wrong with it? I don't claim to be a sculptor, but, oh, it's not bad, and I would have taken it if you didn't have any money, like you said, but you've got plenty. Why do you throw your cash around for people to see if you want them to think you're broke? The other customers, sobered and thrilled by the sight of the gold, vigorously nodded their agreement. Musashi, recognizing the futility of arguing that the money was not his, took out a piece of silver and handed it to the man. This is far too much, sir, complained the proprietor. Don't you have anything smaller? A cursory examination revealed some variation in the worth of the pieces, but nothing less valuable. Don't worry about the change, Musashi said. You can keep it. No longer able to maintain the fiction that the money didn't exist, Musashi tucked the pouch into his stomach wrapper for safekeeping. Then, despite urgings to linger a while, he shouldered his pack and went out into the night. Having eaten and restored his strength, he calculated that he could make it to Daimon Pass by sunrise. By day, he would have seen around him an abundance of highland flowers, rhododendrons, gentians, wild chrysanthemums, but at night, there in the immense sea of darkness, he could see only a cotton-like mist clinging to the earth. He was about two miles from the tea house when one of the men he'd seen there hailed him, saying, Wait! You forgot something! Catching up with Musashi, the man puffed. My! You walk fast! After you left, I found this money, so I brought it to you. It must be yours. He held out a piece of silver, which Musashi refused, saying it certainly wasn't his. The man insisted that it was. It must have rolled into the corner when you dropped your money pouch. Not having counted the money, Musashi was in no position to prove the man wrong. With a word of thanks, he took the silver and put it in his kimono sleeve. Yet for some reason, he found himself unmoved by this display of honesty. Though the man's errand had been completed, he fell in alongside Musashi and began making small talk. 
Perhaps I shouldn't ask, but are you studying swordsmanship under a well-known teacher? No, I use my own style. The perfunctory answer failed to discourage the man, who declared that he had been a samurai himself, adding, But for the time being, I'm reduced to living here in the mountains. Is that so? Um, those two back there, too. We were all samurai. Now we make our living cutting trees and gathering herbs. We're like the proverbial dragon biding its time in a pond. I can't pretend to be Sano Genzaemon, but when the time comes... I'll grab my old sword and put on my threadbare armor and go fight for some famous daimyo. I'm just waiting for that day to come. Are you for Osaka or Edo? Doesn't matter. The main thing is to be on somebody's side, or else I'll waste my life hanging around here. Musashi laughed politely. Thanks for bringing the money. Then, in an effort to lose the man, he started taking long, rapid strides. The man stayed right beside him, step for step. He also kept pressing in on Musashi's left side, an encroachment that any experienced swordsman would regard as suspicious. Rather than reveal his wariness, however, Musashi did nothing to protect his left side, leaving it wide open. The man became increasingly friendly. May I make a suggestion? If you'd like, why don't you come spend the night at our place? After Wada Pass, you've still got Daimon ahead of you. You might make it by morning, but it's very steep. A difficult road for a man not familiar with these parts. Thanks. I think I'll take you up on that. You should, you should. Only thing is, we don't have anything to offer in the way of food or entertainment. I'd be happy to have a place to lie down. Where is your house? About a half mile off to the left and a little higher up. You really are deep in the mountains, aren't you? As I said, until the proper time comes, we're lying low, gathering herbs, hunting, doing things like that. I share a house with the other two men. Now that you mention it, what became of them? They're probably still drinking. Every time we go there, they get drunk, and I wind up lugging them home. Tonight I decided to just leave them. Watch out! There's a sharp drop there. Stream down below. It's dangerous. Do we cross the stream? Yes, it's narrow here, and there's a log across it just below us. After we cross, we turn right and climb up along the river bank. Musashi sensed that the man had stopped walking, but he did not look back. He found the log and started across. A moment later, the man leaped forward and lifted the end of the log in an attempt to throw Musashi into the stream. What are you up to? The shout came from below, but the man jerked his head upward in astonishment. Musashi, having anticipated his treacherous move, had already jumped from the log and lit as lightly as a wagtail on a large rock. His startled attacker dropped the log into the stream. Before the curtain of flying water had fallen back to earth, Musashi had jumped back onto the bank, sword unsheathed, and cut his assailant down. It all happened so quickly that the man did not even see Musashi draw. The corpse wriggled for a moment or two before subsiding into stillness. Musashi did not deign to give it a glance. He had already taken a new stance in preparation for the next attack, for he was sure there would be one. As he steeled himself for it, his hair stood up like an eagle's crown feathers. A short silence ensued, followed by a boom loud enough to split the gorge asunder. The gunshot seemed to have come from somewhere on the other side, Musashi dodged, and the well-aimed slug hissed through the space he had been occupying, burring itself in the embankment behind him. Falling as though wounded, Musashi looked across to the opposite side, where he saw red sparks flying through the air like so many fireflies. He could just make out two figures creeping cautiously forward. A Cleansing Fire Clenching his teeth tightly on the sputtering fuse, the man made ready to fire his musket again. His confederate crouched down and, squinting into the distance, whispered, Do you think it's safe? I'm sure I got him with the first shot, came the confident reply. The two crept cautiously forward, but no sooner had they reached the edge of the bank than Musashi jumped up. The musketeer gasped and fired but lost his balance, sending the bullet uselessly skyward. 
As the echo reverberated through the ravine, both men, the other two from the tea house, fled up the path. Suddenly, one of them stopped in his tracks and roared, Wait! What are we running for? There's two of us and only one of him. I'll take him on and you can back me up. I'm with you, shouted the musketeer, letting go of the fuse and aiming the butt of his weapon at Musashi. They were definitely a cut above ordinary hoodlums. The man Musashi took to be the leader wielded his sword with genuine finesse. Nonetheless, he was a poor match for Musashi, who sent them both flying through the air with a single sword stroke. The musketeer, sliced from shoulder to waist, fell dead to the ground, his upper torso hanging over the bank as if by a thread. The other man sped up the slope, clutching a wounded forearm with Musashi in hot pursuit. Showers of dirt and gravel rose and fell in his wake. The ravine, Buna Valley, lay midway between Wada and Daimon Passes and took its name from the beech trees that seemed to fill it. On its highest point stood an exceptionally large mountaineer's cabin surrounded by trees and itself crudely fashioned of beech logs. Scrambling rapidly toward the tiny flame of a torch, the bandit shouted, Douse the lights! Protecting the flame with an outstretched sleeve, a woman exclaimed, Why, you! Oh, you're covered with blood! Sh shut up, you fool! Put out the lights! The ones inside, too! He could hardly get the words out from panting, and with the last look behind him, he hurtled past her. The woman blew out the torch and rushed after him. By the time Musashi arrived at the cabin, not a trace of light was visible anywhere. Open up, he bellowed. He was indignant, not for being taken to be a fool, nor because of the cowardly attack, but because men like these daily inflicted great harm on innocent travelers. He might have broken open the wooden rain shutters, but rather than make a frontal attack, which would have left his back dangerously exposed, he cautiously kept a distance of four or five feet. Open up! Getting no answer, he picked up the largest rock he could handle and hurled it at the shutters. It struck the crack between the two panels, sending both the man and the woman reeling into the house. A sword flew out from beneath them and was followed by the man crawling on his knees. He quickly regained his feet and retreated into the house. Musashi bounded forward and seized him by the back of his kimono. Don't kill me! I'm sorry! pleaded Gion Toji his whining tone exactly that of a petty crook. He was soon back on his feet again, trying to find Musashi's weak point. Musashi parried each of his moves, but when he pressed forward to hem in his opponent, Toji, mustering all his strength, pulled his short sword and made a powerful thrust. Dodging adroitly, Musashi swept him up in his arms and with a cry of contempt sent him crashing into the next room. Either an arm or a leg struck the pot hanger, for the bamboo pole from which it hung broke with a loud crack. White ashes billowed up from the hearth like a volcanic cloud. A barrage of missiles coming through the smoke and ashes kept Musashi at bay. As the ashes settled, he saw that his adversary was no longer the bandit's chief, who was flat on his back near the wall. The woman, between curses, was throwing everything she could lay her hands on. Pot lids, kindling, metal chopsticks, tea bowls. Musashi leapt forward and quickly pinned her to the floor, but she managed to pull a bodkin from her hair and take a stab at him. When he brought his foot down on her wrist, she gnashed her teeth, then cried out in anger and disgust at the unconscious Toji. Haven't you any pride? How can you lose to a nobody like this? Hearing the voice, Musashi abruptly drew in his breath and let her go. She jumped to her feet, grabbed up the short sword and lunged at him. Stop it, ma'am, said Musashi. Startled by the oddly courteous tone, she paused and gaped at him. Why, it's... it's Takezo! His hunch was right. Apart from Osugi, the only woman who could still call him by his childhood name was Oko. It is Takezo, she exclaimed, her voice growing syrupy. Your name's Musashi now, isn't it? You've become quite a swordsman, haven't you? What are you doing in a place like this? 
I'm ashamed to say. Is that man lying over there your husband? You must know him. He's what's left of Gion Toji. That's Toji? murmured Musashi. He had heard in Kyoto what a reprobate Toji was, and how he had pocketed the money collected to enlarge the school and absconded with Oko. Still, as he looked at the human wreck by the wall, he couldn't help feeling sorry for him. You'd better tend to him, he said. If I'd known he was your husband, I wouldn't have been so rough with him. Oh, I want to crawl in a hole and hide, simpered Oko. She went to Toji's side, gave him some water, bound his wounds, and when he had begun to come around, told him who Musashi was. What? he croaked. Miyamoto Musashi? The one who... Oh, this is awful! Placing his hands over his face, he doubled up abjectly. Forgetting his anger, Musashi allowed himself to be treated as an honored guest. Oko swept the floor, tidied up the hearth, put on new kindling and heated some sake. Handing him a cup, she said, in accordance with the accepted rules of etiquette, We haven't a thing to offer, but... I had quite enough at the tea house, Musashi replied politely. Please, don't go to any trouble. Oh, I hope you can eat the food I've prepared. It's been such a long time. Having hung a pot of stew on the pot hanger, she sat down beside him and poured his sake. It reminds me of old times at Mount Ibuki, said Musashi amiably. A strong wind had come up, and though the shutters were again securely in place, it came in through various cracks and teased the smoke from the hearth as it rose to the ceiling. Please don't remind me of that, said Oko. But tell me, have you heard anything of Akemi? Do you have any idea where she is? I heard she spent several days at the inn on Mount Hiei. She and Matahachi were planning to go to Edo. Seems she ran away with all his money. Oh, said Oko disappointedly. Her too? She gazed at the floor, sadly comparing her daughter's life with her own. When Toji had recovered sufficiently, he joined them and begged Musashi's forgiveness. He had, he avowed, acted on a sudden impulse, which he now deplored. There would come a day, he assured his guest, when he would re-enter society as the Gion Toji the world had known before. Musashi kept quiet, but he would have liked to say that there didn't seem to be much to choose from between Toji the samurai and Toji the bandit. But if he did return to the life of a warrior, the roads would be that much safer for travelers. Somewhat mellowed by the sake, he said to Oko, I think you'd be wise to give up this dangerous way of life. You're quite right. But of course, it's not as though I'm living this way out of choice. When we left Kyoto, we were going to try our luck in Edo. But in Sua... Toji got to gambling and lost everything we had. Travel money, everything. I thought of the moksa business, so we started gathering herbs and selling them in the town. Oh, I've had enough of this get-rich-quick schemes to last a lifetime. After tonight, I'm through. As always, a few drinks had introduced a coquettish note into her speech. She was beginning to turn on the charm. Oko was one of those women of indeterminate age, and she was still dangerous. A house cat will romp coyly on its master's knees so long as it is well fed and cared for, but turn it loose in the mountains, and in no time it will be prowling the night with flaming eyes, ready to feast off a corpse or tear the living flesh off travelers who have fallen sick by the wayside. Oko was very much like that. Toji, she said lovingly, according to Takezo, Akemi was headed for Edo. Couldn't we go there too and live more like human beings again? If we found Akemi, I'm sure we'd think of some profitable business to go into. Well, maybe, was the unenthusiastic reply. His arms were wrapped pensively around his knees. Perhaps the implied idea 
peddling Akemi's body, was a little raw even for him. Toji, after living with this predatory woman, was beginning to have the same regrets as Matahachi. To Musashi, the expression on Toji's face seemed pathetic. It reminded him of Matahachi. With a shudder, he recalled how he himself had once been enticed by her charms. Oko, said Toji, lifting his head. It won't be long till daylight. Musashi's probably tired. Why don't you fix a place for him in the back room so he can get some rest? Yes, of course. With a tipsy, sidelong glance at Musashi, she said, You'll have to be careful, Takizo. It's dark back there. Thanks. I could use some sleep. He followed her down a dark corridor to the back of the house. The room seemed to be an addition to the cabin. It was supported by logs and projected out over the valley with a drop of about seventy feet from the outer wall to the river. The air was damp from the mist and the spray blowing in from a waterfall. Each time the groaning of the wind rose a trifle, the little room rocked like a boat. Oko's white feet retreated across the slatted floor of the outdoor hallway to the hearth room. Has he gone to sleep? asked Toji. I think so, she replied, kneeling by his side. She whispered in his ear, What are you going to do? Go call the others. You're going through with it? Absolutely. It's not just a matter of money. If I kill the bastard, I'll have taken revenge for the house of Yoshioka. Tucking up the skirt of her kimono, she went outside. Under the starless sky, deep in the mountains, she sped through the black wind like a feline demon, her long hair streaming out behind. The nooks and crevices on the mountainside were not inhabited solely by birds and beasts. As Oko raced along, she made contact with more than twenty men, all members of Toji's band. Trained for night forays, they moved more quietly than floating leaves to a spot just in front of the cabin. Only one man? A samurai? Does he have money? The whispered exchanges were accompanied by explanatory gestures and eye movements. Carrying muskets and daggers and the type of lances used by boar hunters, a few of them surrounded the back room. About half went down into the valley, while a couple stopped halfway down, directly below the room. The floor of the room was covered with reed mats. Along one wall were neat little piles of dried herbs and a collection of mortars and other tools used to make medicine. Musashi found the pleasant aroma of the herbs soothing. It seemed to beckon him to close his eyes and sleep. His body felt dull and swollen to the tips of his extremities. But he knew better than to give in to the sweet temptation. He was aware there was something afoot. The herb gatherers of Mimasaka never had storage sheds like this. Theirs were never located where dampness accumulated and were always at some distance from dense foliage. By the dim light of a small lamp resting on a mortar stand beside his pillow, he could see something else that disturbed him. The metal brackets holding the room together at the corners were surrounded by numerous nail holes. He could also discern fresh wooden surfaces that must previously have been covered by joinery. The implication was unmistakable. The room had been rebuilt, probably a number of times. A tiny smile came to his lips, but he did not stir. Takizo? Oko called softly. Are you asleep? Gently sliding the shoji aside, she tiptoed to his pallet and placed a tray near his head. I'll put some water here for you, she said. He gave no sign of being awake. When she was back in the cabin itself, Toji whispered, Is everything all right? Closing her eyes for emphasis, she replied, He's sound asleep. With a satisfied look, Toji hurried outside, went to the back of the cabin and waved a lighted musket fuse, 
whereupon the men below pulled the supports out from under the room, sending it crashing down into the valley, walls, frame, ridge pole, and all. With a triumphant roar, the others sprang from their hiding places, like hunters from behind portable blinds, and rushed down to the riverbank. The next step was to extricate the corpse and the victim's belongings from the debris. After that, it would be a simple matter to gather up the pieces and rebuild the room. The bandits jumped into the pile of planks and posts like dogs falling on bones. Arriving from above, others asked, Have you found the body? No, not yet. It's got to be here somewhere. Toji shouted raucously. Maybe he struck a rock or something on the way down and bounced off to the side. Look all around. Rocks, water, the trees, and plants of the valley were taking on a bright reddish cast. With startled exclamations, Toji and his henchmen looked toward the sky. Seventy feet above, bright flames spouted from the doors, windows, walls, and roof of the cabin. It had turned into a huge ball of fire. Quick! Hurry! Get back up here! The piercing summons came from Oko and sounded like the howl of a woman gone mad. By the time the men had made their way up the cliff, the flames were dancing wildly in the wind. Unprotected from the shower of sparks and embers, Oko stood tied securely to a tree trunk. To a man, they were dumbfounded. Musashi, gone? How? How could he conceivably have outwitted them all? Toji lost heart. He did not even send his men in pursuit. He had heard enough about Musashi to know they'd never catch him. On their own, however, the bandits quickly organized search parties and flew off in all directions. They found no trace of Musashi. Playing with Fire Unlike the other principal routes, there were no trees lining the Koshu High Road, which joined Shiojiri and Edo by way of Kai Province. Used for military transport during the 16th century, it lacked the Nakasendo's network of back roads and had only recently been upgraded to the status of a main artery. For travelers coming from Kyoto or Osaka, its least agreeable feature was a dearth of good inns and eating places. A request for a box lunch was likely to bring forth nothing more appetizing than flat rice cakes wrapped in bamboo leaves, or, even less appealing, balls of plain rice done up in dried oak leaves. Despite the primitive fare, probably not much different from that of the Fujiwara period hundreds of years earlier, the rustic hostelries swarmed with guests, most of them bound for Edo. A group of travelers was taking a rest above Kobotoke Pass. One of them exclaimed, Look, there's another batch, referring to a sight he and his companions had been enjoying almost daily, a group of prostitutes on their way from Kyoto to Edo. The girls numbered about thirty, some old, some in their twenties or early thirties, at least five in their middle teens. Together with about ten men who managed or served them, they resembled a large patriarchal family. There were in addition several pack horses loaded down with everything from small wicker baskets to man-sized wooden chests. The head of the family, a man of about forty, was addressing his girls. If your straw sandals are giving you blisters, change into Zodi, but tie them tight so they don't slip around. And stop complaining that you can't walk any farther. Just look at the children on the road. The children! It was clear from his acid tone that he was having a hard time forcing his usually sedentary charges to keep moving. The man, whose name was Shoji Jinnai, was a native of Fushimi, a samurai by birth who had for reasons of his own abandoned the military life to become a brothel keeper. Being both quick-witted and resourceful, he had succeeded in gaining the support of Tokugawa Ieyasu, who often took up residence at Fushimi Castle, and had not only obtained permission to move his own business to Edo, but had also persuaded many of his colleagues in the trade to do likewise. 
Near the crest of Kobotoke, Jinnai brought his procession to a halt, saying, It's still a little early, but we can have our lunch now. Turning to Onao, an old woman who functioned as a sort of mother hen, he ordered her to pass out the food. The basket containing the box lunches was duly unloaded from one of the horses, and a leaf-wrapped ball of rice dealt out to each of the women who scattered themselves about and relaxed. The dust that had yellowed their skin had also turned their black hair nearly white, though they wore broad-brimmed traveling hats or had tied hand towels around their heads. There being no tea, eating entailed a good deal of lip-smacking and tooth-sucking. There was no suggestion of sexual wiles or amorous thrills. Whose arms will embrace this red, red blossom tonight? Seemed utterly beside the point. Oh, this is delicious, cried one of Jinnai's younger charges ecstatically. Her tone of voice would have brought tears to her mother's eyes. The attention of two or three others wandered from their lunch to focus on a young samurai passing by. Isn't he handsome? whispered one. Hmm, not bad, replied another of more worldly outlook. A third volunteered. Oh, I know him. He used to come to our place with men from the Yoshioka school. Which one are you talking about? asked one lustful-eyed creature. The young one, strutting along there with a the long sword on his back. Unaware of the admiration, Sasaki Kojiro was pushing his way through a throng of porters and pack horses. A high, flirtatious voice called, Mr. Sasaki! Over here! Mr. Sasaki! Since there were lots of people named Sasaki, he didn't even turn. You! With the forelock! Kojiro's eyebrows shot up, and he spun around. Watch your tongues! Jinnai shouted angrily. You're being rude! Then, glancing up from his lunch, he recognized Kojiro. Well, well, he said, rising quickly. If it isn't our friend Sasaki, where are you headed, if I may ask? Why, hello! You're the master of the Sumia, aren't you? I'm going to Edo. And what about you? You seem to be engaged in a full-scale move. That we are. We're moving to the new capital. Really? Do you think you can make a go of it there? Nothing grows in stagnant waters. The way Edo's growing, I imagine there's plenty of work for construction workers and gunsmiths. But elegant entertainment? It seems doubtful there's much demand for it yet. You're wrong, though. Women made a city out of Osaka before Hideyoshi got around to taking any notice of it. Maybe, but in a place as new as Edo, you probably won't even be able to find a suitable house. Wrong again. The government set aside some marshland in a place called Yoshiwara for people in my business. My associates have already started filling it in, putting in streets and building houses. From all reports, I should be able to find a good street front location fairly easily. You mean the Tokugawas are giving the land away? For free? Of course. Who'd pay for marshland? The government's even providing some of the construction materials. I see. No wonder you're all abandoning the Kyoto area. And what about you? Or do you have some prospect of a position with a daimyo? Oh no, nothing like that. I wouldn't take one if it was offered. I just thought I'd see what's going on up there, since it's the shogun's residence and the place where orders are going to come from in the future. Of course, if I were asked to be one of the shogun's instructors, I might accept. Though no judge of swordsmanship, Jinnai had a good eye for people. Thinking it just as well not to comment on Kojiro's unbridled egotism, he averted his eyes and began prodding his troop into movement. Everybody up now! It's time we were going! Onao, who had been counting heads, said, We seem to be missing one girl. Which one is it now? Kicho? Or maybe Sumizome? No, they're both over there. This is strange. Who could it be? Kojiro, disinclined to have a party of prostitutes for traveling companions, went on his way. A couple of the girls who had gone back down the road to search returned to where Onao was. Jinnai joined them. Here, here, Onao, which one is it? Ah, I know now. 
It was that girl named Akemi, she replied contritely, as if the fault were hers. The one you picked up on the road in Kiso. She must be around here somewhere. We've looked everywhere. I think she must have run away. Well, I didn't have a written commitment from her, and I didn't lend her any body money. She said she was willing, and since she was good-looking enough to be marketable, I took her on. I suppose she's cost me a bit in traveling expenses, but not enough to worry about. Never mind her. Let's get moving. He began hustling his group along. Even if it meant traveling after sundown, he wanted to reach Hachioji within the day. If they could get that far before stopping, they could be in Edo the next day. A short way down the road, Akemi reappeared and fell in with them. Where have you been? Onao demanded angrily. You can't just wander off without telling anyone where you're going. Unless, of course, you're planning to leave us. The old woman went on to explain self-righteously how they had all been so worried about her. You don't understand, said Akemi, from whom the scolding brought nothing but giggles. There was a man I know on the road, and I didn't want him to see me. I ran into a clump of bamboo, not knowing there was a sudden drop-off there. I slid all the way down to the bottom. She corroborated this by holding up her torn kimono and a skinned elbow. But all the time she was begging forgiveness, her face showed not the slightest sign of contrition. From his position near the front, Jinnai caught wind of what had happened and summoned her. Sternly, he said, Your name's Akemi, isn't it? Akemi, that's hard to remember. If you're really going to succeed in this business, you'll have to find a better name. Tell me, have you really resolved to go through with this? Does it require resolution to become a whore? It's not something you can take up for a month or so and then quit. And if you become one of my girls, you'll have to give the customers what they ask for, like it or not. Don't make any mistake about that. What difference does it make now? Men have already made a mess of my life. That's not the right attitude at all. Now, you give this some careful thought. If you change your mind before we reach Edo, that's all right. I won't ask you to pay me back for your food and lodging. That same day, at the Yakuoing in Takao, an older man, apparently free of the pressures of business, was about to resume his leisurely journey. He, his servant, and a boy of about fifteen had arrived the previous evening and requested overnight accommodations. He and the boy had been touring the temple grounds since early morning. It was now about noon. Use this for roof repairs or whatever is necessary, he said, offering one of the priests three large gold coins. The head priest, immediately apprised of the gift, was so overwhelmed by the donor's generosity that he personally hastened out to exchange greetings. Perhaps you would like to leave your name, he said. Another priest, saying this had already been done, showed him the entry in the temple registry, which read, Daizo of Narai, dealer in herbs, resident at the foot of Mount Ontake in Kiso. The head priest apologized profusely for the poor quality of the fare served by the temple, for Daizo of Narai was known throughout the country as a lavish contributor to shrines and temples. His gifts always took the form of gold coins, in some cases, it was said, as many as several dozen. Only he himself knew whether he did this for amusement, to acquire reputation, or out of piety. The priest, eager to have him stay longer, begged him to inspect the temple's treasures, a privilege accorded to few. I'll be in Edo a while, said Daizo. I'll come to see them another time. By all means, but at least let me accompany you to the outer gate, insisted the priest. Are you planning to stop in Fuchu tonight? No, Hachioji. In that case, it'll be an easy trip. Tell me, who's the lord of Hachioji now? It's recently been put under the administration of Okubo Nagayasu. He was a magistrate of Nara, wasn't he? Yes, that's the man. The gold mines on Sado Island are also under his control. He's very rich. A very able man, it would appear. 
It was still daylight when they came to the foot of the mountains and stood on the busy main street of Hachioji, where reportedly there were no fewer than twenty-five inns. Well, Jotaro, where shall we stay? Jotaro, who had stuck to Daizo's side like a shadow, let it be known in no uncertain terms that he preferred anywhere as long as it's not a temple. Choosing the largest and most imposing inn, Daizo entered and requested a room. His distinguished appearance, together with the elegant lacquered traveling case his servant carried on his back, made a dazzling impression on the head clerk, who said fawningly, You're stopping quite early, aren't you? Inns along the high roads were accustomed to having hordes of travelers tumble in at dinner time or even later. Daizo was shown to a large room on the first floor, but shortly after sundown, both the innkeeper and the head clerk came to Daizo's room. I'm sure it's a great inconvenience, the innkeeper began abjectly, but a large party of guests has come in very suddenly. I'm afraid it'll be terribly noisy here. If you wouldn't mind moving to a room on the second floor? Oh, that's perfectly all right, replied Daizo good-naturedly. Glad to see your business is thriving. Signaling Skechi, his servant, to take care of the luggage, Daizo proceeded upstairs. He had no sooner left the room than it was overrun by women from the Sumia. The inn wasn't just busy, it was frenetic. What with the hubbub downstairs, the servants did not come when called. Dinner was late, and when they had eaten, no one came to clear away the dishes. On top of that, there was the constant tramping of feet on both floors. Only Daizo's sympathy for the hired help kept him from losing his temper. Ignoring the litter in the room, he stretched out to take a nap, using his arm for a pillow. After only a few minutes, a sudden thought came to him, and he called Skechi. When Skechi failed to materialize, Daizo opened his eyes, sat up, and shouted, Jotaro! Come here! But he, too, had disappeared. Daizo got up and went to the veranda, which he saw was lined with guests, excitedly gaping with delight at the prostitutes on the first floor. Spying Jotaro among the spectators, Daizo swiftly yanked him back into the room. With a forbidding eye, he demanded, What were you staring at? The boy's long wooden sword, which he did not take off even indoors, scraped the tatami as he sat down. Well, he said, everyone else is looking. And just what are they looking at? Oh, there are a lot of women in the back room downstairs. Is that all? Yes. What's so entertaining about that? The presence of the whores didn't bother Daizo, but for some reason he found the intense interest of the men gawking at them annoying. I don't know, replied Jotaro honestly. I'm going for a walk around town, Daizo said. You stay here while I'm gone. Can't I go with you? Not at night. Why not? As I told you before, when I go for a walk, it's not simply to amuse myself. Well, what's the idea, then? It has to do with my religion. Don't you get enough of shrines and temples during the daytime? Even priests have to sleep at night. Religion has to do with more than shrines and temples, young man. Now go find Skechi for me. He has the key to my traveling case. He went downstairs a few minutes ago. I saw him peeking into the room where the women are. Him too? exclaimed Daizo with a click of his tongue. Go get him and be quick about it. After Jotaro had left, Daizo began retying his obi. Having heard the women were Kyoto prostitutes, famous for their beauty and savoir-faire, the male guests were unable to leave off feasting their eyes. Skeichi was so absorbed with the sight that his mouth was still hanging open when Jotaro located him. Come on, you've seen enough, snapped the boy, giving the servant's ear a tug. Ouch, squealed Skeichi. Your master's calling you. That's not true. It is, too. He said he was going for a walk. He's always taking walks, isn't he? Eh? Oh, all right, said Skeichi, tearing his eyes away reluctantly. The boy had turned to follow him when a voice called, Jotaro? 
You're Jotaro, aren't you? The voice was that of a young woman. He looked around searchingly. The hope that he would find his lost teacher and Otsu never left him. Could it be? He peered tensely through the branches of a large evergreen shrub. Who is it? Me. The face that emerged from the foliage was familiar. Oh, it's only you. Akemi slapped him roughly on the back. You little monster, and it's been such a long time since I saw you. What are you doing here? I could ask you the same question. Well, I... Oh, it wouldn't mean anything to you anyway. Are you traveling with those women? I am, but I haven't made up my mind yet. Made up your mind about what? Whether to become one of them or not, she replied with a sigh. After a long pause, she asked, What's Musashi doing these days? This, Jotaro perceived, was what she really wanted to know. He only wished he could answer the question. Otsu and Musashi and I, we got separated on the high road. Otsu? Who's she? She had hardly spoken before she remembered. Oh, never mind. I know. Is she still chasing after Musashi? Akemi was in the habit of thinking of Musashi as a dashing shugyosha, wandering about as the mood suited him, living in the forest, sleeping on bare rocks. Even if she succeeded in catching him, he'd see right away how dissolute her life had become and shun her. She had long since resigned herself to the idea that her love would go unrequited. But the mention of another woman awoke feelings of jealousy and rekindled the dying embers of her amorous instinct. Jotaro, she said, there are too many curious eyes around here. Let's go out somewhere. They left via the garden gate. Out in the street, their eyes were regaled by the lights of Hachioji and its twenty-five hostelries. It was the liveliest town either had seen since leaving Kyoto. To the northwest rose the dark, silent forms of the Chichibu Range and the mountains marking the boundary of Kai Province. But here the atmosphere was replete with the aroma of sake, noisy with the clinking of weaver's reeds, the shouts of market officials, the excited voices of gamblers, and the dispirited whining songs of local street singers. I often heard Matahachi mention Otsu, Akemi lied. What kind of person is she? She's a very good person, Jotaro said soberly. Sweet and gentle and considerate and pretty. I really like her. The threat Akemi felt hanging over her grew heavier, but she cloaked her feelings with a benign smile. Is she really so wonderful? Oh, yes, and she can do anything. She sings, she writes well, and she's good at playing the flute. Now visibly ruffled, Akemi said, I don't see what good it does a woman to be able to play the flute. If you don't, you don't. But everybody, even Lord Yagyu Sekshusai, speaks highly of Otsu. There's only one little thing I don't like about her. All women have their faults. It's just a question of whether they honestly admit to them the way I do or try to hide them behind a ladylike pose. Otsu is not like that. It's just this one weakness of hers. What's that? She's always breaking into tears. She's a regular crybaby. Oh? Why is that? She cries whenever she thinks of Musashi. That makes being around her pretty gloomy, and I don't like it. Jotaro expressed himself with youthful abandon, heedless of the effect this might have. Akemi's heart, her whole body, was afire with raging jealousy. It showed in the depths of her eyes, even in the color of her skin. But she continued her interrogation. Tell me, how old is she? About the same. You mean the same age as me? Hmm, but she looks younger and prettier. Akemi plunged on, hoping to turn Jotaro against Otsu. Musashi's more masculine than most men. He must hate having to watch a woman carry on all the time. Otsu probably thinks tears will win a man's sympathy. She's like the girls working for the Sumia. 
Jotaro, very much irked, retorted, That's not true at all. In the first place, Musashi likes Otsu. He never shows his feelings, but he's in love with her. Akemi's flushed face grew bright crimson. She longed to throw herself into a river to quench the flames that were consuming her. Jotaro, let's go this way. She pulled him toward a red light in a side street. That's a drinking place. Well, what of it? Women have no business in a place like that. You can't go in there. All of a sudden, I have the urge to drink, and I can't go in alone. I'd be embarrassed. You'd be embarrassed? What about me? They'll have things to eat. You can have anything you want. At first glance, the shop seemed empty. Akemi walked right in, then, facing the wall rather than the counter, said, Bring me some sake. One cup after another went down as fast as was humanly possible. Jotaro, frightened by the quantity, tried to slow her down, but she elbowed him out of the way. Quiet, she yelped. What a nuisance you are. Bring some more sake. Sake? Jotaro, insinuating himself between her and the sake jar, pleaded, You've got to stop. You can't go on drinking here like this. Don't worry about me, she slurred. You're a friend of Otsu's, aren't you? I can't stand women who try to win a man with tears. Well, I dislike women who get drunk. I'm so sorry, but how could a runt like you understand why I drink? Come on, just pay the bill. You think I've got money? Don't you? No. Maybe he can collect from the sumia. I've already sold myself to the master anyway. Tears flooded her eyes. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. Weren't you the one who was making fun of Otsu for crying? Look at yourself. My tears aren't the same as hers. Oh, life's too much trouble. I might as well be dead. With that, she stood up and lurched out into the street. The shopkeeper, having had other female customers like this in his time, merely laughed it off. But a Ronin, who had until then been sleeping quietly in a corner, opened his bleary eyes and stared at her retreating back. Jotaro darted after her and grabbed her around the waist, but he lost his hold. She started running down the darkened street, Jotaro close behind. Stop! he cried with alarm. You mustn't even think of it! Come back! Though she seemed not to care whether she ran into something in the dark or fell into a swamp, she was fully conscious of Jotaro's pleading. When she had plunged into the sea at Sumiyoshi, she had wanted to kill herself, but she was no longer so lacking in guile. She got a certain thrill from having Jotaro so worried about her. Watch out! he screamed, seeing that she was headed straight toward the murky water of a moat. Stop it! Why do you want to die? It's crazy! As he caught her around the waist again, she wailed, Why shouldn't I die? You think I'm wicked. So does Musashi. Everybody does. There's nothing I can do but die, embracing Musashi in my heart. Never will I let him be taken from me by a woman like that. You're pretty mixed up. How did you get this way? It doesn't matter. All you have to do is push me into the moat. Go ahead, Jotaro. Push! Covering her face with her hands, she burst into frenzied tears. This awakened a strange fear in Jotaro. He, too, felt the urge to cry. Come on, Akemi. Let's go back. Oh, I yearn so to see him. Find him for me, Jotaro. Please find Musashi for me. Stand still. Don't move. It's dangerous. Oh, Musashi. Watch out. At that moment, the ronin from the sake shop stepped out of the darkness. Go away, boy, he commanded. I'll take her back to the inn. He put his hands under Jotaro's arms and roughly lifted him aside. He was a tall man, thirty-four or five years old, with deep-set eyes and a heavy beard. A crooked scar, no doubt left by a sword, ran from below his right ear to his chin. It looked like the jagged tear that appears when a peach is broken open. Swallowing hard to overcome his fear, Jotaro tried coaxing, Akemi, please come with me. 
Everything will be all right. Akemi's head was now resting on the samurai's chest. Look, the man said. She's gone to sleep. Off with you. I'll take her home later. No, let go of her. When the boy refused to budge, the ronin slowly reached out with one hand and grabbed his collar. Hands off! screamed Jotaro, resisting with all his strength. You little bastard! How'd you like to get thrown into the moat? Who's going to do it? He wriggled loose, and as soon as he was free, his hand found the end of his wooden sword. He swung it at the man's side, but his own body did a somersault and landed on a rock by the roadside. He moaned once, then remained still. Jotaro had been out for some time before he began hearing voices around him. Wake up there! What happened? Opening his eyes, he vaguely took in a small crowd of people. Are you awake? Are you all right? Embarrassed by the attention he was attracting, he picked up his wooden sword and was trying to get away when a clerk from the inn grabbed his arm. Wait a minute, he barked. What happened to the woman you were with? Looking around, Jotaro got the impression that the others were also from the inn, guests as well as employees. Some of the men were carrying sticks. Others were holding round paper lanterns. A man came and said you'd been attacked and a ronin had carried the woman off. Do you know which way they went? Jotaro, still dazed, shook his head. That's impossible. You must have some idea. Jotaro pointed in the first direction that came to hand. Now I remember. It was that way. He was reluctant to say what really happened, fearing a scolding from Daizo for getting involved, but also dreading to admit in front of these people that the Loning had thrown him. Despite the vagueness of his reply, the crowd rushed off, and presently a cry went up. Here she is! Over here! The lanterns gathered in a circle around Akemi, whose disheveled form lay where she had been abandoned, on a stack of hay in a farmer's shed. Prodded back to reality by the clatter of running feet, she dragged herself to her feet. The front of her kimono was open. Her obi lay on the ground. Hay clung to her hair and clothing. What happened? While the word rape was on the tip of everyone's tongue, no one said it. Nor did it even cross their minds to chase the villain. Whatever had happened to Akemi, they felt, she had brought on herself. Come on, let's go back, said one of the men, taking her hand. Akemi pulled away quickly. Resting her face forlornly against the wall, she broke down in bitter tears. Seems to be drunk. How'd she get that way? Jotaro had been watching the scene from a distance. What had befallen Akemi was not clear to him in detail, but somehow he was reminded of an experience that had nothing to do with her. The titillation of lying in the fodder shed in Koyagyu with Kocha came back to him, along with the strangely excited fear of approaching footsteps. But his pleasure quickly evaporated. I better get back, he said decisively. As his pace quickened, his spirit, back from its trip to the unknown, moved him to break into song. Old metal Buddha standing in the field, have you seen a girl of sixteen? Don't you know a girl who strayed? When asked, you say clang. When struck, you say bong. <laughs>